Leon Trotsky. History of the Russian Revolution. Preface During the first two months of 1917, Russia was still a Romanov monarchy. Eight months later, the Bolsheviks stood at the helm. They were little known to anybody when the year began, and their leaders were still under indictment for state treason when they came to power. You will not find another such sharp turn in history, especially if you remember that it involves a nation of 150 million people. It is clear that the events of 1917, whatever you think of them, deserve study. The history of revolution, like every other history, ought first of all to tell what happened and how. That, however, is little enough. From the very telling it ought to become clear why it happened thus and not otherwise. Events can neither be regarded as a series of adventures, nor strung on the thread of a preconceived moral. They must obey their own laws. The discovery of these laws is the author's task. The most indubitable feature of a revolution is the direct interference of the masses in historical events. In ordinary times, the state, be it monarchical or democratic, elevates itself above the nation, and history is made by specialists in that line of business kings, ministers, bureaucrats, parliamentarians, journalists. But at those crucial moments when the old order becomes no longer endurable to the masses, they break over the barriers excluding them from the political arena, sweep aside their traditional representatives, and create by their own interference the initial groundwork for a new regime. Whether this is good or bad we leave to the judgment of moralists. We ourselves will take the facts as they are given by the objective course of development. The history of a revolution is for us first of all a history of the forcible entrance of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. In a society that is seized by revolution, classes are in conflict. It is perfectly clear, however, that the change is introduced between the beginning and the end of revolution in the economic basis of the society and its social substratum of classes are not sufficient to explain the course of the revolution itself, which can overthrow in a short interval age-old institutions, create new ones, and again overthrow them. The dynamic of revolutionary events is directly determined by swift, intense, and passionate changes in the psychology of classes which have already formed themselves before the revolution. The point is that society does not change its institutions as need arises the way a mechanic changes his instruments. On the contrary, society actually takes the institutions which hang upon it as given once and for all. For decades the oppositional criticism is nothing more than a safety valve for mass dissatisfaction, a condition of the stability of the social structure. Such in principle, for example, was the significance acquired by the social democratic criticism. Entirely exceptional conditions, independent of the will of persons and parties, are necessary in order to tear off from discontent the fetters of conservatism, and bring the masses to insurrection. The swift changes of mass views and moods in an epoch of revolution thus derive, not from the flexibility and mobility of man's mind, but just the opposite, from its deep conservatism. The chronic lag of ideas and relations behind new objective conditions, right up to the moment when the latter crash over people in the form of a catastrophe, is what creates in a period of revolution that leaping movement of ideas and passions which seems to the police mind a mere result of the activities of demagogues. The masses go into a revolution not with a prepared plan of social reconstruction, but with a sharp feeling that they cannot endure the old regime. Only the guiding layers of a class have a political program, and even this still requires the test of events, and the approval of the masses. The fundamental political process of the revolution thus consists in the gradual comprehension by a class of the problems arising from the social crisis. The active orientation of the masses by a method of successive approximations. The different stages of a revolutionary process certified by a change of parties in which the more extreme always supersedes the less, express the growing pressure to the left of the masses, so long as the swing of the movement does not run into objective obstacles. When it does, there begins a reaction, disappointments of the different layers of the revolutionary class, growth of indifferentism, and therewith a strengthening of the position of the counter-revolutionary forces. Such 
at least, is the general outline of the old revolutions. Only on the basis of a study of political processes in the masses themselves can we understand the role of parties and leaders, whom we least of all are inclined to ignore. They constitute not an independent, but nevertheless a very important, element in the process. Without a guiding organization, the energy of the masses would dissipate like steam not enclosed in a piston box. But nevertheless what moves things is not the piston or the box, but the steam. The difficulties which stand in the way of studying the changes of mass consciousness in a revolutionary epoch are quite obvious. The oppressed classes make history in the factories, in the barracks, in the villages, on the streets of the cities. Moreover, they are least of all accustomed to write things down. Periods of high tension in social passions leave little room for contemplation and reflection. All the muses, even the plebeian muse of journalism, in spite of her sturdy hips, have hard sledding in times of revolution. Still the historian's situation is by no means hopeless. The records are incomplete, scattered, accidental. But in the light of the events themselves these fragments often permit a guess as to the direction and rhythm of the hidden process. For better or worse, a revolutionary party bases its tactics upon a calculation of the changes of mass consciousness. The historic course of Bolshevism demonstrates that such a calculation, at least in its rough features, can be made. If it can be made by a revolutionary leader in the whirlpool of the struggle, why not by the historian afterward? However, the processes taking place in the consciousness of the masses are not unrelated and independent. No matter how the idealists and the eclectics rage, consciousness is nevertheless determined by conditions. In the historic conditions which formed Russia, her economy, her classes, her state, in the action upon her of other states, we ought to be able to find the premises both of the February Revolution and of the October Revolution which replaced it. Since the greatest enigma is the fact that a backward country was the first to place the proletariat in power, it behooves us to seek the solution of that enigma in the peculiarities of that backward country, that is, in its differences from other countries. The historic peculiarities of Russia and their relative weight will be characterized by us in the early chapters of this book which give a short outline of the development of Russian society and its inner forces. We venture to hope that the inevitable schematism of these chapters will not repel the reader. In the further development of the book he will meet these same forces in living action. This work will not rely in any degree upon personal recollections. The circumstance that the author was a participant in the events does not free him from the obligation to base his exposition upon historically verified documents. The author speaks of himself, insofar as that is demanded by the course of events, in the third person. And that is not a mere literary form, the subjective tone, inevitable in autobiographies or memoirs, is not permissible in a work of history. However, the fact that the author did participate in the struggle naturally makes easier his understanding, not only of the psychology of the forces in action, both individual and collective but also of the inner connection of events. This advantage will give positive results only if one condition is observed, that he does not rely upon the testimony of his own memory either in trivial details or in important matters, either in questions of fact or questions of motive and mood. The author believes that in so far as in him lies he has fulfilled this condition. There remains the question of the political position of the author, who stands as a historian upon the same viewpoint upon which he stood as a participant in the events. The reader, of course, is not obliged to share the political views of the author, which the latter on his side has no reason to conceal. But the reader does have the right to demand that a historical work should not be the defense of a political position, but an internally well-founded portrayal of the actual process of the revolution. A historical work only then completely fulfills the mission when events unfold upon its pages in their full natural necessity. For this, is it necessary to have the so-called historian's impartiality? Nobody has yet clearly explained what this impartiality consists of. The often quoted words of Clements that it is necessary to take a revolution en bloc, as a whole, are at the best a clever evasion. How can you take as a whole a thing whose essence consists in a split? 
Clemence's aphorism was dictated partly by shame for his two resolute ancestors, partly by embarrassment before their shades. One of the reactionary and therefore fashionable historians in contemporary France, L. Madeleine, slandering in his drawing room fashion the Great Revolution, that is, the birth of his own nation, asserts that the historian ought to stand upon the wall of a threatened city and behold at the same time the besiegers and the besieged, only in this way, it seems, can he achieve a conciliatory justice. However, the words of Madeline himself testify that if he climbs out on the wall dividing the two camps, it is only in the character of a reconnoiterer for the reaction. It is well that he is concerned only with war camps of the past, in a time of revolution standing on the wall involves great danger. Moreover, in times of alarm the priests of conciliatory justice are usually found sitting on the inside of four walls waiting to see which side will win. The serious and critical reader will not want a treacherous impartiality, which offers him a cup of conciliation with a well-settled poison of reactionary hate at the bottom, but a scientific conscientiousness, which for its sympathies and antipathies, open and undisguised, seeks support in an honest study of the facts a determination of their real connections, an exposure of the causal laws of their movement. That is the only possible historic objectivism, and moreover it is amply sufficient, for it is verified and attested not by the good intentions of the historian, for which only he himself can vouch, but the natural laws revealed by him of the historic process itself. The sources of this book are innumerable periodical publications newspapers and journals, memoirs, report, and other material, partly in manuscript, but the greater part published by the Institute of the History of the Revolution in Moscow and Leningrad. We have considered it superfluous to make reference in the text to particular publications, since that would only bother the reader. Among the books which have the character of collective historical works we have particularly used the two-volume essays on the history of the October Revolution. Moscow Leningrad, 1927. Written by different authors, the various parts of this book are unequal in value, but they contain at any rate abundant factual material. The dates in our book are everywhere indicated according to the old style, that is, they are 13 days behind the international and the present Soviet calendar. The author felt obliged to use the calendar which was in use at the time of the revolution. It would have been no labor of course to translate the dates into the new style. But this operation in removing one difficulty would have created others more essential. The overthrow of the monarchy has gone into history as the February Revolution, according to the Western calendar, however, it occurred in March. The armed demonstration against the imperialist policy of the provisional government has gone into history under the name of the April Days whereas according to the Western calendar it happened in May. Not to mention other intervening events and dates, we remark only that the October Revolution happened according to European reckoning in November. The calendar itself, we see, is tinted by the events, and the historian cannot handle revolutionary chronology by mere arithmetic. The reader will be kind enough to remember that before overthrowing the Byzantine calendar, the revolution had to overthrow the institutions that clung to it. L. Trotsky Principo November 14, 1930 Volume and Eth Overthrow of Tsarism One Peculiarities of Russia's Development The fundamental and most stable feature of Russian history is the slow tempo of her development, with the economic backwardness, primitiveness of social forms and low level of culture resulting from it. The population of this gigantic and austere plain, open to eastern winds and Asiatic migrations, was condemned by nature itself to a long backwardness. The struggle with nomads lasted almost up to the end of the 17th century, the struggle with winds, bringing winter cold and summer drought, continues still. Agriculture, the basis of the whole development, advanced by extensive methods. In the north they cut down and burned up the forests, in the south they ravished the virgin steppes. The conquest of nature went wide and not deep. While the western barbarians settled in the ruins of Roman culture, where many an old stone lay ready as building material, the Slavs in the east found no inheritance upon their desolate plain. 
Their predecessors had been on even a lower level of culture than they. The Western European peoples, soon finding their natural boundaries, created those economic and cultural clusters, the commercial cities. The population of the Eastern Plain, at the first sign of crowding, would go deeper into the forest or spread out over the steppe. The more aggressive and enterprising elements of the peasantry in the West became burghers, craftsmen, merchants. The more active and bold in the East became, some of them, traders, but most of them Cossacks, frontiersmen, pioneers. The process of social differentiation, intensive in the West, was delayed in the East and diluted by the process of expansion. The Tsar of Muscovia, although a Christian, rules a lazy minded people, wrote Vico, a contemporary of Peter I. That lazy mind of the Muscovites was a reflection of the slow tempo of economic development, the formlessness of class relations, the me ageness of inner history. The ancient civilizations of Egypt, India, and China had a character self sufficient enough, and they had time enough at their disposal, to bring their social relations, in spite of low productive powers, almost to the same detailed completion to which their craftsmen brought the products of their craft. Russia stood not only geographically, but also socially and historically, between Europe and Asia. She was marked off from the European West, but also from the Asiatic East, approaching at different periods and in different features now one, now the other. The East gave her the Tartar yoke which entered as an important element into the structure of the Russian state. The West was a still more threatening foe, but at the same time a teacher. Russia was unable to settle in the forms of the East because she was continually having to adapt herself to military and economic pressure from the West. The existence of feudal relations in Russia, denied by former historians, may be considered unconditionally established by later investigation. Furthermore, the fundamental elements of Russian feudalism were the same as in the West. But the mere fact that the existence of the feudal epoch had to be established by means of extended scientific arguments sufficiently testifies to the incompleteness of Russian feudalism, its formlessness, its poverty of cultural monuments. A backward country assimilates the material and intellectual conquests of the advanced countries. But this does not mean that it follows them slavishly reproduces all the stages of their past. The theory of the repetition of historic cycles, Vico and his more recent followers, rests upon an observation of the orbits of old pre-capitalistic cultures, and in part upon the first experiments of capitalist development. A certain repetition of cultural stages in ever new settlements was in fact bound up with the provincial and episodic character of that whole process. Capitalism means, however, an overcoming of those conditions. It prepares and, in a certain sense, realizes the universality and permanence of man's development. By this, a repetition of the forms of development by different nations is ruled out. Although compelled to follow after the advanced countries, a backward country does not take things in the same order. The privilege of historic backwardness, and such a privilege exists, permits or rather compels, the adoption of whatever is ready in advance of any specified date, skipping a whole series of intermediate stages. Savages throw away their bows and arrows for rifles all at once, without traveling the road which lay between those two weapons in the past. The European colonists in America did not begin history all over again from the beginning. The fact that Germany and the United States have now economically outstripped England was made possible by the very backwardness of their capitalist development. On the other hand, the conservative anarchy in the British coal industry, as also in the heads of Macdonald and his friends, is a paying up for the past when England played too long the role of capitalist pathfinder. The development of historically backward nations leads necessarily to a peculiar combination of different stages in the historic process. Their development as a whole acquires a planless, complex, combined character. The possibility of skipping over intermediate steps is, of course, by no means absolute. Its degree is determined in the long run by the economic and cultural capacities of the country. The backward nation, moreover, 
not infrequently debases the achievements borrowed from outside in the process of adapting them to its own more primitive culture. In this, the very process of assimilation acquires a self-contradictory character. Thus the introduction of certain elements of Western technique and draining, above all military and industrial, under Peter I, led to a strengthening of serfdom as the fundamental form of labor organization. European armament and European loans, both indubitable products of a higher culture, led to a strengthening of Tsarism, which delayed in its turn the development of the country. The laws of history have nothing in common with a pedantic schematism. Unevenness. The most general law of the historic process, reveals itself most sharply and complexly in the destiny of the backward countries. Under the whip of external necessity, their backward culture is compelled to make leaps. From the universal law of unevenness thus derives another law which, for the lack of a better name, we may call the law of combined development, by which we mean a drawing together of the different stages of the journey, a combining of the separate steps, an amalgam of archaic with more contemporary forms. Without this law, to be taken of course in its whole material content, it is impossible to understand the history of Russia, and indeed of any country of the second, third, or tenth cultural class. Under pressure from richer Europe, the Russian state swallowed up a far greater relative part of the people's wealth than in the West, and thereby not only condemned the people to a twofold poverty, but also weakened the foundations of the possessing classes. Being at the same time in need of support from the latter, it forced and regimented their growth. As a result the bureaucratized privileged classes never rose to their full height, and the Russian state thus still more approached an Asiatic despotism. The Byzantine autocratism, officially adopted by the Muscovite Tsars at the beginning of the 16th century, subdued the feudal boy Tsars with the help of the nobility, and then gained the subjection of the nobility by making the peasantry their slaves and upon this foundation created the St. Petersburg imperial absolutism. The backwardness of the whole process is sufficiently indicated in the fact that serfdom, born at the end of the 16th century, took form in the 17th, flowered in the 18th, and was juridically annulled only in 1861. The clergy, following after the nobility, played no small role in the formation of the Tsarist autocracy, but nevertheless a servile role. The Church never rose in Russia to that commanding height that it attained in the Catholic West, it was satisfied with the role of spiritual servant of the autocracy, and counted this a recompense for its humility. The bishops and metropolitans enjoyed authority merely as deputies of the temporal power. The patriarchs were changed along with the Tsars. In the Petersburg period, the dependence of the Church upon the state became still more servile. 200,000 priests and monks were in all essentials a part of the bureaucracy, a sort of police of the gospel. In return for this, the monopoly of the orthodox clergy in matters of faith, land, and income was defended by a more regular kind of police. Slavophilism, the messianism of backwardness, has based its philosophy upon the assumption that the Russian people and their church are democratic through and through whereas official Russia is a German bureaucracy imposed upon them by Peter the Great. Marx remarked upon this theme, in the same way that Teutonic jackasses blamed the despotism of Frederick II upon the French, as though backward slaves were not always in need of civilized slaves to train them. This brief comment completely finishes off not only the old philosophy of the Slavophiles, but also the latest revelations of the racists. The Miagenus, not only of Russian feudalism but of all the old Russian history, finds its most depressing expression in the absence of real medieval cities as centers of commerce and craft. Handicraft did not succeed in Russia in separating itself from agriculture, but preserved its character of home industry. The old Russian cities were commercial, administrative, military, and manorial, centers of consumption, consequently, not of production. Even Novgorod, similar to Hanzu and not subdued by the Tatars, was only a commercial and not an industrial city. True, the distribution of the peasant industries over various districts created a demand for trade mediation on a large scale. 
but nomad traders could not possibly occupy that place in social life which belonged in the West to the craft guild and merchant industrial petty and middle bourgeoisie, inseparably bound up with its peasant environment. The chief roads of Russian trade, moreover, led across the border, thus from time immemorial giving the leadership to foreign commercial capital, and imparting a semi-colonial character to the whole process in which the Russian trader was a mediator between the western cities and the Russian villages. This kind of economic relation developed further during the epoch of Russian capitalism and found its extreme expression in the imperialist war. The insignificance of the Russian cities, which more than anything else promoted the development of an Asiatic state, also made impossible a reformation, that is, a replacement of the feudal bureaucratic orthodoxy by some sort of modernized kind of Christianity adapted to the demands of a bourgeois society. The struggle against the state church did not go further than the creation of peasant sects, the faction of the old believers being the most powerful among them. Fifteen years before the Great French Revolution, there developed in Russia a movement of the Cossacks, peasants, and worker serfs of the Urals known as the Pugikev Rebellion. What was lacking to this menacing popular uprising in order to convert it into a revolution? A third estate. Without the industrial democracy of the cities, a peasant war could not develop into a revolution, just as the peasant sects could not rise to the height of a reformation. The result of the Pugikev Rebellion was just the opposite, a strengthening of bureaucratic absolutism as the guardian of the interests of the nobility, a guardian which had again justified itself in the hour of danger. The Europeanization of the country, formally begun in the time of Peter, became during the following century more and more a demand of the ruling class itself, the nobility. In 1825, the aristocratic intelligentsia, generalizing this demand politically, went to the point of a military conspiracy to limit the powers of the autocracy. Thus, under pressure from the European bourgeois development, the progressive nobility attempted to take the place of the lacking third estate. But nevertheless they wished to combine their liberal regime with the security of their own caste domination, and therefore feared most of all to arouse the peasantry. It is thus not surprising that the conspiracy remained a mere attempt on the part of a brilliant but isolated officer caste which gave up the sponge almost without a struggle. Such was the significance of the decabrist uprising. The landlords who owned factories were the first among their caste to favor replacing serfdom by wage labor. The growing export of Russian grain gave an impulse in the same direction. In 1861, the noble bureaucracy, relying upon the liberal landlords, carried out its peasant reform. The impotent bourgeois liberalism during this operation played the role of humble chorus. It is needless to remark that Tsarism solved the fundamental problem of Russia, the agrarian problem, in a more niggardly and thieving fashion than that in which the Prussian monarchy during the next decade was to solve the fundamental problem of Germany, its national consolidation. The solution of the problems of one class by another is one of those combined methods natural to backward countries. The law of combined development reveals itself most indubitably, however in the history and character of Russian industry. Arising late, Russian industry did not repeat the development of the advanced countries, but inserted itself into this development, adapting their latest achievements to its own backwardness. Just as the economic evolution of Russia as a whole skipped over the epoch of craft guilds and manufacture, so also the separate branches of industry made a series of special leaps over technical productive stages that had been measured in the West by decades. Thanks to this, Russian industry developed at certain periods with extraordinary speed. Between the First Revolution and the war, industrial production in Russia approximately doubled. This has seemed to certain Russian historians a sufficient basis for concluding that we must abandon the legend of backwardness and slow growth. One in reality the possibility of this swift growth was determined by that very backwardness which, alas, continued not only up to the moment of liquidation of the old Russia but as her legacy up to the present day. The basic criterion of the economic level of a nation is the productivity of labor, 
which in its turn depends upon the relative weight of the industries in the general economy of the country. On the eve of the war, when Tsarist Russia had attained the highest point of its prosperity, the national income per capita was eight to ten times less than in the United States, a fact which is not surprising when you consider that four-fifths of the self-supporting population of Russia was occupied with agriculture, while in the United States, for every one engaged in agriculture, two and one-half were engaged in industry. We must add that for every 100 square kilometers of land, Russia had, on the eve of the war, 0.4 kilometers of railroads, Germany 11.7, Austria Hungary 7. Other comparative coefficients are of the same type. But it is just in the sphere of economy, as we have said, that the law of combined development most forcibly emerges. At the same time that peasant land cultivation as a whole remained, right up to the revolution, at the level of the 17th century, Russian industry in its technique and capitalist structure stood at the level of the advanced countries, and in certain respects even outstripped them. Small enterprises, involving less than 100 workers, employed in the United States, in 1914, 35% of the total of industrial workers, but in Russia 17.8%. The two countries had an approximately identical relative quantity of enterprises involving 100 to 1,000 workers. But the giant enterprises, above 1,000 workers each, employed in the United States 17.8% of the workers and in Russia 41.4%. For the most important industrial districts the latter percentage is still higher, for the Petrograd district 44.4%, for the Moscow district even 57.3%. We get a like result if we compared Russian with British or German industry. This fact, first established by the author in 1908, hardly accords with the banal idea of the economic backwardness of Russia. However, it does not disprove this backwardness, but dialectically completes it. The confluence of industrial with bank capital was also accomplished in Russia with a completeness you might not find in any other country. But the subjection of the industries to the banks meant, for the same reasons, their subjection to the Western European money market. Heavy industry, metal, coal, oil, was almost wholly under the control of foreign finance capital which had created for itself an auxiliary and intermediate system of banks in Russia. Light industry was following the same road. Foreigners owned in general about 40% of all the stock capital of Russia, but in the leading branches of industry, that percentage was still higher. We can say without exaggeration that the controlling shares of stock in the Russian banks, plants, and factories were to be found abroad, the amount held in England, France and Belgium being almost doubled that in Germany. The social character of the Russian bourgeoisie and its political physiognomy were determined by the condition of origin and the structure of Russian industry. The extreme concentration of this industry alone meant that between the capitalist leaders and the popular masses there was no hierarchy of transitional layers. To this we must add that the proprietors of the principal industrial, banking, and transport enterprises were foreigners, who realized on their investment not only the profits drawn from Russia, but also a political influence in foreign parliaments, and so not only did not forward the struggle for Russian parliamentarism, but often opposed it, it is sufficient to recall the shameful role played by official France. Such are the elementary and irremovable causes of the political isolation and anti-popular character of the Russian bourgeoisie. Whereas in the dawn of its history it was too unripe to accomplish a reformation, when the time came for leading a revolution it was overripe. In correspondence with this general course of development of the country, the reservoir from which the Russian working class formed itself was not the craft guild, but agriculture, not the city, but the country. Moreover, in Russia the proletariat did not arise gradually through the ages, carrying with itself the burden of the past as in England but in leaps involving sharp changes of environment, ties, relations, and a sharp break with the past. It is just this fact, combined with the concentrated oppressions of Tsarism, 
that made the Russian workers hospitable to the boldest conclusions of revolutionary thought, just as the backward industries were hospitable to the last word in capitalist organization. The Russian proletariat was forever repeating the short history of its origin. While in the metal industry, especially in Petrograd, a layer of hereditary proletarians was crystallized out, having made a complete break with the country, in the Urals the prevailing type was half proletarian, half peasant. A yearly inflow of fresh labor forces from the country in all the industrial districts kept renewing the bonds of the proletariat with its fundamental social reservoir. The incapacity of the bourgeoisie for political action was immediately caused by its relation to the proletariat and the peasantry. It could not lead after it workers who stood hostile in their everyday life, and had so early learned to generalize their problems. But it was likewise incapable of leading after it the peasantry, because it was entangled in a web of interests with the landlords, and dreaded a shake-up of property relations in any form. The belatedness of the Russian Revolution was thus not only a matter of chronology, but also of the social structure of the nation. England achieved her Puritan Revolution when her whole population was not more than five and a half million, of whom half a million were to be found in London. France, in the epoch of her revolution, had in Paris also only half a million out of a population of 25 million. Russia at the beginning of the 20th century had a population of about 150 million, of whom more than 3 million were in Petrograd and Moscow. Behind these comparative figures lurk enormous social differences. Not only England of the 17th century but also France of the 18th had no proletariat in the modern sense. In Russia, however, the working class in all branches of labor, both city and village, numbered in 1905 no less than 10 million, which with their families amounts to more than 25 million, that is to say, more than the whole population of France in the epoch of the Great Revolution. Advancing from the sturdy artisans and independent peasants of the army of Cromwell, through the sansculottes of Paris, to the industrial proletarians of St. Petersburg, the revolution had deeply changed its social mechanism, its methods, and therewith its aims. The events of 1905 were a prologue to the two revolutions of 1917, that of February and that of October. In the prologue, all the elements of the drama were included but not carried through. The Russo-Japanese war had made Tsarism totter. Against the background of a mass movement the liberal bourgeoisie had frightened the monarchy with its opposition. The workers had organized independently of the bourgeoisie, and in opposition to it, in Soviets, a form of organization then first called into being. Peasant uprisings to seize the land occurred throughout vast stretches of the country. Not only the peasants, but also the revolutionary parts of the army tended toward the Soviets, which at the moment of highest tension openly disputed the power with the monarchy. However, all the revolutionary forces were then going into action for the first time, lacking experience and confidence. The liberals demonstratively backed away from the revolution exactly at the moment when it became clear that to shake Tsarism would not be enough, it must be overthrown. This sharp break of the bourgeoisie with the people, in which the bourgeoisie carried with it considerable circles of the democratic intelligentsia, made it easier for the monarchy to differentiate within the army, separating out the loyal units, and to make a bloody settlement with the workers and peasants. Although with a few broken ribs, Tsarism came out of the experience of 1905 alive and strong enough. What changes in the correlation of forces were introduced by the 11 years historical development dividing the prologue from the drama? Tsarism during this period came into still sharper conflict with the demands of historic development. The bourgeoisie became economically more powerful, but as we have seen, its power rested on a higher concentration of industry and an increased predominance of foreign capital. Impressed by the lessons of 1905, the bourgeoisie had become more conservative and suspicious. The relative weight of the petty and middle bourgeoisie, insignificant before, had fallen still lower. The democratic intelligentsia generally speaking had no firm social support whatever. It could have a transitional political influence, but could play no independent role, its dependence upon bourgeois liberalism had grown enormously. 
In these circumstances, only the youthful proletariat could give the peasantry a program, a banner, and leadership. The gigantic tasks thus presented to the proletariat gave rise to an urgent necessity for a special revolutionary organization capable of quickly getting hold of the popular masses and making them ready for revolutionary action under the leadership of the workers. Thus the Soviets of 1905 developed gigantically in 1917. That the Soviets, we may remark here, are not a mere child of the historic backwardness of Russia but a product of her combined development, is indicated by the fact that the proletariat of the most industrial country, Germany, at the time of its revolutionary high point, 1918 to 1919, could find no other form of organization. The revolution of 1917 still had as its immediate task the overthrow of the bureaucratic monarchy, but in distinction from the older bourgeois revolutions, the decisive force now was a new class formed on the basis of a concentrated industry, and armed with new organizations, new methods of struggle. The law of combined development here emerges in its extreme expression, starting with the overthrow of a decayed medieval structure, the revolution in the course of a few months placed the proletariat and the communist party in power. In its initial task the Russian revolution was thus a democratic revolution but it posed the problem of political democracy in a new way. While the workers were covering the whole country with Soviets, including in them the soldiers and part of the peasantry, the bourgeoisie still continued to dicker, shall we summon or not summon a constituent assembly? In the course of our exposition, this question will rise before us in full completeness. Here we wish only to mark the place of the Soviets in the historic succession of revolutionary ideas and forms. In the middle of the 17th century, the bourgeois revolution in England developed under the guise of a religious reformation. A struggle for the right to pray according to one's own prayer book was identified with the struggle against the king, the aristocracy, the princes of the church, and Rome. The Presbyterians and Puritans were deeply convinced that they were placing their earthly interests under the unshakable protection of the divine providence. The goals for which the new classes were struggling commingled inseparably in their consciousness with texts from the Bible and the forms of churchly ritual. Emigrants carried with them across the ocean this tradition sealed with blood. Hence the extraordinary virility of the Anglo-Saxon interpretation of Christianity. We see even today how the minister socialists of Great Britain back up their cowardice with these same magic texts with which the people of the 17th century sought to justify their courage. In France, which stepped across the Reformation, the Catholic Church survived as a state institution until the Revolution, which found its expression and justification for the tasks of the bourgeois society, not in texts from the Bible, but in the abstractions of democracy. Whatever the hatred of the present rulers of France for Jacobinism, the fact is that only thanks to the austere labor of Robespierre are they still able to cover their conservative rulership with those formulas with the help of which the old society was exploded. Each of the great revolutions marked off a new stage of the bourgeois society, and new forms of consciousness for its classes. Just as France stepped over the Reformation, so Russia stepped over the formal democracy. The Russian Revolutionary Party, which was to place its stamp upon a whole epoch, sought an expression for the tasks of the revolution neither in the Bible nor in that secularized Christianity called pure democracy, but in the material relations of the social classes. The Soviet system gave to these relations their simplest, most undisguised and transparent expression. The rule of the toilers has for the first time been realized in the Soviet system which, whatever its immediate historic vicissitudes, has penetrated as irrevocably into the consciousness of the masses as did in its day the system of the Reformation or of pure democracy. Tsarist Russia in the war Russia's participation in the war was self-contradictory both in motives and in aims. That bloody struggle was waged essentially for world domination. In this sense it was beyond Russia's scope. The war aims of Russia herself, the Turkish Straits, Galicia, Armenia, were provincial in character, and to be decided only incidentally according to the degree in which they answered the interests of the principal contestants. At the same time, Russia, as one of the great powers, 
could not help participating in the scramble of the advanced capitalist countries, just as in the preceding epoch she could not help introducing shops, factories, railroads, rapid fire guns, and airplanes. The not infrequent disputes among Russian historians of the newest school as to how far Russia was ripe for present day imperialist policies often fall into mere scholasticism, because they look upon Russia in the international arena as isolated as an independent factor, whereas she was but one link in a system. India participated in the war both essentially and formally as a colony of England. The participation of China, though in a formal sense voluntary, was in reality the interference of a slave in the fight of his masters. The participation of Russia falls somewhere halfway between the participation of France and that of China. Russia paid in this way for her right to be an ally of advanced countries, to import capital and pay interest on it, that is, essentially, for her right to be a privileged colony of her allies, but at the same time for her right to oppress and rob Turkey, Persia, Galicia, and in general the countries weaker and more backward than herself. The twofold imperialism of the Russian bourgeoisie had basically the character of an agency for other mightier world powers. The Chinese compradors are the classic type of the national bourgeoisie a kind of mediating agency between foreign finance capital and the economy of their own country. In the world hierarchy of the powers, Russia occupied before the war a considerably higher position than China. What position she would have occupied after the war, if there had been no revolution, is a different question. But the Russian autocracy on the one hand, the Russian bourgeoisie on the other, contained features of compradorism, ever more and more clearly expressed. They lived and nourished themselves upon their connections with foreign imperialism, served it, and without its support could not have survived. To be sure, they did not survive in the long run even with its support. The semi comprador Russian bourgeoisie had world imperialistic interests in the same sense in which an agent working on percentages lives by the interests of his employer. The instrument of war is the army. Inasmuch as every army is considered unconquerable in the national mythology, the ruling classes of Russia saw no reason for making an exception of the army of the Tsar. In reality, however, this army was a serious force only against semi barbaric peoples, small neighbors, and disintegrating states. On the European arena, it could act only as part of a coalition, in the matter of defense, it could fulfill its task only by the help of the vastness of spaces the sparsity of population, and the impassability of the roads. The virtuoso of this army of serfs had been Suvorov. The French Revolution, in breaking open the doors to the new society and the new military art, had pronounced a death sentence on the Suvorov type of army. The semi annulment of serfdom and the introduction of universal military service had modernized the army only as far as it had the country that is, it introduced into the army all the contradictions proper to a nation that still has its bourgeois revolution to accomplish. It is true that the Tsar's army was constructed and armed upon western models, but this was more formed than essence. There was no correspondence between the cultural level of the peasant soldier and modern military technique. In the commanding staff, the ignorance, light-mindedness, and thievery of the ruling classes found their expression. Industry and transport continually revealed their bankruptcy before the concentrated demands of wartime. Although appropriately armed, as it seemed, on the first day of the war, the troops soon turned out to have neither weapons nor even shoes. In the Russo Japanese War, the Tsarist army had shown what it was worth. In the epoch of counter revolution, the monarchy, with the aid of the Duma, had filled up the military stores and put many new patches on the army, especially upon its reputation for invincibility. In 1914 came a new and far heavier test. In the matter of military supplies and finances, Russia at war suddenly finds herself in slavish dependence upon her allies. This is merely a military expression of her general dependence upon advanced capitalist countries. But help from the allies does not save the situation. The lack of munitions, the small number of factories for their production, the sparseness of railroad lines for their transportation, soon translated the backwardness of Russia into the familiar language of defeat, 
which served to remind the Russian national liberals that their ancestors had not accomplished the bourgeois revolution and that the descendants, therefore, owed a debt to history. The first days of war were the first days of disgrace. After a series of partial catastrophes, in the spring of 1915 came the general retreat. The generals took out their own criminal incapacity on the peaceful population. Enormous tracts of land were violently laid waste. Clouds of human locusts were driven to the rear with whips. The external route was completed with an internal one. Dot in answer to alarmed questions from his colleagues as to the situation at the front, the war minister Paul Ivanov answered in these words I place my trust in the impenetrable spaces, impassable mud, and the mercy of Saint Nicholas Merlikisky, protector of Holy Russia. Session of August 4, 1915. A week later General Rusky confessed to the same ministers, the present-day demands of military technique are beyond us. At any rate we can't keep up with the Germans. That was not the mood of a moment. Officer Stankovich reports the words of an engineer of the Corps, it is hopeless to fight with the Germans, for we are in no condition to do anything, even the new methods of fighting become the causes of our failure. There is a cloud of such testimony. The one thing the Russian generals did with a flourish was to drag human meat out of the country. Beef and pork are handled with incomparably more economy. Grey staff non-entities, like Yanushkevich under Nikolai Nikolaevich, and Alexa under the Tsar, would stop up all cracks with new mobilizations, and comfort themselves and the Allies with columns of figures when columns of fighters were wanted. About 15 million men were mobilized, and they brimmed the depots. Barracks, points of transit, crowded, stamped, stepped on each other's feet, getting harsh and cursing. If these human masses were an imaginary magnitude for the front, for the rear they were a very real factor of destruction. About five and a half million were counted as killed, wounded, and captured. The number of deserters kept growing. Already in July 1915 the ministers chanted, Poor Russia! Even her army, which in past ages filled the world with the thunder of its victories. Even her army turns out to consist only of cowards and deserters. The ministers themselves, with a gallows joke at the bravery in retreat of their generals, wasted hours in those days discussing such problems as whether to remove or not to remove the bones of the saints from Kiev. The Tsar submitted that it was not necessary, since the Germans would not risk touching them, and if they did touch them, so much the worse for the Germans. But the Synod had already started to remove them. When we leave, they said, we will take with us what is most precious. This happened not in the epoch of the Crusades, but in the 20th century when the news of the Russian defeats came over the wireless. The Russian successes against Austria Hungary had their roots rather in Austria Hungary than in Russia. The disintegrating Habsburg monarchy had long ago hung out a sign for an undertaker, not demanding any high qualifications of him. In the past, Russia had been successful against inwardly decomposing states like Turkey, Poland, and Persia. The southwestern front of the Russian army, facing Austria, celebrated immense victories which made it very different from the other fronts. Here there emerged a few generals, who to be sure demonstrated no military gifts, but were at least not thoroughly imbued with the fatalism of steadily beaten commanders. From this milieu there arose subsequently several white heroes of the Civil War. Everybody was looking for someone upon whom to lay the blame. They accused the Jews wholesale of espionage. They set upon people with German names. The staff of the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich gave orders to shoot a colonel of the gendarmes, Masla Edoff, as a German spy, which he obviously was not. They arrested Sukhamilinov, the war minister, an empty and slovenly man, accusing him, possibly not without foundation, of treason. The British Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gray, said to the President of the Russian Parliamentary Delegation, Your government is very bold if it dares in time of war indict its war minister for treason. The staff and the Duma accused the court of Germanophilism. All of them together envied the Allies and hated them. The French command spared its army by putting in Russian soldiers. 
England warmed up slowly. In the drawing rooms of Petrograd and the headquarters at the front they gently joked, England has sworn to fight to the last drop of blood dot of the Russian soldier. These jokes seeped down and reached the trenches. Everything for the war, said the ministers, deputies, generals, journalists. Yes, the soldier began to think in the trenches, they are all ready to fight to the last drop dot of my blood. The Russian army lost in the whole war more men than any army which ever participated in a national war, approximately two and a half million killed, or 40 percent of all the losses of the Entente. In the first months, the soldiers fell under shell fire unthinkingly or thinking little, but from day to day they gathered experience, bitter experience of the lower ranks who are ignorantly commanded. They measured the confusion of the generals by the number of purposeless maneuvers on soulless shoes, the number of dinners not eaten. From the bloody mash of people and things emerged a generalized word, the mess, which in the soldiers' jargon was replaced by a still juicier term. The swiftest of all to disintegrate was the peasant infantry. As a general rule, the artillery with its high percentage of industrial workers is distinguished by an incomparably greater hospitality to revolutionary ideas, this was clearly evident in 1905. If in 1917, on the contrary, the artillery showed more conservatism than the infantry, the cause lies in the fact that through the infantry divisions, as through a sieve, the past ever knew and less and less trained human masses. The artillery, moreover, suffering infinitely fewer losses, retained its original cadres. The same thing was observed in other specialized troops. But in the long run, the artillery yielded too. During the retreat from Galicia, a secret order was issued by the commander-in-chief, flog the soldiers for desertion and other crimes. The soldier Pirae correlates, they began to flog soldiers for the most trivial offenses. For example, for a few hours absence without leave. And sometimes they flogged them in order to rouse their fighting spirit. As early as September 17, 1915, Kuropatkin wrote, citing Guchkov, the lower orders began the war with enthusiasm, but now they are weary, and with the continual retreats have lost faith in a victory. At about the same time, the Minister of the Interior spoke of the presence in Moscow of 30,000 convalescent soldiers, that's a wild crowd of libertines knowing no discipline, rough housing, getting into fights with the police, not long ago a policeman was killed by soldiers, rescuing arrested men, etc. Undoubtedly, in case of disorders this entire horde will take the side of the mob. The same soldier, Pyreko, writes, everyone, to the last man, was interested in nothing but peace. Who should win and what kind of peace it would be, that was of small interest to the army. It wanted peace at any cost, for it was weary of war. An observant woman, Fodorshenko, serving as Sister of Mercy, listened to the conversations of the soldiers, almost to their thoughts, and cleverly wrote them down on scattered slips of paper. The little book thus produced, The People at War permits us to look in that laboratory where bombs, barbed wire entanglements, suffocating gases, and the baseness of those in power had been fashioning for long months the consciousness of several million Russian peasants, and where along with human bones age-old prejudices were cracking. In many of the self-made aphorisms of the soldiers appear already the slogans of the coming civil war. General Ruski complained in December 1916 that Riga was the misfortune of the Northern Front. This is a nest of propaganda, and so is Dvinsk. General Bruslov confirmed this, from the Riga district troops arrived demoralized, soldiers refused to attack. They lifted one company commander on the points of their bayonets. It was necessary to shoot several men, etc., etc. The ground for the final disintegration of the army was prepared long before the revolution, concedes Rodzienko, who was in close association with the officers and visited the front. The revolutionary elements, scattered at first, were drowned in the army almost without a trace, but with the growth of the general discontent they rose to the surface. 
the sending of striking workers to the front as a punishment increased the ranks of the agitators and the retreat gave them a favorable audience. The army in the rear and especially at the front, reports a secret service agent, is full of elements of which some are capable of becoming active forces of insurrection, and others may merely refuse to engage in punitive activities. The gendarme administration of the Petrograd province declares in October 1916, on the basis of a report made by a representative of the land union, that the mood in the army is alarming, the relation between officers and soldiers is extremely tense, even bloody encounters are taking place. Deserters are to be met everywhere by the thousands. Everyone who comes near the army must carry away a complete and convincing impression of the utter moral disintegration of the troops. Out of caution the report adds that although much in these communications seems hardly probable, nevertheless it must be believed, since many physicians returning from the active army have made reports to the same effect. The mood of the rear corresponded to that of the front. At a conference of the Kud party in October 1916, a majority of the delegates remarked upon the apathy and lack of faith in the victorious outcome of the war in all layers of the population, but especially in the villages and among the city poor. On October 30, 1916, the director of the police department wrote, in a summary of his report, of the weariness of war to be observed everywhere, and the longing for a swift peace, regardless of the conditions upon which it is concluded. In a few months, all these gentlemen, deputies, police, generals, and land representatives, physicians and former gendarmes, will nevertheless assert that the revolution killed patriotism in the army, and that the Bolsheviks snatched a sure victory out of their hands. The place of Korifis, in the chorus of military patriotism, undoubtedly belonged to the constitutional democrats, cadets. Having already in 1905 broken its dubious ties with the revolution, liberalism at the beginning of the counter-revolutionary period had raised the banner of imperialism. One thing flowed from another, once it proved impossible to purge the country of the feudal rubbish in order to assure the bourgeoisie a dominant position, it remained to form a union with the monarchy and the nobility in order to assure the capital the best position in the world market. If it is true that the world catastrophe was prepared in various quarters, so that it arrived to a certain degree unexpectedly even to its most responsible organizers, it is equally indubitable that Russian liberalism, as the inspirer of the foreign policy of the monarchy, did not occupy the last place in its preparation. The War of 1914 was quite rightly greeted by the leaders of the Russian bourgeoisie as their war. In a solemn session of the State Duma on July 26, 1914, the president of the Kud faction announced, We will make no conditions or demands. We will simply throw in the scales our firm determination to conquer the enemy. In Russia, too, national unity became the official doctrine. During a patriotic manifestation in Moscow the master of ceremonies, Count Benkendorf, cried to the diplomats, Look! there is your revolution which they were prophesying in Berlin. A similar thought, explained the French minister Paleologue, was evidently in the minds of all. People considered it their duty to nourish and propagate illusions in a situation which, it would seem, absolutely forbade illusions. They did not wait long for sobering lessons. Very soon after the beginning of the war one of the more expansive cadets, a lawyer and landlord, Rodichev, exclaimed at a session of the Central Committee of his party, Do you really think we can conquer with those fools? Events proved that it was not possible to conquer with fools. Liberalism, having more than half lost faith in the victory, tried to employ the momentum of the war in order to carry out a purgation of the Camarilla and compel the monarchy to a compromise. The chief implement toward this end was to accuse the court party of Germanophilism and of preparing a separate peace. In the spring of 1915, while the weaponless soldiers were retreating along the whole front, it was decided in governmental circles, not without pressure from the Allies, to recruit the initiative of private industry for work in behalf of the army. The special conference called for this end included, along with bureaucrats, the more influential industrialists. The land and city unions, 
which had arisen at the beginning of the war, and the military industrial committees created in the spring of 1915, became the points of support of the bourgeoisie in the struggle for victory and for power. The state Duma, backed by these organizations, was induced to intercede more confidently between the bourgeoisie and the monarchy. These broad political perspectives did not, however, distract attention from the important problems of the day. Out of the special conferences out of a central reservoir tens of hundreds of millions, mounting up to billions, flowed down through distributing canals, abundantly irrigating the industries and incidentally nourishing numberless appetites. In the state Duma and in the press a few of the war profits by 1914 and 1915 were published. The Moscow Textile Company of the Ryabushinskys showed a net profit of 75%, the Tver Company, 111%, the Copper Works of Kolchugin netted over 12 million on a basic capital of 10 million. In this sector, patriotic virtue was rewarded generously, and moreover immediately. Speculation of all kinds and gambling on the market went to the point of paroxysm. Enormous fortunes arose out of the bloody foam. The lack of bread and fuel in the capital did not prevent the court jeweler of Faberg from boasting that he had never before done such a flourishing business. Lady in waiting Verubova says that in no other season were such gowns to be seen as in the winter of 1915-16, and never were so many diamonds purchased. The nightclubs were brimful of heroes of the rear legal deserters, and simply respectable people too old for the front but sufficiently young for the joys of life. The Grand Dukes were not among the last to enjoy this feast in times of plague. Nobody had any fear of spending too much. A continual shower of gold fell from above. Society held out its hands and pockets, aristocratic ladies spread their skirts high, everybody splashed about in the bloody mud, bankers, heads of the commissariat, industrialists, ballerinas of the Tsar and the Grand Dukes, orthodox prelates, ladies-in-waiting, liberal deputies, generals of the front and rear, radical lawyers, illustrious mandarins of both sexes, innumerable nephews, and more particularly nieces. All came running to grab and gobble, in fear lest the blessed train should stop and all rejected with indignation the shameful idea of a premature peace. Common gains, external defeats, and internal dangers, drew together the parties of the ruling classes. The Duma, divided on the eve of the war, achieved in 1915 its patriotic oppositional majority which received the name of Progressive Bloc. The official aim of this bloc was of course declared to be a satisfaction of the needs created by the war. On the left the Social Democrats and Trudoviks did not enter the bloc, on the right the notorious Black Hundred groups. All the other factions of the Duma, the Cadets, the Progressives, three groups of Octobrusts, the Centre and a part of the Nationalists, entered the bloc or adhered to it, as also the national groups, Poles, Lithuanians, Muslims, Jews etc. In order not to frighten the Tsar with the formula of a responsible ministry, the bloc demanded a united government composed of men enjoying the confidence of the country. The Minister of the Interior, Prince Sherbatov, at that time characterized the bloc as a temporary union called forth by the danger of social revolution. It required no great penetration to realize this. Miliukov, the leader of the cadets, and thus also of the oppositional bloc, said at a conference of his party, we are treading a volcano. The tension has reached its extreme limit. A carelessly dropped match will be enough to start a terrible conflagration. Whatever the government, whether good or bad, a strong government is needed now more than ever before. The hope that the Tsar, under the burden of defeat, would grant concessions was so great that in the liberal press there appeared in August the slate of a proposed cabinet of confidence with the president of the Duma, Rodzienko, as Premier, according to another version, the President of the Land Union, Prince Lvov, was indicated for that office, Guchkov as Minister of the Interior, Miliukov, Foreign Minister, etc. A majority of these men who here nominated themselves for a union with the Tsar against the revolution, turned up a year later as members of the revolutionary government. 
history has permitted herself such antics more than once. This time the joke was at least a brief one. A majority of the ministers of Gore Mikin's cabinet were no less frightened than the cadets by the course things were taking, and therefore inclined toward an agreement with the progressive bloc. A government which has not behind it the confidence of the supreme ruler, nor the army, nor the cities, nor the Zemstvos, nor the nobles, nor the merchants, nor the workers, not only cannot function, but cannot even exist. The thing is obviously absurd. In these words, Prince Sherbatov in August 1915 appraised the government in which he himself was Minister of the Interior. If you only arrange the scene properly and offer a loophole, said Foreign Minister Sazanov, the cadets will be the first to propose a compromise. Miliukov is the greatest possible bourgeois and fears a social revolution above everything. Besides, a majority of the cadets are trembling for their own capital. Miliukov on his side considered that the progressive bloc would have to give in somewhat. Both sides were ready to bargain, and everything seemed thoroughly oiled. But on August 29th the Premier, Gormikin, a bureaucrat weighed down with years and honours, an old cynic playing politics between two games of grand patience and defending himself against all complaints by remarking that the war is not my business, journeyed out to the Tsar at headquarters and returned with the information that or and everybody should remain in their places, except the rambunctious Duma, which was to be dissolved on the 3rd of September. The reading of the Tsar's order dissolving the Duma was heard without a single word of protest, the deputies gave a hurrah for the Tsar, and dispersed. How did the Tsar's government, supported according to its own confession by nobody at all, survive for over a year and a half after that? A temporary success of the Russian troops undoubtedly exerted its influence and this was reinforced by the good golden rain. The successes at the front soon ceased, to be sure but the profits at the rear continued. However, the chief cause of the successful propping up of the monarchy for twelve months before its fall was to be found in a sharp division in the popular discontent. The chief of the Moscow Secret Service Department reported a rightward tendency of the bourgeoisie under the influence of a fear of possible revolutionary excesses after the war. During the war, we note, a revolution was still considered impossible. The industrialists were alarmed, over and above that, by a coquetting of certain leaders of the military industrial committee with the proletariat. The general conclusion of this Colonel of Gendarmes, Martinov, in whom a professional reading of Marxist literature had left some traces, announced as the cause of a certain improvement in the political situation the steadily growing differentiation of social classes concealing a sharp contradiction in their interests a contradiction felt especially keenly in the times we are living through. The dissolution of the Duma in September 1915 was a direct challenge to the bourgeoisie, not to the workers. But while the liberals were dispersing with cries of hurrah, to be sure, not very enthusiastic cries, the workers of Petrograd and Moscow responded with strikes of protest. That cooled off the liberals still more. They feared worst of all the intrusion of an uninvited third party in their family discussion with the monarchy. But what further step was to be taken? Accompanied by a slight growl from the left wing, liberalism cast its vote for a well-tried recipe, to stand exclusively on legal grounds, and render the bureaucracy as it were, unnecessary in the course of a mere fulfillment of our patriotic functions. The ministerial slate at any rate would have to be laid aside for a time. The situation in those days was getting worse automatically. In May 1916, the Duma was again convoked, but nobody knew exactly what for. The Duma, in any case, had no intention of summoning a revolution, and aside from that, there was nothing for it to say. At that session, Rodzienko remembers, the proceedings were languid the deputies attended irregularly. The continual struggle seemed fruitless, the government would listen to nothing, irregularities were increasing, and the country was headed for ruin. In the bourgeoisie's fear of revolution and its impotence without revolution, the monarchy found, during the year 1916, a simulacrum of social support. By autumn the situation was still worse. The hopelessness of the war had become evident to all. 
the indignation of the popular masses threatened any moment to flow over the brim. While attacking the court parties before for Germanophilism, the liberals now deemed it necessary to feel out the chances of peace themselves, preparing their own future. Only in this way can you explain the negotiations of one of the leaders of the progressive bloc, the deputy Protopopov, with the German diplomat, Warburg, in Stockholm in the autumn of 1916. The Duma delegation, making friendly visits to the French and English, could easily convince itself in Paris and London that the dear allies intended in the course of the war to squeeze all the live juice out of Russia, in order after the victory to make this backward country their chief field of economic exploitation. A defeated Russia in tow to a victorious Entente would have meant a colonial Russia. The Russian possessing classes had no other course but to try to free themselves from the too close embraces of the Entente, and find an independent road to peace, making use of the antagonism of the two more powerful camps. The meeting of the Duma deputy with the German diplomat, as a first step on this road, was both a threat in the direction of the Allies with a view to gaining concessions, and a feeling out of the actual possibilities of rapprochement with Germany. Protopopov was acting in agreement not only with the Tsarist diplomats, the meeting occurred in the presence of the Russian ambassador in Sweden, but also with the whole delegation of the State Duma. Incidentally the liberals by means of this reconnoitre were pursuing a not unimportant domestic goal. Rely on us they were hinting to the Tsar, and we will make you a separate piece better and more reliable than SDU diarasis Matu can. According to Protopopov's scheme, that is, the scheme of his backers, the Russian government was to inform the Allies several months in advance that she would be compelled to end the war, and that if the Allies refused to institute peace negotiations, Russia would have to conclude a separate peace with Germany. In his confession written after the revolution, Protopopov speaks as of something which goes without saying of the fact that all reasonable people in Russia, among them probably all the leaders of the Party of the People's Freedom, cadets, were convinced that Russia was unable to continue the war. The Tsar, to whom Protopopov upon his return reported his journey and negotiations, treated the idea of a separate peace with complete sympathy. He merely did not see the necessity of drawing the liberals into the business. The fact that Protopopov himself was included incidentally in the staff of the court Camarilla, having broken with the progressive bloc, is explained by the personal character of this fop, who had fallen in love, according to his own words, with the Tsar and the Tsarina, and at the same time, we may add, with an expected portfolio as Minister of the Interior. But this episode of Protopopov's treason to liberalism does not alter the general content of the liberal foreign policy, a mixture of greed, cowardice, and treachery. The Duma again assembled on November 1st. The tension in the country had become unbearable. Decisive steps were expected of the Duma. It was necessary to do something, or at the very least say something. The progressive bloc found itself compelled to resort to parliamentary exposures. Counting over from the tribune the chief steps taken by the government, Miliukov asked after each one, Was this stupidity or treason? High notes were sounded also by other deputies. The government was almost without defenders. It answered in the usual way, the speeches of the Duma orators were forbidden publication. The speeches therefore circulated by the million. There was not a government department, not only in the rear but at the front, where the forbidden speeches were not transcribed, frequently with additions corresponding to the temperament of the transcriber. The reverberation of the debate of November 1st was such that terror seized the very authors of the arraignment. A group of extreme rights, sturdy bureaucrats inspired by Der Novo, who had put down the revolution of 1905, took that moment to present to the Tsar a proposed program. The eye of these experienced officials, trained in a serious police school, saw not badly and pretty far, and if their prescription was no good, it is only because no medicine existed for the sickness of the old regime. The authors of the program speak against any concessions whatever to the bourgeois opposition, not because the liberals want to go too far, as think the vulgar black hundreds, upon whom these official reactionaries look with some scorn, no, the trouble is that the liberals are so weak, 
so disunited, and, to speak frankly, so mediocre, that their triumph would be as brief as it would be unstable. The weakness of the principal opposition party, the Constitutional Democrats, cadets, is indicated, they point out, by its very name. It is called democratic, when it is in essence bourgeois. Although to a considerable degree a party of liberal landlords, it has signed a program of compulsory land redemption. Without these trumps from a deck not their own right these secret councillors, using the images to which they are accustomed, the cadets are nothing more than a numerous association of liberal lawyers, professors, and officials of various departments, nothing more. A revolutionist, they point out, is a different thing. They accompany their recognition of the significance of the revolutionary parties with a grinding of teeth, the danger and strength of these parties lies in the fact that they have an idea, they have money, they have a crowd ready and well organized. The revolutionary parties can count on the sympathy of an overwhelming majority of the peasantry, which will follow the proletariat the very moment the revolutionary leaders point a finger to other people's land. What would a responsible ministry yield in these circumstances? A complete and final destruction of the right parties, a gradual swallowing of the intermediate parties, the centre, the liberal conservatives, the octoberists and the progressives of the Kurd party? which at the beginning would have a decisive importance. But the same fate would menace the cadets. and afterward would come the revolutionary mob, the commune, destruction of the dynasty, pogroms of the possessing classes, and finally the peasant brigand. It is impossible to deny that the police anger here rises to a certain kind of historic vision. The positive part of their program was not new, but consistent, a government of ruthless partisans of the autocracy. Abolition of the Duma, martial law in both capitals, preparation of forces for putting down a rebellion. This program did in its essentials become the basis of the government policy of the last pre-revolutionary months. But its success presupposed a power which Turnovo had in his hands in the winter of 1905, but which by the autumn of 1917 no longer existed. The monarchy tried, therefore, to strangle the country stealthily and in sections. Ministers were shifted upon the principle of our people meaning those unconditionally devoted to the Tsar and Tsarina. But these our people especially the renegade Protopopov, were insignificant and pitiful. The Duma was not abolished, but again dissolved. The declaration of martial law in Petrograd was saved for a moment when the revolution had already triumphed and the military forces prepared for putting down the rebellion were themselves seized by rebellion. All this became evident after two or three months. Liberalism in those days was making its last efforts to save the situation. All the organizations of the enfranchised bourgeoisie supported the November speeches of the Duma opposition with a series of new declarations. The most impudent of these was the resolution of the Union of Cities on December 9th irresponsible criminals, fanatics, are preparing for Russia's defeat, shame and slavery. The state Duma was urged not to disperse until the formation of a responsible government is attained. Even the state council, organ of the bureaucracy and of the vast properties, expressed itself in favor of calling to power people who enjoyed the confidence of the country. A similar intercession was made by a session of the United Nobility, even the moss covered stones cried out. But nothing was changed. The monarchy would not let the last shreds of power slip out of its hands. The last session of the last Duma was convoked, after waverings and delays, on February 14, 1917. Only two weeks remained before the coming of revolution. Demonstrations were expected. In the Kotorgan Reach, alongside an announcement by the chief of the Petrograd military district, General Karbalev, forbidding demonstrations, was printed a letter from Miliukov warning the workers against dangerous and bad counsel issuing from dark sources. In spite of strikes, the opening of the Duma was sufficiently peaceful. Pretending that the question of power no longer interested it, the Duma occupied itself with a critical but still strictly business question, food supplies. The mood was languid, as Rodzienko subsequently remembered, we felt the impotence of the Duma, weariness of a futile struggle. 
Miliukov kept repeating that the progressive bloc will act with words and with words only. Such was the Duma that entered the whirlpool of the February Revolution. Three, the proletariat and the peasantry. The Russian proletariat learned its first steps in the political circumstances created by a despotic state. Strikes forbidden by law, underground circles, illegal proclamations, street demonstrations, encounters with the police and with troops. Such was the school created by the combination of a swiftly developing capitalism with an absolutism slowly surrendering its positions. The concentration of the workers in colossal enterprises, the intense character of governmental persecution, and finally the impulsiveness of a young and fresh proletariat, brought it about that the political strike, so rare in Western Europe, became in Russia the fundamental method of struggle. The figures of strikes from the beginning of the present century are a most impressive index of the political history of Russia. With every desire not to burden our text with figures, we cannot refrain from introducing a table of political strikes in Russia for the period 1903 to 1917. The figures, reduced to their simplest expression, relate only to enterprises undergoing factory inspection. The railroads, mining industries, mechanical and small enterprises in general, to say nothing of agriculture, for various reasons do not enter into the count. But the changes in the strike curve in the different periods emerge no less clearly for this dot we have before us a curve, the only one of its kind, of the political temperature of a nation carrying in its womb a great revolution. In a backward country with a small proletariat. For in all the enterprises undergoing factory inspections there were only about one and a half million workers in 1905, about two million in 1917, the strike movement attains such dimensions as it never knew before anywhere in the world. With the weakness of the petty bourgeois democracy, the scatteredness and political blindness of the peasant movement, the revolutionary strike of the workers becomes the battering ram which the awakening nation directs against the walls of absolutism. Participants in political strikes in 1905 numbering 1,843,000, workers participating in several strikes are here, of course, counted twice, that number alone would permit us to put our finger on the revolutionary year in our table if we knew nothing else about the Russian political calendar. The figures for 1903 and 1904 refer to all strikes, the economic undoubtedly predominating dot for 1904, the first year of the Russo-Japanese War, the factory inspection indicates in all only 25,000 strikers. In 1905, political and economic strikes together involved 2,863,000 men. 115 times more than in the previous year. This remarkable fact by itself would suggest the thought that a proletariat, impelled by the course of events to improvise such unheard of revolutionary activities, must at whatever cost produce from its depths an organization corresponding to the dimensions of the struggle and the colossal tasks. This organization was the Soviet, brought into being by the first revolution and made the instrument of the general strike and the struggle for power. Beaten in the December uprising of 1905, the proletariat during the next two years makes heroic efforts to defend a part of the conquered positions. These years, as our strike figures show, still belong directly to the revolution, but they are the years of ebb. The four following years, 1908 emerge in a mirror of strike statistics as the years of victorious counter-revolution. An industrial crisis coincident with this still further exhausts the proletariat, already bled white. The depth of the fall is symmetrical with the height of the rise. National convulsions find their reflection in these simple figures. The industrial boom beginning in 1910 lifted the workers to their feet, and gave a new impulse to their energy. The figures for 1912-14 almost repeat those for 1905-7, but in the opposite order, not from above downward but from below up. On a new and higher historical basis, there are more workers now, and they have more experience, a new revolutionary offensive begins.
The first half year of 1914 clearly approaches in the number of political strikes the culminating point of the year of the first revolution. But war breaks out and sharply interrupts this process. The first warm months are marked by political inertness in the working class, but already in the spring of 1915 the numbness begins to pass. A new cycle of political strikes opens, a cycle which in February 1917 will culminate in the insurrection of soldiers and workers. The sharp ebbs and flows of the mass struggle had left the Russian proletariat after a few years almost unrecognizable. Factories that two or three years ago would strike unanimously over some single arbitrary police action today have completely lost their revolutionary color, and accept the most monstrous crimes of the authorities without resistance. Great defeats discourage people for a long time. The consciously revolutionary elements lose their power over the masses. Prejudices and superstitions not yet burned out come back to life. Grey immigrants from the village during these times dilute the workers' ranks. Skeptics ironically shake their heads. So it was in the years 1907-11. But molecular processes in the masses are healing the psychological wounds of defeat. A new turn of events, or an underlying economic impulse, opens a new political cycle. The revolutionary elements again find their audience. The struggle reopens on a higher level. In order to understand the two chief tendencies in the Russian working class, it is important to have in mind that Menshevism finally took shape in the years of ebb and reaction. It relied chiefly upon a thin layer of workers who had broken with the revolution. Whereas Bolshevism, cruelly shattered in the period of the reaction, began to rise swiftly on the crest of a new revolutionary tide in the years before the war. The most energetic and audacious element, ready for tireless struggle, for resistance and continual organization, is that element, those organizations, and those people who are concentrated around Lenin. In these words the police department estimated the work of the Bolsheviks during the years preceding the war. In July 1914, while the diplomats were driving the last nail into the cross designed for the crucifixion of Europe. Petrograd was boiling like a revolutionary cauldron. The president of the French Republic, Poincare, had to lay his wreath on the tomb of Alexander III amid the last echoes of a street fight and the first murmurs of a patriotic demonstration. Would the mass offensive of 1912 14 have led directly to an overthrow of Tsarism if the war had not broken out? It is hardly possible to answer that question with certainty. The process would inexorably have led to a revolution, but through what stages would the revolution in those circumstances have had to go? Would it not have experienced another defeat? How much time would have been needed by the workers in order to arouse the peasantry and win the army? In all these directions only guesses are possible. The war, at any rate, gave the process at first a backward movement, but only to accelerate it more powerfully in the next period and guarantee its overwhelming victory. At the first sound of the drum, the revolutionary movement died down. The more active layers of the workers were mobilized. The revolutionary elements were thrown from the factories to the front. Severe penalties were imposed for striking. The workers' press was swept away. Trade unions were strangled. Hundreds of thousands of women, boys, peasants, poured into the workshops. The war, combined with the wreck of the international, greatly disoriented the workers politically, and made it possible for the factory administration, then just lifting its head, to speak patriotically in the name of the factories, carrying with it a considerable part of the workers, and compelling the more bold and resolute to keep still and wait. The revolutionary ideas were barely kept glowing in small and hushed circles. In the factories in those days, nobody dared to call himself Bolshevik for fear, not only of arrest, but of a beating from the backward workers. The Bolshevik faction in the Duma, weak in its personnel, had not risen at the outbreak of the war to the height of its task. Along with the Menshevik deputies, it introduced a declaration in which it promised to defend the cultural wheel of the people against all attacks wheresoever originating. The Duma underlined with applause this yielding of a position. 
not one of the Russian organizations or groups of the party took the openly defeatist position which Lenin came out for abroad. The percentage of patriots among the Bolsheviks, however, was insignificant. In contrast to the Narodniks III and Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks began in 1914 to develop among the masses a printed and aural agitation against the war. The Duma deputies soon recovered their poise and renewed their revolutionary work, about which the authorities were very closely informed, thanks to a highly developed system of provocation. It is sufficient to remark that out of seven members of the Petersburg Committee of the Party, three, on the eve of the war, were in the employ of the Secret Service. Thus Tsarism played blind man's bluff with the revolution. In November the Bolshevik deputies were arrested. There began a general smash-up of the party throughout the country. In February 1915, the case of the Duma faction was called in the courts. The deputies conducted themselves cautiously. Kamen F., theoretical instigator of the factions, stood apart from the defeatist position of Lenin, so did Petrovsky, the present president of the Central Committee in the Ukraine. The police department remarked with satisfaction that the severe sentences dealt out to the deputies did not evoke any movement of protest among the workers. It seemed as though the war had produced a new working class. To a considerable extent, this was the fact. In Petrograd, the personnel of the workers had been renewed almost 40%. The revolutionary succession had been abruptly broken. All that existed before the war, including the Duma faction of the Bolsheviks, had suddenly retired to the background and almost disappeared in oblivion. But under cover of this quietness and patriotism, and to some extent even monarchism, the moods of a new explosion were gradually accumulating in the masses. In August 1915, the Tsarist ministers were telling each other that the workers are everywhere hunting out treason, betrayal, and sabotage in behalf of the Germans, and are enthusiastic in the search for those guilty of our unsuccesses at the front. It is true that in that period the awakening mass criticism, in part sincerely and in part for the sake of defensive coloration, often adopted the standpoint of defense of the fatherland. But that idea was only a point of departure. The discontent of the workers was digging a deeper and deeper course, silencing the masters, the black hundred workers, the servants of the administration, permitting the worker Bolsheviks to raise their heads. From criticism, the masses pass over to action. Their indignation finds expression first of all in food disturbances, sometimes rising to the height of local riots. Women, old men, and boys, in the market or on the open square, feel bolder and more independent than the workers on military duty in the factories. In Moscow in May, the movement turns into a pogrom of Germans, although the participants in this are chiefly the scum of the town armed under police protection. Nevertheless, the very possibility of such a pogrom in industrial Moscow proves that the workers are not yet sufficiently awakened to impose their slogans and their discipline upon the disturbed small town people. These food disorders, spreading over the whole country, broke the war hypnosis and laid the road to strikes. The inflow of raw labor power to the factories and the greedy scramble for war profits, brought everywhere a lowering of the conditions of labor, and gave rise to the crudest methods of exploitation. The rise in the cost of living automatically lowered wages. Economic strikes were the inevitable mass reflection, stormy in proportion as they had been delayed. The strikes were accompanied by meetings, adoption of political resolutions, scrimmages with the police, not infrequently by shots and casualties. The struggle arose chiefly in the central textile district. On June 5, the police fire a volley at the weavers in Kostroma, four killed, nine wounded. On August 10, the troops fire on the Ivanovo Vozens and Squirkers, 16 killed, 30 wounded. In the movement of the textile workers, some soldiers of a local battalion are involved. Protest strikes in various parts of the country give answer to the shootings at Ivanovo Vozensk. Parallel to this goes the economic struggle. The textile workers often march in the front rank. In comparison with the first half of 1914, this movement, as regards strength of pressure and clarity of slogans, represents a big step backward. This is not surprising, 
since raw masses are to a large extent being drawn into the struggle, and there has been a complete disintegration of the guiding layer of the workers. Nevertheless, even in these first strikes of the war, the approach of great battles can be heard. The Minister of Justice, Kvostov, said on the 16th of August, if there are at present no armed demonstrations of the workers, it is only because they have as yet no organization. Gore Amikin expressed himself more concisely, the trouble among the workers' leaders is that they have no organization, since it was broken up by the arrest of the five members of the Duma. The Minister of the Interior added, we must not amnesty the members of the Duma, Bolsheviks they are the organizing center of the movement in its most dangerous form. These people at least made no mistake as to who was the real enemy. While the ministry, even at the moment of its greatest dismay and readiness for liberal concessions, deemed it necessary as before to pound the workers' revolution on the head, that is on the Bolsheviks, the big bourgeoisie was trying to fix up a cooperation with the Mensheviks. Frightened by the scope of the strike movement, the liberal industrialists made an attempt to impose patriotic discipline upon the workers by including their elected representatives in the staff of the military industrial committees. The Minister of the Interior complained that it was very difficult to oppose this scheme, fathered by Guchkov. The whole enterprise, he said, is being carried out under a patriotic flag, and in the interests of the defense. We must remark, however, that even the police avoided arresting the social patriots, seeing in them a side partner in the struggle against strikes and revolutionary excesses. It was indeed upon their too great confidence in the strength of patriotic socialism, that the Secret Service based their conviction that no insurrection would occur while the war lasted. In the elections to the military industrial committees, the defensists, headed by an energetic metal worker, Gvozdf, we shall meet him later as Minister of Labor in the coalition government of the revolution, turned out to be a minority. They enjoyed the support, however, not only of the liberal bourgeoisie, but of the bureaucracy, in getting the better of those who, led by the Bolsheviks, wished to boycott the committees. They succeeded in imposing a representation in these organs of industrial patriotism upon the Petersburg proletariat. The position of the Mensheviks was clearly expressed in a speech one of their representatives later made to the industrialists in the committee, you ought to demand that the existing bureaucratic power retire from the scene, yielding its place to you as the inheritors of the present social structure. This young political friendship was growing by leaps and bounds. After the revolution it will bring forth its ripe fruit. The war produced a dreadful desolation in the underground movement. After the arrest of the Duma faction, the Bolsheviks had no centralized party organization at all. The local committees had an episodic existence, and often had no connections with the workers' districts. Only scattered groups, circles, and solitary individuals did anything. However, the reviving strike movement gave them some spirit and some strength in the factories. They gradually began to find each other and build up the district connections. The underground work revived. In the police department they wrote later, ever since the beginning of the war, the Leninists, who have behind them in Russia an overwhelming majority of the underground social democratic organizations, have in their larger centers, such as Petrograd, Moscow, Kharkov, Kiev, Tula, Kostroma, Vladimir Province, Samara, been issuing in considerable numbers revolutionary appeals with a demand to stop the war overthrow the existing government, and found a republic. And this work has had its palpable result in workers' strikes and disorders. The traditional anniversary of the march of the workers to the Winter Palace, which had passed almost unnoticed the year before, produces a widespread strike on January 9, 1916. The strike movement doubles during this year. Encounters with the police accompany every big and prolonged strike. In contact with the troops, the workers conduct themselves with demonstrative friendliness, and the secret police more than once notice this alarming fact. The war industries swelled out, devouring all resources around them and undermining their own foundation. The peacetime branches of production began to die away. In spite of all plannings, nothing came of the regulation of industry. 
the bureaucracy, incapable of taking this business in hand against the opposition of the powerful military industrial committees, at the same time refuse to turn over the regulating role to the bourgeoisie. The chaos increased. Skilled workers were replaced by unskilled. The coal mines, shops, and factories of Poland were soon lost. In the course of the first year of the war, a fifth part of the industrial strength of the country was cut off. As much as 50% of production went to supply the needs of the army in the war, including about 75% of the textile production of the country. The overloaded transport proved incapable of supplying factories with the necessary quantity of fuel and raw material. The war not only swallowed up the whole current national income, but seriously began to cut into the basic capital of the country. The industrialists grew less and less willing to grant anything to the workers, and the government, as usual, answered every strike with severe repressions. All this pushed the minds of the workers from the particular to the general, from economics to politics, we must all strike at once. Thus arose the idea of the general strike. The process of radicalization of the masses is most convincingly reflected in the strike statistics. In 1915, two and a half times fewer workers participated in political strikes than in economic strikes. In 1916, twice as few. In the first few months of 1917, political strikes involved six times as many workers as economic. The role of Petrograd is portrayed in one figure. 72% of the political strikers during the years of the war fall to her lot. Many of the old beliefs are burned up in the fires of this struggle. The Secret Service reports, with pain, that if they should react according to the dictates of the law to every instance of insolence and open insult to His Majesty, the number of trials under Article 103 would reach an unheard of figure. Nevertheless the consciousness of the masses is far behind their action. The terrible pressure of the war and the national ruin is accelerating the process of struggle to such a degree that broad masses of the workers, right up to the very revolution, have not freed themselves from many opinions and prejudices brought with them from the village or from the petty bourgeois family circle in the town. This fact will set its stamp on the first stage of the February Revolution. By the end of 1916, prices are rising by leaps and bounds. To the inflation and the breakdown of transport, there is added an actual lack of goods. The demands of the population have been cut down by this time to one half. The curve of the workers' movement rises sharply. In October the struggle enters its decisive phase, uniting all forms of discontent in one. Petrograd draws back for the February leap. A wave of meetings runs through the factories. The topics, food supplies, high cost of living, war, government. Bolshevik leaflets are distributed, political strikes begin, improvised demonstrations occur at factory gates, cases of fraternization between certain factories and the soldiers are observed, a stormy protest strike flares up over the trial of the revolutionary sailors of the Baltic fleet. The French ambassador calls Premier Sturmer's attention to the fact, become known to him, that some soldiers have shot at the police. Sturmer quiets the ambassador, the repressions will be ruthless. In November a good-sized group of workers on military duty are removed from the Petrograd factories and sent to the front. The year ends in storm and thunder. Comparing the situation with that in 1905, the director of the police department, Vaslov, reaches a very uncomforting conclusion, the mood of the opposition has gone very far, far beyond anything to be seen in the broad masses during the above-mentioned period of disturbance. Vassilov rests no hope in the garrison, even the police officers are not entirely reliable. The intelligence department reports a revival of the slogan of the general strike, the danger of a resurrection of the terror. Soldiers and officers arriving from the front say of the present situation, what is that to wait for question mark why don't you take and bump off such and such a scoundrel? If we were here, we wouldn't waste much time thinking, etc. Shlyapnikov, a member of the Bolshevik Central Committee, himself a former metal worker, describes how nervous the workers were in those days, sometimes a whistle would be enough, 
or any kind of noise, the workers would take it for a signal to stop the factory. This detail is equally remarkable both as a political symptom and as a psychological fact, the revolution is there in the nerves before it comes out on the street. The provinces are passing through the same stages, only more slowly. The growth in massiveness of the movement and in fighting spirit shifts the center of gravity from the textile to the metal workers, from economic strikes to political, from the provinces to Petrograd. The first two months of 1917 show 575,000 political strikers, the lion's share of them in the capital. In spite of new raids carried out by the police on the eve of January 9, 150,000 workers went on strike in the capital on that anniversary of blood. The mood was tense. The metal workers were in the lead. The workers all felt that no retreat was possible. In every factory, an active nucleus was forming, oftenest around the Bolsheviks. Strikes and meetings went on continuously throughout the first two weeks of February. On the 8th, at the Putilov factory, the police received a hail of slag and old iron. On the 14th, the day the Duma opened, about 90,000 were on strike in Petrograd. Several plants also stopped work in Moscow. On the 16th, the authorities decided to introduce bread cards in Petrograd. This novelty rasped the nerves. On the 19th, a mass of people gathered around the food shops, especially women, all demanding bread. A day later, bakeries were sacked in several parts of the city. These were the heat lightnings of the revolution, coming in a few days. The Russian proletariat found its revolutionary audacity not only in itself. Its very position as minority of the nation suggests that it could not have given its struggle a sufficient scope, certainly not enough to take its place at the head of the state, if it had not found a mighty support in the thick of the people. Such a support was guaranteed to it by the agrarian problem. The belated half liberation of the peasants in 1861 had found agricultural industry almost on the same level as 200 years before. The preservation of the old area of communal land, somewhat filched from during the reform, together with the archaic methods of land culture, automatically sharpened a crisis caused by the rural excess population which was at the same time a crisis in the three-field system. The peasantry felt still more caught in a trap because the process was not taking place in the 17th but in the 19th century, that is, in the conditions of an advanced money economy which made demands upon the wooden plough that could only be met by a tractor. Here too we see a drawing together of separate stages of the historic process, and as a result an extreme sharpening of contradictions. The learned agronomes and economists had been preaching that the old area with rational cultivation would be amply sufficient, that is to say, they proposed to the peasant to make a jump to a higher level of technique and culture without disturbing the landlord, the bailiff, or the czar. But no economic regime, least of all an agricultural regime, the most tardy of all, has ever disappeared before exhausting all its possibilities. Before feeling compelled to pass over to a more intensive economic culture, the peasant had to make a last attempt to broaden his three fields. This could obviously be achieved only at the expense of non-peasant lands. Choking in the narrowness of his land area, under the smarting whip of the treasury and the market, the muzzit was inexorably forced to attempt to get rid of the landlord once and for all. On the eve of the first revolution, the whole stretch of arable land within the limits of European Russia was estimated at 280 million dissiatans. For the communal allotments constituted about 140 million. The crown lands, above 5 million. Church and monastery lands, about 2.5 million. Of the privately owned land, 70 million dissiatans belonged to the 30,000 great landlords, each of whom owned above 500 dissiatans. This 70 million was about what would have belonged to 10 million peasant families. The land statistics constitute the finished program of a peasant war. The landlords were not settled within the first revolution. Not all the peasants rose. The movement in the country did not coincide with that in the cities. The peasant army wavered, and finally supplied sufficient forces for putting down the workers. 
As soon as the Samanovsky Guard Regiment had settled with the Moscow insurrection, the monarchy abandoned all thought of cutting down the landed estates, as also its own autocratic rights. However, the defeated revolution did not pass without leaving traces in the village. The government abolished the old land redemption payments and opened the way to a broader colonization of Siberia. The frightened landlords not only made considerable concessions in the matter of rentals, but also began the large-scale selling of their landed estates. These fruits of the revolution were enjoyed by the better-off peasants, who were able to rent and buy the landlord's land. However, the broadest gates were opened for the emerging of capitalist farmers from the peasant class by the law of November 9, 1906. The chief reform introduced by the victorious counter-revolution. Giving the right even to a small minority of the peasants of the commune, against the will of the majority, to cut out from the communal land a section to be owned independently. The law of November 9 constituted an explosive capitalist shell directed against the commune. The president of the Council of Ministers, Stolypin, described the essence of this governmental policy toward the peasants as banking on the strong ones. This meant, encourage the upper circles of the peasantry to get hold of the communal land by buying up these liberated sections, and convert these new capitalist farmers into a support for the existing regime. It was easier to propose such a task, however, than to achieve it. In this attempt to substitute the Kulak 5 problem for the peasant problem, the counter-revolution was destined to break its neck. By January 1, 1916, 2.5 million homeowners had made good their personal possession of 17 million dissiatons. Two more million homeowners were demanding the allotment to them of 14 million dissiatons. This looked like a colossal success for the reform. But the majority of the homesteads were completely incapable of sustaining life, and represented only material for natural selection. At that time when the more backward landlords and small peasants were selling on a large scale, the former their estates, the latter their bits of land, there emerged in the capacity of principal purchaser a new peasant bourgeoisie. Agriculture entered upon a state of indubitable capitalist boom. The export of agricultural products from Russia rose between 1908 and 1912 from 1 billion rubles to 1.5 billion. This meant that broad masses of the peasantry had been proletarianized, and the upper circles of the villages were throwing on the market more and more grain. To replace the compulsory communal ties of the peasantry, there developed very swiftly a voluntary cooperation which succeeded in penetrating quite deeply into the peasant masses in the course of a few years, and immediately became a subject of liberal and democratic idealization. Real power in the cooperatives belonged, however, only to the rich peasants, whose interests in the last analysis they served. The Narodnik intelligentsia, by concentrating its chief forces in peasant cooperation, finally succeeded in shifting its love for the people onto good solid bourgeois rails. In this way was prepared, partially at least, the political bloc of the anti-capitalist party of the social revolutionaries with the cadets, the capitalist party par excellence. Liberalism, although preserving the appearance of opposition to the agrarian policy of the reaction, nevertheless looked with great helps upon this capitalist destruction of the communes. In the country, a very powerful petty bourgeoisie is arising, wrote the liberal prince Trubetskoy, in its whole make and essence alien alike to the ideals of the united nobility and to the socialist dreams. But this admirable medal had its other side. There was arising from the destroyed communes not only a very powerful bourgeoisie, but also its antithesis. The number of peasants selling tracts of land they could not live on had risen by the beginning of the war to a million which means no less than 5 million souls added to the proletarian population. A sufficiently explosive material was also supplied by the millions of peasant paupers to whom nothing remained but to hang on to their hungry allotments. In consequence those contradictions kept reproducing themselves among the peasants which had so early undermined the development of bourgeois society as a whole in Russia. The new rural bourgeoisie which was to create a support for the old and more powerful proprietors, turned out to be as hostilely opposed to the fundamental masses of the peasantry as the old proprietors had been to the people as a whole. 
before it could become a support to the existing order, this peasant bourgeoisie had need of some order of its own wherewith to cling to its conquered positions. In these circumstances, it is no wonder that the agrarian problem continued a sharp one in all the state Duma. Everyone felt that the last word had not yet been spoken. The peasant deputy Petrichenko once declared from the tribune of the Duma, no matter how long you debate you won't create a new planet, that means that you will have to give us the land. This peasant was neither a Bolshevik, nor a social revolutionary. On the contrary, he was a right deputy, a monarchist. The agrarian movement, having, like the strike movement of the workers, died down toward the end of 1907, partially revives in 1908, and grows stronger during the following years. The struggle, to be sure, is transferred to a considerable degree within the commune, that is just what the reaction had figured on politically. There are not infrequent armed conflicts among peasants during the division of the communal land. But the struggle against the landlord also does not disappear. The peasants are more frequently setting fire to the landlord's manors, harvest, haystacks, seizing on the way also those individual tracts which had been cut off against the will of the communal peasants. The war found the peasantry in this condition. The government carried away from the country about 10 million workers and about 2 million horses. The weak homesteads grew still weaker. The number of peasants who could not sow their fields increased. But in the second year of the war the middle peasants also began to go under. Peasant hostility toward the war sharpened from month to month. In October 1916, the Petrograd Gendarme administration reported that in the villages they had already ceased to believe in the success of the war, the report being based on the words of insurance agents, teachers, traders, etc. all are waiting and impatiently demanding. When will this cursed war finally end? And this is not all, political questions are being talked about everywhere and resolutions adopted directed against the landlords and merchants. Nuclei of various organizations are being formed. As yet there is no uniting center, but there is reason to suppose that the peasants will unite by way of the cooperatives which are daily growing throughout all Russia. There is some exaggeration here. In some things the gendarme has run ahead a little, but the fundamentals are indubitably correct. The possessing classes could not but foresee that the village was going to present its spill. But they drove away these black thoughts, hoping to wriggle out of it somehow. On this theme the inquisitive French ambassador Paleologue had a chat during the war days with the former minister of agriculture Krivosh and the former premier Kokovtsev, the great landlord Count Borbrinsky the president of the state Duma Rodzienko, the great industrialist Butilov, and other distinguished people. Here is what was unveiled before him in this conversation, in order to carry into action radical land reform, it would require the work of a standing army of 300,000 surveyors for no less than 15 years, but during this time the number of homesteads would increase to 30 million and consequently all these preliminary calculations by the time they were made would prove invalid. To introduce a land reform thus seemed in the eyes of these landlords, officials, and bankers something like squaring the circle. It is hardly necessary to say that a like mathematical scrupulousness was completely alien to the peasant. He thought that first of all the thing to do was to smoke out the landlord, and then see. If the village nevertheless remained comparatively peaceful during the war, that was because its active forces were at the front. The soldiers did not forget about the land, whenever at least they were not thinking about death, and in the trenches the Muzik's thoughts about the future were saturated with the smell of powder. But all the same, the peasantry, even after learning to handle firearms, could never of its own force have achieved the agrarian democratic revolution that is, its own revolution. It had to have leadership. For the first time in world history the peasant was destined to find a leader in the person of the worker. In that lies the fundamental, and you may say the whole, difference between the Russian Revolution and all those preceding it. In England serfdom had disappeared in actual fact by the end of the 14th century, that is, two centuries before it arose in Russia. 
and four and a half centuries before it was abolished. The expropriation of the landed property of the peasants dragged along in England through one reformation and two revolutions to the 19th century. The capitalist development, not forced from the outside, thus had sufficient time to liquidate the independent peasant long before the proletariat awoke to political life. In France, the struggle with royal absolutism, the aristocracy, and the princes of the church, compelled the bourgeoisie in various of its layers and in several installments, to achieve a radical agrarian revolution at the beginning of the 18th century. For long after that an independent peasantry constituted the support of the bourgeois order, and in 1871 it helped the bourgeoisie put down the Paris Commune. In Germany, the bourgeoisie proved incapable of revolutionary solution of the agrarian problem, and in 1848 betrayed the peasants to the landlords just as Luther some three centuries before in the peasant wars had betrayed them to the princes. On the other hand, the German proletariat was still too weak in the middle of the 19th century to take the leadership of the peasantry. As a result, the capitalist development of Germany got sufficient time, although not so long a period as in England, to subordinate agriculture, as it emerged from the uncompleted bourgeois revolution to its own interests. The peasant reform of 1861 was carried out in Russia by an aristocratic and bureaucratic monarchy under pressure of the demands of a bourgeois society, but with the bourgeoisie completely powerless politically. The character of this peasant emancipation was such that the forced capitalistic transformation of the country inevitably converted the agrarian problem into a problem of revolution. The Russian bourgeois dreamed of an agrarian evolution on the French plan, or the Danish, or the American, anything you want, only not the Russian. He neglected, however, to supply himself in good season with a French history or an American social structure. The democratic intelligentsia, notwithstanding its revolutionary past, took its stand in the decisive hour with the liberal bourgeoisie and the landlord, and not with the revolutionary village. In these circumstances, only the working class could stand at the head of the peasant revolution. The law of combined development of backward countries, in the sense of a peculiar mixture of backward elements with the most modern factors, here rises before us in its most finished form, and offers a key to the fundamental riddle of the Russian Revolution. If the agrarian problem, as a heritage from the barbarism of the old Russian history, had been solved by the bourgeoisie, if it could have been solved by them, the Russian proletariat could not possibly have come to power in 1917. In order to realize the Soviet state, there was required a drawing together and mutual penetration of two factors belonging to completely different historic species, a peasant war, that is, a movement characteristic of the dawn of bourgeois development, and a proletarian insurrection, the movement signalizing its decline. That is the essence of 1917.4 The Tsar and the Tsarina This book will concern itself least of all with those unrelated psychological researches which are now so often substituted for social and historical analysis. Foremost in our field of vision will stand the great, moving forces of history, which are superpersonal in character. Monarchy is one of them. But all these forces operate through people and monarchy is by its very principle bound up with the personal. This in itself justifies an interest in the personality of that monarch whom the process of social development brought face to face with a revolution. Moreover, we hope to show in what follows, partially at least, just where in the personality the strictly personal ends, often much sooner than we think, and how frequently the distinguishing traits of a person are merely individual scratches made by a higher law of development. Nicholas II inherited from his ancestors not only a giant empire, but also a revolution. And they did not bequeath him one quality which would have made him capable of governing an empire, or even a province or a county. To that historic flood which was rolling its billows each one closer to the gates of his palace, the last Romanov opposed only a dumb indifference. It seemed as though between his consciousness and his epoch there stood some transparent but absolutely impenetrable medium. People surrounding the Tsar often recalled after the revolution that in the most tragic moments of his reign, 
at the time of the surrender of Port Arthur and the sinking of the fleet at Tsushima, and ten years later at the time of the retreat of the Russian troops from Galicia and then two years later during the days preceding his abdication when all those around him were depressed, alarmed, shaken, Nicholas alone preserved his tranquility. He would inquire as usual how many versts he had covered in his journeys about Russia, would recall episodes of hunting expeditions in the past, anecdotes of official meetings, would interest himself generally in the little rubbish of the day's doings, while thunders roared over him and lightnings flashed. What is this? asked one of his attendant generals, a gigantic, almost unbelievable self restraint, the product of breeding, of a belief in the divine predetermination of events? Or is it inadequate consciousness? The answer is more than half included in the question. The so called breeding of the Tsar, his ability to control himself in the most extraordinary circumstances, cannot be explained by a mere external training its essence was an inner indifference, a poverty of spiritual forces, a weakness of the impulses of the will. That mask of indifference which was called breeding in certain circles, was a natural part of Nicholas at birth. The Tsar's diary is the best of all testimony. From day to day and from year to year drags along upon its pages the depressing record of spiritual emptiness. Walked long and killed two crows? Drank tea by daylight? promenades on foot, rides in a boat, and then again crows, and again tea, all on the borderline of physiology. Recollections of church ceremonies are jotted down in the same tone as a drinking party. In the days preceding the opening of the state Duma, when the whole country was shaking with convulsions, Nicholas wrote, April 14th. Took a walk in a thin shirt and took up paddling again. Had tea in the balcony? Starna dined and took a ride with us. Read. Not a word as to the subject of his reading. Some sentimental English romance? Or a report from the police department? April 15. Accepted Witt's resignation. Marie and Dimitri to dinner. Drove them home to the palace. On the day of the decision to dissolve the Duma, when the court as well as the liberal circles were going through a paroxysm of fright, the Tsar wrote in his diary, July 7, Friday. Very busy morning. Half hour late to breakfast with the officers. A storm came up and it was very muggy. We walked together. Received Gormikin. Signed a decree dissolving the Duma. Dined with Olga and Peter. Read all evening. An exclamation point after the coming dissolution of the Duma is the highest expression of his emotions. The deputies of the dispersed Duma summoned the people to refuse to pay taxes. A series of military uprisings followed, in Svoboda, Kronstadt, on ships, in army units. The revolutionary terror against high officials was renewed on an unheard of scale. The Tsar writes, July 9. Sunday. It has happened. The Duma was closed today. At breakfast after mass long faces were noticeable among many. The weather was fine. On our walk we met Uncle Misha who came over yesterday from Gatchina. Was quietly busy until dinner and all evening. Went paddling in a canoe. It was in a canoe he went paddling. That is told. But with what he was busy all evening is not indicated. So it was always dot and further in those same fatal days, July 14th got dressed and rode a bicycle to the bailing beach and bathed enjoyably in the sea. July 15. Bathed twice. It was very hot. Only us two at dinner. A storm passed over. July 19. Bathed in the morning. Received at the farm. Uncle Vladimir and Shagin lunched with us. An insurrection and explosions of dynamite are barely touched upon with a single phrase, pretty doings. Astonishing in its imperturbable indifference, which never owes to conscious cynicism. At 9.30 in the morning we rode out to the Caspian Regiment. Walked for a long time. The weather was wonderful. Bathed in the sea. After tea received Lvov and Guchkov. Not a word of the fact that this unexpected reception of the two liberals was brought about by the attempt of Stolypin to include opposition leaders in his ministry. Prince Lvov 
the future head of the provisional government, said of that reception at the time, I expected to see the sovereign stricken with grief, but instead of that there came out to meet me a jolly, sprightly fellow in a raspberry colored shirt. The Tsar's outlook was not broader than that of a minor police official, with this difference, that the latter would have a better knowledge of reality and be less burdened with superstitions. The sole paper which Nicholas read for years, and from which he derived his ideas, was a weekly published on state revenue by Prince Meshkoski, a vile, bribed journalist of the reactionary bureaucratic clique, despised even in his own circle. The Tsar kept his outlook unchanged through two wars and two revolutions. Between his consciousness and events stood always that impenetrable medium, indifference. Nicholas was called, not without foundation, a fatalist. It is only necessary to add that his fatalism was the exact opposite of an active belief in his star. Nicholas indeed considered himself unlucky. His fatalism was only a form of passive self-defense against historic evolution, and went hand in hand with an arbitrariness, trivial in psychological motivation, but monstrous in its consequences. I wish it and therefore it must be, writes Count Witt. That motto appeared in all the activities of this weak ruler, who only through weakness did all the things which characterized his reign, a wholesale shedding of more or less innocent blood, for the most part without aim. Nicholas is sometimes compared with his half-crazy great-great-grandfather Paul, who was strangled by a Camarillo acting in agreement with his own son, Alexander the Blessed. These two Romanovs were actually alike in their distrust of everybody due to a distrust of themselves, their touchiness as of omnipotent nobodies, their feeling of abnegation, their consciousness, as you might say, of being crowned pariahs. But Paul was incomparably more colorful, there was an element of fancy in his rantings, however irresponsible. In his descendant everything was dim, there was not one sharp trait. Nicholas was not only unstable, but treacherous. Flatterers called him a charmer, bewitcher, because of his gentle way with the courtiers. But the Tsar reserved his special caresses for just those officials whom he had decided to dismiss. Charmed beyond measure at a reception, the minister would go home and find a letter requesting his resignation. That was a kind of revenge on the Tsar's part for his own non-entity. Nicholas recoiled in hostility before everything gifted and significant. He felt at ease only among completely mediocre and brainless people, saintly fakers, holy men, to whom he did not have to look up. He had his amour proper, indeed it was rather keen. But it was not active, not possessed of a grain of initiative, enviously defensive. He selected his ministers on a principle of continual deterioration. Men of brain and character he summoned only in extreme situations when there was no other way out, just as we call in a surgeon to save our lives. It was so with wit, and afterward with Stolypin. Theirs are treated both with ill concealed hostility. As soon as the crisis had passed, he hastened to part with these counselors who were too tall for him. This selection operated so systematically that the president of the last Duma, Rodzienko, on the 7th of January 1917, with the revolution already knocking at the doors, ventured to say to the Tsar, Your Majesty, there is not one reliable or honest man left around you, all the best men have been removed or have retired. There remain only those of ill repute. All the efforts of the liberal bourgeoisie to find a common language with the court came to nothing. The tireless and noisy Rodzienka tried to shake up the Tsar with his reports, but in vain. The latter gave no answer either to argument or to impudence, but quietly made ready to dissolve the Duma. Grand Duke Dmitri, a former favorite of the Tsar, and future accomplice in the murder of Rasputin, complained to his colleague, Prince Yusupov that the Tsar at headquarters was becoming every day more indifferent to everything around him. In Dmitri's opinion, the Tsar was being fed a some kind of dope which had a benumbing action upon his spiritual faculties. Rumors went round, writes the liberal historian Miliukov, that this condition of mental and moral apathy was sustained in the Tsar by an increased use of alcohol. This was all fancy or exaggeration. The Tsar had no need of narcotics. 
the fatal dope was in his blood. Its symptoms merely seemed especially striking on the background of those great events of war and domestic crisis which led up to the revolution. Rasputin, who was a psychologist, said briefly of the Tsar that he lacked insides. This dim, equable, and well-bred man was cruel, not with the active cruelty of Ivan the Terrible or of Peter, in the pursuit of historic aims. What had Nicholas II in common with them question mark but with the cowardly cruelty of the late born, frightened at his own doom. At the very dawn of his reign Nicholas praised the Fonigaritzi regiment as fine fellows for shooting down workers. He always read with satisfaction how they flogged with whips the bob-haired girl students, or cracked the heads of defenseless people during Jewish pogroms. This crowned black sheep gravitated with all his soul to the very dregs of society, the black hundred hooligans. He not only paid them generously from the state treasury, but loved to chat with them about their exploits, and would pardon them when they accidentally got mixed up in the murder of an opposition deputy. Wit, who stood at the head of the government during the putting down of the first revolution, has written in his memoirs, when news of the useless cruel antics of the chiefs of those detachments reached the sovereign, they met with his approval, or in any case his defense. In answer to the demand of the governor general of the Baltic states that he stop a certain lieutenant captain, Richter, who was executing on his own authority and without trial non resistant persons, the Tsar wrote on the report, Ah, what a fine fellow! Such encouragements are innumerable. This charmer, without will, without aim, without imagination, was more awful than all the tyrants of ancient and modern history. The Tsar was mightily under the influence of the Tsarina, an influence which increased with the years and the difficulties. Together they constituted a kind of unit, and that combination shows already to what an extent the personal, under pressure of circumstances, is supplemented by the group. But first we must speak of the Tsarina herself. Maurice Paleolog, the French ambassador at Petrograd during the war, a refined psychologist for French academicians and janitresses, offers a meticulously licked portrait of the last Tsarina, moral restlessness, a chronic sadness, infinite longing, intermittent ups and downs of strength, anguishing thoughts of the invisible other world, superstitions, are not all these traits so clearly apparent in the personality of the empress, the characteristic traits of the Russian people? Strange as it may seem, there is in this saccharine lie just a grain of truth. The Russian satirist Saltikov, with some justification, called the ministers and governors from among the Baltic barons Germans with a Russian soul. It is indubitable that aliens, in no way connected with the people, developed the most pure culture of the genuine Russian administrator. But why did the people repay with such open hatred as Arena who, in the words of Paleolog, had so completely assimilated their soul? The answer is simple. In order to justify her new situation, this German woman adopted with a kind of cold fury all the traditions and nuances of Russian medievalism, the most meager and crude of all medievalisms, in that very period when the people were making mighty efforts to free themselves from it. This Hessian princess was literally possessed by the demon of autocracy. Having risen from her oral corner to the heights of Byzantine despotism, she would not for anything take a step down. In the orthodox religion she found a mysticism and a magic adapted to her new lot. She believed the more inflexibly in her vocation, the more naked became the foulness of the old regime. With a strong character and a gift for dry and hard exaltations, the Tsarina supplemented the weak quilled Tsar, ruling over him. On March 17, 1916, a year before the revolution, when the tortured country was already writhing in the grip of defeat and ruin, the Tsarina wrote to her husband at military headquarters, You must not give indulgences, a responsible ministry etc. or anything that they want. This must be your war and your peace, and the honor yours and our fatherlands, and not by any means the Dumas. They have not the right to say a single word in these matters. This was at any rate a thoroughgoing program. 
and it was in just this way that she always had the whip hand over the continually vacillating Tsar. After Nicholas's departure to the army in the capacity of factitious commander in chief, the Tsarina began openly to take charge of internal affairs. The ministers came to her with reports as to a regent. She entered into a conspiracy with a small Camarilla against the Duma, against the ministers, against the staff generals, against the whole world, to some extent indeed against the Tsar. On December 6, 1916, the Tsarina wrote to the Tsar, Once you have said that you want to keep Protopopov, how does he, Premier Trepov, go against you? Bring down your fist on the table. Don't yield. Be the boss. Obey your firm little wife and our friend. Believe in us. Again three days later, you know you are right. Carry your head high. Command Trepov to work with him. Strike your fist on the table. Those phrases sound as though they were made up, but they are taken from authentic letters. Besides, you cannot make up things like that. On December 13th, the Tsarina suggests to the Tsar, anything but this responsible ministry about which everybody has gone crazy. Everything is getting quiet and better, but people want to feel your hand. How long they have been saying to me, for whole years, the same thing, Russia loves to feel the whip. That is their nature. This orthodox Hessian, with a Windsor upbringing and a Byzantine crown on her head, not only incarnates the Russian soul, but also organically despises it. Their nature demands the whip, writes the Russian Tsarina to the Russian Tsar about the Russian people, just two months and a half before the monarchy tips over into the abyss. In contrast to her force of character, the intellectual force of the Tsarina is not higher, but rather lower than her husband's. Even more than he, she craves the society of simpletons. The close and long-lasting friendship of the Tsar and Tsarina with their lady-in-waiting Virubova gives a measure of the spiritual stature of this autocratic bear. Virubova has described herself as a fool, and this is not modesty. Wit, to whom one cannot deny an accurate eye, characterized her as a most commonplace, stupid, Petersburg young lady, homely as a bubble in the biscuit dough. In the society of this person, with whom elderly officials, ambassadors, and financiers obsequiously flirted, and who had just enough brains not to forget about her own pockets, the Tsar and Tsarina would pass many hours, consulting her about affairs, corresponding with her and about her. She was more influential than the state Duma, and even than the ministry. But Virubhava herself was only an instrument of the friend, whose authority superseded all three. This is my private opinion writes the Tsarina to the Tsar, I will find out what our friend thinks. The opinion of the friend is not private, it decides. I am firm, insists the Tsarina a few weeks later, but listen to me, that is this means our friend, and trust us in everything. I suffer for you as for a gentle soft-hearted child, who needs guidance, but listens to bad counselors, while a man sent by God is telling him what he should do. The friend sent by God was Gregory Rasputin. The prayers and the help of our friend, then all will be well. If we did not have him, all would have been over long ago. I am absolutely convinced of that. Throughout the whole reign of Nicholas and Alexandra, soothsayers and hysterics were imported for the court not only from all over Russia, but from other countries. Special official purveyors arose, who would gather around the momentary oracle forming a powerful upper chamber attached to the monarch. There was no lack of bigoted old women with the title of countess, nor of functionaries weary of doing nothing, nor of financiers who had entire ministries in their hire. With a jealous eye on the uncharted competition of mesmerists and sorcerers, the high priesthood of the Orthodox Church would hasten to pry their way into the holy of holies of the intrigue. Wit called this ruling circle, against which he himself twice stubbed his toe the leprous court Camarilla. The more isolated the dynasty became, and the more unsheltered the autocrat felt, the more he needed some help from the other world. Certain savages, in order to bring good weather, wave in the air a shingle on a string. The Tsar and Tsarina used shingles for the greatest variety of purposes. In their Tsar's train, 
there was a whole chapel full of large and small images, and all sorts of fetishes, which were brought to bear, first against the Japanese, then against the German artillery. The level of the court circle really had not changed much from generation to generation. Under Alexander II, called the Liberator, the Grand Dukes had sincerely believed in house spirits and witches. Under Alexander III it was no better, only quieter. The leprous Camarilla had existed always, changed only its personnel and its method. Nicholas II did not create, but inherited from his ancestors, this court atmosphere of savage medievalism. But the country during these same decades had been changing, its problems growing more complex, its culture rising to a higher level. The court circle was thus left far behind. Although the monarchy did under compulsion make concessions to the new forces, nevertheless inwardly it completely failed to become modernized. On the contrary, it withdrew into itself. Its spirit of medievalism thickened under the pressure of hostility and fear, until it acquired the character of a disgusting nightmare overhanging the country. Toward November 1905, that is, at the most critical moment of the First Revolution, the Tsar writes in his diary, we got acquainted with a man of God, Gregory, from the Tobolsk province. That was Rasputin, a Siberian peasant with a bald scar on his head, the result of a beating for horse stealing. Put forward at an appropriate moment, this man of God soon found official helpers, or rather they found him, and thus was formed a new ruling circle which got a firm hold of the Tsarina and through her of the Tsar. From the winter of 1913-14, it was openly said in Petersburg society that all high appointments, posts, and contracts depended upon the Rasputin clique. The elder himself gradually turned into a state institution. He was carefully guarded, and no less carefully sought after by the competing ministers. Spies of the police department kept a diary of his life by hours, and did not fail to report how on a visit to his home village of Pokrovsky he got into a drunken and bloody fight with his own father on the street. On the same day that this happened, September 9, 1915, Rasputin sent two friendly telegrams, one to Tsar Skusilo, to the Tsarina, the other two headquarters to the Tsar. In epic language the police spies registered from day to day the revels of the friend. He returned today five o'clock in the morning completely drunk. On the night of the 25th 26th the actress V. spent the night with Rasputin. He arrived with Princess D. the wife of a gentleman of the bedchamber of the Tsar's court, at the Hotel Astoria. And right beside this, came home from Tsar Skusilo about eleven o'clock in the evening. Rasputin came home with Princess S.H very drunk and together they went out immediately. In the morning or evening of the following day a trip to Zarsku Silo. To a sympathetic question from the spy as to why the elder was thoughtful, the answer came, can't decide whether to convoke the Duma or not. And then again, he came home at five in the morning pretty drunk. Thus for months and years the melody was played on three keys, pretty drunk, very drunk, and completely drunk. These communications of state importance were brought together and countersigned by the general of gendarmes, Gorbachev. The bloom of Rasputin's influence lasted six years. The last years of the monarchy. His life in Petrograd, says Prince Yusupov, who participated to some extent in that life, and afterward killed Rasputin, became a continual revel, the drunken debauch of a galley slave who had come into an unexpected fortune. I had at my disposition, wrote the president of the Duma, Rodzi and Co., a whole mass of letters from mothers whose daughters had been dishonored by this insolent rake. Nevertheless the Petrograd Metropolitan, Pitirim, owed his position to Rasputin, as also the almost illiterate Archbishop Varniva. The procurer of the Holy Synod, Sabla, was long sustained by Rasputin, and Premier Kokovtsev was removed at his wish having refused to receive the elder. Rasputin appointed Sturmer president of the Council of Ministers, Protopopov minister of the interior, the new procurer of the Synod, Ref, and many others. The ambassador of the French Republic, 
Paleolog, sought an interview with Rasputin, embraced him, and cried, Voila, unveritable illumin! Hoping in this way to win the heart of the Tsarina to the cause of France. The Jew Simonovich, financial agent of the elder, himself under the eye of the secret police as a nightclub gambler and usurer, introduced into the Ministry of Justice through Rasputin the completely dishonest creature Dobrovolsky. Keep by you the little list, writes the Tsarina to the Tsar, in regard to new appointments. Our friend has asked that you talk all this over with Protopopov. Two days later, our friend says that Sturmer may remain a few days longer as President of the Council of Ministers. And again, Protopopov venerates our friend and will be blessed. On one of those days when the police spies were counting up the number of bottles and women, their Tsarina grieved in a letter to the Tsar. They accuse Rasputin of kissing women, etc. Read the Apostles. They kissed everybody as a form of greeting. This reference to the Apostles would hardly convince the police spies. In another letter, their Tsarina goes still farther. During Vespers I thought so much about our friend, she writes, how the scribes and Pharisees are persecuting Christ pretending that they are so perfect. Yes, in truth no man is a prophet in his own country. The comparison of Rasputin and Christ was customary in that circle, and by no means accidental. The alarm of the royal couple before the menacing forces of history was too sharp to be satisfied with an impersonal God and the futile shadow of a biblical Christ. They needed a second coming of the Son of Man. In Rasputin the rejected and agonizing monarchy found a Christ in its own image. If there had been no Rasputin, said Senator Tigantsev, a man of the old regime, it would have been necessary to invent one. There is a good deal more in these words than their author imagined. If by the word hooliganism we understand the extreme expression of those antisocial parasite elements at the bottom of society, we may define Rasputinism as a crowned hooliganism at its very top. Five the idea of a palace revolution why did not the ruling classes, who were trying to save themselves from a revolution, attempt to get rid of the Tsar and his circle? They wanted to but they did not dare. They lacked both resolution and belief in their cause. The idea of a palace revolution was in the air up to the very moment when it was swallowed up in a state revolution. We must pause upon this in order to get a clearer idea of the interrelations, just before the explosion, of the monarchy, the upper circles of the nobility, the bureaucracy, and the bourgeoisie. The possessing classes were completely monarchist, by virtue of interests, habits, and cowardice. But they wanted a monarchy without Rasputin. The monarchy answered them, take me as I am. In response to demands for a decent ministry, their Tsarina sent to the Tsar at headquarters an apple from the hands of Rasputin, urging that he eat it in order to strengthen his will. Remember, she adjured, that even Monsieur Philippe, a French charlatan hypnotist, said that you must not grant a constitution, as that would mean ruin to you and Russia. Be Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, Emperor Paul, crush them all under your feet. What a disgusting mixture of fright, superstition, and malicious alienation from the country. To be sure, it might seem that on the summits the Tsar's family could not be quite alone. Rasputin indeed was always surrounded with a galaxy of grand ladies, and in general shamanism flourishes in an aristocracy. But this mysticism of fear does not unite people, it divides them. Each saves himself in his own way. Many aristocratic houses have their competing saints. Even on the summits of Petrograd society, their Tsar's family was surrounded as though plague-stricken, with a quarantine of distrust and hostility. Lady-in-waiting Verubova remembers. I was aware and felt deeply in all those around us a malice toward those whom I revered, and I felt that this malice would assume terrible dimensions. Against the purple background of the war, with the roar of underground tremors clearly audible, the privileged did not for one moment renounce the joys of life, on the contrary, they devoured them greedily. Yet more and more often a skeleton would appear at their banquets and shake the little bones of his fingers. It began to seem to them that all their misery lay in the disgusting character of Alex, in the treacherous weakness of the Tsar, in that greedy fool Verubova, 
and in the Siberian Christ with a scar on his skull. Waves of unendurable foreboding swept over the ruling class, contracting it with spasms from the periphery to the center, and more and more isolating the hated upper circle at Zarsku Silo. Virubova has pretty clearly expressed the feelings of the upper circle at that time in her, generally speaking, very lying reminiscences, for the hundredth time I asked myself what has happened to Petrograd society. Are they all spiritually sick, or have they contracted some epidemic which rages in wartime? It is hard to understand, but the fact is, all were in an abnormally excited condition. To the number of those out of their heads belonged the whole copious family of the Romanovs, the whole greedy, insolent, and universally hated pack of grand dukes and grand duchesses. Frightened to death, they were trying to wriggle out of the ring narrowing around them. They cowed out to the critical aristocracy, gossiped about the royal bear, and egged on both each other and all those around them. The august uncles addressed the Tsar with letters of advice in which between the lines of respect was to be heard a snarl and a grinding of teeth. Protopopov, some time after the October Revolution, colorfully if not very learnedly characterized the mood of the upper circles, even the very highest classes became frunders before the revolution, in the grand salons and clubs the policy of the government received harsh and unfriendly criticism. The relations which had been formed in the Tsar's family were analyzed and talked over. Little anecdotes were passed around about the head of the state. Verses were composed. Many grand dukes openly attended these meetings, and their presence gave a special authority in the eyes of the public to tales that were caricatures and to malicious exaggerations. A sense of the danger of this sport did not awaken till the last moment. These rumors about the court Camarilla were especially sharpened by the accusation of Germanophilism and even of direct connections with the enemy. The noisy and not very deep Rodzi and Co. definitely stated, the connection and the analogy of aspirations is so logically obvious that I at least have no doubt of the cooperation of the German staff and the Rasputin circle, nobody can doubt it. The bare reference to illogical obviousness greatly weakens the categorical tone of this testimony. No evidence of a connection between the Rasputinists and the German staff was discovered after the revolution. It was otherwise with the so-called Germanophilism. This was not a question, of course, of the national sympathies and antipathies of the German Tsarina, Premier Sturmer, Countess Klimichel, Minister of the Court Count Fredericks, and other gentlemen with German names. The cynical memoirs of the old Interiguanti Klin Michael demonstrate with remarkable clearness how a supernational character distinguished the aristocratic summits of all the countries of Europe, bound together as they were by ties of birth, inheritance, scorn for all those beneath them, and last but not least, cosmopolitan adultery in ancient castles, at fashionable watering places, and in the courts of Europe. Considerably more real were the organic antipathies of the court household to the obsequious lawyers of the French Republic, and the sympathy of the reactionaries, whether bearing Teuton or Slavic family names, for the genuine Russian soul of the Berlin regime which had so often impressed them with its waxed mustachios, its sergeant major manner, and self-confident stupidity. But that was not the decisive factor. The danger arose from the very logic of the situation for the court could not help seeking salvation in a separate peace, and this the more insistently the more dangerous the situation became. Liberalism in the person of its leaders was trying, as we shall see, to reserve for itself the chance of making a separate peace in connection with the prospect of its own coming to power. But for just this reason it carried on a furious chauvinist agitation, deceiving the people and terrorizing the court. The Camarilla did not dare show its real face prematurely in so ticklish a matter, and was even compelled to counterfeit the general patriotic tone, at the same time feeling out the ground for a separate peace. General Kurloff, a former chief of police belonging to the Rasputin Camarilla, denies, of course, in his reminiscences any German connection or sympathies on the part of his protector but immediately adds, we cannot blame Sturmer for his opinion that the war with Germany was the greatest possible misfortune for Russia and that it had no serious political justification. 
It is hardly possible to forget that while holding this interesting opinion Sturmer was the head of the government of a country waging war against Germany. The Tsarist Minister of the Interior, Protopopov, just before he entered the government, had been conducting negotiations in Stockholm with the German diplomat Warburg and had reported them to the Tsar. Rasputin himself, according to the same Kurloff, considered the war with Germany a colossal misfortune for Russia. And finally the Empress wrote to the Tsar on April 5, 1916, they dare not say that he has anything in common with the Germans. He is good and magnanimous toward all, like Christ. No matter to what religion a man may belong, that is the way a good Christian ought to be. To be sure, this good Christian who was almost always intoxicated might quite possibly have been made up to, not only by sharpers, usurers, and aristocratic procuresses, but by actual spies of the enemy. Connections of this kind are not inconceivable. But the oppositional patriots posed the matter more directly and broadly, they directly accused the Tsarina of treason. In his memoirs, written considerably later, General Denikin testifies, in the army there was loud talk, unconstrained both in time and place, as to the insistent demands of the Empress for a separate peace, her treachery in the matter of Field Marshal Kitchener, of whose journey she was supposed to have told the Germans, etc. This circumstance played a colossal role in determining the mood of the army in its attitude to the dynasty and the revolution. The same Denikin relates how after the revolution General Alexov, to a direct question about the treason of the Empress, answered, vaguely and reluctantly, that in going over the papers they had found in the possession of the Tsarina a chart with a detailed designation of troops on the whole front, and that upon him, Alexov, this had produced a depressing effect. Not another word, significantly adds Denikin. He changed the subject. Whether the Tsarina had the mysterious chart or not, the luckless generals were obviously not unwilling to shoulder off upon her the responsibility for their own defeat. The accusation of treason against the court undoubtedly crept through the army chiefly from above downward, starting with that incapable staff. But if the Tsarina herself, to whom the Tsar submitted in everything, was betraying to Wilhelm the military secrets and even the heads of the allied chieftains, what remained but to make an end of the royal pair? And since the head of the army and of the anti-German party was the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, was he not as a matter of duty chosen for the role of supreme patron of a palace revolution? That was the reason why the Tsar, upon the insistence of Rasputin and the Tsarina, removed the Grand Duke and took the chief command into his own hands. But the Tsarina was afraid even of a meeting between the nephew and the uncle in turning over the command. Sweetheart, try to be cautious, she writes to the Tsar at headquarters, and don't let Nikolasha catch you in any kind of promises or anything else, remember that Gregory saved you from him and from his bad people. Remember in the name of Russia what they wanted to do, oust you, this is not gossip, Orloff had all the papers ready, and put me in a monastery. The Tsar's brother Mikhail said to Rodzienko. The whole family knows how harmful Alexandra Fodorovna is. Nothing but traitors surround her and my brother. All honest people have left. But what's to be done in such a situation? That is it exactly, what is to be done? The Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna insisted in the presence of her sons that Rodzienko should take the initiative in removing the Tsarina. Rodzienko suggested that they consider the conversation as not having taken place, as otherwise in loyalty to his oath he should be obliged to report to the Tsar that the Grand Duchess had suggested to the President of the Duma that he destroy the Tsarina. Thus the ready-witted Lord Chamberlain reduced the question of murdering the Tsarina to a pleasantry of the drawing room. At times the ministry itself came into sharp opposition to the Tsar. As early as 1915, a year and a half before the revolution, at the sittings of the government, talk went on openly which even now seems unbelievable. The war minister Palai Vanif, only a policy of conciliation towards society can save the situation. The present shaky dikes will not avert a catastrophe. The minister of Marine Grigorovich, it's no secret that the army does not trust us and is awaiting a change. 
the Minister of Foreign Affairs Sazanov, the popularity of the Tsar and his authority in the eyes of the popular mass is considerably shaken. The Minister of the Interior Prince Sherbatov, all of us together are unfit for governing Russia in the situation that is forming. We must have either a dictatorship or a conciliatory policy, session of August 21, 1915. Neither of these measures could now be of help, neither was now attainable. The Tsar could not make up his mind to a dictatorship, he rejected a conciliatory policy, and did not accept the resignation of the ministers who considered themselves unfit. The high official who kept the record makes a short commentary upon these ministerial speeches, evidently we shall have to hang from a lamppost. With such feelings prevailing, it is no wonder that even in bureaucratic circles they talked of the necessity of a palace uprising as the sole means of preventing the advance in revolution. If I had shut my eyes, remembers one of the participants of these conversations, I might have thought that I was in the company of desperate revolutionists. A colonel of gendarmes making a special investigation of the army in the south of Russia painted a dark picture in his report, thanks to propaganda chiefly relating to the German affilism of the Empress and the Tsar, the army is prepared for the idea of a palace revolution. Conversations to this effect are openly carried on in officers' meetings and have not met the necessary opposition on the part of the high command. Protopopov on his part testifies that a considerable number of people in the high commanding staff sympathized with the idea of a coup d'etat, certain individuals were in touch with and under the influence of the chief leaders of the so-called progressive bloc. The subsequently notorious Admiral Kolchak testified before the Soviet Investigation Commission after his troops were routed by the Red Army that he had connections with many oppositional members of the Duma whose speeches he welcomed, since his attitude to the powers existing before the revolution was adverse. As to the plan for a palace revolution, however, Kolchak was not informed. After the murder of Rasputin and the subsequent banishment of Grand Dukes, high society talked still louder of the necessity of a palace revolution. Prince Yusupov tells how when the Grand Duke Dmitri was arrested at the palace, the officers of several regiments came up and proposed plans for decisive action, to which he, of course, could not agree. The allied diplomats, in any case, the British ambassador, were considered accessories to the plot. The latter, doubtless upon the initiative of the Russian liberals, made an attempt in January 1917 to influence Nicholas, having secured the preliminary sanction of his government. Nicholas attentively and politely listened to the ambassador, thanked him, and, spoke of other matters. Protopopov reported to Nicholas the relations between Buchanan and the chief leaders of the progressive bloc, and suggested that the British ambassador be placed under observation. Nicholas did not seem to approve of the proposal finding the watching of an ambassador inconsistent with international tradition. Meanwhile Kurloff has no hesitation in stating that the intelligence service remarks daily the relations between the leader of the Kurd party Miliukov and the British ambassador. International traditions, then, had not stood in the way at all. But their transgression helped little, even so, a palace conspiracy was never discovered. Did it in reality exist? there is nothing to prove this. It was a little too broad, that conspiracy. It included too many and too various circles to be a conspiracy. It merely hung in the air as a mood of the upper circles of Petrograd society, as a confused idea of salvation, or a slogan of despair. But it did not thicken down to the point of becoming a practical plan. The upper nobility in the 18th century had more than once introduced practical corrections into the succession by imprisoning or strangling inconvenient emperors, this operation was carried out for the last time on Paul in 1801. It is impossible to say, therefore, that a palace revolution would have transgressed the traditions of the Russian monarchy. On the contrary, it had been a steady element in those traditions. But the aristocracy had long ceased to feel strong at heart. It surrendered the honor of strangling the Tsar and Tsarina to the bourgeoisie. But the leaders of the latter showed little more resolution. Since the revolution, references have been made more than once to the liberal capitalists Kuchkov and Dereshkenko, and to General Krymov, who was close to them, as the nucleus of the conspirators. 
Guchkov and Tiresh Kenko themselves have confirmed this, but indefinitely. The former volunteer in the Army of the Boers against England, the duelist Guchkov, a liberal with spurs, must have seemed to social opinion in a general way the most suitable figure for a conspiracy. Surely not the wordy Professor Miliukov. Guchkov undoubtedly recurred more than once in his thoughts to the short and sharp blow in which one regiment of the guard would replace and forestall the revolution. Wood in his memoirs had already told on Guchkov, whom he hated, as an admirer of the young Turk methods of disposing of an inconvenient sultan. But Guchkov, having never succeeded in his youth in displaying his young Turkish audacity, had had time to grow much older. And more important, this henchman of Stolypin could not help but see the difference between Russian conditions and the old Turkish conditions, could not fail to ask himself, will not the palace revolution, instead of a means for preventing a real revolution, turn out to be the last jar that looses the avalanche? May not the cure prove more ruinous than the disease? In the literature devoted to the February Revolution the preparation of a palace revolution is spoken of as a firmly established fact. Miliukov puts it thus, its realization was already on the way in February. Denikin transfers its realization to March. Both mention a plan to stop the Tsar's train in transit, demand an abdication, and in case of refusal, which was considered inevitable, carry out a physical removal of the Tsar. Miliukov adds that, foreseeing a possible revolution, the heads of the progressive bloc, who did not participate in the plot, and were not accurately informed of its preparation, talked over in narrow circle how best to make use of the coup d'etat in case of success. Certain Marxist investigations of recent years also take on faith the story of the practical preparation of a coup d'etat. By that example we may learn how easily and firmly legends win a place in historical science. As chief evidence of the plot, they not infrequently advance a certain colorful tale of Rodzi and Co., which testifies to the very fact that there was no plot. In January 1917 General Krimov arrived from the front and complained before members of the Duma that things could not continue longer as they were, if you decide upon this extreme measure replacement of the Tsar, we will support you. If you decide. The Octoberist Shudlovsky angrily exclaimed, there is no need to pity or spare him when he is ruining Russia. In the noisy argument these real or imaginary words of Bruslov are also reported, if it is necessary to choose between the Tsar and Russia, I side with Russia. If it is necessary. The young millionaire Tereshkenko spoke as an inflexible Tsarisite. The Kutschingraf spoke, the general is right, an overturn is necessary. But who will resolve upon it? That is just the question, who will resolve upon it? Such is the essence of the testimony of Rodzi and Co., who himself spoke against an overturn. In the course of the few following weeks, the plan apparently did not move forward an inch. They conversed about stopping the Tsar's train, but it is quite unknown who was to carry out that operation. Russian liberalism, when it was younger, had supported the revolutionary terrorists with money and sympathy in the hope that they would drive the monarchy into its arms with their bombs. None of those respected gentlemen was accustomed to risk his own head. But all the same, the chief role was played not by personal but by class fear, things are bad now, they reasoned, but they might get worse. In any case, if Guchkov, Tereshkenko, and Krimov had seriously moved toward a coup d'etat, that is, practically prepared it, mobilizing the necessary forces and means, that would have been established definitely and accurately after the revolution. For the participants, especially the active young men of whom not a few would have been needed, would have had no reason to keep mum about the almost accomplished deed. After February, this would only have assured them a career. However, there were no revelations. It is quite obvious that the affair never went any further with Krimov and Guchkov than patriotic sighs over wine and cigars. The light-minded frondas of the aristocracy, like the heavyweight oppositionists of the plutocracy, could not find the heart to amend by action the course of an unpropitious providence. In May 1917, one of the most eloquent and empty liberals, Maklukov, 
will cry out at a private conference of that Duma which the revolution will sweep away along with the monarchy, if a posterity curses this revolution they will curse us for having been unable to prevent it in time with a revolution from above. Still later, when he is already in exile, Kierensky, following Maklikov will lament, yes, enfranchised Russia was too slow with its timely coup d'etat from above, of which they talked so much, and for which they prepared, so much she was too slow to forestall the spontaneous explosion of the state. These two exclamations complete the picture of how, even after the revolution had unleashed its unconquerable forces, educated nincompoops continued to think that it could have been forestalled by a timely change of dynastic figureheads. The determination was lacking for a big palace revolution. But out of it there arose a plan for a small one. The liberal conspirators did not dare to remove the chief actor of the monarchy, but the Grand Dukes decided to remove its prompter. In the murder of Rasputin they saw the last means of saving the dynasty. Prince Yusupov, who was married to a Romanov, drew into the affair the Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich and the monarchist deputy Purishkovich. They also tried to involve the liberal Maklikov, obviously to give the murder an all national character. The celebrated lawyer wisely declined, supplying the conspirators, however, with poison, a rather stylistic distinction. The conspirators judged, not without foundation, that a Romanov automobile would facilitate the removal of the body after the murder. The Grand Ducal coat of arms had found its use at last. The rest was carried out in the manner of a moving picture scenario designed for people of bad taste. On the night of the 16th 17th of December, Rasputin, coaxed into a little party, was murdered in Yuzapov's maisonette. The ruling classes, with the exception of a narrow Camarilla and the mystic worshippers, greeted the murder of Rasputin as an act of salvation. The Grand Duke, placed under house arrest, his hands, according to the Tsar's expression, stained with the blood of a muzik, although a Christ, still a muzik exclamation mark was visited with sympathy by all the members of the imperial household then in Petersburg. The Tsarina's own sister, widow of the Grand Duke Sergei, telegraphed that she was praying for the murderers and calling down blessings on their patriotic act. The newspapers, until they were forbidden to mention Rasputin, printed ecstatic articles. In the theatres, people tried to demonstrate in honour of the murderers. Passers-by congratulated one another in the streets. In private houses, in officers' meetings, in restaurants, relates Prince Yusupov, they drank to our health, the workers in the factories cried hurrah for us. We may well concede that the workers did not grieve when they learned of the murder of Rasputin, but their cries of hurrah had nothing in common with the hope for a rebirth of the dynasty. The Rasputin Camarilla dropped out of sight and waited. They buried Rasputin in secrecy from the whole world, the Tsar, the Tsarina, the Tsar's daughters and Virubova. Around the body of the Holy Friend, the former horse thief murdered by Grand Dukes, the Tsar's family must have seemed outcast even to themselves. However, even after he was buried, Rasputin did not find peace. Later on, when Nicholas and Alexandra Romanov were under house arrest, the soldiers of Tsar Skusilo dug up the grave and opened the coffin. At the head of the murdered man lay an icon with the signatures, Alexandra, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, Anya. The provisional government for some reason sent an emissary to bring the body to Petrograd. A crowd resisted and the emissary was compelled to burn the body on the spot. After the murder of its friend, the monarchy survived in all ten weeks. But this short space of time was still its own. Rasputin was no longer, but his shadow continued to rule. Contrary to all the expectations of the conspirators, the royal pair began after the murder to promote with special determination the most scorned members of the Rasputin clique. In revenge for Rasputin, a notorious scoundrel was named Minister of Justice. A number of Grand Dukes were banished from the capital. It was rumoured that Protopopov took up spiritualism, calling up the ghost of Rasputin. The noose of hopelessness was drawing tighter. The murder of Rasputin played a colossal role, 
but a very different one from that upon which its perpetrators and inspirers had counted. It did not weaken the crisis, but sharpened it. People talked of the murder everywhere, in the palaces, in the staffs, at the factories, and in the peasants' huts. The inference drew itself, even the Grand Dukes have no other recourse against the leprous Camarilla except poison and the revolver. The poet Bloch wrote of the murder of Rasputin, the bullet which killed him reached the very heart of the ruling dynasty. Robespierre once reminded the Legislative Assembly that the opposition of the nobility, by weakening the monarchy, had roused the bourgeoisie, and after them the popular masses. Robespierre gave warning at the same time that in the rest of Europe the revolution could not develop so swiftly as in France, for the privileged classes of other countries, taught by the experience of the French nobility, would not take the revolutionary initiative. In giving this admirable analysis, Robespierre was mistaken only in his assumption that with its oppositional recklessness the French nobility had given a lesson once and for all to other countries. Russia proved again, both in 1905 and yet more in 1917, that a revolution directed against an autocratic and half-feudal regime, and consequently against a nobility, meets in its first step an unsystematic and inconsistent but nevertheless very real cooperation not only from the rank and file nobility, but also from its most privileged upper circles, including here even members of the dynasty. This remarkable historic phenomenon may seem to contradict the class theory of society, but in reality it contradicts only its vulgar interpretation. A revolution breaks out when all the antagonisms of a society have reached their highest tension. But this makes the situation unbearable even for the classes of the old society, that is, those who are doomed to break up. Although I do not want to give a biological analogy more weight than it deserves. It is worth remarking that the natural act of birth becomes at a certain moment equally unavoidable both for the maternal organism and for the offspring. The opposition put up by the privileged classes expresses the incompatibility of their traditional social position with the demands of the further existence of society. Everything seems to slip out of the hands of the ruling bureaucracy. The aristocracy finding itself in the focus of a general hostility lays the blame upon the bureaucracy. The latter blames the aristocracy, and then together, or separately, they direct their discontent against the monarchical summit of their power. Prince Sherbatov, summoned into the ministry for a time from his service in the hereditary institutions of the nobility, said, Both Samarin and I are former heads of the nobility in our provinces. Up till now nobody has ever considered us as lefts and we do not consider ourselves so. But we can neither of us understand a situation in a state where the monarch and his government find themselves in radical disagreement with all reasonable, we are not talking here of revolutionary intrigue, society, with the nobility, the merchants, the cities, the zemstvos, and even the army. If those above do not want to listen to our opinion, it is our duty to withdraw. The nobility sees the cause of all its misfortunes in the fact that the monarchy is blind or has lost its reason. The privileged caste cannot believe that no policy whatever is possible which would reconcile the old society with the new. In other words, the nobility cannot accept its own doom and converts its death weariness into opposition against the most sacred power of the old regime, that is, the monarchy. The sharpness and irresponsibility of the aristocratic opposition is explained by histories having made spoiled children of the upper circles of the nobility, and by the unbearableness to them of their own fears in face of revolution. The unsystematic and inconsistent character of the noble discontent is explained by the fact that it is the opposition of a class which has no future. But as a lamp before it goes out flares up with a bright hollow smoky light, so the nobility before disappearing gives out an oppositional flash, which performs a mighty service for its mortal enemy. Such is the dialectic of this process, which is not only consistent with the class theory of society, but can only by this theory be explained. Six, the death agony of the monarchy the dynasty fell by shaking, like rotten fruit, before the revolution even had time to approach its first problems. 
Our portrayal of the old ruling class would remain incomplete if we did not try to show how the monarchy met the hour of its fall. The Tsar was at headquarters at Mogilev, having gone there not because he was needed, but in flight from the Petrograd disorders. The court chronicler, General Dubinsky, with the Tsar at headquarters, noted in his diary, A quiet life begins here. Everything will remain as before. Nothing will come of his, the Tsar's, presence. Only accidental external causes will change anything. On February 24, the Tsarina wrote Nicholas at headquarters, in English as always, I hope that Duma man Kedrinsky, she means Kierinsky, will be hung for his horrible speeches, it is necessary, wartime law, and it will be an example. All that thirsting and beseeching that you show your firmness. On February 25th, a telegram came from the Minister of War that strikes were occurring in the capital, disorders beginning among the workers, but measures had been taken and there was nothing serious. In a word, it isn't the first time, and won't be the last. The Tsarina, who had always taught the Tsar not to yield, here too tried to remain firm. On the 26th, with an obvious desire to hold up the shaky courage of Nicholas, she telegraphs him, it is calm in the city. But in her evening telegram she has to confess, things are not going at all well in the city. In a letter she says, you must say to the workers that they must not declare strikes, if they do, they will be sent to the front as a punishment. There is no need at all of shooting. Only order is needed, and not to let them cross the bridges. Yes, only a little thing is needed, only order. But the chief thing is not to admit the workers into the city, let them choke in the raging impotence of their suburbs. On the morning of the 27th, General Ivanov moves from the front with the battalion of St. George, entrusted with dictatorial powers, which he is to make public, however, only upon occupying Zasku Silo. It would be hard to imagine a more unsuitable person, General Denikin will recall later, himself having taken a turn at military dictatorship a flabby old man, me agely grasping the political situation, possessing neither strength, nor energy, nor will, nor austerity. The choice fell upon Ivanov through memories of the first revolution. Eleven years before that he had subdued Kronstadt. But those years had left their traces. The subduers had grown flabby, the subdued, strong. The northern and western fronts were ordered to get ready troops for the march on Petrograd, Evidently everybody thought there was plenty of time ahead. Ivanov himself assumed that the affair would be ended soon and successfully, he even remembered to send out an adjutant to buy provisions in Mogilev for his friends in Petrograd. On the morning of February 27, Rodzienko sent the Tsar a new telegram, which ended with the words, The last hour has come when the fate of the fatherland and the dynasty is being decided. The Tsar said to his minister of the court, Fredericks, Again that fat belly Drodzienki has written me a lot of nonsense, which I won't even bother to answer. But no. It was not nonsense. He will have to answer. About noon of the 27th, headquarters received a report from Kabalov of the mutiny of the Pavlovsky, Volinsky, Litovsky, and Preobrazensky regiments, and the necessity of sending reliable troops from the front. An hour later from the war ministry came a most reassuring telegram, the disorders which began this morning in certain military units are being firmly and energetically put down by companies and battalions loyal to their duty. I am firmly convinced of an early restoration of tranquility. However, a little after seven in the evening, the same minister, Belief, is reporting that we are not succeeding in putting down the military rebellion with the few detachments that remain loyal to their duty, and requesting a speedy dispatch of really reliable troops, and that too in sufficient numbers for simultaneous activity in different parts of the city. The Council of Ministers deemed this a suitable day to remove from their midst the presumed cause of all misfortunes, the half-crazy Minister of the Interior Protopopov. At the same time General Kabul issued an edict, prepared in secrecy from the government, declaring Petrograd, on His Majesty's orders, under martial law. So here too was an attempt to mix hot with cold, hardly intentional, however, and anyway of no use.
they did not even succeed in pasting up the declaration of martial law through the city, the Bergmaster, Balker, could find neither paste nor brushes. Nothing would stick together for those functionaries any longer, they already belonged to the kingdom of shades. The principal shade of the last Tsarist ministry was the 70 year old Prince Golitsyn, who had formerly conducted some sort of elite missionary institutions of the Tsarina, and had been advanced by her to the post of head of the government in a period of war and revolution. When friends asked this good natured Russian squire, this old weakling as the liberal Baron Nolder described him, why he accepted such a troublesome position, Golitsyn answered, so as to have one more pleasant recollection. This aim, at any rate, he did not achieve. How the last Tsarist government felt in those hours is attested by Rodzi and Co in the following tale, with the first news of the movement of a crowd toward the Mariinsky Palace, where the ministry was in session, all the lights in the building were immediately put out. The government wanted only one thing, that the revolution should not notice it. The rumor, however, proved false, the attack did not take place, and when the lights were turned on, one of the members of the Tsarist government was found to his own surprise under the table. What kind of recollections he was accumulating there has not been established. But Rodzi and Co's own feelings apparently were not at their highest point. After a long but vain hunt for the government by telephone, the president of the Duma tries again to ring up Prince Golitsyn. The latter answers him, I beg you not to come to me with anything further, I have resigned. Hearing this news, Rodzi and Co, according to his loyal secretary, sank heavily in an armchair and covered his face with both hands. My God, how horrible! Without a government. Anarchy. Blood, and softly wept. At the expiring of the senile ghost of the Tsarist power, Rodzi and Co felt unhappy, desolate, often. How far he was at that moment from the thought that tomorrow he would have to head revolution. The telephone answer of Golitsyn is explained by the fact that on the evening of the 27th the Council of Ministers had definitely acknowledged itself incapable of handling the situation, and proposed to the Tsar to place at the head of the government a man enjoying general confidence. The Tsar answered Golitsyn, in regard to changes in the personal staff in the present circumstances, I consider that inadmissible. Nicholas. Just what circumstances was he waiting for? At the same time the Tsar demanded that they adopt the most decisive measures for putting down the rebellion. That was easier said than done. On the next day, the 28th, even the untamable Tsarina at last loses heart. Concessions are necessary, she telegraphs Nicholas. The strikes continue, many troops have gone over to the side of the revolution. Alex. It required an insurrection of the whole guard, the entire garrison to compel this Hessian zealot of autocracy to agree that concessions are necessary. Now the Tsar also begins to suspect that the fat-bellied Rodzian K had not telegraphed nonsense. Nicholas decides to join his family. It is possible that he is a little gently pushed from behind by the generals of the staff, too, who are not feeling quite comfortable. The Tsar's train travelled at first without mishap. Local chiefs and governors came out as usual to meet him. Far from the revolutionary whirlpool, in his accustomed royal car, surrounded by the usual suite, the Tsar apparently again lost a sense of the close coming crisis. At three o'clock on the 28th, when the events had already settled his fate, he sent a telegram to the Tsarina from Vyazma, wonderful weather. Hope you are well and calm. Many troops sent from the front. With tender love. Nikki. Instead of the concessions, upon which even the Tsarina is insisting, the tenderly loving Tsar is sending troops from the front. But in spite of that wonderful weather, in just a few hours the Tsar will stand face to face with the revolutionary storm. His train went as far as the vicious station. The railroad workers would not let it go farther, the bridge is damaged. Most likely this pretext was invented by the courtiers themselves in order to soften the situation. Nicholas tried to make his way, or they tried to get him through, by way of Bologo on the Nikolfsk railroad, but here too the workers would not let the train pass. This was far more palpable than all the Petrograd telegrams. 
Dezar had broken away from headquarters, and could not make his way to the capital. With its simple railroad pawns, the revolution had cried check to the king. The court historian Dubinsky, who accompanied the Tsar in his train, writes in his diary, Everybody realizes that this midnight turn at Fisher is a historical night. To me it is perfectly clear that the question of a constitution is settled, it will surely be introduced. Everybody is saying that it is only necessary to strike a bargain with them, with the members of the provisional government. Facing a lowered semaphore, behind which mortal danger is thickening, Count Fredericks, Prince Dolgoraki, Count Luchtenberg, all of them, all those high lords, are now for a constitution. They no longer think of struggling. It is only necessary to strike a bargain, that is, try to fool them again as in 1905. While the train was wandering and finding no road, their Tsarina was sending the Tsar telegram after telegram, appealing to him to return as soon as possible. But her telegrams came back to her from the office with the inscription in blue pencil, whereabouts of the address unknown. The telegraph clerks were unable to locate the Russians are. The regiments marched with music and banners to the Tauride Palace. A company of the guards marched under the command of Cyril Vladimirovich, who had quite suddenly, according to Countess Klimichael, developed a revolutionary streak. The sentries disappeared. The intimates were abandoning the palace. Everybody was saving himself who could, relates Verubova. Bands of revolutionary soldiers wandered about the palace and with eager curiosity looked over everything. Before they had decided up above what should be done, the lower ranks were converting the palace of the Tsar into a museum. The Tsar, his location unknown, turns back to Skov, to the headquarters of the Northern Front, commanded by the old General Rossky. In the Tsar's suite one suggestion follows another. The Tsar procrastinates. He is still reckoning in days and weeks, while the revolution is keeping its count in minutes. The poet Bloch characterized the Tsar during the last months of the monarchy as follows, stubborn, but without will, nervous, but insensitive to everything, distrustful of people, taut and cautious in speech, he was no longer master of himself. He had ceased to understand the situation and did not take one clearly conscious step, but gave himself over completely into the hands of those whom he himself had placed in power. And how much these traits of tautness and lack of will, cautiousness and distrust, were to increase during the last days of February and first days of March. Nicholas finally decided to send, and nevertheless evidently did not send, a telegram to the hated Rodzienko stating that for the salvation of the fatherland he appointed him to form a new ministry, reserving, however, the ministries of foreign affairs, war and marine for himself. The Tsar still hoped to bargain with them. The many troops, after all, were on their way to Petrograd. General Ivanov actually arrived without hindrance at Tsarsku Silo. Evidently the railroad workers did not care to come in conflict with the battalion of St. George. The general confessed later that he had three or four times found it necessary on the march to use fatherly influence with the lower ranks, who were impudent to him, he made them get down on their knees. Immediately upon the arrival of the dictator in Tsarsku Silo, the local authorities informed him that an encounter between the battalion of St. George and the troops would mean danger to the Tsar's family. They were simply afraid for themselves and advised the dictator to go back without detraining. General Ivanov telegraphed to the other dictator, Kabilov, in Petrograd ten questions, to which he received succinct answers, we will quote them in full, for they deserve it. Ivanov's questions, 1. How many troops are in order and how many are misbehaving? Question mark 2. Which railroad stations are guarded? Question mark 3. In what parts of the city is order preserved? Question mark 4. What authorities are governing the different parts of the city? Question mark 5. Are all the ministries functioning properly? Question mark 6. What police forces are at your disposal at the present moment? Question mark 7. What technical and supply institutions of the War Department are now in your control? Question mark 8. What quantity of provisions is at your disposal? Question mark 9. Have many weapons, artillery, 
and military stores fallen into the hands of the mutineers? Question mark 10. What military forces and their staffs are in your control? Karbalov's replies, 1. I have at my disposal in the Admiralty building four companies of the Guard, five squadrons of cavalry and Cossacks, and two batteries, the rest of the troops have gone over to the revolutionists, or by agreement with them are remaining neutral. Soldiers are wandering through the towns singly or in bands disarming officers. Two. All the stations are in the hands of the revolutionists and strictly guarded by them. Three. The whole city is in the hands of the revolutionists. The telephone is not working, there is no communication between different parts of the city. Four. I cannot answer this question. Five. The ministers have been arrested by the revolutionists. Six. None whatever. Seven. I have none. Eight. There are no provisions at my disposal. In the city on February 5th, there were five million six hundred thousand pounds of flour in store. Nine. All the artillery establishments are in the hands of the revolutionists. Ten. The chief of the staff of the district is in my personal control. With the other district administrations I have no connections. Having received this unequivocal illumination as to the situation, General Ivanov agreed to turn back his echelon without detraining to the station. No. 6. Thus, concludes one of the chief personages of the staff, General Lukomsky, nothing came of the expedition of General Ivanov with dictatorial powers but a public disgrace. That disgrace, incidentally, was a very quiet one sinking unnoticed in the billowing events. The dictator, we may suppose, delivered the provisions to his friends in Petrograd, and had a long chat with the Tsarina. She referred to her self-sacrifice in work in the hospitals, and complained of the ingratitude of the army and the people. During this time news was arriving at Skov by way of Mogilev, blacker and blacker. His Majesty's own bodyguard, in which every soldier was known by name and coddled by the royal family, turned up at the state duma asking permission to arrest those officers who had refused to take part in the insurrection. Vice Admiral Kirosh reported that he found it impossible to take any measures to put down the insurrection at Kronstadt, since he could not vouch for the loyalty of a single detachment. Admiral Nepanin telegraphed that the Baltic fleet had recognized the provisional committee of the state duma. The Moscow commander-in-chief, Mrozovsky, telegraphed, a majority of the troops have gone over with artillery to the revolutionists. The whole town is therefore in their hands. The Bergmaster and his aide have left the city hall. Have left means that they fled. All this was communicated to the Tsar on the evening of March 1st. Deep into the night, they coaxed and argued about a responsible ministry. Finally. At two o'clock in the morning, the Tsar gave his consent, and those around him drew a sigh of relief. Since they took it for granted that this would settle the problem of the revolution, an order was issued at the same time that the troops which had been sent to Petrograd to put down the insurrection should return to the front. Ruski hurried at dawn to convey the good news to Rodzienko. But the Tsar's clock was way behind. Rodzienko in the Torride Palace, already buried under a pile of Democrats, Socialists, soldiers, workers' deputies, replied to Rossky, your proposal is not enough, it is now a question of the dynasty itself. Everywhere the troops are taking the side of the Duma, and the people are demanding an abdication in favor of the heir with Mikhail Alexandrovich as regent. Of course the troops never thought of demanding either the heir or Mikhail Alexandrovich. Rodzienko merely attributed to the troops and the people that slogan upon which the Duma was still hoping to stop the revolution. But in either case the Tsar's concession had come too late, the anarchy has reached such proportions that I, Rodzienko, was this night compelled to appoint a provisional government. Unfortunately, the edict has come too late. These majestic words bear witness that the president of the Duma had succeeded in drying the tears shed over Golitsyn. The Tsar read the conversation between Rodzienko and Rossky, and hesitated, read it over again, and decided to wait. But now the military chiefs had begun to sound the alarm, the matter concerned them too a little. 
General Alexov carried out during the hours of that night a sort of plebiscite among the commanders in chief at the fronts. It is a good thing present day revolutions are accomplished with the help of the telegraph, so that the very first impulses and reactions of those in power are preserved to history on the tape. The conversations of the Tsarist field marshals on the night of March the 1st to the 2nd are an incomparable human document. Should the Tsar abdicate or not? The commander in chief of the Western Front, General Levert, consented to give his opinion only after Generals Rusky and Bruslov had expressed themselves. The commander in chief of the Romanian Front, General Sakharov, demanded that before he express himself the conclusions of all the other commanders in chief should be communicated to him. After long delays, this valiant chieftain announced that his warm love for the monarch would not permit his soul to reconcile itself with an acceptance of the base suggestion, nevertheless, with sobs he advised the Tsar to abdicate in order to avoid still viler pretensions. Adjutant General Levert quite reasonably explained the necessity for capitulation. I am taking all measures to prevent information as to the present situation in the capital from penetrating the army, in order to protect it against indubitable disturbances. No means exist for putting down the revolution in the capitals. Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich on the Caucasian front beseeched the Tsar on bended knee to adopt the supermeasure and renounce the throne. A similar prayer came from Generals Alexov and Braslov and Admiral Nepanin. Rusky spoke orally to the same effect. The generals respectfully presented seven revolver barrels to the temple of the adored monarch. Fearing to let slip the moment for reconciliation with the new power, and no less fearing their own troops, these military chieftains, accustomed as they were to surrendering positions, gave the Tsar and the high commander in chief a quite unanimous counsel retire without fighting. This was no longer distant Petrograd against which, as it seemed, one might send troops, this was the front from which the troops had to be borrowed. Having listened to this suggestively circumstanced report, the Tsar decided to abdicate the throne which he no longer possessed. A telegram to Rodzi and Co suitable to the occasion was drawn up, there is no sacrifice that I would not make in the name of the real welfare and salvation of my native mother Russia. Thus I am ready to abdicate the throne in favor of my son, and in order that he may remain with me until he is of age, under the regency of my brother, Mikhail Alexandrovich. Nicholas. This telegram too, however, was not dispatched, for news came from the capital of the departure for Skov of the deputies Guchkov and Shulgin. This offered a new pretext to postpone the decision. The Tsar ordered the telegram returned to him. He obviously dreaded to sell too cheap, and still hoped for comforting news, or more accurately, hoped for a miracle. Nicholas received the two deputies at twelve o'clock midnight March the second to the third. The miracle did not come, and it was impossible to evade longer. The Tsar unexpectedly announced that he could not part with his son, what vague helps were then wandering in his head question mark and signed an abdication in favor of his brother. At the same time, Edicts to the Senate were signed, naming Prince Lvov President of the Council of Ministers, and Nikolai Nikolaevich Supreme Commander-in-Chief. The family suspicions of the Tsarina seemed to have been justified, the hated Nikolasha came back to power along with the conspirators. Guchkov apparently seriously believed that the revolution would accept the most august war chief. The latter also accepted his appointment in good faith. He even tried for a few days to give some kind of orders and make appeals for the fulfillment of patriotic duty. However, the revolution painlessly removed him. In order to preserve the appearance of a free act, the abdication was dated three o'clock in the afternoon, on the pretense that the original decision of the Tsar to abdicate had taken place at that hour. But as a matter of fact, that afternoon's decision, which gave the scepter to his son and not to his brother, had been taken back in anticipation of a more favorable turn of the wheel. Of that, however, nobody spoke out loud. The Tsar made a last effort to save his face before the hated deputies, who upon their part permitted this falsification of a historic act, this deceiving of the people. The monarchy retired from the scene preserving its usual style, 
and its successors also remained true to themselves. They probably even regarded their connivance as the magnanimity of a conqueror to the conquered. Departing a little from the phlegmatic style of his diary, Nicholas writes on March 2nd, This morning Ruski came and read me a long conversation over the wire with Rodzienko. According to his words, the situation in Petrograd is such that a ministry of the members of the State Duma will be powerless to do anything for it is being opposed by the Social Democratic Party in the person of a workers' committee. My abdication is necessary. Rusky transmitted this conversation to Alexaford headquarters and to all the commanders-in-chief. Answers arrived at 12.30. To save Russia and keep the army at the front, I decided upon this step. I agreed, and they sent from headquarters the text of an abdication. In the evening came Guchkov and Shulbin from Petrograd, with whom I talked it over and gave them the document amended and signed. At one o'clock in the morning I left Skov with heavy feelings, around me treason, cowardice, deceit. The bitterness of Nicholas was, we must confess, not without foundation. It was only as short a time ago as February 28, that General Alexev had telegraphed to all the commanders-in-chief at the front, Upon us all lies a sacred duty before the sovereign and the fatherland to preserve loyalty to oath and duty in the troops of the active army. Two days later Alexev appealed to these same commanders-in-chief to violate their loyalty to oath and duty. In all the commanding staff there was not found one man to take action on behalf of his Tsar. They all hastened to transfer to the ship of the revolution, firmly expecting to find comfortable cabins there. Generals and admirals one and all removed the Tsarist braid and put on the red ribbon. There was news subsequently of one single righteous soul, some commander of a corps, who died of heart failure taking the new oath. But it is not established that his heart failed through injured monarchist feelings, and not through other causes. The civil officials naturally were not obliged to show more courage than the military. Each one was saving himself as he could. Dot, but the clock of the monarchy decidedly did not coincide with the revolutionary clocks. At dawn of March 3, Ruski was again summoned to the direct wire from the capital. Rodzienko and Prince Lvov were demanding that he hold up the Tsar's abdication, which had again proved too late. The installation of Alexei, said the new authorities evasively, might perhaps be accepted by whom question mark but the installation of Mikhail was absolutely unacceptable. Ruski with some venom expressed his regret that the deputies of the Duma who had arrived the night before had not been sufficiently informed as to the aims and purposes of their journey. But here too the deputies had their justification. Unexpectedly to us all there broke out such a soldier's rebellion as I never saw the like of, explained the Lord Chamberlain to Ruski as though he had done nothing all his life but watch soldiers' rebellions. To proclaimed Mikhail Emperor would pour royal on the fire and there would begin a ruthless extermination of everything that can be exterminated. How it whirls and shakes and bends and contorts them all. The generals silently swallowed this new vile pretension of the revolution. Alexa alone slightly relieved his spirit in a telegraphic bulletin to the commanders-in-chief. The left parties and the workers' deputies are exercising a powerful pressure upon the president of the Duma, and there is no frankness or sincerity in the communications of Rodzienko. The only thing lacking to the generals in those hours was sincerity. But at this point the Tsar again changed his mind. Arriving in Mogilev from Skov, he handed to his former chief of staff, Alexev, for transmission to Petrograd a sheet of paper with his consent to the handing over of the scepter to his son. Evidently he found this combination in the long run more promising. Alexev, according to Denikin's story, went away with the telegram and Dot did not send it. He thought that those two manifestos which had already been published to the army and the country were enough. The discord arose from the fact that not only the Tsar and his counsellors, but also the Duma liberals were thinking more slowly than the revolution. Before his final departure from Mogilev on March 8, the Tsar, already under formal arrest, wrote an appeal to the troops ending with these words, Whoever thinks now of peace, whoever desires it, that man is a traitor to the fatherland, its betrayer. 
this was in the nature of a prompted attempt to snatch out of the hands of liberalism the accusation of Germanophilism. The attempt had no result, they did not even dare publish the appeal. Thus ended a reign which had been a continuous chain of ill luck, failure, misfortune, and evil doing, from the Kodinka catastrophe during the coronation, through the shooting of strikers and revolting peasants, the Russo Japanese War, the frightful putting down of the revolution of 1905 the innumerable executions, punitive expeditions, and national pogroms, and ending with the insane and contemptible participation of Russia in the insane and contemptible world war. Upon arriving at Tsarsku Silo, where he and his family were confined in the palace, the Tsar, according to Virubova, softly said, There is no justice among men. But those very words irrefutably testify that historic justice, though it comes late, does exist. The similarity of the Romanov couple to the French royal pair of the epoch of the Great Revolution is very obvious. It has already been remarked in literature, but only in passing and without drawing inferences. Nevertheless, it is not at all accidental, as appears at the first glance, but offers valuable material for an inference. Although separated from each other by five quarter centuries, the Tsar and the king were at certain moments like two actors playing the same role. A passive, patient, but vindictive treachery was the distinctive trait of both, with this difference, that in Louis it was disguised with a dubious kindliness, in Nicholas with affability. They both make the impression of people who are overburdened by their job, but at the same time unwilling to give up even a part of those rights of which they are unable to make any use. The diaries of both similar in style or lack of style, reveal the same depressing spiritual emptiness. The Austrian woman and the Hessian German form also a striking symmetry. Both queens stand above their kings, not only in physical but also in moral growth. Marie Antoinette was less pious than Alexandra Fodorovna, and unlike the latter was passionately fond of pleasures. But both alike scorned the people, could not endure thought of concessions alike mistrusted the courage of their husbands, looking down upon them, Antoinette with a shade of contempt, Alexandra with pity. When the authors of memoirs, approaching the Petersburg court of their day, assure us that Nicholas too, had he been a private individual, would have left a good memory behind him, they merely reproduce the long ago stereotyped remarks about Louis XVI, not enriching in the least our knowledge either of history or of human nature. We have already seen how Prince Lvov became indignant when, at the height of the tragic events of the First Revolution, instead of a depressed Tsar, he found before him a jolly, sprightly little man in a raspberry colored shirt. Without knowing it, the prince merely repeated the comment of Gouverne Morris writing in Washington in 1790 about Louis What will you have from a creature who, situated as he is, eats and drinks and sleeps well, and laughs and is as merry a grig as lives. When Alexandra Fodorovna, three months before the fall of the monarchy, prophesies, all is coming out for the best, the dreams of our friend mean so much. She merely repeats Marie Antoinette, who one month before the overthrow of the royal power wrote, I feel a liveliness of spirit, and something tells me that we shall soon be happy and safe. They both see rainbow dreams as they drown. Certain elements of similarity, of course, are accidental, and have the interest only of historic anecdotes. Infinitely more important are those traits of character which have been grafted, or more directly imposed, on a person by the mighty force of conditions, and which throw a sharp light on the interrelation of personality and the objective factors of history. He did not know how to wish, that was his chief trait of character says a reactionary French historian of Louis. Those words might have been written of Nicholas, neither of them knew how to wish, but both knew how to not wish. But what really could be wished by the last representatives of a hopelessly lost historic cause? Usually he listened, smiled, and rarely decided upon anything. His first word was usually no. Of whom is that written? Again of Capet. But if this is so, the manners of Nicholas were an absolute plagiarism. They both go toward the abyss with the crown pushed down over their eyes. But would it after all be easy to go to an abyss, which you cannot escape anyway, with your eyes open? 
what difference would it have made, as a matter of fact, if they had pushed the crown way back on their heads? Some professional psychologist ought to draw up an anthology of the parallel expressions of Nicholas and Louis, Alexandru and Antoinette, and their courtiers. There would be no lack of material, and the result would be a highly instructive historic testimony in favor of the materialist psychology. Similar, of course, far from identical, irritations in similar conditions call out similar reflexes, the more powerful the irritation the sooner it overcomes personal peculiarities. To a tickle, people react differently, but to a red hot iron, alike. As a steam hammer converts a sphere and a cube like into sheet metal, so under the blow of two great and inexorable events resistances are smashed and the boundaries of individuality lost. Louis and Nicholas were the last born of a dynasty that had lived tumultuously. The well-known equability of them both, their tranquility and gaiety in difficult moments, were the well-bred expression of a me-ageness of inner powers, a weakness of the nervous discharge, poverty of spiritual resources. Moral castrates. They were absolutely deprived of imagination and creative force. They had just enough brains to feel their own triviality, and they cherished an envious hostility toward everything gifted and significant. It fell to them both to rule a country in conditions of deep inner crisis and popular revolutionary awakening. Both of them fought off the intrusion of new ideas, and the tide of hostile forces. Indecisiveness, hypocrisy, and lying were in both cases the expression, not so much of personal weakness, as of the complete impossibility of holding fast to their hereditary positions. And how was it with their wives? Alexandra, even more than Antoinette, was lifted to the very heights of the dreams of a princess, especially such a rural one as this Hessian, by her marriage with the unlimited despot of a powerful country. Both of them were filled to the brim with the consciousness of their high mission, and were net more frivolously, Alexandra in a spirit of Protestant bigotry translated into the Slavonic language of the Russian church. An unlucky reign and a growing discontent of the people ruthlessly destroyed the fantastic world which these two enterprising but nevertheless chicken-like heads had built for themselves. Hence the growing bitterness, the gnawing hostility to an alien people that would not bow before them, the hatred toward ministers who wanted to give even a little consideration to that hostile world, to the country, hence their alienation even from their own court and their continued irritation against a husband who had not fulfilled the expectations aroused by him as a bridegroom. Historians and biographers of the psychological tendency not infrequently seek and find something purely personal and accidental where great historical forces are refracted through a personality. This is the same fault of vision as that of the courtiers who considered the last Russians are born unlucky. He himself believed that he was born under an unlucky star. In reality his ill luck flowed from the contradictions between those old aims which he inherited from his ancestors and the new historic conditions in which he was placed. When the ancients said that Jupiter first makes mad those who whom he wishes to destroy, they summed up in superstitious form a profound historic observation. In the saying of Goethe about reason becoming nonsense vernonft word once in this same thought is expressed about the impersonal Jupiter of the historical dialectic, which withdraws reason from historic institutions that have outlived themselves and condemns their defenders to failure. The scripts for the roles of Romanov and Caput were prescribed by the general development of the historic drama, only the nuances of interpretation fell to the lot of the actors. The ill luck of Nicholas, as of Louis, had its roots not in his personal horoscope, but in the historical horoscope of the bureaucratic caste monarchy. They were both, chiefly and above all, the last born offspring of absolutism. Their moral insignificance, deriving from their dynastic epigonism, gave the latter an especially malignant character. You might object, if Alexander III had drunk less he might have lived a good deal longer, the revolution would have run into a very different make of Tsar, and no parallel with Louis XVI would have been possible. Such an objection, however, does not refute in the least what has been said above. We do not at all pretend to deny the significance of the personal in the mechanics of the historic process, nor the significance in the personal of the accidental. 
We only demand that a historic personality, with all its peculiarities, should not be taken as a bare list of psychological traits, but as a living reality grown out of definite social conditions and reacting upon them. As a rose does not lose its fragrance because the natural scientist points out upon what ingredients of soil and atmosphere it has nourished, so an exposure of the social roots of a personality does not remove from it either its aroma or its foul smell. The consideration advanced above about a possible longer life of Alexander III is capable of illumining this very problem from another side. Let us assume that this Alexander III had not become mixed up in 1904 in a war with Japan. This would have delayed the first revolution. For how long? It is possible that the revolution of 1905 that is, the first test of strength, the first breach in the system of absolutism, would have been a mere introduction to the second, republican, and the third, proletarian revolution. Upon this question more or less interesting guesses are possible, but it is indubitable in any case that the revolution did not result from the character of Nicholas II, and that Alexander III would not have solved its problem. It is enough to remember that nowhere and never was the transition from the feudal to the bourgeois regime made without violent disturbances. We saw this only yesterday in China, today we observe it again in India. The most we can say is that this or that policy of the monarchy, this or that personality of the monarch, might have hastened or postponed the revolution, and placed a certain imprint on its external course. With what angry and impotent stubbornness Zarism tried to defend itself in those last months, weeks, and days, when its game was hopelessly lost. If Nicholas himself lacked the will, the lack was made up by the Tsarina. Rasputin was an instrument of the action of a clique which rapidly fought for self-preservation. Even on this narrow scale, the personality of the Tsar merges in a group which represents the coagulum of the past and its last convulsion. The policy of the upper circles at Tsarsku Silo, face to face with the revolution, were but the reflexes of a poisoned and weak beast of prey. If you chase a wolf over the step in an automobile, the beast gives out at last and lies down impotent. But attempt to put a collar on him, and he will try to tear you to pieces, or at least wound you. And indeed what else can he do in the circumstances? The liberals imagine there was something else he might do. Instead of coming to an agreement with the enfranchised bourgeoisie in good season, and thus preventing the revolution, such as liberalism's act of accusation against the last Tsar, Nicholas stubbornly shrank from concessions, and even in the last days when already under the knife of destiny, when every minute was to be counted, still kept on procrastinating, bargaining with fate, and letting slip the last possibilities. This all sounds convincing. But how unfortunate that liberalism, knowing so accurately how to save the monarchy, did not know how to save itself. It would be absurd to maintain that Tsarism never and in no circumstances made concessions. It made them when they were demanded by the necessity of self-preservation. After the Crimean defeat, Alexander II carried out the semi-liberation of the peasants and a series of liberal reforms in the sphere of land administration, courts, press, educational institutions, etc. The Tsar himself expressed the guiding thought of this reformation to free the peasants from above lest they free themselves from below. Under the drive of the first revolution, Nicholas II granted a semi-constitution. Stolypin scrapped the peasant communes in order to broaden the arena of the capitalist forces. For Tsarism, however, all these reforms had a meaning only insofar as the partial concession preserved the whole, that is, the foundations of a caste society and the monarchy itself. When the consequences of the reform began to splash over those boundaries, the monarchy inevitably beat a retreat. Alexander II in the second half of his reign stole back the reforms of the first half. Alexander III went still farther on the road of counter-reform. Nicholas II in October 1905 retreated before the revolution, and then afterward dissolved the Duma created by it, and as soon as the revolution grew weak, made his coup d'etat. Throughout three quarters of a century, if we begin with the reform of Alexander II, the developed a struggle of historic forces, now underground, now in the open, 
far transcending the personal qualities of the separate Tsars, and accomplishing the overthrow of the monarchy. Only within the historic framework of this process can you find a place for individual Tsars, their characters, their biographies. Even the most despotic of autocrats is but little similar to a free individuality laying its arbitrary imprint upon events. He is always the crowned agent of the privileged classes which are forming society in their own image. When these classes have not yet fulfilled their mission, then the monarchy is strong and self-confident. Then it has in its hands a reliable apparatus of power and an unlimited choice of executives, because the more gifted people have not yet gone over into the hostile camp. Then the monarch, either personally, or through the mediation of a powerful favorite, may become the agent of a great and progressive historic task. It is quite otherwise when the sun of the old society is finally declining to the west. The privileged classes are now changed from organizers of the national life into a parasitic growth, having lost their guiding function, they lose the consciousness of their mission and all confidence in their powers. Their dissatisfaction with themselves becomes a dissatisfaction with the monarchy, the dynasty becomes isolated, the circle of people loyal to the death narrows down, their level sinks slower, meanwhile the dangers grow, new forces are pushing up. The monarchy loses its capacity for any kind of creative initiative, it defends itself, it strikes back, it retreats, its activities acquire the automatism of mere reflexes. The semi-Asiatic despotism of the Romanovs did not escape this fate. If you take the Tsarism in its agony, in a vertical section, so to speak, Nicholas is the axis of a clique which has its roots in the hopelessly condemned past. In a horizontal section of the historic monarchy, Nicholas is the last link in a dynastic chain. His nearest ancestors, who also in their day were merged in a family, caste, and bureaucratic collectivity, only a broader one, tried out various measures and methods of government in order to protect the old social regime against the fate advancing upon it. But nevertheless they passed on to Nicholas a chaotic empire already carrying the matured revolution in its womb. If he had any choice left, it was only between different roads to ruin. Liberalism was dreaming of a monarchy on the British plan. But was parliamentarism born on the Thames by a peaceful evolution? Was it the fruit of the free foresight of a single monarch? No, it was deposited as the result of a struggle that lasted for ages and in which one of the kings left his head at the crossroads. The historic psychological contrast mentioned above between the Romanovs and the Capets can, by the way, be aptly extended to the British royal pair of the epoch of the First Revolution. Charles I revealed fundamentally the same combination of traits with which memoirists and historians have endowed Louis XVI and Nicholas II. Charles, therefore, remained passive, writes Montague yielded where he could not resist, betrayed how unwillingly he did so, and reaped no popularity, no confidence. He was not a stupid man, says another historian of Charles Stuart, but he lacked firmness of character. His evil fate was his wife, Henrietta, a French woman, sister of Louis XIII, saturated even more than Charles with the idea of absolutism. We will not detail the characteristics of this third chronologically first, royal pair to be crushed by a national revolution. We will merely observe that in England the hatred was concentrated above all on the Queen, as a French woman and a Papist, whom they accused of plotting with Rome, secret connections with the Irish rebels, and intrigues at the French court. But England had, at any rate, ages at her disposal. She was the pioneer of bourgeois civilization, she was not under the yoke of other nations, but on the contrary held them more and more under her yoke. She exploited the whole world. This softened the inner contradictions, accumulated conservatism, promoted an abundance and stability of fatty deposits in the form of a parasitic caste, in the form of a squirearchy, a monarchy, house of lords, and the state church. Thanks to this exclusive historic privilege of development possessed by bourgeois England, conservatism combined with elasticity passed over from her institutions into her moral fiber. Various continental Philistines, like the Russian Professor Miliukov, 
or the Austromarxist Otto Bauer, have not to this day ceased going into ecstasies over this fact. But exactly at the present moment, when England, hard pressed throughout the world, is squandering the last resources of her former privileged position, her conservatism is losing its elasticity, and even in the person of the Labrites is turning into stark reactionism. In the face of the Indian Revolution the socialist Macdonald will find no other methods but those with which Nicholas II opposed the Russian Revolution. Only a blind man could fail to see that Great Britain is headed for gigantic revolutionary earthquake shocks, in which the last fragments of her conservatism, her world domination, her present state machine, will go down without a trace. Macdonald is preparing these shocks no less successfully than did Nicholas II in his time and no less blindly. So here too, as we see, is no poor illustration of the problem of the role of the free personality in history. But how could Russia with her belated development, coming along at the tail end of the European nations, with her meagre economic foundation underfoot, how could she develop an elastic conservatism of social forms, and develop it for the special benefit of professorial liberalism and its leftward shadow? reformist socialism. Russia was too far behind. And when world imperialism once took her in its grip, she had to pass through her political history in too brief a course. If Nicholas had gone to meet liberalism and replaced Sturmer with Miliukov, the development of events would have differed a little in form, not in substance. Indeed it was just in this way that Louis behaved in the second stage of the revolution, summoning the giant to power, this did not save Louis himself from the guillotine, nor after him the gyrant. The accumulating social contradictions were bound to break through to the surface, and breaking through to carry out their work of purgation. Before the pressure of the popular masses, who had at last brought out into the open arena their misfortunes, their pains, indignations, passions, hopes, illusions, and aims, the high up combinations of the monarchy with liberalism had only an episodic significance. They could exert, to be sure, an influence on the order of events maybe upon the number of actions, but not at all upon the development of the drama nor its momentous climax. Seven five days, February the 23rd to the 27th, 1917. The 23rd of February was International Women's Day. The social democratic circles had intended to mark this day in a general manner, by meetings, speeches, leaflets. It had not occurred to anyone that it might become the first day of the revolution. Not a single organization called for strikes on that day. What is more, even a Bolshevik organization, and a most militant one, the Vyborg Borough Committee, all workers, was opposing strikes. The temper of the masses, According to K. Yurov, one of the leaders in the workers' district, was very tense, any strike would threaten to turn into an open fight. But since the committee thought the time unripe for militant action, the party not strong enough and the workers having too few contacts with the soldiers, they decided not to call for strikes but to prepare for revolutionary action at some indefinite time in the future. Such was the course followed by the committee on the eve of the 23rd of February and everyone seemed to accept it. On the following morning, however, in spite of all directives, the women textile workers in several factories went on strike, and sent delegates to the metal workers with an appeal for support. With reluctance, writes Kayurov, the Bolsheviks agreed to this, and they were followed by the workers, Mensheviks and social revolutionaries. But once there is a mass strike, one must call everybody into the streets and take the lead. Such was K. Yurov's decision, and the Vyborg committee had to agree to it. The idea of going into the streets had long been ripening among the workers, only at that moment nobody imagined where it would lead. Let us keep in mind this testimony of a participant, important for understanding the mechanics of the events. It was taken for granted that in case of a demonstration the soldiers would be brought out into the streets against the workers. What would that lead to? This was wartime, the authorities were in no mood for joking. On the other hand, a reserve soldier in wartime is nothing like an old soldier of the regular army. Is he really so formidable? 
in revolutionary circles, they had discussed this much, but rather abstractly. For no one, positively no one, we can assert this categorically upon the basis of all the data, then thought that February 23rd was to mark the beginning of a decisive drive against absolutism. The talk was of a demonstration which had indefinite, but in any case limited, perspectives. Thus the fact is that the February revolution was begun from below, overcoming the resistance of its own revolutionary organizations, the initiative being taken of their own accord by the most oppressed and downtrodden part of the proletariat, the women textile workers, among them no doubt many soldiers' wives. The overgrown breadlines had provided the last stimulus. About 90,000 workers, men and women, were on strike that day. The fighting mood expressed itself in demonstrations, meetings, encounters with the police. The movement began in the Viborg district with its large industrial establishments, thence it crossed over to the Petersburg side. There were no strikes or demonstrations elsewhere, according to the testimony of the secret police. On that day, detachments of troops were called in to assist the police, evidently not many of them, but there were no encounters with them. A mass of women, not all of them workers, flocked to the municipal Duma demanding bread. It was like demanding milk from a he goat. Red banners appeared in different parts of the city, and inscriptions on them showed that the workers wanted bread, but neither autocracy nor war. Women's day passed successfully, with enthusiasm, and without victims. But what it concealed in itself, no one had guessed even by nightfall. On the following day, the movement not only fails to diminish, but doubles. About one half of the industrial workers of Petrograd are on strike on the 24th of February. The workers come to the factories in the morning, instead of going to work they hold meetings, then begin processions toward the center. New districts and new groups of the population are drawn into the movement. The slogan bread is crowded out or obscured by louder slogans, down with autocracy, down with the war. Continuous demonstrations on the Nevsky 7, first compact masses of workmen singing revolutionary songs, later a motley crowd of city folk interspersed with the blue caps of students. The promenading crowd was sympathetically disposed toward us, and soldiers in some of the war hospitals greeted us by waving whatever was at hand. How many clearly realized what was being ushered in by this sympathetic waving from sick soldiers to demonstrating workers? But the Cossacks constantly, though without ferocity, kept charging the crowd. Their horses were covered with foam. The mass of demonstrators would part to let them through, and close up again. There was no fear in the crowd. The Cossacks promise not to shoot, passed from mouth to mouth. Apparently some of the workers had talks with individual Cossacks. Later, however, cursing, half-drunken dragoons appeared on the scene. They plunged into the crowd, began to strike at heads with their lances. The demonstrators summoned all their strength and stood fast, they won't shoot. And in fact they did an apostrophe t. A liberal senator was looking at the dead streetcars. Or was that on the following day and his memory failed him question mark some of them with broken windows, some tipped over on the tracks, and was recalling the July days of 1914 on the eve of the war. It seemed that the old attempt was being renewed. The senator's eyes did not deceive him, the continuity is clear. History was picking up the ends of the revolutionary threads broken by the war, and tying them in a knot dot throughout the entire day. Crowds of people poured from one part of the city to another. They were persistently dispelled by the police, stopped, and crowded back by cavalry detachments and occasionally by infantry. Along with shouts of down with the police. Was heard often and often rahara. Addressed to the Cossacks. That was significant. Toward the police the crowd showed ferocious hatred. They routed the mounted police with whistles, stones and pieces of ice. In a totally different way the workers approached the soldiers. Around the barracks, sentinels, patrols, and lines of soldiers, stood groups of working men and women exchanging friendly words with the army men. This was a new stage, due to the growth of the strike and the personal meeting of the worker with the army. 
such a stage is inevitable in every revolution. But it always seems new, and does in fact occur differently every time, those who have read and written about it do not recognize the thing when they see it. Dot in the state humor that day they were telling how an enormous mass of people had flooded Znaim and Ski Square and all Nevsky Prospect, and the adjoining streets and that a totally unprecedented phenomenon was observed. The Cossacks and the regiments with bands were being greeted by revolutionary and not patriotic crowds with shouts of hurrah. To the question, what does it all mean? The first person accosted in the crowd answered the deputy, a policeman struck a woman with and, the Cossacks stepped in and drove away the police. Whether it happened in this way or another, will never be verified. But the crowd believed that it was so, that this was possible. The belief had not fallen out of the sky, it arose from previous experience, and was therefore to become an earnest of victory. The workers at the Ericsson, one of the foremost mills in the Vyborg district, after a morning meeting came out on the Samsonsky Prospect, a whole mass, 2,500 of them, and in a narrow place ran into the Cossacks. Cutting their way with the breasts of their horses, the officers first charged through the crowd. Behind them, filling the whole width of the prospect, galloped the Cossacks. Decisive moment. But the horsemen, cautiously, in a long ribbon, rode through the corridor just made by the officers. Some of them smiled, Kayurov recalls, and one of them gave the workers a good wink. This wink was not without meaning. The workers were emboldened with a friendly, not hostile, kind of assurance, and slightly infected the Cossacks with it. The one who winked found imitators. In spite of renewed efforts from the officers, the Cossacks, without openly breaking discipline, failed to force the crowd to disperse, but flowed through it in streams. This was repeated three or four times and brought the two sides even closer together. Individual Cossacks began to reply to the workers' questions and even to enter into momentary conversations with them. Of discipline there remained but a thin transparent shell that threatened to break through any second. The officers hastened to separate their patrol from the workers, and, abandoning the idea of dispersing them, lined the Cossacks out across the street as a barrier to prevent the demonstrators from getting to the center. But even this did not help, standing stock still in perfect discipline, the Cossacks did not hinder the workers from diving under their horses. The revolution does not choose its paths, it made its first steps toward victory under the belly of a Cossack's horse. A remarkable incident. And remarkable the eye of its narrator, an eye which took an impression of every bend in the process. No wonder, for the narrator was a leader, he was at the head of over two thousand men. The eye of a commander watching for enemy whips and bullets looks sharp. It seems that the break in the army first appeared among the Cossacks those age-old subduers and punishers. This does not mean, however, that the Cossacks were more revolutionary than others. On the contrary, these solid property owners, riding their own horses, highly valuing their Cossack peculiarities, scorning the plain peasants, mistrustful of the workers, had many elements of conservatism. But just for this reason the changes caused by the war were more sharply noticeable in them. Besides, they were always being pulled around, sent everywhere, driven against the people, kept in suspense, and they were the first to be put to the test. They were sick of it, and wanted to go home. Therefore they winked, do it, boys, if you know how, we won't bother you. All these things, however, were merely very significant symptoms. The army was still the army, it was bound with discipline, and the threads were in the hands of the monarchy. The worker mass was unarmed. The leaders had not yet thought of the decisive crisis. On the calendar of the Council of Ministers that day, there stood, among other questions, the question of disorders in the capital. Strikes? Demonstrations? This isn't the first time. Everything is provided for. Directions have been issued. Return to the order of business. And what were the directions? In spite of the fact that on the 23rd and 24th 28 policemen were beaten up, persuasive exactness about the number exclamation mark the military commander of the district, General Karbalev, almost a dictator, did not resort to shooting. 
not from kind-heartedness, everything was provided for and marked down in advance, even the time for the shooting. The revolution caught them unawares only with regard to the exact moment. Generally speaking, both sides, the revolutionary and the governmental, were carefully preparing for it, had been preparing for years, had always been preparing. As a for the Bolsheviks, all their activity since 1905 was nothing but preparation for a second revolution. And the activities of the government, an enormous share of them, were preparations to put down the new revolution. In the fall of 1916 this part of the government's work had assumed an aspect of particularly careful planning. A commission under Karbalev's chairmanship had completed by the middle of January 1917 a very exact plan for crushing a new insurrection. The city was divided into six police districts, which in turn were subdivided into rayons. The commander of the reserve guard units, General Chebikin, was placed at the head of all the armed forces. Regiments were assigned to different rayons. In each of the six police districts, the police, the gendarmes, and the troops were united under the command of special staff officers. The Cossack cavalry was at the disposal of Chebikin himself for larger scale operations. The order of action was planned as follows, first the police act alone, then the Cossacks appear on the scene with whips, and only in case of real necessity the troops go into action with rifles and machine guns. It was this very plan, developed out of the experience of 1905, that was put into operation in the February days. The difficulty lay not in lack of foresight, nor defects of the plan itself, but in the human material. Here the whole thing threatened to hang fire. Formally, the plan was based on the entire garrison, which comprised 150,000 soldiers, but in reality only some 10,000 came into the count. Besides the policemen, numbering 3,500, a firm hope was placed in the military training schools. This is explained by the makeup of the Petrograd garrison which at that time consisted almost exclusively of reserve units, primarily of the 14 reserve battalions attached to the regiments of the guard which were then at the front. In addition to that, the garrison comprised one reserve infantry regiment, a reserve bicycle battalion, a reserve armored car division, small units of sappers and artillerymen, and two regiments of Don Cossacks. That was a great many, it was too many. The swollen reserve units were made up of a human mass which had either escaped training almost entirely, or succeeded in getting free of it. But for that matter, substantially the same thing was true of the entire army. Karbalev meticulously adhered to the plan he had worked out. On the first day, the 23rd, the police operated alone. On the 24th, for the most part the cavalry was led into the streets, but only to work with whip and lance. The use of infantry and firearms was to depend on the further development of events. But events came thick and fast. On the 25th, the strike spread wider. According to the government's figures, 240,000 workers participated that day. The most backward layers are following up the vanguard. Already a good number of small establishments are on strike. The streetcars are at a stand. Business concerns are closed. In the course of the day, students of the higher schools join in the strike. By noon tens of thousands of people pour to the Kazan Cathedral and the surrounding streets. Attempts are made to organize street meetings, a series of armed encounters with the police occurs. Orators address the crowds around the Alexander III monument. The mounted police open fire. A speaker falls wounded. Shots from the crowd kill a police inspector, wound the chief of police and several other policemen. Bottles, petards, and hand grenades are thrown at the gendarmes. The war has taught this art. The soldiers show indifference, at times hostility, to the police. It spreads excitedly through the crowd that when the police opened fire by the Alexander III monument, the Cossacks let go of Oli at the horse pharaohs, such was the nickname of the police, and the latter had to gallop off. This apparently was not a legend circulated for self-encouragement, since the incident, although in different versions, is confirmed from several sources. A worker Bolshevik, Kurov, 
one of the authentic leaders in those days, relates how at one place, within sight of a detachment of Cossacks, the demonstrators scattered under the whips of the mounted police, and how he, Kayurov, and several workers with him, instead of following the fugitives, took off their caps and approached the Cossacks with the words, Brothers, Cossacks, help the workers in a struggle for their peaceable demands, you see how the pharaohs treat us, hungry workers. Help us. This consciously humble manner, those caps in their hands, what an accurate psychological calculation. Inimitable gesture. The whole history of street fights and revolutionary victories swarms with such improvisations. But they are drowned without a trace in the abyss of great events. The shell remains to the historian, the generalization. The Cossacks glanced at each other in some special way, Kayurov continues, and we were hardly out of the way before they rushed into the fight. And a few minutes later, near the station gate, the crowd were tossing in their arms a Cossack who before their eyes had slaughtered a police inspector with his sabadot soon the police disappear altogether, that is, begin to act secretly. Then the soldiers appear, bayonets lowered. Anxiously the workers ask them, comrades, you haven't come to help the police? A rude move along. For answer. Another attempt ends the same way. The soldiers are sullen. A worm is gnawing them, and they cannot stand it when a question hits the very center of the pain. Meanwhile disarmament of the pharaohs becomes a universal slogan. The police are fierce, implacable, hated, and hating foes. To win them over is out of the question. Beat them up and kill them. It is different with the soldiers, the crowd makes every effort to avoid hostile encounters with them, on the contrary, seeks ways to dispose them in its favor, convince, attract, fraternize, merge them in itself. In spite of the auspicious rumors about the Cossacks, perhaps slightly exaggerated, the crowd's attitude toward the mounted men remains cautious. A horseman sits high above the crowd, his soul is separated from the soul of the demonstrator by the four legs of his beast. A figure at which one must gaze from below always seems more significant, more threatening. The infantry are beside one on the pavement, closer, more accessible. The masses try to get near them, look into their eyes, surround them with their hot breath. A great role is played by women workers in the relationship between workers and soldiers. They go up to the cordons more boldly than men, take hold of the rifles, beseech, almost command, put down your bayonets, join us. The soldiers are excited, ashamed, exchange anxious glances, waver, someone makes up his mind first, and the bayonets rise guiltily above the shoulders of the advancing crowd. The barrier is opened, a joyous and grateful hurrah. Shakes the air. The soldiers are surrounded. Everywhere arguments, reproaches, appeals, the revolution makes another forward step. Nicholas from headquarters sent Karbalov a telegraphic command to put an end to the disorders tomorrow. There's as will fell in with the next step in Karbalov's plan, and the telegram served merely as an extra stimulus. Tomorrow the troops will say their say. Isn't it too late? You can't tell yet. The question is posed, but far from answered. The indulgence of the Cossacks, the wavering of certain infantry lines, these are but much promising episodes repeated by the thousand voiced echo of the sensitive street. Enough to inspire the revolutionary crowd, but too little for victory. Especially since there are episodes of an opposite kind. In the afternoon, a detachment of dragoons, supposedly in response to revolver shots from the crowd, first opened fire on the demonstrators near Gostiny Dvor. According to Karbalov's report to headquarters, three were killed and ten wounded. A serious warning. At the same time, Karbalov issued a threat that all workers registered in the draft would be sent to the front if they did not go to work before the 28th. The general issued a three-day ultimatum, that is, he gave the revolution more time than it needed to overthrow Karbalev and the monarchy into the bargain. But that will become known only after the victory. On the evening of the 25th, 
nobody guessed what the next day had in its womb. Let us try to get a clearer idea of the inner logic of the movement. On February 23rd, under the flag of Women's Day, began the long ripe and long withheld uprising of the Petrograd working masses. The first step of the insurrection was the strike. In the course of three days, it broadened and became practically general. This alone gave assurance to the masses and carried them forward. Becoming more and more aggressive, the strike merged with the demonstrations, which were bringing the revolutionary mass face to face with the troops. This raised the problem as a whole to the higher level where things are solved by force of arms. The first days brought a number of individual successes, but these were more symptomatic than substantial. A revolutionary uprising that spreads over a number of days can develop victoriously only in case it ascends step by step, and scores one success after another. A pause in its growth is dangerous, a prolonged marking of time, fatal. But even successes by themselves are not enough, the masses must know about them in time and have time to understand their value. It is possible to let slip a victory at the very moment when it is within arm's reach. This has happened in history. The first three days were days of uninterrupted increase in the extent and acuteness of the strife. But for this very reason, the movement had arrived at a level where mere symptomatic successes were not enough. The entire active mass of the people had come out on the streets. It was settling accounts with the police successfully and easily. In the last two days, the troops had been drawn into the events, on the second day, cavalry, on the third, the infantry too. They barred the way, pushed and crowded back the masses, sometimes connived with them, but almost never resorted to firearms. Those in command were slow to change their plan, partly because they underestimated what was happening. The faulty vision of the reaction supplemented that of the leaders of the revolution, partly because they lacked confidence in the troops. But exactly on the third day, the force of the developing struggle, as well as the Tsar's command, made it necessary for the government to send the troops into action in dead earnest. The workers understood this, especially their advance ranks. The dragoons had already done some shooting the day before. Both sides now faced the issue unequivocally. On the night of the 26th, about a hundred people were arrested in different parts of the city, people belonging to various revolutionary organizations, and among them five members of the Petrograd Committee of the Bolsheviks. This also meant that the government was taking the offensive. What will happen today? In what mood will the workers wake up after yesterday's shooting? And most important, what will the troops say? The sun of February 26 came up in a fog of uncertainty and acute anxiety. In view of the arrest of the Petrograd Committee, the guidance of the entire work in the city fell into the hands of the Vyborg Rayon. Maybe this was just as well. The upper leadership in the party was hopelessly slow. Only on the morning of the 25th, the Bureau of the Bolshevik Central Committee at last decided to issue a handbill calling for an all-Russian general strike. At the moment of issue, if indeed it ever did issue, the general strike in Petrograd was facing an armed uprising. The leaders were watching the movement from above, they hesitated, they lagged, in other words, they did not lead. They dragged after the movement. The nearer one comes to the factories, the greater the decisiveness. Today however, the 26th, there is anxiety even in the rayons. Hungry, tired, chilled, with a mighty historic responsibility upon their shoulders, the Vyborg leaders gather outside the city limits, amid vegetable gardens, to exchange impressions of the day and plan the course. Dot of what? Of a new demonstration? But where will an unarmed demonstration lead, now that the government has decided to go the limit? This question bores into their minds. One thing seems evident, the insurrection is dissolving. Here we recognize the voice of Kyurov, already familiar to us, and at first it seems hardly his voice. The barometer falls so low before the storm. In the hours when hesitation seized even those revolutionists closest to the mass, the movement itself had gone much farther than its participants realized. Even the day before, Toward evening of the 25th, the Vyborg side was wholly in the hands of the insurrection. 
the police stations were wrecked, individual officers had been killed, and the majority had fled. The city headquarters had completely lost contact with the greater part of the capital. On the morning of the 26th, it became evident that not only the Vyborg side, but also Pesky almost up to Lydiny Prospect, was in control of the insurrection. At least so the police reports defined the situation. And it was true in a sense, although the revolutionists could hardly realize it, the police in so many cases abandoned their lairs before there was any threat from the workers. But even aside from that, ridding the factory districts of the police could not have decisive significance in the eyes of the workers, the troops had not yet said their final word. The uprising is dissolving, thought the boldest of the bold. Meanwhile it was only beginning to develop. The 26th of February fell on a Sunday, the factories were closed, and this prevented measuring the strength of the mass pressure in terms of the extent of the strike. Moreover, the workers could not assemble in the factories as they had done on the preceding days, and that hindered the demonstrations. In the morning, the Nevsky was quiet. In those hours, the Tsarina telegraphed the Tsar, the city is calm. But this calmness does not last long. The workers gradually concentrate, and move from all suburbs to the center. They are stopped at the bridges. They flock across the ice, it is only February and the Neva is one solid bridge of ice. The firing at their crowds on the ice is not enough to stop them. They find the city transformed. Posses, cordons, horse patrols everywhere. The approaches to the Nevsky are especially well guarded. Every now and then shots ring out from ambush. The number of killed and wounded grows. Ambulances dart here and there. You cannot always tell who is shooting and where the shots come from. One thing is certain, after their cruel lesson, the police have decided not to expose themselves again. They shoot from windows, through balcony doors, from behind columns, from attics. Hypotheses are formed, which easily become legends. They say that in order to intimidate the demonstrators, many soldiers are disguised in police uniforms. They say that Protopopov has placed numerous machine gun nests in the garrets of houses. A commission created after the revolution did not discover such nests, but this does not mean that there were none. However, the police on this day occupy a subordinate place. The troops come decisively into action. They are given strict orders to shoot, and the soldiers, mostly training squads, that is, non-commissioned officers regimental schools, do shoot. According to the official figures, on this day about 40 are killed and as many wounded, not counting those led or carried away by the crowd. The struggle arrives at a decisive stage. Will the mass ebb before the lead and flow back to its suburbs? No, it does not ebb. It is bound to have its own dot bureaucratic, bourgeois, liberal Petersburg was in a fright. On that day Rodzienko, the president of the state Duma, demanded that reliable troops be sent from the front, later he reconsidered and recommended to the war minister Belief that the crowds be dispersed, not with lead, but with cold water out of a fire hose. Belief, having consulted General Karbalev, answered that a douse of water would produce precisely the opposite effect because it excites. Thus, in the liberal and bureaucratic upper circles, they discussed the relative advantages of hot and cold douches for the people in revolt. Police reports for that day testify that the fire hose was inadequate, in the course of the disorders, it was observed as a general phenomenon, that the rioting mobs showed extreme defiance toward the military patrols, at whom, when asked to disperse, they threw stones and lumps of ice dug up from the street. When preliminary shots were fired into the air, the crowd not only did not disperse but answered these volleys with laughter. Only when loaded cartridges were fired into the very midst of the crowd was it found possible to disperse the mob, the participants in which, however, would most of them hide in the yards of nearby houses, and as soon as the shooting stopped come out again into the street. This police report shows that the temperature of the masses had risen very high. To be sure, it is hardly probable that the crowd would have begun of itself to bombard the troops, 
even the training squads, with stones and ice, that would too much contradict the psychology of the insurrectionary masses, and the wise strategy they had shown with regard to the army. For the sake of supplementary justification for mass murders, the colors in the report are not exactly what they were, and are not laid on the way they were, in actual fact. But the essentials are reported truly and with remarkable vividness. The masses will no longer retreat, they resist with optimistic brilliance, they stay on the street even after murderous volleys. They cling, not to their lives, but to the pavement, to stones, to pieces of ice. The crowd is not only bitter, but audacious. This is because, in spite of the shooting, it keeps its faith in the army. It counts on victory and intends to have it at any cost. The pressure of the workers upon the army is increasing, countering the pressure from the side of the authorities. The Petrograd garrison comes into the focus of events. The expectant period, which has lasted almost three days, during which it was possible for the main mass of the garrison to keep up friendly neutrality toward the insurrection, has come to an end. Shoot the enemy. The monarchy commands. Don't shoot your brothers and sisters. Cry the workers. And not only that, come with us. Thus in the streets and squares, by the bridges, at the barrack gates, is waged a ceaseless struggle, now dramatic, now unnoticeable, but always a desperate struggle, for the heart of the soldier. In this struggle, in these sharp contacts between working men and women and the soldiers, under the steady crackling of rifles and machine guns, the fate of the government, of the war, of the country, is being decided. The shooting of demonstrators increased the uncertainty among the leaders. The very scale of the movement began to seem dangerous. Even at the meeting of the Vyborg Committee the evening of the 26th, that is, twelve hours before the victory, arose discussions as to whether it was not time to end the strike. This may seem astonishing. But remember, it is far easier to recognize victory the day after, than the day before. Besides, moods change frequently under the impact of events and the news of them. Discouragement quickly gives way to a flow of enthusiasm. Kurovs and Chugarins have plenty of personal courage, but, at moments, a feeling of responsibility for the masses clutches them. Among the rank and file workers, there were fewer oscillations. Reports about their moods were made to the authorities by a well informed agent in the Bolshevik organization, Shurkanov. Since the army units have not opposed the crowd, wrote this provocateur, and in individual cases have even taken measures paralyzing the initiative of the police officers. The masses have got a sense of impunity, and now, after two days of unobstructed walking the streets, when the revolutionary circles have advanced the slogans down with war and down with the autocracy, the people have become convinced that the revolution has begun, that success is with the masses, that the authorities are powerless to suppress the movement because the troops are with it, that a decisive victory is near, since the troops will soon openly join the side of the revolutionary forces, that the movement begun will not subside, but will ceaselessly grow to a complete victory and a state revolution. A characterization remarkable for compactness and clarity. The report is a most valuable historic document. This did not, of course, prevent the victorious workers from executing its author. These provocateurs, whose number was enormous, especially in Petrograd, feared, more than anyone else did, the victory of the revolution. They followed a policy of their own. In the Bolshevik conferences, Shurkinov defended the most extreme actions, in his reports to the secret police, he suggested the necessity of a decisive resort to firearms. It is possible that with this aim, Shurkinov tried even to exaggerate the aggressive confidence of the workers. But in the main he was right, events would soon confirm his judgment. The leaders in both camps guessed and vacillated, for not one of them could estimate a prior either relation of forces. External indications ceased absolutely to serve as a measure. Indeed one of the chief features of a revolutionary crisis consists in this sharp contradiction between the present consciousness and the old forms of social relationship. A new relation of forces was mysteriously implanting itself in the consciousness of the workers and soldiers. 
it was precisely the government's offensive, called forth by the previous offensive of the revolutionary masses, which transformed the new relation of forces from a potential to an active state. The worker looked thirstily and commandingly into the eyes of the soldier, and the soldier anxiously and diffidently looked away. This meant that, in a way, the soldier could no longer answer for himself. The worker approached the soldier more boldly. The soldier sullenly, but without hostility, guiltily rather, refused to answer. Or sometimes, now more and more often, he answered with pretended severity in order to conceal how anxiously his heart was beating in his breast. Thus the change was accomplished. The soldier was clearly shaking off his soldiery. In doing so, he could not immediately recognize himself. The authorities said that the revolution intoxicated the soldier. To the soldier it seemed, on the contrary, that he was sobering up from the opium of the barracks. Thus the decisive day was prepared, the 27th of February. However, on the eve of that day, an incident occurred that, in spite of its episodic nature, paints with a new color all the events of the 26th. Toward evening the 4th Company of the Pavlovsky Regiment of the Imperial Guard mutinied. In the written report of a police inspector, the cause of the mutiny is categorically stated, indignation against the training squad of the same regiment which, while on duty in the Nevsky, fired on the crowd. Who informed the 4th Company of this? A record has been accidentally preserved. About two o'clock in the afternoon, a handful of workers ran up to the barracks of the Pavlovsky regiment. Interrupting each other, they told about a shooting on the Nevsky. Tell your comrades that the Pavlovsky, too, are shooting at us, we saw soldiers in your uniform on the Nevsky. That was a burning reproach, a flaming appeal. All looked distressed and pale. The seed fell not upon the rock. By six o'clock the fourth company had left the barracks without permission under the command of a non-commissioned officer, who was he? His name is drowned forever among hundreds and thousands of equally heroic names, and marched to the Nevsky to recall its training squad. This was not a mere soldier's mutiny over wormy meat, it was an act of high revolutionary initiative. On their way down, the company had an encounter with a detachment of mounted police. The soldiers opened fire. One policeman and one horse were killed, another policeman and another horse were wounded. The further path of the mutineers in the hurricane of the streets is unknown. The company returned to the barracks and aroused the entire regiment. But their arms had been hidden. According to some sources, they nevertheless got hold of thirty rifles. They were soon surrounded by the Preobras and Sai. Nineteen Pavlovtsi were arrested and imprisoned in the fortress the rest surrendered. According to other information, the officers on that evening found twenty-one soldiers with rifles missing. A dangerous leak. These twenty-one soldiers would be seeking allies and defenders all night long. Only the victory of the revolution could save them. The workers would surely learn from them what had happened. This was not a bad omen for tomorrow's battles. Nabokov, one of the most prominent liberal leaders, whose truthful memoirs seem at times to be the very diary of his party and of his class, was returning home from a visit at one o'clock in the morning along the dark and watchful streets. He was perturbed and filled with dark forebodings. It is possible that at one of the crossings he met a fugitive Pavlovitz. Both hurried past, they had nothing to say to each other. In the workers' quarters and the barracks, some kept watch or conferred, Others slept the half-sleep of the bivouac, or dreamed feverishly about tomorrow. Here the fugitive Pavlovitz found shelter. How scant are the records of the mass fighting in the February days, scant even in comparison with the slim records of the October fights. In October, the party directed the insurrection from day to day, in its articles, proclamations, and report, at least the external continuity of the struggle is recorded, not so in February. The masses had almost no leadership from above. The newspapers were silenced by the strike. Without a look back, the masses made their own history. To reconstruct a living picture of the things that happened in the streets is almost unthinkable. 
It would be well if we could recreate at least the general continuity and inner order of events. The government, which had not yet lost hold of the machinery of power, observed the events on the whole even less ably than the left parties, which, as we know, were far from brilliant in this direction. After the successful shootings of the 26th, the ministers took heart for an instant. At dawn of the 27th, Protopopov reassuringly reported that, according to information received, part of the workers intend to return to work. But the workers never thought of going back to the shops. Yesterday's shootings and failures had not discouraged the masses. How explain this? Apparently the losses were outbalanced by certain gains. Pouring through the streets, colliding with the enemy, pulling at the arms of soldiers, crawling under horses' bellies, attacking, scattering, leaving their corpses on the crossings, grabbing a few firearms, spreading the news, catching at rumors, the insurrectionary mass becomes a collective entity with numberless eyes, ears, and antennae. At night, returning home from the arena of struggle to the workers' quarter, it goes over the impressions of the day, and sifting away what is petty and accidental, casts its own thoughtful balance. On the night of the 27th, this balance was practically identical with the report made to the authorities by the provocateur, Shurkinov. In the morning, the workers streamed again to the factories, and in open meetings resolved to continue the struggle. Especially resolute, as always, were the Vibagtsi. But in other districts too these morning meetings were enthusiastic. To continue the struggle. But what would that mean today? The general strike had issued in revolutionary demonstrations by immense crowds, and the demonstrations had led to a collision with the troops. To continue the struggle today would mean to summon an armed insurrection. But nobody had formulated this summons. It had grown irresistibly out of the events, but it was never placed on the order of the day by a revolutionary party. The art of revolutionary leadership in its most critical moments consists nine tenths in knowing how to sense the mood of the masses, just as Kayurov detected the movement of the Cossack eyebrow, though on a larger scale. An unexcelled ability to detect the mood of the masses was Lenin's great power. But Lenin was not in Petrograd. The legal and semi-legal socialistic staffs, Kierensky, Chides, Skoplev, and all those who circled around them, pronounced warnings and opposed the movement. But even the central Bolshevik staff, composed of Shlyapnikov, Zalatsky, and Molotov, was amazing in its helplessness and lack of initiative. In fact, the districts and barracks were left to themselves. The first proclamation to the army was released only on the 26th by one of the social democratic organizations close to the Bolsheviks. This proclamation, rather hesitant in character, not even containing an appeal to come over to the people, was distributed throughout all the city districts on the morning of the 27th. However, testifies UNF, the leader of this organization. The tempo of the revolutionary events was such that our slogans were already lagging behind it. By the time the leaflets had penetrated into the thick of the troops, the latter had already come over. As for the Bolshevik center, Shlyapnikov, at the demand of Chugarin, one of the best work leaders of the February days, finally wrote an appeal to the soldiers on the morning of the 27th. Was it ever published? At best, it might have come in at the finish. It could not possibly have influenced the events of February 27. We must lay it down as a general rule for those days that the higher the leaders, the further they lagged behind. But the insurrection, not yet so named by anyone, took its own place on the order of the day. All the thoughts of the workers were concentrated on the army. Don't you think we can get them started? Today, haphazard agitation would no longer do. The Vyborg section staged a meeting near the barracks of the Moscow regiment. The enterprise proved a failure. Is it difficult for some officer or sergeant major to work the handle of a machine gun? The workers were scattered by cruel fire. A similar attempt was made at the barracks of a reserve regiment. And there too, officers with machine guns interfered between the workers and soldiers. The leaders of the workers fumed, looked for firearms, demanded them from the party. 
and the answer was, the soldiers have the firearms, go get them. That they knew themselves. But how to get them? Isn't everything going to collapse all at once today? Thus came on the critical point of the struggle. Either the machine gun will wipe out the insurrection, or the insurrection will capture the machine gun. In his recollections, Shliapnikov, the chief figure in the Petrograd center of the Bolsheviks, tells how he refused the demands of the workers for firearms, or even revolvers, sending them to the barracks to get them. He wished in this way to avoid bloody clashes between workers and soldiers, staking everything on agitation, that is, on the conquest of the soldiers by work and example. We know of no other testimony that confirms or refutes this statement of a prominent leader of those days, a statement which testifies to sidestepping rather than foresight. It would be simpler to confess that the leaders had no firearms. There is no doubt that the fate of every revolution at a certain point is decided by a break in the disposition of the army. Against a numerous, disciplined, well armed, and ably led military force, unarmed or almost unarmed masses of the people cannot possibly gain a victory. But no deep national crisis can fail to affect the army to some extent. Thus, Along with the conditions of a truly popular revolution, there develops a possibility, not, of course, a guarantee, of its victory. However, the going over of the army to the insurrection does not happen of itself, nor as a result of mere agitation. The army is heterogeneous, and its antagonistic elements are held together by the terror of discipline. On the very eve of the decisive hour, the revolutionary soldiers do not know how much power they have or what influence they can exert. The working masses, of course, are also heterogeneous. But they have immeasurably more opportunity for testing their ranks in the process of preparation for the decisive encounter. Strikes, meetings, demonstrations, are not only acts in the struggle but also measures of its force. The whole mass does not participate in the strike. Not all the strikers are ready to fight. In the sharpest moments, the most daring appear in the streets. The hesitant, the tired, the conservative, sit at home. Here a revolutionary selection takes place of itself, people are sifted through the sieve of events. It is otherwise with the army. The revolutionary soldiers, sympathetic, wavering or antagonistic, are all tied together by a compulsory discipline whose threads are held, up to the last moment, in the officer's fist. The soldiers are told off daily into first and second files, but how are they to be divided into rebellious and obedient? The psychological moment when the soldiers go over to the revolution is prepared by a long molecular process, which, like other processes of nature, has its point of climax. But how determine this point? A military unit may be wholly prepared to join the people, but may not receive the needed stimulus. The revolutionary leadership does not yet believe in the possibility of having the army on its side, and lets slip the victory. After this ripened but unrealized mutiny, a reaction may seize the army. The soldiers lose the hope which flared in their breasts, they bend their necks again to the yoke of discipline, and in a new encounter with the workers, especially at a distance, will stand opposed to the insurrection. In this process, there are many elements imponderable or difficult to weigh, many cross-currents, collective suggestions, and auto-suggestions. But, out of this complicated web of material and psychic forces, one conclusion emerges with irrefutable clarity. The more the soldiers in their mass are convinced that the rebels are really rebelling, that this is not a demonstration after which they will have to go back to the barracks and report, that this is a struggle to the death that the people may win if they join them, and that this winning will not only guarantee impunity, but alleviate the lot of all. The more they realize this, the more willing they are to turn aside their bayonets, or go over with them to the people. In other words, the revolutionists can create a break in the soldiers' mood only if they themselves are actually ready to seize the victory at any price whatever, even the price of blood. And this highest determination never can or will, remain unarmed. The critical hour of contact between the pushing crowd and the soldiers who bar their way has its critical minute. That is when the grey barrier has not yet given way, 
still holds together shoulder to shoulder, but already wavers, and the officer, gathering his last strength of will, gives the command, fire. The cry of the crowd, the yell of terror and threat, drowns the command, but not wholly. The rifles waver. The crowd pushes. Then the officer points the barrel of his revolver at the most suspicious soldier. From the decisive minute now stands out the decisive second. The death of the boldest soldier, to whom the others have involuntarily looked for guidance, a shot into the crowd by a corporal from the dead man's rifle, and the barrier closes, the guns go off of themselves, scattering the crowd into the alleys and backyards. But how many times since 1905 it has happened otherwise? At the critical moment, when the officer is ready to pull the trigger, a shot from the crowd, which has its Kurovs and Chugarins, forestalls him. This decides not only the fate of the street skirmish, but perhaps the whole day, or the whole insurrection. The task which Lyapnikov set himself of protecting the workers from hostile clashes with the troops by not giving firearms to the insurrectionists, could not in any case be carried out. Before it came to these clashes with the troops, innumerable clashes had occurred with the police. The street fighting began with the disarming of the hated pharaohs, their revolvers passing into the hands of the rebels. The revolver by itself is a weak, almost oil-like weapon against the muskets, rifles, machine guns, and cannon of the enemy. But are these weapons genuinely in the hands of the enemy? To settle this question, the workers demanded arms. It was a psychological question. But even in an insurrection psychic processes are inseparable from material ones. The way to the soldier's rifle leads through the revolver taken from the pharaoh. The feelings of the soldiers in those hours were less active than those of the workers, but not less deep. Let us recall again that the garrison consisted mainly of reserve battalions many thousands strong, destined to fill up the ranks of those at the front. These men, most of them fathers of families, had the prospect of going to the trenches when the war was lost and the country ruined. They did not want war. They wanted to go home to their farms. They knew well enough what was going on at court, and had not the slightest feeling of attachment to the monarchy. They did not want to fight with the Germans, and still less with the Petrograd workers. They hated the ruling class of the capital, who had been having a good time during the war. Among them were workers with a revolutionary past, who knew how to give a generalized expression to all these moods. To bring the soldiers from a deep but as yet hidden revolutionary discontent to avert mutinous action, or, at least, first to a mutinous refusal to act, that was the task. On the third day of the struggle, the soldiers totally ceased to be able to maintain a benevolent neutrality toward the insurrection. Only accidental fragments of what happened in those hours along the line of contact between workers and soldiers have come down to us. We heard how yesterday the workers complained passionately to the Pavlovsky regiment about the behavior of its training squad. Such scenes, conversations, reproaches, appeals, were occurring in every corner of the city. The soldiers had no more time for hesitation. They were compelled to shoot yesterday and they would be again today. The workers will not surrender or retreat, under fire, they are still holding their own. And with them their women, wives, mothers, sisters, sweethearts. Yes, and this is the very hour they had so often whispered about, if only we could all get together. And in the moment of supreme agony, in the unbearable fear of the coming day, the choking hatred of those who are imposing upon them the executioner's role, there ring out in the barrack room the first voices of open indignation, and in those voices, to be forever nameless, the whole army with relief and rapture recognizes itself. Thus dawned upon the earth the day of destruction of the Romanov monarchy. At a morning conference in the home of the indefatigable Kurov, where over forty shop and factory representatives had assembled, a majority spoke for continuing the movement. A majority, but not all. Too bad we cannot establish what majority, but in those hours there was no time for records. Anyway, the decision was belated. 
The meeting was interrupted by the intoxicating news of the soldiers' insurrection and the opening of the jails. Shurkinov kissed all those present. A kiss of Judas, but not, fortunately, to be followed by a crucifixion. One after another, from early morning, the reserve guard battalions mutinied before they were led out of the barracks, continuing what the 4th Company of the Pavlovsky Regiment had begun the day before. In the documents, records, memoirs, this grandiose event of human history has left but a pale, dim imprint. The oppressed masses, even when they rise to the very heights of creative action, tell little of themselves and write less. And the overpowering rapture of the victory later erases memory's work. Let us take up what records there are. The soldiers of the Volinsky regiment were the first to revolt. As early as seven o'clock in the morning, a battalion commander disturbed Kabalov with a telephone call and this threatening news. The training squad, that is, the unit especially relied on to put down the insurrection, had refused to march out, its commander was killed, or had shot himself in front of the troops. The latter version, by the way, was soon rejected. Having burned their bridges behind them, the valiant Tsai hastened to broaden the base of the insurrection. In that lay their only salvation. They rushed into the neighboring barracks of the Litovsky and Preobrazhensky regiments calling out the soldiers as strikers go from factory to factory calling out the workers. Some time after, Karbalev received a report that the Volinsky regiment had not only refused to surrender their rifles when ordered by the general, but together with the Litovsky and Preobrazhensky regiments, and what is even more alarming, having joined the workers had wrecked the barracks of the political police. This meant that yesterday's experiment of the Pavlovtsi had not been in vain. The insurrection had found leaders, and at the same time a plan of action. In the early hours of the 27th, the workers thought the solution of the problem of the insurrection infinitely more distant than it really was. It would be truer to say that they saw the problem as almost entirely ahead of them, when it was really nine tenths behind. The revolutionary pressure of the workers on the barracks fell in with the existing revolutionary movement of the soldiers to the streets. During the day, these two mighty currents united to wash out clean and carry away the walls, the roof, and later the whole groundwork of the old structure. Chugarin was among the first to appear at the Bolshevik headquarters, a rifle in his hands, a cartridge belt over his shoulder, all spattered up, but beaming and triumphant. Why shouldn't he beam? Soldiers with rifles in their hands are coming over to us. In some places, the workers had succeeded in uniting with the soldiers, penetrating the barracks, and receiving rifles and cartridges. The Vibagtsi ate together with the most daring of the soldiers, outlined a plan of action, seize the police stations where the armed police have entrenched themselves, disarm all policemen, free the workers held in the police stations, and the political prisoners in the jails, rout the government troops in the city proper, unite with the still inactive troops and with the workers of other districts. The Moscow regiment joined the uprising not without inner struggle. Amazing that there was so little struggle among the regiments. The monarchist command impotently fell away from the soldier mass, and either hid in the cracks or hastened to change its colors. At two o'clock, remembers Korolev, a worker from the Arsenal factory, when the Moscow regiment marched out, we armed ourselves. We took a revolver and rifle apiece, picked out a group of soldiers who came up, some of them asked us to take command and tell them what to do, and set out for Tykvinskaya Street to shoot up the police station. The workers, it seems, did not have a moment's trouble telling the soldiers what to do. One after another came the joyful reports of victories. Our own armored cars have appeared. With red flags flying. They are spreading terror through the districts to all who have not yet submitted. Now it will no longer be necessary to crawl under the belly of a Cossack's horse. The revolution is standing up to its full height. Dot toward noon, Petrograd again became the field of military action, rifles and machine guns rang out everywhere. It was not easy to tell who was shooting or where. One thing was clear, the past and the future were exchanging shots. 
there was much casual firing, young boys were shooting off revolvers unexpectedly acquired. The arsenal was wrecked. They say that several tens of thousands of Brownings alone were carried off. From the burning buildings of the district court and the police stations pillars of smoke rolled to the sky. At some points, clashes and skirmishes thickened into real battles. On Sampsonsky Boulevard, the workers came up to a barrack occupied by the bicycle men, some of whom crowded into the gate. Why don't you get on the move, comrades? The soldiers smiled, not a good smile, one of the participants testifies, and remained silent, while the officers rudely commanded the workers to move on. The bicyclists, along with the cavalry, proved to be the most conservative part of the army in the February, as in the October Revolution. A crowd of workers and revolutionary soldiers soon gathered round the fence. We must pull out the suspicious battalion. Someone reported that the armored cars had been sent for, perhaps there was no other way of getting these bicyclists, who had set up the machine guns. But it is hard for a crowd to wait, it is anxiously impatient, and quite right in its impatience. Shots rang out from both sides. But the board fence stood in the way, dividing the soldiers from the revolution. The attackers decided to break down the fence. They broke down part of it and set fire to the rest. About twenty barracks came into view. The bicyclists were concentrated in two or three of them. The empty barracks were set fire to at once. Six years later, K. Yurov would recall, the flaming barracks and the wreckage of the fence around them, the fire of machine guns and rifles, the excited faces of the besiegers, a truckload of armed revolutionists dashing up and finally an armored car arriving with its gleaming gun mouths, made a memorable and magnificent picture. This was the old Tsarist, feudal, priestly, police Russia burning down, barracks and fences and all, expiring in fire and smoke, spewing out its soul with the hiccup of machine gun shots. No wonder K. Yurov, and tens, hundreds, thousands of K. Yurovs, rejoiced. The arriving armored car fired several shells at the barrack where the bicyclists and officers were barricaded. The commander was killed. The officers, tearing off their epaulets and other insignia, fled through the vegetable gardens adjoining the barracks, the rest gave themselves up. This was probably the biggest encounter of the day. The military revolt had meanwhile become epidemic. Only those did not mutiny that day who did not get around to it. Toward evening, the Simonovsky regiment joined in, a regiment notorious for its brutal putting down of the Moscow uprising of 1905. Eleven years had not passed in vain. Together with the Chasseurs, the Simonovtsi late at night called out the Ismailovtsi, whom the command were holding locked up in their barracks. This regiment, which on December 3, 1905 had surrounded and arrested the first Petrograd Soviet, was even now considered one of the most backward. The Tsarist garrison of the capital, numbering 150,000 soldiers, was dwindling, melting, disappearing. By night, it no longer existed. After the morning's news of the revolt of the regiments, Karbalev still tried to offer resistance, sending against the revolution a composite regiment of about a thousand men with the most drastic orders. But the fate of that regiment has become quite a mystery. Something impossible begins to happen on that day. The incomparable Karbalev relates after the revolution, the regiment start, starts under a brave, a resolute officer, meaning Colonel Q. Typov, but dot there are no results. Companies sent after that regiment also vanished, leaving no trace. The general began to draw up reserves on Palace Square but there were no cartridges and nowhere to get them. This is taken from Kabbalah's authentic testimony before the Commission of Inquiry of the Provisional Government. What became of the punitive regiments? It is not hard to guess that as soon as they marched out they were drowned in the insurrection. Workers, women, youths, rebel soldiers, swarmed around Kabbalah's troops on all sides, either considering the regiment their own or striving to make it so and did not let them move any way but with the multitude. To fight with this thick swarming, inexhaustible, all-penetrating mass, 
which now feared nothing, was as easy as to fence in Dodo. Together with reports of more and more military revolts came demands for reliable troops to put down the rebels, to defend the telephone building, the Litovsky castle, the Mariinsky palace, and other even more sacred places. Karbalov demanded by telephone that loyal troops be sent from Kronstadt, but the commandant replied that he himself feared for the fortress. Karbalov did not yet know that the insurrection had spread to the neighboring garrisons. The general attempted, or pretended to attempt, to convert the Winter Palace into a redoubt, but the plan was immediately abandoned as unrealizable, and the last handful of loyal troops was transferred to the Admiralty. Here, at last, the dictator occupied himself with the most important and urgent business, he printed for publication the last two governmental decrees, on the retirement of Protopopov owing to illness, and on the state of siege in Petrograd. With the latter he really had to hurry, for several hours later Kabulov's army lifted the siege and departed from the Admiralty for their homes. It was due only to ignorance that the revolution had not already on the evening of the 27th arrested this formidably empowered but not at all formidable general. This was done without any complications the next day. Can it be that that was the whole resistance put up by the redoubtable Russian Empire in the face of mortal danger? Yes, that was about all, in spite of its great experience in crushing the people and its meticulously elaborated plans. When they came to themselves later, the monarchists explained the ease of the February victory of the people by the peculiar character of the Petrograd garrison. But the whole further course of the revolution refutes this explanation. True, at the beginning of the fatal year, the Camarilla had already suggested to the Tsar the advisability of renovating the garrison. The Tsar had easily allowed himself to be persuaded that the cavalry of the guard, considered especially loyal, had been under fire long enough and had earned a rest in its Petrograd barracks. However, after respectful representations from the front, the Tsar agreed that four regiments of the cavalry guard should be replaced by three crews of the naval guard. According to Protopopov's version, this replacement was made by the command without the Tsar's consent, and with treacherous design, the sailors are recruited from among the workers and constitute the most revolutionary element of the forces. But this is sheer nonsense. The highest officers of the guard, and particularly the cavalry, were simply cutting out too good a career for themselves at the front to want to come back. Besides that, they must have thought with some dread of the punitive functions to be allotted to them. In these they would be at the head of troops totally different after their experience at the front from what they used to be on the parade grounds of the capital. As events at the front soon proved, the horse guard at this time no longer differed from the rest of the cavalry, and the naval guard, which was transferred to the capital, did not play an active part in the February Revolution. The whole truth is that the fabric of the regime had completely decayed. There was not a live thread left. During the 27th of February, the crowd liberated, without bloodshed, from the many jails of the capital all political prisoners, among them the patriotic group of the Military Industrial Committee, which had been arrested on the 26th of January, and the members of the Petrograd Committee of the Bolsheviks, seized by Kabul of 40 hours earlier. A political division occurred immediately outside the prison gates. The Menshevik patriots set out for the Duma, where functions and places were to be assigned. The Bolsheviks marched to the districts, to the workers and soldiers, to finish with them the conquest of the capital. The enemy must have no time to breathe. A revolution, more than any other enterprise, has to be carried through to the end. It is impossible to say who thought of leading the mutinous troops to the Tauride Palace. This political line of march was dictated by the whole situation. Naturally all the elements of radicalism not bound up with the masses gravitated toward the Torrid Palace as the center of oppositional information. Quite probably these elements, having experienced on the 27th a sudden injection of vital force, became the guides of the mutinous soldiers. This was an honorable role and now hardly a dangerous one. In view of its location, Potemkin's palace was well fitted to be the center of the revolution. The Tauride Park is separated by just one street from the whole military community, containing the barracks of the guard and a series of military institutions. 
It is true that for many years this part of the city was considered both by the government and the revolutionists to be the military stronghold of the monarchy. And so it was. But now everything had changed. The soldiers' rebellion had begun in the guard sector. The mutinous troops had only to cross the street in order to reach the park of the Tauride Palace, which in turn was only one block from the Neva River. And beyond the Neva lies the Vyborg district, the very cauldron of the revolution. The workers need only cross Alexander's Bridge, or if that is up, walk over the ice of the river, to reach the guards barracks or the Tauride Palace. Thus, the heterogeneous, and in its origins contradictory, northeast triangle of Petrograd, the guards, Potemkin's palace, and the giant factories, closely interlocked, became the field of action of the revolution. In the Tauride Palace, various centers are already created, or at least sketched out, among them the field staff of the insurrection. It has no very serious character. The revolutionary officers, that is, those officers who had somehow or other, even though by mistake, got connected with the revolution in the past, but who have safely slept through the insurrection, hasten after the victory to call attention to themselves, or upon summons from others arrive to serve the revolution. They survey the situation with profound thought and pessimistically shake their heads. These tumultuous crowds of soldiers, often unarmed, are totally unfit for battle. No artillery no machine guns, no communications, no commanders. One strong regiment is all the enemy needs. To be sure, just now the revolutionary crowds prevent any planned maneuvers in the streets. But the workers will go home for the night. The residents will quiet down, the town will be emptied. If Karbalov were to strike with a strong regiment at the barracks, he might become master of the situation. This idea, by the way, will meet us in different versions throughout all the stages of the revolution. Give me a strong regiment, gallant colonels will more than once exclaim to their friends, and in two seconds I will clean up all this mess. And some of them, as we shall see, will make the attempt. But they will all have to repeat Karbalov's words, the regiment start, starts under a brave officer, but dot there are no results. Yes and how could there be results? The most reliable of all possible forces had been the police and the gendarmes, and the training squads of certain regiments. But these proved as pitiful before the assault of the real masses as the battalion of St. George and the officers' training schools were to prove eight months later in October. Where could the monarchy get that Salvation Regiment, ready and able to enter a prolonged and desperate duel with a city of two million? The revolution seems defenseless to these verbally so enterprising colonels, because it is still terrifically chaotic. Everywhere aimless movements, conflicting currents, whirlpools of people, individuals astounded as though suddenly gone deaf, unfastened trench coats, gesticulating students, soldiers without rifles, rifles without soldiers, boys firing into the air, a thousand voice tumult, hurricanes of wild rumor false alarms, false rejoicing. Enough, you would think, to lift a sword over all that chaos, and it would scatter apart and leave never a trace. But that is a crude error of vision. It is only seeming chaos. Beneath it is proceeding an irresistible crystallization of the masses around new axes. These innumerable crowds have not yet clearly defined what they want, but they are saturated with an acid hatred of what they do not want. Behind them is an irreparable historic avalanche. There is no way back. Even if there were someone to scatter them, they would be gathering again in an hour, and the second flood would be more furious and bloodier than the first. After the February days, the atmosphere of Petrograd becomes so red hot that every hostile military detachment arriving in that mighty forge, or even coming near to it, scorched by its breath, is transformed, loses confidence becomes paralyzed, and throws itself upon the mercy of the victor without a struggle. Tomorrow General Ivanov, sent from the front by the Tsar with a battalion of the Knights of St. George, will find this out. In five months, the same fate will befall General Kornilov, and in eight months it will happen to Kierensky. On the streets in the preceding days, 
the Cossacks had seemed the most open to persuasion, it was because they were the most abused. But when it came to the actual insurrection, the cavalry once more justified its conservative reputation and lagged behind the infantry. On the 27th, it was still preserving the appearance of watchful neutrality. Though Kabbalah no longer relied upon it, the revolution still feared it. The fortress of Peter and Paul, which stands on an island in the Neva opposite the Winter Palace and the palaces of the Grand Dukes, remained a puzzle. Behind its walls, the garrison of the fortress was, or seemed to be, a little world completely shielded from outside influences. The fortress had no permanent artillery, except for that antiquated cannon which daily announced the noon hour to Petrograd. But today field guns are set up on the walls and aimed at the bridge. What are they getting ready for? The Torride staff has worried all night what to do about the fortress, and in the fortress they were worrying, what will the revolution do with us? By morning the puzzle is solved, on condition that officers remain inviolable the fortress will surrender to the Torrid Palace. Having analyzed the situation, not so difficult a thing to do. The officers of the fort hastened to forestall the inevitable march of events. Toward evening of the 27th, a stream of soldiers, workers, students, and miscellaneous people flows toward the Torrid Palace. Here they hope to find those who know everything, to get information and instructions. From all sides. Ammunition is being carried by armfuls into the palace and deposited in a room that has been converted into an arsenal. At nightfall, the revolutionary staff settles down to work. It sends out detachments to guard the railway stations and dispatches reconnoitering squads wherever danger lurks. The soldiers carry out eagerly and without a murmur, although very unsystematically, the orders of the new authorities. But they always demand a written order. The initiative in this probably came from the fragments of the military staff which had remained with the troops, or from the military clerks. But they were right, it is necessary to bring order immediately into the chaos. The staff, as well as the newborn Soviet, had as yet no seals. The revolution has still to fit itself out with the implements of bureaucratic management. In time this will be done, alas too well. The revolution begins a search for enemies. Arrests are made all over the city, arbitrarily, as the liberals will say reproachfully later. But the whole revolution is arbitrary. Streams of people are brought into the Torride under arrest, such people as the chairman of the state council, ministers, policemen, secret service men, the pro-German countess, whole broods of gendarme officers, several statesmen such as Protopopov, will come of their own volition to be arrested, it is safer so. The walls of the chamber, which had resounded to hymns in praise of absolutism, now heard but sobbing and sighs, the countess will subsequently relate. An arrested general sank down exhausted on a nearby chair. Several members of the Duma kindly offered me a cup of tea. Shaken to the depths of his soul, the general was saying excitedly, Countess, we are witnessing the death of a great country. Meanwhile, the great country, which had no intention of dying, marched by these people of the past, stamping its boots, clanging the butts of its rifles, rending the air with its shouts, and stepping all over their feet. A revolution is always distinguished by impoliteness, probably because the ruling classes did not take the trouble in good season to teach the people fine manners. The Torrid became the temporary field headquarters, governmental center, arsenal, and prison fortress of the revolution, which had not yet wiped the blood and sweat from its face. Into this whirlpool some enterprising enemies also made their way. A disguised captain of gendarmes was accidentally discovered taking down notes in a corner, not for history but for the court-martials. The soldiers and workers wanted to end him right there. But people from the staff interfered, and easily led the gendarme out of the crowd. The revolution was then still good-natured, trustful and kind-hearted. It will become ruthless only after a long series of treasons, deceits, and bloody trials. The first night of the triumphant revolution was full of alarms. 
the improvised commissars of the railway terminals and other points, most of them chosen haphazard from the intelligentsia through personal connection, upstarts and chance acquaintances of the revolution, non-commissioned officers, especially of worker origin, would have been more useful. Got nervous, saw danger on all sides, nagged the soldiers, and ceaselessly telephoned to the Toride asking for reinforcements. But in the Toride too they were nervous. They were telephoning. They were sending out reinforcements, which for the most part did not arrive. Those who receive orders, said a member of the Toride night staff, do not execute them, those who act, act without orders. The workers' districts act without orders. The revolutionary chiefs who have led out their factories, seized the police stations, called out the soldiers, and wrecked the strongholds of the counter-revolution do not hurry to the Toride Palace, to the staffs, to the administrative centers. On the contrary, they jerk their heads in that direction with irony and distrust, those brave boys are getting in early to divide the game they didn't kill, before it's even killed. Worker Bolsheviks, as well as the best workers of the other left parties, spend their days on the streets, their nights in the district headquarters, keeping in touch with the barracks and preparing tomorrow's work. On the first night of victory they continue, and they enlarge, the same work they have been at for the whole five days and nights. They are the young bones of the revolution, still soft, as all revolutions are in the first days. On the 27th, Nabokov, already known to us as a member of the Kud Center, and at that time working, a legalized deserter, at general headquarters, went to his office as usual and stayed until three o'clock, knowing nothing of the events. Toward evening, shots were heard on the Moors Gare. Nabokov listened to them from his apartment. Armored cars dashed along, individual soldiers and sailors ran past, sidling along the wall. The respected liberal observed them from the side windows of his vestibule. The telephone continued to function, and my friends, I remember, kept me in touch with what was going on during the day. At the usual time we went to bed. This man will soon become one of the inspirators of the revolutionary provisional government, occupying the position of general administrator. Tomorrow an unknown old man will approach him on the street, a bookkeeper, perhaps, or a teacher, bow low and remove his hat, and say to him, thank you for all that you have done for the people. Nabokov, with modest pride, will relate the incident himself. Eight who led the February insurrection? Lawyers and journalists belonging to the classes damaged by the revolution wasted a good deal of ink subsequently trying to prove that what happened in February was essentially a petticoat rebellion, backed up afterward by a soldier's mutiny, and given out for a revolution. Louis XVI in his day also tried to think that the capture of the Bastille was a rebellion, but they respectfully explained to him that it was a revolution. Those who lose by a revolution are rarely inclined to call it by its real name. For that name, in spite of the efforts of spiteful reactionaries, is surrounded in the historic memory of mankind with a halo of liberation from all shackles and all prejudices. The privileged classes of every age, as also their lackeys, have always tried to declare the revolution which overthrew them, in contrast to past revolutions, a mutiny, a riot a revolt of the rabble. Classes which have outlived themselves are not distinguished by originality. Soon after the 27th of February, attempts were also made to liken the revolution to the military coup d'etat of the Young Turks, of which, as we know, they had been dreaming not a little in the upper circles of the Russian bourgeoisie. This comparison was so hopeless, however, that it was seriously opposed even in one of the bourgeois papers. Dugan Baranovsky, an economist who had studied Marx in his youth, a Russian variety of Sombart, wrote on March 10 in the Bears Vervedomosti, the Turkish revolution consisted in a victorious uprising of the army, prepared and carried out by the leaders of the army, the soldiers were merely obedient executives of the plans of their officers. But the regiments of the guard which on February 27 overthrew the Russian throne, came without their officers. Not the army but the workers began the insurrection, not the generals but the soldiers came to the state humor.
The soldiers supported the workers not because they were obediently fulfilling the commands of their officers, but because they felt themselves blood brothers of the workers as a class composed of toilers like themselves. The peasants and the workers, those are the two social classes which made the Russian Revolution. These words require neither correction, nor supplement. The further development of the revolution sufficiently confirmed and reinforced their meaning. In Petrograd, the last day of February was the first day after the victory, a day of raptures, embraces, joyful tears, voluble outpourings, but at the same time a day of final blows at the enemy. Shots were still crackling in the streets. It was said that Protopopov's pharaohs, not informed of the people's victory, were still shooting from the roofs. From below they were firing into attics, false windows, and belfries where the armed phantoms of Tsarism might still lurking. About four o'clock they occupied the Admiralty where the last remnants of what was formerly the state power had taken refuge. Revolutionary organizations and improvised groups were making arrests throughout the town. The Schlusselberg hard labor prison was taken without a shot. More and more regiments were joining the revolution, both in the capital and in the environs. The overturn in Moscow was only an echo of the insurrection in Petrograd. The same moods among the workers and soldiers, but less clearly expressed. A slightly more leftward tendency among the bourgeoisie. A still greater weakness among revolutionary organizations than in Petrograd. When events began on the Neva, the Moscow radical intelligentsia called a conference on the question what to do, and came to no conclusion. Only on the 27th of February strikes began in shops and factories of Moscow, and then demonstrations. The officers told the soldiers in the barracks that a rabble was rioting in the streets and they must be put down. But by this time, relates the soldier Shishailin, the soldiers understood the word rabble in the opposite sense. Toward two o'clock, there arrived at the building of the city Duma many soldiers of various regiments inquiring how to join the revolution. On the next day, the strikes increased. Crowds flowed toward the Duma with flags. A soldier of an automobile company, Muralov, an old Bolshevik, an agriculturist, a good-natured and courageous giant, brought to the Duma the first complete and disciplined military detachment, which occupied the wireless station and other points. Eight months later, Moore Alef will be in command of the troops of the Moscow military district. The prisons were opened. The same Moore Alef was driving an automobile truck filled with freed political prisoners. A police officer with his hand at his visor asked the revolutionist whether it was advisable to let out the Jews also. Tsuzinski, just liberated from a hard labor prison and without changing his prison dress, spoke in the Duma building where a Soviet of deputies was already formed. The artist Dorofeev relates how, on March 1st, workers from the Sayu Candy factory came with banners to the barracks of an artillery brigade to fraternize with the soldiers and how many could not contain their joy, and wept. There were cases of sniping in the town, but in general neither armed encounters nor casualties, Petrograd answered for Moscow. In a series of provincial cities, the movement began only on March 1st, after the revolution was already achieved even in Moscow. In Tva, the workers went from their work to the barracks in a procession and, having mixed with the soldiers, marched through the streets of the city. At that time, they were still singing the mass lays, not the Internationale. In Nizhny Novgorod, thousands of workers gathered round the city Duma building, which in a majority of the cities played the role of the Tauride Palace. After a speech from the mayor, the workers marched off with red banners to free the politicals from the jails. By evening, 18 out of the 21 military divisions of the garrison had voluntarily come over to the revolution. In Samara and Saratov, meetings were held, Soviets of workers' deputies organized. In Kharkov, the chief of police, having gone to the railroad station and got news of the revolution, stood up in his carriage before an excited crowd and, lifting his hat, shouted at the top of his lungs, Long live the revolution! Hurrah! 
The news came to Ekaterina Slav from Kharkov. At the head of the demonstration strode the assistant chief of police carrying in his hand a long sabre as in the grand parades on saints' days. When it became finally clear that the monarchy could not rise, they began cautiously to remove the Tsar's portraits from the government institutions and hide them in the attics. Anecdotes about this, both authentic and imaginary, were much passed around in liberal circles, where they had not yet lost a taste for the jocular tone when speaking of the revolution. The workers, and the soldier barracks as well, took the events in a very different way. As to a series of other provincial cities, Skov, or El, Rybensk, Penza, Kazan, Zaritsyn, and others, the chronicle remarks under date of March 2nd, news came of the uprising and the population joined the revolution. This description, notwithstanding its summary character, tells with fundamental truth what happened. News of the revolution trickled into the villages from the nearby cities, partly through the authorities, but chiefly through the markets, the workers, the soldiers on furlough. The villages accepted the revolution more slowly and less enthusiastically than the cities, but felt it no less deeply. For them it was bound up with the question of war and land. It would be no exaggeration to say that Petrograd achieved the February Revolution. The rest of the country adhered to it. There was no struggle anywhere except in Petrograd. There were not to be found anywhere in the country any groups of the population, any parties, institutions, or military units, which were ready to put up a fight for the old regime. This shows how ill-founded was the belated talk of the reactionaries to the effect that if there had been cavalry of the guard in the Petersburg garrison, or if Ivanov had brought a reliable brigade from the front, the fate of the monarchy would have been different. Neither at the front nor at the rear was there a brigade or regiment to be found which was prepared to do battle for Nicholas II. The revolution was carried out upon the initiative and by the strength of one city, constituting about 175th of the population of the country. You may say, if you will, that this most gigantic democratic act was achieved in a most undemocratic manner. The whole country was placed before a fait accompli. The fact that a constituent assembly was in prospect does not alter the matter, for the dates and methods of convoking this national representation were determined by institutions which issued from the victorious insurrection of Petrograd. This casts a sharp light on the question of the function of democratic forms in general, and in a revolutionary epoch in particular. Revolutions have always struck such blows at the judicial fetishism of the popular will and the blows have been more ruthless the deeper, bolder and more democratic the revolutions. It is often said, especially in regard to the great French Revolution, that the extreme centralization of a monarchy subsequently permits the revolutionary capital to think and act for the whole country. That explanation is superficial. If revolutions reveal a centralizing tendency, this is not an imitation of overthrown monarchies but in consequence of irresistible demands of the new society, which cannot reconcile itself to particularism. If the capital plays as dominating a role in a revolution as though it concentrated in itself the will of the nation, that is simply because the capital expresses most clearly and thoroughly the fundamental tendencies of the new society. The provinces accept the steps taken by the capital as their own intentions already materialized. In the initiatory role of the centers there is no violation of democracy, but rather its dynamic realization. However, the rhythm of this dynamic has never in great revolutions coincided with the rhythm of formal representative democracy. The provinces adhere to the activity of the center, but belatedly. With the swift development of events characteristic of a revolution this produces sharp crises in revolutionary parliamentarism which cannot be resolved by the methods of democracy. In all genuine revolutions the national representation has invariably come into conflict with the dynamic force of the revolution, whose principal seat has been the capital. It was so in the 17th century in England, in the 18th in France, in the 20th in Russia. The role of the capital is determined not by the tradition of a bureaucratic centralism, but by the situation of the leading revolutionary class whose vanguard is naturally concentrated in the chief city, 
This is equally true for the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. When the February victory was fully confirmed, they began to count up the victims. In Petrograd, they counted 1,443 killed and wounded, 869 of them soldiers and 60 of these officers. By comparison with the victims of any battle in the Great Slaughter, these figures are suggestively tiny. The liberal press declared the February Revolution bloodless. In the days of general salubrity and mutual amnesty of the patriotic parties, nobody took the trouble to establish the truth. Albert Thomas, a friend of everything victorious, even a victorious insurrection, wrote at that time about the sunniest, most holiday-like, most bloodless Russian revolution. To be sure, he was hopeful that this revolution would remain at the disposal of the French Bourse. But after all Thomas did not invent this habit. On the 27th of June 1789, Myrab exclaimed, How fortunate that this great revolution will succeed without evil doing and without tears. History has too long been telling us only of the actions of beasts of prey. We may well hope that we are beginning the history of human beings. When all the three estates were united in the National Assembly, the ancestors of Albert Thomas wrote, The revolution is ended. It has not cost a drop of blood. We must acknowledge, however, that at that period blood had really not yet flowed. Not so in the February days. Nevertheless the legend of a bloodless revolution stubbornly persisted, answering the need of the liberal bourgeois to make things look as though the power had come to him of its own accord. Although the February revolution was far from bloodless, still one cannot but be amazed at the insignificant number of victims, not only at the moment of revolution but still more in the first period after it. This revolution, we must remember, was a paying back for oppression, persecution, taunts, vile blows, suffered by the masses of the Russian people throughout the ages. The sailors and soldiers did in some places, to be sure, take summary revenge upon the most contemptible torturers in the person of their officers but the number of these acts of settlement was at first insignificant in comparison with the number of the old bloody insults. The masses shook off their good-naturedness only a good while later, when they were convinced that the ruling classes wanted to drag everything back and appropriate to themselves a revolution not achieved by them, just as they had always appropriated the good things of life not produced by themselves. Dugan Baranovsky is right when he says that the February Revolution was accomplished by workers and peasants the latter in the person of the soldiers. But there still remains the great question, who led the revolution? Who raised the workers to their feet? Who brought the soldiers into the streets? After the victory, these questions became a subject of party conflict. They were solved most simply by the universal formula, nobody led the revolution, it happened of itself. The theory of spontaneousness fell in most opportunely with the minds not only of all those gentlemen who had yesterday been peacefully governing, judging, convicting, defending, trading, or commanding, and today were hastening to make up to the revolution, but also of many professional politicians and former revolutionists, who having slept through the revolution wished to think that in this they were not different from all the rest. In his curious history of the Russian disorders, General Denikin, former commander of the White Army, says of the 27th of February, on that decisive day, there were no leaders, there were only the elements. In their threatening current there were then visible neither aims, nor plans, nor slogans. The learned historian Miliukov delves no deeper than this general with a passion for letters. Before the revolution, the liberal leader had declared every thought of revolution a suggestion of the German staff. But the situation was more complicated after a revolution which had brought the liberals to power. Miliukov's task was now not to dishonor the revolution with a Hohenzollern origin, but on the contrary to withhold the honor of its initiation from revolutionists. Liberalism therefore has wholeheartedly fathered the theory of a spontaneous and impersonal revolution. Miliukov sympathetically cites the semi-liberal, semi-socialist Stankovich, a university instructor who became political commissar at the headquarters of the Supreme Command, the masses moved of themselves, obeying some unaccountable inner summons, writes Stankovich of the February days. With what slogans did the soldiers come out? 
who led them when they conquered Petrograd, when they burned the district court. Not a political idea, not a revolutionary slogan, not a conspiracy, and not a revolt, but a spontaneous movement suddenly consuming the entire old power to the last remnant. Spontaneousness here acquires an almost mystic character. This same Stankovich offers a piece of testimony in the highest degree valuable. At the end of January, I happened in a very intimate circle to meet with Kierensky. To the possibility of a popular uprising, they all took a definitely negative position, fearing lest a popular mass movement once aroused might get into an extreme leftward channel and this would create vast difficulties in the conduct of the war. The views of Kierensky's circle in no wise essentially differed from those of the cadets. The initiative certainly did not come from there. The revolution fell like thunder out of the sky, says the president of the Social Revolutionary Party, Zenzinov. Let us be frank, it arrived joyfully unexpected for us too, revolutionists who had worked for it through long years and waited for it always. It was not much better with the Mensheviks. One of the journalists of the bourgeois emigration tells about his meeting in a tram car on February 21 with Skoplev, a future minister of the revolutionary government. This social democrat, one of the leaders of their movement, told me that the disorders had the character of plundering which it was necessary to put down. This did not prevent Skoplev from asserting a month later that he and his friends had made the revolution. The colors here are probably laid on a little thick but fundamentally the position of the legal social democrats, the Mensheviks, is conveyed accurately enough. Finally, one of the most recent leaders of the left wing of the social revolutionaries, Mstislavsky, who subsequently went over to the Bolsheviks, says of the February uprising, the revolution caught us, the party people of those days, like the foolish virgins of the Bible, napping. It does not matter how much they resembled virgins, but it is true they were all fast asleep. How was it with the Bolsheviks? This we have in part already seen. The principal leaders of the underground Bolshevik organization were at that time three men the former workers Shlyapnikov and Zalotsky, and the former student Molotov. Shlyapnikov, having lived for some time abroad and in close association with Lenin, was in a political sense the most mature and active of these three who constituted the Bureau of the Central Committee. However, Shlyapnikov's own memoirs best of all confirm the fact that the events were too much for the trio. Up to the very last hour, these leaders thought that it was a question of a revolutionary manifestation, one among many, and not at all of an armed insurrection. Our friend K. Yurov, one of the leaders of the Vyborg section, asserts categorically, absolutely no guiding initiative from party centers was felt. The Petrograd committee had been arrested and the representative of the Central Committee, Comrade Shlyapnikov, was unable to give any directives for the coming day. The weakness of the underground organizations was a direct result of police raids, which had given exceptional results amid the patriotic moods at the beginning of the war. Every organization, the revolutionary included, has a tendency to fall behind its social basis. The underground organization of the Bolsheviks at the beginning of 1917 had not yet recovered from its oppressed and scattered condition, whereas in the masses the patriotic hysteria had been abruptly replaced by revolutionary indignation. In order to get a clear conception of the situation in the sphere of revolutionary leadership, it is necessary to remember that the most authoritative revolutionists, the leaders of the left parties, were abroad, and, some of them, in prison and exile. The more dangerous a party was to the old regime, the more cruelly beheaded it appeared at the moment of revolution. The Narodniks had a Duma faction headed by the non-party radical Kierensky. The official leader of the social revolutionaries, Jinov, was abroad. The Mensheviks had a party faction in the Duma headed by Chides and Skoblev, Martov was abroad, Dan and Tsritelli, in exile. A considerable number of socialistic intellectuals with a revolutionary past were grouped around these left factions, Narodnik and Menshevik. This constituted a kind of political staff, but one which was capable of coming to the front only after the victory. The Bolsheviks had no Duma faction, their five worker deputies, 
in whom the Tsarist government had seen the organizing center of the revolution, had been arrested during the first few months of the war. Lenin was abroad, Zinovov with him, Kamenev was in exile, in exile also, the then little known practical leaders, Sverdlov, Rykov, Stalin. The Polish Social Democrat, Tsarzynski, who did not yet belong to the Bolsheviks, was at hard labor. The leaders accidentally present, for the very reason that they had been accustomed to act under unconditionally authoritative supervisors, did not consider themselves and were not considered by others capable of playing a guiding role in revolutionary events. But if the Bolshevik party could not guarantee the insurrection and authoritative leadership, there is no use talking of other organizations. This fact has strengthened the current conviction as to the spontaneous character of the February Revolution. Nevertheless the conviction is deeply mistaken, or at least meaningless. The struggle in the capital lasted not an hour, or two hours, but five days. The leaders tried to hold it back, the masses answered with increased pressure and marched forward. They had against them the old state behind whose traditional facade a mighty power was still assumed to exist, the liberal bourgeoisie with the state duma, the land and city unions, the military industrial organizations, academies, universities, a highly developed press, and finally the two strong socialist parties who put up a patriotic resistance to the assault from below. In the party of the Bolsheviks the insurrection had its nearest organization but a headless organization with a scattered staff and with weak, illegal nuclei. And nevertheless the revolution, which nobody in those days was expecting, unfolded, and just when it seemed from above as though the movement was already dying down, with an abrupt revival, a mighty convulsion, it seized the victory. Whence came this unexampled force of aggression and self-restraint? It is not enough to refer to bitter feelings. Bitterness alone is little. The Petersburg workers, no matter how diluted during the war years with human raw material, had in their past a great revolutionary experience. In their aggression and self-restraint, in the absence of leadership, and in the face of opposition from above, was revealed a vitally well-founded, although not always expressed, estimate of forces and a strategic calculation of their own dot on the eve of the war, the revolutionary layers of the workers had been following the Bolsheviks, and leading the masses after them. With the beginning of the war, the situation had sharply changed, conservative groups lifted their heads, dragging after them a considerable part of the class. The revolutionary elements found themselves isolated, and quieted down. In the course of the war, the situation began to change, at first slowly, but after the defeats faster and more radically. An active discontent seized the whole working class. To be sure, it was to an extent patriotically colored, but it had nothing in common with the calculating and cowardly patriotism of the possessing classes, who were postponing all domestic questions until after the victory. The war itself, its victims, its horror, its shame, brought not only the old, but also the new layers of workers into conflict with the Tsarist regime. It did this with a new incisiveness and led them to the conclusion, we can no longer endure it. The conclusion was universal, it welded the masses together and gave them a mighty dynamic force. The army had swollen, drawing into itself millions of workers and peasants. Every individual had his own people among the troops, a son, a husband, a brother, a relative. The army was no longer insulated, as before the war, from the people. One met with soldiers now far oftener, saw them off to the front lived with them when they came home on leave, chatted with them on the streets and in the tramways about the front, visited them in the hospitals, the workers' districts, the barracks, the front, and to an extent the villages too, became communicating vessels. The workers would know what the soldiers were thinking and feeling. They had innumerable conversations about the war, about the people who were getting rich out of the war, about the generals, government, czar, and Tsarina. The soldier would say about the war, to hell with it. And the worker would answer about the government, to hell with it. The soldier would say, why then do you sit still here in the center? The worker would answer, 
we can't do anything with bare hands, we stubbed our toe against the army in 1905. The soldier would reflect, what if we should all start at once? The worker, that's it, all at once. Conversations of this kind before the war were conspirative and carried on by twos, now they were going on everywhere, on every occasion, and almost openly, at least in the workers' districts. The Tsar's intelligence service every once in a while took its soundings very successfully. Two weeks before the revolution, a spy, who signed himself with the name Krestyaninov, reported a conversation in a tram car traversing the workers' suburb. The soldier was telling how in his regiment eight men were under hard labor because last autumn they refused to shoot at the workers of the Nobel factory, but shot at the police instead. The conversation went on quite openly, since in the workers' districts the police and the spies preferred to remain unnoticed. We'll get even with them, the soldier concluded. The report reads further, a skilled worker answered him, for that it is necessary to organize so that all will be like one. The soldier answered, don't you worry, we've been organized a long time. They've drunk enough blood. Men are suffering in the trenches and here they are fattening their bellies. No special disturbance occurred. February 10, 1917. Krestyaninov. Incomparable spies epic. No special disturbance occurred. They will occur, and that soon. This tramway conversation signalizes their inexorable approach. The spontaneousness of the insurrection Mstislavsky illustrates with a curious example, when the Union of Officers of February 27, formed just after the revolution, tried to determine with a questionnaire who first led out the Volinsky regiment, they received seven answers naming seven initiators of this decisive action. It is very likely, we may add, that a part of the initiative really did belong to several soldiers, nor is it impossible that the chief initiator fell in the street fighting, carrying his name with him into oblivion. But that does not diminish the historic importance of his nameless initiative. Still more important is another side of the matter which will carry us beyond the walls of the barrack room. The insurrection of the battalions of the guard, flaring up a complete surprise to the liberal and legal socialist circles was no surprise at all to the workers. Without the insurrection of the workers, the Volinsky regiment would not have gone into the street. That street encounter of the workers with the Cossacks, which a lawyer observed from his window and which he communicated by telephone to the deputy, was to them both an episode in an impersonal process, a factory locust stumbled against a locust from the barracks. But it did not seem that way to the Cossack who had dared wink to the worker, nor to the worker who instantly decided that the Cossack had winked in a friendly manner. The molecular interpenetration of the army with the people was going on continuously. The workers watched the temperature of the army and instantly sensed its approach to the critical mark. Exactly this was what gave such unconquerable force to the assault of the masses confident of victory. Here we must introduce the pointed remark of a liberal official trying to summarize his February observations, it is customary to say that the movement began spontaneously, the soldiers themselves went into the street. I cannot at all agree with this. After all, what does the word spontaneously mean? Spontaneous conception is still more out of place in sociology than in natural science. Owing to the fact that none of the revolutionary leaders with a name was able to hang his label on the movement, it becomes not impersonal but merely nameless. This formulation of the question, incomparably more serious than Miliukov's references to German agents and Russian spontaneousness, belongs to a former procurer who met the revolution in the position of a Tsarist senator. It is quite possible that his experience in the courts permitted Zavadsky to realize that a revolutionary insurrection cannot arise either at the command of foreign agents, or in the manner of an impersonal process of nature. The same author relates two incidents which permitted him to look as through a keyhole into the laboratory of the revolutionary process. On Friday, February 24, when nobody in the upper circles as yet expected a revolution in the near future, a tram car in which the senator was riding turned off quite unexpectedly, with such a jar that the windows rattled and one was broken, from the light line into a side street, and there stopped. The conductor told everybody to get off, the car isn't going any farther. 
The passengers objected, scolded, but got off. I can still see the face of that unanswering conductor, angrily resolute, a sort of wolf look. The movement of the tramways stopped everywhere as far as the eye could see. That resolute conductor, in whom the liberal official could already catch a glimpse of the wolf look, must have been dominated by a high sense of duty in order all by himself to stop a car containing officials on the streets of Imperial Petersburg in time of war. It was just such conductors who stopped the car of the monarchy and with practically the same words, this car does not go any farther exclamation mark and who ushered out the bureaucracy, making no distinction in the rush of business between a general of gendarmes and a liberal senator. The conductor on the Lydiny Boulevard was a conscious factor of history. It had been necessary to educate him in advance. During the burning of the district court, a liberal jurist from the circle of that same senator started to express in the streets his regret that a room full of judicial decisions and notarial archives was perishing. An elderly man of somber aspect dressed as a worker angrily objected, We will be able to divide the houses and the lands ourselves and without your archives. Probably the episode is rounded out in a literary manner. But there were plenty of elderly workers like that in the crowd, capable of making the necessary retort. They themselves had nothing to do with burning the district court, why burn it? But at least you could not frighten them with excesses of this kind. They were arming the masses with the necessary ideas not only against the Tsarist police but against liberal jurists who feared most of all lest they should burn up in the fire of the revolution the notarial deeds of property. Those nameless, austere statesmen of the factory and street did not fall out of the sky, they had to be educated. In registering the events of the last days of February, the Secret Service also remarked that the movement was spontaneous, that is, had no planned leadership from above but they immediately added, with the generally propagandized condition of the proletariat. This appraisal hits the bull's eye, the professionals of the struggle with the revolution, before entering the cells vacated by the revolutionists, took a much closer view of what was happening than the leaders of liberalism. The mystic doctrine of spontaneousness explains nothing. In order correctly to appraise the situation and determine the moment for a blow at the enemy, it was necessary that the masses or their guiding layers should make their examination of historical events and have their criteria for estimating them. In other words, it was necessary that there should be not masses in the abstract, but masses of Petrograd workers and Russian workers in general, who had passed through the revolution of 1905, through the Moscow insurrection of December 1905 shattered against the Simonovsky Regiment of the Guard. It was necessary that throughout this mass should be scattered workers who had thought over the experience of 1905, criticized the constitutional illusions of the liberals and Mensheviks, assimilated the perspectives of the revolution, meditated hundreds of times about the question of the army, watched attentively what was going on in its midst workers capable of making revolutionary inferences from what they observed and communicating them to others. And finally, it was necessary that there should be in the troops of the garrison itself progressive soldiers, seized, or at least touched, in the past by revolutionary propaganda. In every factory, in each guild, in each company, in each tavern, in the military hospital, at the transfer stations, even in the depopulated villages. The molecular work of revolutionary thought was in progress. Everywhere were to be found the interpreters of events, chiefly from among the workers, from whom one inquired, what's the news? And from whom one awaited the needed words. These leaders had often been left to themselves, had nourished themselves upon fragments of revolutionary generalizations arriving in their hands by various routes had studied out by themselves between the lines of the liberal papers what they needed. Their class instinct was refined by a political criterion, and though they did not think all their ideas through to the end, nevertheless their thought ceaselessly and stubbornly worked its way in a single direction. Elements of experience, criticism, initiative, self-sacrifice, seeped down through the mass and created, invisibly to a superficial glance but no less decisively, 
an inner mechanics of the revolutionary movement as a conscious process. To the smug politicians of liberalism and tamed socialism, everything that happens among the masses is customarily represented as an instinctive process, no matter whether they are dealing with an anthill or a beehive. In reality, the thought which was drilling through the thick of the working class was far bolder, more penetrating, more conscious, than those little ideas by which the educated classes live. Moreover, this thought was more scientific, not only because it was to a considerable degree fertilized with the methods of Marxism, but still more because it was ever nourishing itself on the living experience of the masses which were soon to take their place on the revolutionary arena. Thoughts are scientific if they correspond to an objective process and make it possible to influence that process and guide it. Were these qualities possessed in the slightest degree by the ideas of those government circles who were inspired by the apocalypse and believed in the dreams of Rasputin? Or maybe the ideas of the liberals were scientifically grounded, who hoped that a backward Russia, having joined the scrimmage of the capitalist giants, might win at one and the same time victory and parliamentarism. Or maybe the intellectual life of those circles of the intelligentsia was scientific, who slavishly adapted themselves to this liberalism, senile since childhood, protecting their imaginary independence the while with long dead metaphors. In truth, here was a kingdom of spiritual inertness, spectres, superstition, and fictions, a kingdom, if you will of spontaneousness. But have we not in that case a right to turn this liberal philosophy of the February Revolution exactly upside down? Yes, we have a right to say, at the same time that the official society, all that many storied superstructure of ruling classes, layers, groups, parties, and cliques, lived from day to day by inertia and automatism, nourishing themselves with the relics of worn-out ideas deaf to the inexorable demands of evolution, flattering themselves with phantoms, and foreseeing nothing, at the same time, in the working masses there was taking place an independent and deep process of growth, not only of hatred for the rulers but of critical understanding of their impotence, an accumulation of experience, and creative consciousness which the revolutionary insurrection and its victory only completed dot to the question, who led the February revolution? We can then answer definitely enough. Conscious and tempered workers educated for the most part by the party of Lenin. But we must here immediately add, this leadership proved sufficient to guarantee the victory of the insurrection, but it was not adequate to transfer immediately into the hands of the proletarian vanguards the leadership of the revolution. Nine the paradox of the February Revolution the insurrection triumphed. But to whom did it hand over the power snatched from the monarchy? We come here to the central problem of the February Revolution, why and how did the power turn up in the hands of the liberal bourgeoisie? In Duma circles and in bourgeois society no significance was attributed to the agitation beginning the 23rd of February. The liberal deputies and patriotic journalists were assembling in drawing rooms as before, talking over the questions of Trist and Fume and again confirming Russia's need of the Dardanelles. When the decree dissolving the Duma was already signed, a Duma commission was still hastily considering the question of turning over the food problem to the city administration. Less than twelve hours before the insurrection of the battalions of the guard, the Society for Slavic Reciprocity was peacefully listening to its annual report. Only when I had returned home on foot from that meeting, remembers one of the deputies. I was struck by some sort of awesome silence and emptiness in the usually lively streets. That awesome emptiness was forming around the old ruling classes and already oppressing the hearts of their future inheritors. By the 26th, the seriousness of the movement had become clear both to the government and to the liberals. On that day, negotiations about a compromise were going on between the Tsar's ministers and members of the Duma negotiations from which even subsequently the liberals never lifted the curtain. Protopopov states in his testimony that the leaders of the Duma bloc demanded as formerly the naming of new ministers from among people enjoying social confidence, this measure perhaps will pacify the people. But the 26th created, as we know, a certain stoppage in the development of the revolution, and for a brief moment the government felt firmer. 
When Rodzi and Co. called on Golitsyn to persuade him to resign, the Premier pointed in answer to a portfolio on his desk in which lay the completed edict dissolving the Duma, with the signature of Nicholas but without a date. Golitsyn put in the date. How could the government decide upon such a step at the moment of growing pressure from the revolution? Upon this question the ruling bureaucrats long ago arrived at a firm conviction. Whether we have a block or not, it is all the same to the workers' movement. We can handle that movement by other means, and up till now the Ministry of the Interior has managed to deal with it. Thus Gormikin had spoken in August 1915. On the other hand, the bureaucracy believed that the Duma, in case of its dissolution, would not venture upon any bold step. Again in August 1915, in discussing the question of dissolving a discontented Duma, the Minister of the Interior, Prince Sherbatov, had said, the Duma will hardly venture upon direct disobedience. The vast majority are after all cowards and are trembling for their hides. The Prince expressed himself none too nicely, but in the long run correctly. In its struggle with the Liberal opposition, then, the bureaucracy felt plenty of firm ground under its feet. On the morning of the 27th, the deputies, alarmed at the mounting events, assembled at a regular session. The majority learned only here that the Duma had been dissolved. The news seemed the more surprising as on the very day before they had been carrying on peace negotiations with the ministers. And nevertheless, writes Rodzi and Co. with pride, the Duma submitted to the law, still hoping to find a way out of the tangled situation, and passed no resolution that it would not disperse, or that it would illegally continue its sessions. The deputies gathered at a private conference in which they made confessions of impotence to each other. The moderate liberal Shidlovsky subsequently remembered, not without a malicious pleasure, a proposal made by an extreme left code, Nekrasov, a future colleague of Irinsky, to establish a military dictatorship, handing over the whole power to a popular general. At that time a practical attempt at salvation was undertaken by the leaders of the progressive bloc, not present at this private conference of the Duma. Having summoned the Grand Duke Mikhail to Petrograd, they proposed to him to take upon himself the dictatorship, to impel the personal staff of the government to resign and to demand of the Tsar by direct wire that he grant a responsible ministry. In those hours, when the uprising of the first guard regiments was beginning, the liberal bourgeoisie were making a last effort to put down the insurrection with the help of a dynastic dictator, and at the same time at the expense of the revolution to enter into an agreement with the monarchy. The hesitation of the Grand Duke, complains Rodzi and Co., contributed to the letting slip of the favorable moment. How easily a radical intelligentsia believes whatever it wants to, is testified by a non-party socialist, Sukhanov, who begins in this period to play a certain political role in the Tauride Palace. They told me the fundamental political news of those morning hours of that unforgettable day, he relates in his extensive memoirs, the decree dissolving the state Duma had been promulgated, and the Duma had answered with a refusal to disperse, electing a provisional committee. This is written by a man who hardly ever left the Tauride Palace, and was the continually buttonholing his deputy friends. Miliukov in his History of the Revolution, following Rodzi and Co., categorically declares, There was adopted after a series of hot speeches a resolution not to leave Petrograd, but no resolution that the state Duma should as an institution not disperse, as the legend runs. Not to disperse would have meant to take upon themselves however belatedly, a certain initiative. Not to leave Petrograd meant to wash their hands of the matter and wait to see which way the course of events would turn. The credulousness of Sukhanov has, by the way, mitigating circumstances. The rumor that the Duma had adopted a revolutionary resolution not to submit to the Tsar's decree was slipped in hurriedly by the Duma journalists in their information bulletin. The only paper published at that time owing to the general strike. Since the insurrection triumphed during that day the deputies were in no hurry to correct this mistake, being quite willing to sustain the illusions of their left friends. They did not in fact undertake to establish the facts of the matter until they were out of the country. The episode seems secondary, but it is full of meaning.
the revolutionary role of the Duma on the 27th of February was a complete myth, born of the political credulity of the radical intelligentsia delighted and frightened by the revolution, distrusting the ability of the masses to carry the business through, and eager to lean as quickly as possible toward the enfranchised bourgeoisie. In the memoirs of the deputies belonging to the Duma majority, there is preserved by good luck a story of how the Duma did meet the revolution. According to the account of Prince Mansi Ref, one of the right cadets, among the deputies who assembled in great numbers on the morning of the 27th there were no members of the presidium, no leaders of parties, nor heads of the progressive bloc, they already knew of the dissolution and the insurrection and had preferred as long as possible to refrain from showing their heads. Moreover, at just that time they were, it seems, negotiating with Mikhail about the dictatorship. A general consternation and bewilderment prevailed in the Duma, says Mansi Ref. Even lively conversations ceased, and in their place were heard sighs and brief ejaculations like it's come, or indeed frank expressions of fear for life. Thus speaks a very moderate deputy who sighed the loudest of all. At two o'clock in the afternoon, when the leaders had found themselves obliged to appear in the Duma, the secretary of the presidium brought in the joyful but ill-founded news, the disorders will soon be put down, because measures have been taken. It is possible that by measures was meant the negotiations for a dictatorship, but the Duma was downcast and awaited a decisive word from the leader of the progressive bloc. We cannot adopt any decision at the present moment, Mili Ukov announced, because the extent of the disorders is unknown to us. Likewise it is unknown on upon which side a majority of the local troops, workers, and social organizations will take their stand. It is necessary to gather accurate information about this, and then will be time enough to judge the situation. At present it is too soon. At two o'clock in the afternoon of February 27, it is still for liberalism too soon. Gather information means wash your own hands and await the outcome of the struggle. But Miliukov had not ended his speech, which, by the way, he began with a view to ending in nothing, when Kierensky came running into the hall in high excitement, an enormous crowd of people and soldiers is coming to the Torride Palace, he announces, and intends to demand of the Duma that it seize the power in its hands. The radical deputy knows accurately just what the enormous crowd of people is going to demand. In reality, it is Kierensky himself who first demands that the power shall be seized by a Duma which is still hoping in its soul that the insurrection may yet be put down. Kierensky's announcement is met with general bewilderment and dismayed looks. He has however not finished speaking when a frightened Duma attendant, rushing in, interrupts him. The advanced detachment of the soldiers has already reached the palace, a detachment of sentries stopped them at the entrance. The chief of the sentries, it seems, was heavily wounded. A minute later, it transpires that the soldiers have entered the palace. It will be declared later in speeches and articles that the soldiers came to greet the Duma and swear loyalty to it, but right now everything is in mortal panic. The water is up to their necks. The leaders whisper together. We must get a breathing space. Rodzianke hastily introduces a proposal suggested to him by somebody, that they form a provisional committee. Affirmative cries. But they all want to get out there as quickly as possible. No time for voting. The president, no less frightened than the others, proposes that they turn over the formation of the committee to the council of elders. Again affirmative cries from the few still remaining in the hall. The majority have already vanished. Such was the first reaction of the Duma dissolved by the Tsar, to the victory of the insurrection. At that time the revolution was creating in the same building, only in a less showy part of it, another institution. The revolutionary leaders did not have to invent it, the experience of the Soviets of 1905 was forever chiseled into the consciousness of the workers. At every lift of the movement, even in wartime, the idea of Soviets was almost automatically reborn. And although the appraisal of the role of the Soviets was different among Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, the social revolutionaries had in general no stable appraisals, the form of organization itself stood clear of all debate. 
the Mensheviks liberated from prison, members of the military industrial committee, meeting in the Torrid Palace with leaders of the trade union and cooperative movements, likewise of the right wing, and with the Menshevik deputies of the Duma, Chides and Skoplev, straightway formed a provisional executive committee of the Soviet of Workers deputies which in the course of the day was filled out principally with former revolutionists who had lost connection with the masses but still preserved their names. This executive committee, including also Bolsheviks in its staff, summoned the workers to elect deputies at once. The first session was appointed for the same evening in the Torrid Palace. It actually met at nine o'clock and ratified the staff of the executive committee supplementing it with official representatives from all the socialist parties. But not here lay the significance of this first meeting of representatives of the victorious proletariat of the capital. Delegates from the mutinied regiments made speeches of greeting at this meeting. Among their number were completely grey soldiers, shell-shocked as it were by the insurrection, and still hardly in control of their tongues but they were just the ones who found the words which no orator could find. That was one of the most moving scenes of the revolution, now first feeling its power, feeling the unnumbered masses it has aroused, the colossal tasks, the pride in success, the joyful failing of the heart at the thought of the morrow which is to be still more beautiful than today. The revolution still has no ritual, the streets are in smoke, the masses have not yet learned the new songs. The meeting flows on without order, without shores, like a river at flood. The Soviet chokes in its own enthusiasm. The revolution is mighty but still naive, with a child's naiveness. At this first session it was decided to unite the garrison with the workers in a general Soviet of workers and soldiers deputies. Who first proposed this resolution? It probably arose from various, or rather from all sides as an echo of that fraternization of workers and soldiers which had this day decided the fate of the revolution. From the moment of its formation, the Soviet, in the person of its executive committee, begins to function as a sovereign. It elects a temporary food commission and places it in charge of the mutineers and of the garrison in general. It organizes parallel with itself a provisional revolutionary staff, everything was called provisional in those days of which we have already spoken above. In order to remove financial resources from the hands of the officials of the old power, the Soviet decides to occupy the state bank, the treasury, the mint and the printing office with a revolutionary guard. The tasks and functions of the Soviet grow unceasingly under pressure from the masses. The revolution finds here its indubitable center. The workers, the soldiers, and soon also the peasants, will from now on turn only to the Soviet. In their eyes, the Soviet becomes the focus of all hopes and all authority, an incarnation of the revolution itself. But representatives of the possessing classes will also seek in the Soviet, with whatever grindings of teeth, protection and counsel in the resolving of conflicts. However, even in those very first days of victory, when the new power of the revolution was forming itself with fabulous speed and unconquerable strength, those socialists who stood at the head of the Soviet were already looking around with alarm to see if they could find a real boss. They took it for granted that power ought to pass to the bourgeoisie. Here the chief political knot of the new regime is tied, one of its threads leads into the chamber of the executive committee of workers and soldiers the other into the central headquarters of the bourgeois parties. The Council of Elders at three o'clock in the afternoon, when the victory was already fully assured in the capital, elected a provisional committee of members of the Duma made up from the parties of the progressive bloc with the addition of Chides and Kierensky. Chides declined, Kierensky wiggle-waggled. The designation prudently indicated that it was not a question of an official committee of the state Duma but a private committee of a conference of members of the Duma. The leaders of the progressive bloc thought to the very end of but one thing, how to avoid responsibility and not tie their own hands. The task of the committee was defined with meticulous equivocation, the restoration of order and conducting of negotiations with institutions and persons. Not a word as to the kind of order which those gentlemen intended to restore nor with what institutions they intended to negotiate. 
they were not yet openly reaching out their hands toward the bear's hide, what if he is not killed but only badly wounded? Only at eleven o'clock in the evening of the twenty-seventh, when, as Miliukov acknowledged, the whole scope of the revolutionary movement had become clear, did the Provisional Committee decide upon a further step, and take in its hands the power which had fallen from the hands of the government. Imperceptibly the new institution had changed from a committee of the members of the Duma to a committee of the Duma itself. There is no better means of preserving the state juridical succession than forgery. But Miliukov remains silent about the chief thing. The leaders of the executive committee of the Soviet, created during that day, had already appeared before the provisional committee and insistently demanded that it take the power into its hands. This friendly push had its effect. Miliukov subsequently explained the decision of the Duma committee by saying that the government was supposed to be sending loyal troops against the insurrectionists, and on the streets of the capital it threatened to come to actual battle. In reality the government was already without troops, the revolution was wholly in the past. Rodzienko subsequently wrote that in case they had declined the power, the Duma would have been arrested and killed off to the last man by the mutinied troops, and the power would gave gone immediately to the Bolsheviks. That is, of course, an inept exaggeration, wholly in the character of the respected Lord Chamberlain, but it unmistakably reflects the feelings of the Duma which regarded the transfer of power to itself as an act of political rape. With such feelings the decision was not easily arrived at. Rodzienko especially stormed and vacillated, putting a question to the others, what will this be? Is it a rebellion or not a rebellion? The monarchist deputy Shulgin answered him, according to his own report, there is no rebellion in this at all, take the power as a loyal subject. If the ministers have run away somebody has got to take their place. There may be two results, everything quiets down, the sovereign names a new government, we turn over the power to him. Or it doesn't quiet down. In that case if we don't take the power, others will take it, those who have already elected some sort of scoundrels in the factories. We need not take offence at the low class abuse directed by the reactionary gentlemen toward the workers, the revolution had just firmly stepped on the tails of all these gentlemen. The moral is clear, if the monarchy wins, we are with it, if the revolution wins, we will try to plunder it. The conference lasted long. The democratic leaders were anxiously waiting for a decision. Finally, Miliukov came out of the office of Rodzienko. He wore a solemn expression. Approaching the Soviet delegation Miliukov announced, the decision is reached we will take the power. I did not inquire whom he meant by we, relates Sukhanov with rapture, I asked nothing further, but I felt with all my being, as they say, a new situation. I felt that the ship of the revolution, tossed in the squall of those hours by the complete caprice of the elements, had put up a sail, acquired stability and regularity in its movements amid the terrible storm and the rocking. What a high-flying formula for a prosaic recognition of the slavish dependence of the petty bourgeois democracy upon capitalistic liberalism. And what a deadly mistake in political perspective. The handing over of power to the liberals not only will not give stability to the ship of state, but, on the contrary, will become from that moment a source of headlessness of the revolution, enormous chaos, embitterment of the masses, collapse of the front and in the future extreme bitterness of the civil war. If you look only backward, to past ages, the transfer of power to the bourgeoisie seems sufficiently regular, in all past revolutions those who fought on the barricades were workers, apprentices, in part students, and the soldiers came over to their side. But afterward, the solid bourgeoisie, having cautiously watched the barricades through their windows, gathered up the power. But the February Revolution of 1917 was distinguished from former revolutions by the incomparably higher social character and political level of the revolutionary class, by the hostile distrust of the insurrectionists toward the liberal bourgeoisie, and the consequent formation at the very moment of victory of a new organ of revolutionary power, the Soviet, based upon the armed strength of the masses. In these circumstances, 
the transfer of power to a politically isolated and unarmed bourgeoisie demands explanation. First of all, we must examine more closely the correlation of forces which resulted from the revolution. Was not the Soviet democracy compelled by the objective situation to renounce the power in favor of the big bourgeoisie? The bourgeoisie itself did not think so. We have already seen that it not only did not expect power from the revolution, but on the contrary foresaw in it a mortal danger to its whole social situation. The moderate parties not only did not desire a revolution, writes Rodzienko, but were simply afraid of it. In particular the party of the people's freedom, the cadets, as a party standing at the left wing of the moderate group, and therefore having more than the rest a point of contact with the revolutionary parties of the country, was more worried by the advancing catastrophe than all the rest. The experience of 1905 had too significantly hinted to the liberals that a victory of the workers and peasants might prove no less dangerous to the bourgeoisie than to the monarchy. It would seem that the course of the February insurrection had only confirmed this foresight. However formless in many respects may have been the political ideas of the revolutionary masses in those days, the dividing line between the toilers and the bourgeoisie was at any rate implacably drawn. Instructor Stankovich, who was close to liberal circles, a friend, not an enemy of the progressive bloc, characterizes in the following way the mood of those circles on the second day after the overturn which they had not succeeded in preventing, officially they celebrated, eulogized the revolution, cried hurrah. To the fighters for freedom, decorated themselves with red ribbons and marched under red banners. But in their souls, in their conversations tete -a tete they were horrified, they shuddered, they felt themselves captives in the hands of hostile elements traveling an unknown road. Unforgettable is the figure of Rod Zienko, that portly lord and imposing personage, when, preserving a majestic dignity but with an expression of deep suffering despair frozen on his pale face, he made his way through a crowd of disheveled soldiers in the corridor of the Torride Palace. Officially it was recorded, the soldiers have come to support the Duma in its struggle with the government. But actually the Duma had been abolished from the very first day. And the same expression was on the faces of the members of the Provisional Committee of the Duma and those circles which surrounded it. They say that the representatives of the progressive bloc in their own homes wept with impotent despair. This living testimony is more precious than any sociological research into the correlation of forces. According to his own tale, Rodzienka trembled with impotent indignation when he saw unknown soldiers, at whose orders is not recorded arresting the officials of the old regime and bringing them to the Duma. The Lord Chamberlain turned out to be something in the nature of a jailer in relation to people, with whom he had, to be sure, his differences, but who nevertheless remained people of his own circle. Shocked by this arbitrary action, Rodzienko invited the arrested minister Sheglovatov into his office, but the soldiers brusquely refused to turn over to him the hated official. When I tried to show my authority, relates Rodzienko, the soldiers surrounded their captive and with the most challenging and insolent expression pointed to their rifles, after which without more ado they led Sheglovatov the way I know not where. Would it be possible to confirm more absolutely Sankovich's assertion that the regiments supposedly coming to support the Duma, in reality abolished it? The power was from the very first moment in the hands of the Soviet, upon that question the Duma members less than anybody else could cherish any illusion. The Octoberist deputy Shidlovsky, one of the leaders of the progressive bloc, relates how, the Soviet seized all the post and telegraph bureaus, the wireless, all the Petrograd railroad stations, all the printing establishments, so that without its permission it was impossible to send a telegram, to leave Petrograd, or to print an appeal. In this unequivocal characterization of the correlation of forces, it is necessary to introduce one slight correction, the seizure by the Soviet of the telegraph, railroad stations, printing establishments, etc meant merely that the workers and clerks in those enterprises refused to submit to anybody but the Soviet. The plaint of Shidlovsky is admirably illustrated by an incident which occurred at the very height of the negotiations about the power between the leaders of the Soviet and the Duma. 
their joint session was interrupted by an urgent communication from Skov, where after his railroad wanderings the Tsar had now come to a stand, stating that they wanted Rodzi and Co on the direct wire. The all-powerful president of the Duma declared that he would not go to the telegraph office alone. Let some of these messieurs, soldiers and workers deputies give me a bodyguard or go with me, otherwise I will be arrested there in the telegraph office. Look here, you've got the power and the sovereignty, he continued excitedly, you can, of course, arrest me. Maybe you are going to arrest us all, how do we know? This happened on the 1st of March. Less than 24 hours after the power was taken over by the provisional committee with Rodzi and Go at its head. How did it happen then that in such a situation the Liberals turned out to be in power? How and by whom were they authorized to form a government as the result of a revolution which they had dreaded, which they had resisted, which they tried to put down, which was accomplished by masses completely hostile to them? and accomplished with such audacity and decisiveness that the Soviet of workers and soldiers arising from the insurrection became the natural, and by all unequivocally recognized, master of the situation. Let us listen now to the other side, to those who surrendered the power. The people did not gravitate toward the state Duma, writes Sukhanov of the February days, they were not interested in it, and never thought of making it either politically or technically the center of the movement. This acknowledgement is the more remarkable in that its author will soon devote all his force to getting the power handed over to a committee of the state Duma. Miliukov perfectly understood, says Sukhanov further, speaking of the negotiations of March 1st, that the executive committee was in a perfect position either to give the power to the bourgeois government, or not to give it. Could it be more categorically expressed? Could a political situation be clearer? And nevertheless Sukhanov, in direct contradiction to the situation and to himself, immediately adds, the power destined to replace Tsarism must be only a bourgeois power. We must steer our course by this principle. Otherwise the uprising will not succeed and the revolution will collapse. The revolution will collapse without Rodzi and Go. The problem of the living relations of social forces is here replaced by an a priori scheme and a conventional terminology, and this is the very essence of the doctrinarism of the intelligentsia. But we shall see later that this doctrinarism was by no means platonic, it fulfilled a very real political function, although with blindfolded eyes. We have quoted Sukhina for a reason. In that first period, the inspirer of the executive committee was not its president. Chides, an honest and limited provincial, but this very Sukhanov, a man, generally speaking, totally unsuited for revolutionary leadership. Semi Narodnik, semi Marxist, a conscientious observer rather than a statesman, a journalist rather than a revolutionist, a rationalizer rather than a journalist, he was capable of standing by a revolutionary conception only up to the time when it was necessary to carry it into action. A passive internationalist during the war, he decided on the very first day of the revolution that it was necessary just as quickly as possible to toss the power and the war over to the bourgeoisie. As a theorist, that is, at least in his feeling of the need that things should be reasoned out, if not in his ability to fulfill it, he stood above all the then members of the executive committee. But his chief strength lay in his ability to translate into a language of doctrinaires the organic traits of all that many colored and yet homogeneous brotherhood, distrust of their own powers, fear of the masses, and a heartily respectful attitude toward the bourgeoisie. Lenin described Sukhanov as one of the best representatives of the petty bourgeoisie, and that is the most flattering thing that can be said of him. Only in this connection it must not be forgotten that the question is here of a new capitalist type of petty bourgeoisie, of industrial, commercial and bank clerks, the functionaries of capital on one side, and the workers' bureaucracy on the other, that is of that new middle caste, in whose name the well-known German social democrat Eduard Bernstein undertook at the end of the last century a revision of the revolutionary conceptions of Marx. In order to answer the question how a revolution of workers and peasants came to surrender the power to the bourgeoisie, it is necessary to introduce into the political chain an intermediate link, the petty bourgeois democrats and socialists of the Sukhanov type, 
journalists and politicians of the new middle caste, who had taught the masses that the bourgeoisie is an enemy, but themselves feared more than anything else to release the masses from the control of that enemy. The contradiction between the character of the revolution and the character of the power that issued from it, is explained by the contradictory character of this new petty bourgeois partition wall between the revolutionary masses and the capitalist bourgeoisie. In the course of further events the political role of this petty bourgeois democracy of the new type will fully open before us. For the time being, we will limit ourselves to a few words. A minority of the revolutionary class actually participates in the insurrection, but the strength of that minority lies in the support, or at least sympathy, of the majority. The active and militant minority inevitably puts forward under fire from the enemy its more revolutionary and self sacrificing element. It is thus natural that in the February fights, the worker Bolsheviks occupied the leading place. But the situation changes the moment the victory is won and its political fortification begins. The elections to the organs and institutions of the victorious revolution attract and challenge infinitely broader masses than those who battled with arms in their hands. This is true not only of general democratic institutions like the city Duma and Zemstvos, or later on, the Constituent Assembly, but also of class institutions like the Soviet of workers' deputies. An overwhelming majority of the workers, Menshevik, social revolutionary, and non-party, supported the Bolsheviks at the moment of direct grapple with Tsarism. But only a small minority of the workers understood that the Bolsheviks were different from other socialist parties. At the same time, however, all the workers drew a sharp line between themselves and the bourgeoisie. This fact determined the political situation after the victory. The workers elected socialists, that is, those who were not only against the monarchy, but against the bourgeoisie. In doing this, they made almost no distinction between the three socialist parties. And since the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries comprised infinitely larger ranks of the intelligentsia, who came pouring in from all sides, and thus got into their hands immediately an immense staff of agitators, the elections, even in shops and factories, gave them an enormous majority. An impulse in the same direction, but an incomparably stronger one, came from the awakening army. On the fifth day of the insurrection, the Petrograd garrison followed the workers. After the victory, it found itself summoned to hold elections for the Soviet. The soldiers trustfully elected those who had been for the revolution against monarchist officers, and who knew how to say this out loud, these were volunteers, clerks, assistant surgeons, young wartime officers from the intelligentsia, petty military officials, that is, the lowest layers of that new middle caste. All of them almost to the last man inscribed themselves, beginning in March, in the party of the social revolutionaries which with its intellectual formlessness perfectly expressed their intermediate social situation and their limited political outlook. The representation of the garrison thus turned out to be incomparably more moderate and bourgeois than the soldier masses. But the latter were not conscious of this difference, it would reveal itself to them only during the experience of the coming months. The workers, on their part, were trying to cling as closely as possible to the soldiers in order to strengthen their blood-bought union and more permanently arm the revolution. And since the spokesmen of the army were predominantly half-baked social revolutionaries, this fact could not help raising the authority of that party along with its ally, the Mensheviks, in the eyes of the workers themselves. Thus resulted the predominance in the Soviets of the two compromised parties. It is sufficient to remark that even in the Soviet of the Vyborg district the leading role in those first times belonged to the worker Mensheviks. Bolshevism in that period was still only simmering in the depths of the revolution. Thus the official Bolsheviks, even in the Petrograd Soviet, represented an insignificant minority, who had moreover none too clearly defined its tasks. Thus arose the paradox of the February Revolution. The power was in the hands of the democratic socialists. It had not been seized by them accidentally by way of a blanquist coup, no, it was openly delivered to them by the victorious masses of the people. 
those masses not only did not trust or support the bourgeoisie, but they did not even distinguish them from the nobility and the bureaucracy. They put their weapons at their disposal only of the Soviets. Meanwhile the socialists, having so easily arrived at the head of the Soviets, were worrying about only one question, will the bourgeoisie, politically isolated, hated by the masses, and hostile through and through to the revolution, consent to accept the power from our hands? Its consent must be won at any cost. And since obviously a bourgeoisie cannot renounce its bourgeois program, we, the socialists, will have to renounce ours, we will have to keep still about the monarchy, the war, the land, if only the bourgeoisie will accept the gift of power. In carrying out this operation, the socialists, as though to ridicule themselves, continued to designate the bourgeoisie no otherwise than as their class enemy. In the ceremonial forms of their worship was thus introduced an act of arrant blasphemy. A class struggle carried to its conclusion is a struggle for state power. The fundamental character of a revolution lies in its carrying the class struggle to its conclusion. A revolution is a direct struggle for power. Nevertheless, our socialists are not worried about getting the power away from the class enemy who does not possess it, and could not with his own forces seize it. But, just the opposite, with forcing this power upon him at any cost. Is not this indeed a paradox? It seems all the more striking, because the experience of the German Revolution of 1918 did not then exist, and humanity had not yet witnessed a colossal and still more successful operation of this same type carried out by the new middle caste led by the German social democracy. How did the compromisers explain their conduct? One explanation had a doctrinaire character, since the revolution is bourgeois, the socialists must not compromise themselves with the power, let the bourgeoisie answer for itself. This sounded very implacable. In reality, however, the petty bourgeoisie disguised with this false implacability its obsequiousness before the power of wealth, education, enfranchised citizenship. The right of the big bourgeoisie to power, the petty bourgeois acknowledged as a right of primogeniture, independent of the correlation of forces. Fundamentally we adhere the same almost instinctive movement which has compelled the small merchant or teacher to step aside respectfully in the stations or theatres to let a Rothschild pass. Doctrinaire arguments served as a compensation for the consciousness of a personal insignificance. In only two months, when it became evident that the bourgeoisie was totally unable with its own force to keep the power thus delivered to it, the compromisers had no difficulty in tossing away their socialistic prejudices and entering a coalition ministry, not in order to crowd out the bourgeoisie but, on the contrary, in order to save it, not against its will but, on the contrary, at its invitation, which sounded almost like a command. Indeed, the bourgeoisie threatened the Democrats, if they refused, to let the power drop on their heads. The second argument for refusing the power, although no more serious in essence, had a more practical appearance. Our friend Sukhanov made the most of the scatteredness of democratic Russia, the Democrats had at that time no stable or influential organizations, party, professional, or municipal. That sounds almost like a joke. Not a word about the Soviets of workers and soldiers deputies from this socialist who is acting in the name of the Soviets. As a matter of fact, thanks to the tradition of 1905, the Soviets sprang up as though from under the earth, and immediately became incomparably more powerful than all the other organizations which later tried to compete with them, the municipalities, the cooperatives, and in part the trade unions. As for the peasantry, a class by its very nature scattered, thanks to the war and revolution, it was exactly at that moment organized as never before. The war had assembled the peasants into an army, and the revolution had given the army a political character. No fewer than eight million peasants were united in companies and squadrons, which had immediately created their revolutionary representation and could through it at any moment be brought to their feet by a telephone call. Is this at all similar to scatteredness? You may say, to be sure, that at the moment of deciding the question of power, the democracy did not know what would be the attitude of the army at the front. 
We will not raise the question whether there was the slightest basis for fearing or hoping that the soldiers at the front, worn out with the war, would want to support the imperialist bourgeoisie. It is sufficient to remark that this question was fully decided during the next two or three days, which the compromisers passed in the backstage preparation of a bourgeois government. The revolution was successfully achieved by the 3rd of March, concedes Sukhanov. In spite of the adherence of the whole army to the Soviets, the leaders of the latter continued with all their strength to push away the power, they feared it the more, the more completely it became concentrated in their hands. But why? How could those Democrats, socialists, directly supported by such human masses as no democracy in history ever had behind it, masses, moreover, with a considerable experience, disciplined and armed, and organized in Soviets, how could that all powerful and apparently unconquerable democracy fear the power? This apparently intricate enigma is explained by the fact that the democracy did not trust its own support, feared those very masses, did not believe in the stability of their confidence in itself, and worst of all dreaded what they called anarchy, that is, that having seized the power, they might along with the power prove a mere plaything of the so called unbridled elements. In other words, the democracy felt that it was not called to be the leader of the people at the moment of its revolutionary uprising, but the left wing of a bourgeois order, its feeler stretched out toward the masses. It called itself, and even deemed itself socialistic, in order to disguise not only from the masses, but from itself too, its actual role, without this self-inebriation it could not have fulfilled this role. This is the solution of the fundamental paradox of the February Revolution. On the evening of March 1, representatives of the Executive Committee, Chides, Stekloff, Sukhanov, and others, appeared at a meeting of the Duma Committee, in order to discuss the conditions upon which the Soviets would support the new government. The program of the Democrats flatly ignored the question of war, republic, land, eight hour day and confined itself to one single demand, to give the left parties freedom of agitation. An example of disinterestedness for all peoples and ages. Socialists, having all the power in their hands, and upon whom alone it depended whether freedom of agitation should be given to others or not, handed over the power to their class enemy upon the condition that the latter should promise them dot freedom of agitation. Rodzienko was afraid to go to the telegraph office and said to Chides and Sukhanov, you have the power, you can arrest us all. Chides and Sukhanov answered him, take the power. But don't arrest us for propaganda. When you study the negotiations of the compromisers with the liberals, and in general all the incidents of the interrelation of the left and right wings at the Torride Palace in those days, it seems as though upon that gigantic stage upon which the historic drama of a people is developing, a group of provincial actors, availing themselves of a vacant corner and a pause, were playing out a cheap quick change vaudeville act. The leaders of the bourgeoisie, we must do them justice, never expected anything of the kind. They would surely have less dreaded the revolution if they had counted upon this kind of politics from its leaders. To be sure, they would have miscalculated even in that case, but at least together with the latter. Fearing, nevertheless, that the bourgeoisie might not agree to take the power on the proposed conditions, Sukhanov delivered a threatening ultimatum, either we or nobody can control the elements. There is but one way out, agree to our terms. In other words, accept the program, which is your program for this we promise to subdue for you the masses who gave us the power. Poor subduers of the elements. Miliukov was astonished. He did not try to conceal, remembers Sukhanov, his satisfaction and his agreeable astonishment. When the Soviet delegates, to make it sound more important, added that their conditions were final, Miliukov even became expansive and patted them on the head with the remark, yes. I was listening and I was thinking how far forward our workers' movement has progressed since the days of 1905. In the same tone of the good-natured crocodile the Hohenzollern diplomat at Brest-Litovsk conversed with the delegates of the Ukrainian Rada, complimenting them upon their statesmanlike maturity just before swallowing them up. 
If the Soviet democracy was not swallowed up by the bourgeoisie, it was not Miliukov's fault, and no thanks to Sukhanov. The bourgeoisie received the power behind the backs of the people. It had no support in the toiling classes. But along with the power it received a simulacrum of support second hand. The Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, lifted aloft by the masses, delivered as if from themselves a testimonial of confidence to the bourgeoisie. If you look at this operation of formal democracy in cross-section you have a picture of a two-fold election, in which the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries play the technical role of a middle link, that is, cut electors. If you take the question politically, it must be conceded that the compromises betrayed the confidence of the masses by calling to power those against whom they themselves were elected. And finally from a deeper, more social point of view, the question presents itself thus, the petty bourgeois parties, having in everyday circumstances shown an extraordinary pretentiousness and satisfaction with themselves, as soon as they were raised by a revolution to the heights of power, were frightened by their own inadequacy and hastened to surrender the helm to representatives of capital. In this act of prostration is immediately revealed the terrible shakiness of the new middle caste and its humiliating dependence upon the big bourgeoisie. Realizing or only feeling that the power in their hands would not last long anyway, that they would soon have to surrender it either to the right or the left, the Democrats decided that it was better to give it today to the solid liberals than tomorrow to the extreme representatives of the proletariat. But in this view also, the role of the compromisers, in spite of its social conditioning, does not cease to be a treachery to the masses. In giving their confidence to the socialists, the workers and soldiers found themselves, quite unexpectedly, expropriated politically. They were bewildered, alarmed, but did not immediately find a way out. Their own betrayers deafened them from above with arguments to which they had no ready answer, but which conflicted with all their feelings and intentions. The revolutionary tendencies of the masses, even at the moment of the February Revolution, did not at all coincide with the compromised tendencies of the petty bourgeois parties. The proletariat and the peasantry voted for the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries not as compromisers, but as opponents of the Tsar, the capitalists, and the landowners. But in voting for them they created a partition wall between themselves and their own names. They could not now move forward at all without bumping into this wall erected by themselves, and knocking it over. Such was the striking quid pro quo comprised in the class relations as they were uncovered by the February Revolution. To this fundamental paradox, a supplementary one was immediately added. The liberals agreed to take the power from the hands of the socialists only on condition that the monarchy should agree to take it from their hands. During the time when Guchkov, with the monarchist Shulgin, already known to us, was traveling out to Skov to save the dynasty, the problem of a constitutional monarchy was at the center of negotiation between the two committees in the Torrid Palace. Miliukov was trying to convince the Democrats who had come to him with the power in the palms of their hands, that the Romanovs could now no longer be dangerous, that Nicholas, to be sure, would have to be removed, but that the Zarevish Alexei, with Mikhail as regent, could fully guarantee the welfare of the country, the one is a sick child, the other an utterly stupid man. We will add also a characterization which the liberal monarchist Shidlovsky gave of the candidate for Tsar, Mikhail Alexandrovich has tried every way possible to avoid interfering in any affairs of state, devoting himself wholeheartedly to horse racing. A striking recommendation especially if it were repeated before the masses. After the flight of Louis XVI to Vienne, Danton proclaimed in the Jacobin club that once a man is weak-minded he can no longer be king. The Russian liberals thought on the contrary that the weak-mindedness of a monarch would serve as the best possible decoration for a constitutional regime. However, this was a random argument calculated to impress the mentality of the left simpletons, a little too crude, however even for them. It was suggested to broad circles of the liberal Philistines that Mikhail was an Anglomaniac without making clear whether in the matter of horse racing or parliamentarism. But the main argument was that they needed a customary symbol of power. 
otherwise the people would imagine that anarchy had come. The Democrats listened, were politely surprised, and tried to persuade them to declare a republic? No. Only not to decide the question in advance. The third point of the Executive Committee's conditions read, the provisional government shall not undertake any steps which would define in advance the future form of government. Miliukov made of the question of the monarchy an ultimatum. The Democrats were in despair. But here the masses came to their help. At the meetings in the Doride Palace, absolutely nobody, not only among the workers but among the soldiers, wanted a Tsar, and there was no means of imposing one upon them. Nevertheless, Miliukov tried to swim against the current and to save the throne and dynasty over the heads of his left allies. In his history of the revolution, he himself cautiously remarks that toward the end of the 2nd of March the excitement produced by his announcement of the regency of Mikhail had considerably increased. Rodzi and Kofar more colorfully paints the effect upon the masses produced by this monarchist maneuver of the liberals. The moment he arrived from Pskov with the Tsar's abdication in favor of Mikhail, Guchkov upon the demand of the workers, went from the station to the railroad shops to tell what had happened, and, having read the act of abdication, he concluded, long live the Emperor Mikhail. The result was unexpected. The orator was, according to Rodzienko, immediately arrested by the workers and even apparently threatened with execution. He was liberated with great difficulty with the help of a sentry company of the nearest regiment. Rodzienko, as always, exaggerates a little, but the essence of the matter is correctly stated. The country had so radically vomited up the monarchy that it could not ever crawl down the people's throat again. The revolutionary masses did not permit even the thought of a new Tsar. Facing such a situation, the members of the provisional committee sidled away from Mikhail one after another, not decisively but until the Constituent Assembly and then we shall see. Only Miliukov and Guchkov stood out for monarchy to the end, continuing to make it a condition of their entering the cabinet. What to do? The Democrats thought that without Miliukov it was impossible to create a bourgeois government, and without a bourgeois government to save the revolution. Bickerings and persuasions went on without end. At a morning conference on March 3rd, a conviction of the necessity of persuading the Grand Duke to abdicate they considered him Tsar then, after all exclamation mark seemed to gain the upper hand completely in the provisional committee. The left cut Nekrasov even drew up a text of the abdication. But since Miliukov stubbornly refused to yield, a decision was finally reached after further passionate quarrels. Both sides shall present before the Grand Duke their opinions and without further argument leave the decision to the Grand Duke himself. Thus an utterly stupid man, to whom his older brother overthrown by the insurrection had tried, in conflict even with the dynastic statute, to slip the throne, unexpectedly became the super umpire on the question of the state structure of the revolutionary country. However improbable it may seem, a betting competition had arisen over the fate of the state. In order to induce the Duke to tear himself away from the stables for the throne, Miliukov assured him that there was an excellent possibility of collecting outside of Petrograd a military force to defend his rights. In other words, having barely received the power from the hands of the socialists, Miliukov advanced a plan for a monarchist coup d'etat. At the end of the speeches for and against, of which there were not a few, the Grand Duke requested time for reflection. Inviting Rodzi and Co. into another room, Mikhail flatly asked him, would the new authorities guarantee him only the crown, or also his head? The incomparable Lord Chamberlain answered that he could only promise the monarch in case of need to die with him. This did not at all satisfy the candidate. Coming out to the deputies after an embrace with Rodzi and Co., Mikhail Romanov pretty firmly declared that he would decline the lofty but risky position offered to him. Here Kierensky, who personified in these negotiations the conscience of the democracy, ecstatically jumped up from his chair with the words, Your Highness, you are a noble man. And swore that from that time on he would proclaim this everywhere. Kierensky's grandiloquence, comments Miliukov dryly, 
harmonized badly with the pros of the decision just taken. It is impossible to disagree. The text of this interlude truly left no place for pathos. To our comparison with a vaudeville played in the corner of an ancient amphitheater, it is necessary to add that the stage was divided by screens into two halves, in one, the revolutionists were begging the liberals to save the revolution, in the other, the liberals were begging the monarchy to save liberalism. The representatives of the executive committee were sincerely perplexed as to why such a cultured and far sighted man as Miliukov should be obstinate about some old monarchy, and even be ready to renounce the power if he could not get a Romanov thrown in. Miliukov's monarchism, however, was neither doctrinaire, nor romantic, on the contrary, it was a result of the naked calculation of the frightened property owners. In its nakedness indeed lay its hopeless weakness. Miliukov the historian, might, it is true, cite the example of the leader of the French revolutionary bourgeoisie, Mirab, who also in his day strove to reconcile the revolution with the king. The two at the bottom it was the fear of the property owners for their property, the more prudent policy was to disguise it with the monarchy, just as the monarchy had disguised itself with the church. But in 1789 the tradition of kingly power in France had still a universal popular recognition, to say nothing of the fact that all surrounding Europe was monarchist. In clinging to the king, the French bourgeoisie was still on common ground with the people, at least in the sense that it was using against the people their own prejudices. The situation was wholly different in Russia in 1917. Aside from the shipwreck of the monarchist regime in various other countries of the world, the Russian monarchy itself had been irremediably damaged already in 1905. After the 9th of January, Father Gapin had cursed the Tsar and his serpent offspring. The Soviet of Workers' Deputies of 1905 had stood openly for a republic. The monarchist feelings of the peasantry, upon which the monarchy itself had long counted, and with references to which the bourgeoisie camouflaged its own monarchism, simply did not exist. The militant counter-revolution which arose later, beginning with Kornilov, although hypocritically, nevertheless all the more demonstratively, disavowed as a wrist power, so little was left of the monarchist roots in the people. But that same revolution of 1905, which mortally wounded the monarchy, had undermined forever the unstable republican tendencies of the advanced bourgeoisie. In contradicting each other, these two processes supplemented each other. Feeling in the first hours of the February Revolution that it was drowning, the bourgeoisie grabbed at a straw. It needed the monarchy, not because that was a faith common to it and the people, on the contrary, the bourgeoisie had nothing left to set against the faith of the people but a crowned phantom. The educated classes of Russia entered the arena of the revolution not as the announcers of a rational state, but as defenders of medieval institutions. Having no support either in the people or in themselves, they sought it above themselves. Archimedes undertook to move the earth if they would give him a point of support. Miliukov was looking for a point of support in order to prevent the overthrow of the landlord's earth. Nine he felt in this operation much nearer to the calloused Russian generals and the hierarchs of the Orthodox Church, than to these tame democrats who were worried about nothing but the approval of the liberals. Not being in a position to break the revolution, Miliukov firmly decided to outwit it. He was ready to swallow a great deal, civil liberty for soldiers democratic municipalities, constituent assembly, but on one condition, that they should give him an Archimedean point of support in the form of monarchy. He intended gradually and step by step to make the monarchy the axis of a group of generals, a patched up bureaucracy, princes of the church, property owners, all those who were dissatisfied with the revolution, and starting with a symbol to create gradually a real monarchist bridle for the masses as soon as the latter should get tired of the revolution. If only he could gain time. Another leader of the Kurt party, Nabokov, explained later what a capital advantage would have been gained if Mikhail had consented to take the throne, the fatal question of convoking a constituent assembly in wartime would have been removed. We must bear those words in mind. The conflict about the date of the Constituent Assembly occupied a great place between February and October, 
during which time the Koditz categorically denied their intention to delay the summoning of the people's representatives, while insistently and stubbornly carrying out a policy of postponement in fact. Alas, they had only themselves to rely on in this effort, the monarchist camouflage they never got. After the desertion of Mikhail, Miliukov had not even a straw to grab. Ten the new power the belated Russian bourgeoisie, separated from the people, bound up much more closely with foreign finance capital than with its own toiling masses, hostile to the revolution which had triumphed, could not in its own name find a single justification for its pretense to power. And yet some justification was necessary, for the revolution was subjecting to a ruthless examination not only inherited rights but new claims. Least of all capable of presenting convincing arguments to the masses was the president of the provisional committee, Rodzienko, who arrived at the head of the revolutionary nation during the first days of the uprising. A page in the court of Alexander II, an officer of the Cavalier Guard, head of the nobles of his province, Lord Chamberlain under Nicholas II, a monarchist through and through, a rich landlord and agrarian administrator, a member of the Octoberist party, a deputy in the state Duma, Rodzienko was finally elected its president. This happened after the resignation of Guchkov, who was hated by the court as a young Turk. The Duma hoped that, through the mediation of the Lord Chamberlain, it would find easier access to the heart of the monarch. Rodzienko did what he could, sincerely enough assured the Tsar of his loyalty to the dynasty, begged the honor of being presented to the heir apparent, and introduced himself to the latter as the biggest and fattest man in Russia. In spite of all his Byzantine clowning, the Lord Chamberlain did not win over the Tsar to the constitution, and the Tsarina briefly referred to Rodzienko in her letters as a scoundrel. During the war, the president of the Duma undoubtedly gave the Tsar not a few unpleasant moments, cornering him when making personal reports and filling his ears with prolix exhortations, patriotic criticisms, and gloomy forebodings. Rasputin considered Rodzienko a personal enemy. Kurlov, who was close to the court gang, speaks of Rodzienko's insolence combined with obvious limitations. Witt spoke in better terms although condescendingly, of the president of the Duma, not a stupid man, rather sensible, but still Rodzienko's chief talent lies not in his mind but his voice, he has an excellent base. At first, Rodzienko tried to put down the revolution with the help of the fire hose, he wept when he found out that the government of Count Golitsyn had abandoned its post declined with terror the power which the socialists offered him, afterward decided to take it, but only in order as a loyal subject to restore the lost property as soon as possible to the monarch. It wasn't Rodzienko's fault if that opportunity never arrived. However the revolution, with the help of the socialists, did offer the Lord Chamberlain a grand opportunity to exercise his thunderous base before the revolting troops. As early as the 27th of February, this retired captain of the guard said to a cavalier regiment which had come to the Tauride Palace, Christian warriors, hearken to my counsel. I am an old man, I will not deceive you, obey your officers, they will not teach you evil, and will act in full agreement with the state Duma. Long live holy Russia! Such a revolution as that would have been agreeable to all the guard officers, but the soldiers couldn't help wondering what was the use making such a revolution. Rodzienko feared the soldiers, feared the workers, considered chides and other left deputies German agents, and while he stood at the head of the revolution kept looking around every few minutes to see whether the Soviet was going to arrest him. The figure of Rodzienko was a little funny, but by no means accidental. This Lord Chamberlain with an excellent base personified the union of the two ruling classes of Russia, the landlords and the bourgeoisie with the progressive priesthood adhering to them. Rodzienke himself was very pious and expert in hymn singing, and the liberal bourgeoisie, whatever its attitude toward Greek orthodoxy, considered a union with the church just as necessary to law and order as a union with the monarchy. The venerable monarchist, having received the power from the hands of conspirators, rebels, and tyrannicides, wore a haunted expression in those days and the other members of the provisional committee felt but little better. 
some of them never appeared at the Torride Palace at all, considering that the situation had not yet sufficiently defined itself. The wisest of them sneaked on tiptoe round the blaze of the revolution, choking from the smoke, and saying to themselves, let it burn down to the cools, then we'll try to cook up something. Although it agreed to accept the power, the committee did not immediately decide to form a ministry. Awaiting the proper moment for the formation of a government as Miliukov expresses it, the committee confined itself to the naming of commissars from the membership of the Duma to the principal governmental departments. That left them a chance to retreat. To the Ministry of the Interior they delegated the deputy Karolov, insignificant but rather less cowardly than the others, and he issued on March 1st an order for the arrest of all police officials, public, secret, and political. This ferocious revolutionary gesture was purely platonic in character, for the police were already being arrested and the jails were their only refuge from massacre. It was some time later that the reaction began to regard this demonstrative act of Karolov as the beginning of all their troubles. As commander of Petrograd, they appointed Colonel Ingelhart, an officer of the Cavalier Guard, owner of a racing stud and vast landed properties. Instead of arresting the dictator Ivanov, sent from the front to pacify the capital, Ingelhart put at his disposition a reactionary officer in the capacity of chief of staff. It was all a matter between friends. To the Ministry of Justice, they delegated a bright light of the Moscow Liberal Bar, the eloquent and empty Matlokov, who began by giving the reactionary bureaucrats to understand that he did not want to accept the ministry as a favor from the revolution and glancing around at a messenger boy who had just come in, said in French, Le dangerous de gauche. The workers and soldiers did not have to understand French in order to recognize in all these gentlemen their mortal enemies. Rodzienko's reverberations at the head of the committee did not last very long. His candidacy for president of the revolution faded away of itself. The mediator between the monarchy and the property owners was too obviously useless as a mediator between the property owners and the revolution. But he did not disappear from the scene. He stubbornly attempted to revive the Duma as a counterweight to the Soviet, and invariably appears in the center of all attempts to solidify the capitalist landlord counter-revolution. We shall hear of him again. On the 1st of March, the Provisional Committee undertook the formation of a ministry appointing to it those men whom the Duma had been recommending to the Tsar since 1915 as enjoying the confidence of the country. They were big landlords and industrialists, opposition deputies in the Duma, leaders of the progressive bloc. The fact is that, with one single exception, the revolution accomplished by workers and soldiers found no reflection whatever in the staff of the revolutionary government. The exception was Kierensky. The distance from Rodzian to Kierensky appeared officially to represent the whole gamut of the February Revolution. Kierensky entered the government somewhat in the character of a plenipotentiary ambassador. His connection with the revolution, however, was that of a provincial lawyer who had defended political cases. Kierensky was not a revolutionist, he merely hung around the revolution. Arriving in the Fourth Duma thanks to his legal position, Kierensky became the president of a grey and characterless faction, the Trudoviks, anemic fruit of a crossbreeding between liberalism and Narodnikism. He had no theoretical preparation, no political schooling, no ability to think, no political will. The place of these qualities was occupied by a nimble susceptibility, an inflammable temperament, and that kind of eloquence which operates neither upon mind nor will, but upon the nerves. His speeches in the Duma, couched in a spirit of declamatory radicalism which had no lack of occasions, gave Kierensky, if not popularity, at least a certain notoriety. During the war Kierensky, a patriot, had looked with the liberals upon the very idea of revolution as ruinous. He acknowledged the revolution only after it had come and catching him up by his pseudo-popularity lifted him aloft. The revolution naturally identified itself for him with the new power. The executive committee decided, however, that there was a bourgeois revolution and the power should belong to the bourgeoisie. This formula seemed false to Kierensky, if only because it slammed the doors of the ministry in his face. 
Kierensky was quite rightly convinced that his socialism would not trouble the bourgeois revolution, nor would the bourgeois revolution do any damage to his socialism. The Provisional Committee of the Duma decided to try to draw this radical deputy away from the Soviet, and achieved it with no difficulty by offering him the portfolio of justice, which had already been refused by Maklikov. Kierensky buttonholed his friends in the Kaloyas, and asked, Shall I take it or not? His friends had no doubt whatever that he would take it. Sukhanov, who was very friendly toward Kierensky at that period, attributes to him in his subsequent memoirs, a confidence in some mission of his own dot and an enormous vexation with those who had not yet found out about that mission. In the long run his friends, and Sukhanov among them, advised Kierensky to take the portfolio, we will be safe for this way we will have our own man to tell us what is going on among those foxy liberals. But while pushing Kierensky sub rosa toward that sin to which he himself aspired with all his heart, the leaders of the executive committee refused him their official sanction. As Sukhanov reminded Kierensky, the executive committee had already expressed itself against its members entering the government, and to raise the question again in the Soviet would be not without danger for the Soviet might simply answer, the power ought to belong to the Soviet democracy. Those are the very words of Sukhanov himself, an unbelievable mixture of naivete and cynicism. The inspirer of this whole governmental mystification thus openly acknowledges that, as early as the 2nd of March, the Petrograd Soviet was in a mood for the formal seizure of that power which had belonged to it in fact since the evening of February 27th that only behind the backs of the workers and soldiers, without their knowledge, and against their actual will, had the socialist leaders been able to expropriate this power for the benefit of the bourgeoisie. In Sukhanov's account, this deal between the Democrats and the Liberals acquires all the necessary juridical marks of a crime against the revolution, a veritable secret conspiracy against the sovereignty and rights of the people. Discussing Kierensky's impatience, the leaders of the executive committee whispered that it would be embarrassing for the socialists to take back from the members of the Duma a small piece of the power when they had only just handed the whole thing over to them. Better let Kierensky do it on his own responsibility. Truly those gentlemen had an infallible instinct for finding in every situation the most false and tangled up solution possible. But Kierensky did not want to enter the government in the business suit of a radical deputy. He wanted to wear the cloak of a plenipotentiary of the triumphant revolution. In order to avoid obstacles, he did not appeal for sanction either to that party of which he professed himself a member, or to the executive committee of which he was one of the vice presidents. Without warning the leaders, he appeared at a plenary session of the Soviet, chaotic meetings in those days, requested the floor for a special announcement and in a speech which some describe as incoherent, others as hysterical, in which, to be sure, there is no contradiction, demanded the personal confidence of the deputies, and spoke of his general readiness to die for the revolution, and his more immediate readiness to take the portfolio of Minister of Justice. He had only to mention the necessity of complete political amnesty and a prosecution of the Tsar's officials in order to win tumultuous applause from that inexperienced and leaderless assembly. This farce, Shlyapnikov remembers, produced in many a deep indignation and disgust for Kierensky. But nobody opposed him. Having turned over the power to the bourgeoisie, the socialists, as we have heard, wanted to avoid raising that question before the masses. There was no vote. Kierensky decided to interpret the applause as a vote of confidence. In a way, he was right. The Soviet was undoubtedly in favor of socialists entering the ministry, seeing in that a step toward the liquidation of the bourgeois government with which it had not for a moment reconciled itself. At any rate, Kierensky, flouting the official doctrine of the sovereignty, accepted on March 2 the post of Minister of Justice. He was highly pleased with his appointment. The Octoberist Shudlovsky relates and I distinctly remember him in the chambers of the Provisional Committee, lying in an armchair, telling us heatedly upon what an unattainably high pedestal he was going to place justice in Russia. He demonstrated this some months later in his prosecution of the Bolsheviks. The Menshevik chides, 
upon whom the liberals, guided by a too simple calculation and an international tradition, wanted in a hard moment to unload the Ministry of Labor, categorically refused, and remained president of the Soviet. Although less brilliant than Kierensky, Chides was made of more serious material. The axis of the provisional government, although not formally its head, was Miliukov, the indubitable leader of the Kurd party. Miliukov was incomparably above his colleagues in the cabinet, wrote the Kurd Nabokov, after he had broken with Miliukov, as an intellectual force, as a man of enormous, almost inexhaustible knowledge and wide intelligence. Sukhanov, while blaming Miliukov personally for the wreck of Russian liberalism, nevertheless wrote, Miliukov was then the central figure, the soul and brain of all the bourgeois political circles. Without him there would have been no bourgeois policy in the first period of the revolution. In spite of their slightly exalted tone, these reports truly indicate the superiority of Miliukov to the other political men of the Russian bourgeoisie. His strength lay, and his weakness too, in this, he expressed more fully and elegantly than others in the language of politics the fate of the Russian bourgeoisie, the fact that it caught historically in a blind alley. The Mensheviks wept because Miliukov ruined liberalism, but it would be truer to say that liberalism ruined Miliukov. In spite of his near slavism warmed over for imperialistic purposes, Miliukov always remained a bourgeois westerner. The goal of his party was always the triumph in Russia of European civilization. But the farther he went, the more he feared those revolutionary paths upon which the Western peoples were traveling. His Westernism therefore reduced itself to an impotent envy of the West. The English and French bourgeoisie created a new society in their own image. The Germans came later, and they were compelled to live for a long time on the pale gruel of philosophy. The Germans invented the phrase speculative world, which does not exist in English or French. While these nations were creating a new world the Germans were thinking one up. But the German bourgeoisie, although poor in political activity, created the classical philosophy, and that is no small achievement. Russia came much later. To be sure, she translated the German phrase speculative world into Russian, and that with several variations but this only the more clearly exposed both her political impotence and her deadly philosophical poverty. She imported ideas as well as machines, establishing high tariffs for the latter, and for the former a quarantine of fear. To these characteristics of his class, Miliukov was called to give a political expression. A former Moscow professor of history, author of significant scholarly works, founder of the Kurt Party, a union of the liberal landlords and the left intelligentsia, Miliukov was completely free from that insufferable, half aristocratic, and half intellectual political dilettantism which is proper to the majority of Russian liberal men of politics. Miliukov took his profession very seriously and that alone distinguished him. Before 1905, the Russian liberals were customarily embarrassed about being liberal. A tinge of Narodnikism, and later of Marxism, long served them as a defensive coloration. This rather shallow, shame-faced capitulation to socialism on the part of wide bourgeois circles, among them a number of young industrialists, expressed the lack of self-confidence of a class which appeared soon enough to concentrate millions in its hands, but too late to stand at the head of the nation. The bearded fathers, wealthy peasants and shopkeepers, had piled up their money thinking nothing of their social role. Their sons graduated from the university in the period of pre-revolutionary intellectual ferment, and when they tried to find their place in society, they were in no hurry to adopt the banner of liberalism, already worn out in advanced countries, patched and half-faded. For a period of time, they gave a part of their souls, and even a part of their incomes, to the revolutionists. This is especially true of the representatives of the liberal professions. A very considerable number of them passed through a stage of socialistic sympathy in their youth. Professor Miliukov never had these measles. He was organically bourgeois and not ashamed of it. It is true that at the time of the first revolution, Miliukov did not wholly renounce the idea of utilizing the revolutionary masses, 
with the help of tame and well-trained socialist parties, which relates that when he was forming his constitutional cabinet in October 1905, and appealed to the cadets, to cut off their revolutionary tail, the answer was that they could no more get along without the armed forces of the revolution than wit could without the army. In the essence of the matter, this was a bluff even then, in order to raise their own price, the cadets tried to frighten wit with the masses whom they themselves feared. It was precisely the experience of 1905 which convinced Miliukov that, no matter how strong the liberal sympathies of the socialist groups of the intelligentsia might be, the genuine forces of the revolution, the masses, would never give up their weapons to the bourgeoisie, and would be the more dangerous the better armed they were. When he declared openly that the red flag is a red rag, Miliukov ended to everybody's relief a romance which in reality nobody had seriously begun. The isolation of the so-called intelligentsia from the people has been one of the traditional themes of Russian journalism, and by intelligentsia the liberals, in contrast with the socialists, mean all the educated, that is, possessing, classes. Ever since that isolation proved such a calamity to the liberals in the first revolution, the ideologues of the educated classes have lived in a kind of perpetual expectation of the judgment day. One of the liberal writers, a philosopher not restrained by the exigencies of politics, has expressed this fear of the masses with an ecstatic force which reminds us of the epileptic reactionism of Dostoevsky, whatever we stand for, we must not dream of uniting with the people, we must fear them more than all the persecutions of the government, and we must give thanks to the government which alone protects us with its prisons and bayonets from the ferocity of the people. With such political feelings, could the liberals possibly dream of leading a revolutionary nation? Miliukov's whole policy is marked with a stamp of hopelessness. At the moment of national crisis his party thinks about dodging the blow, not dealing it. As a writer, Miliukov is heavy, prolix, and wearisome. He has the same quality as an orator. Decorativeness is unnatural to him. That might have been an advantage, if the niggardly policies of Miliukov had not so obviously needed a disguise, or if they had had, at least, an objective disguise in the shape of a great tradition. There was not even a little tradition. The official policy in France, quintessence of bourgeois perfidy and egotism, has two mighty allies, tradition and rhetoric. Each promoting the other, they surround with a defensive covering any bourgeois politician, even such a prosaic clerk of the big proprietors as Poincare. It is not Miliukov's fault if he had no glorious ancestors, and if he was compelled to conduct a policy of bourgeois egotism on the borders of Europe and Asia. Along with a sympathy for Kierensky, we read in the memoirs of the social revolutionary, Sokolov, one felt from the beginning an immense and unconcealed, and yet rather strange, antipathy for Miliukov. I did not understand, and do not now, why that respectable social reformer was so unpopular. If the Philistines had understood the cause of their admiration for Kierensky and their distaste for Miliukov, they would have ceased to be Philistines. The everyday bourgeois did not like Miliukov, because Miliukov too prosaically and soberly, without adornment, expressed the political essence of the Russian bourgeoisie. Beholding himself in the Miliukov mirror, the bourgeois saw that he was grey, self-interested, and cowardly, and, as so often happens, he took offence at the mirror dot on his side, observing the displeased grimaces of the liberal bourgeois, Miliukov quietly and confidently remarked, the everyday man is a fool. He pronounced these words without irritation, almost caressingly, as though to say, he does not understand me today, but never mind, he will understand later. Miliukov was deeply confident that the bourgeoisie would not betray him, that it would obey the logic of the situation and follow, for it had no other way to go. And in reality, after the February Revolution, all the bourgeois parties, even those to the right, followed the cult leader, abusing and even cursing him. It was very different with the democratic politicians of a socialist colouring, men of the type of Sukhanov. 
This was no ordinary Philistine, but on the contrary a professional man of politics, sufficiently expert in his small trade. He could never look intelligent, because one saw too plainly the continual contrast between what he wanted, and what he arrived at. But he intellectualized and blundered and bored. In order to lead him after you, it was necessary to deceive him by acknowledging his genuine independence, even accusing him of being self-willed, excessively given to command. That flattered him and reconciled him to the role of helper. It was in conversation with just these socialistic highbrows that Miliukov tossed out that phrase, the everyday man is a fool. This was delicate flattery, only you and I are intelligent. As a matter of fact, at that very moment Miliukov was hooking a ring in the noses of his democratic friends. By that ring they were subsequently led out of the way. His personal unpopularity prevented Miliukov from standing at the head of the government. He took the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which had been his specialty in the Duma. The War Minister of the Revolution was the big Moscow industrialist, Guchkov, already known to us, in his youth a liberal with an adventurous temperament but afterward, in the period of the defeat of the first revolution, the trusted man of the big bourgeoisie under Stolypin. The dissolution of the two first Duma, dominated by the cadets, led to the governmental overturn of the 3rd of June 1907, which changed the election law to the benefit of the party of Guchkov. It became the leader of the two subsequent Duma and continued so right up to the day of the revolution. In Kiev in 1911, at the unveiling of a monument to Stolypin who was killed by a terrorist, Guchkov, in placing a wreath, bowed silently down to the ground, a gesture in the name of his class. In the Duma, Guchkov dedicated himself chiefly to the question of military might, and in preparing for war walked hand in hand with Miliukov. In the position of president of the Central Military Industrial Committee, Guchkov united the industrialists under the banner of a patriotic opposition, not however preventing the leaders of the progressive bloc, including Rodzienko, from getting a rake off on military contracts. For revolutionary recommendation there was attached to Guchkov's name that semi-legend about the plot of a palace revolution. A former chief of police asserted, moreover, that Guchkov had permitted himself in private conversations about the monarch to employ an epithet insulting in the highest degree. That was very likely true, but in that Guchkov was no exception. The pious Tsarina hated Guchkov, lavished crude abuse upon him in her letters, and expressed the hope that he would hang on a high tree. But the Tsarina had many others in view for this same high position. Somehow, at any rate, this man who bowed to the earth in honor of the hangman of the first revolution became the war minister of the second. The minister of agriculture was the Kutshingarf, a provincial doctor who had subsequently become a deputy in the Duma. His close associates in the party considered him an honest mediocrity or, as Nabokov expressed it, a Russian provincial intellectual, designed on a small town or county, rather than a national, scale. The indefinite radicalism of his early years had long washed away, and the chief anxiety of Shingriff was to demonstrate his statesmanlike maturity to the possessing classes. Although the old Kud program spoke of the confiscation with just indemnity of the landed estates, none of the property owners took this program seriously, especially now in the years of the war inflation. And Shingriff made it his chief task to delay the decision of the agrarian problem deluding the peasants with the mirage of a constituent assembly which the cadets did not want to summon. On the land question and the question of war, the February Revolution was destined to break its neck. Shingriff helped all he could. The portfolio of finance was given to a young man named Deresh Kanko. Where did they get him? Everybody was inquiring with bewilderment in the Torride Palace. The well-informed explained that this was an owner of sugar factories, estates forests, and other innumerable properties, worth some 80 million rubles in gold, president of the military industrial committee of Kiev, possessed of a good French pronunciation, and on top of it all a connoisseur of the ballet. And they added, more importantly, that as the favorite of Guchkov, Tiresh Kenke had almost taken part in the great conspiracy which was to have overthrown Nicholas II. 
the revolution which prevented that conspiracy was of great help to Tirashkenko. In the course of those five February days when the revolutionary fight was being waged in the cold streets of the capital, the flitted before us several times like a shadow the figure of a liberal of noble family, the son of a former Tsarist minister, Nabokov, almost symbolic in his self satisfied correctness and dry egotism. Nabokov passed the decisive days of the insurrection within the four walls of the chancellery, or his home, in dull and anxious expectancy. He now became general administrator of the provisional government, actually a minister without portfolio. In his Berlin exile where he was finally killed by the stray bullet of a white guard, he left memoirs of the provisional government which are not without interest. Let us place that to his credit. But we have forgotten to mention the Prime Minister, whom, by the way, in the most serious moments of his brief term everybody forgot. On March 2, in recommending the new government to a meeting at the Toride Palace, Miliukov described Prince Lvov as the incarnation of the Russian social consciousness so persecuted by the Tsarist regime. Later, in his History of the Revolution, Miliukov prudently remarks that at the head of the government was placed Prince Lvov, personally little known to the majority of the Provisional Committee. The historian here tries to relieve the politician of responsibility for this choice. As a matter of fact, the Prince had long been a member of the Kurd Party, belonging to its right wing. After the dissolution of the First Duma, at that famous meeting of the deputies at Vyborg which addressed the population with the ritual of offended liberalism, refused to pay the taxes. Prince Lvov attended but did not sign the appeal. Nabokov relates that immediately upon his arrival at Vyborg the prince fell sick, and his sickness was attributed to the emotional condition in which he found himself. The prince was evidently not built for revolutionary excitement. This moderate prince, owing to a political indifference that looked like broad-mindedness, tolerated in the organizations which he administered a large number of left intellectuals, former revolutionists, socialistic patriots, and draft dodgers. They worked just as well as the bureaucrats, did not graft, and moreover created for the prince a simulacrum of popularity. A prince, a rich man, and a liberal, that was very impressive to the average bourgeois. For that reason, Prince Lvov was marked for the premiership even under the Tsar. To sum it all up in a word, the head of the government of the February Revolution was an illustrious but notoriously empty spot. Rodzienko would at least have been more colorful. The legendary history of the Russian state begins with a tale in the Chronicle to the effect that delegates of the Slavic tribes went to the Scandinavian princes with the request, come and rule and be princes over us. The pitiable representatives of the social democracy transformed this historic legend into a fact, not in the 9th but in the 20th century, and with this difference, that they did not address themselves to princes over the sea, but to their own home princes. Thus as a result of a victorious insurrection of workers and soldiers, there appeared at the helm of government a handful of the very richest landlords and industrialists, remarkable for less than nothing political dilettantes without a program, and at the head of them a prince with a strong dislike for excitement. The composition of the new government was greeted with satisfaction in the allied embassies, in the bourgeois and bureaucratic salons, and in the broader circles of the middle, and part of the petty bourgeoisie. Prince Lvov, Oktoberist Gutchkov, Kurt Miliukov, those names sounded reassuring. The name of Gierinsky perhaps caused some eyebrows to rise among the Allies, but they were not badly frightened. The more far-seeing understood, after all, there is a revolution in the country, with such a steady wheel horse as Miliukov, a mettlesome teammate can only be helpful. Thus the French ambassador Paleologue, a great lover of Russian metaphors, must have expressed it. Dot among the workers and soldiers. The composition of the government created an immediate feeling of hostility, or at the best a dumb bewilderment. The name of Miliukov or Guchkov did not evoke one voice of greeting in either factory or barrack. There exists no little testimony to this. Officer Mstislavsky reports the sullen alarm of his soldiers at the news that the power had passed from Tsar to Prince, is that worth shedding blood for? Stankovish, one of Kierinsky's intimate circle made the rounds of his sapper battalion, 
company by company, recommending the new government, which he himself considered the best possible and of which he spoke with great enthusiasm. But I felt a coolness in the audience. Only when the officer mentioned Gierinsky did the soldiers kindle with sincere satisfaction. By that time the bourgeois social opinion of the capital had already converted Gierinsky into the central hero of the revolution. The soldiers even more than the workers desired to see in Gierinsky a counterpoise to the bourgeois government, and only wondered why he was there alone. Gierinsky was not a counterpoise, however, but a finishing touch, a screen, a decoration. He was defending the same interests as Miliukov, but with magnesium flashlights. What was the real constitution of the country after the inauguration of the new power? The monarchist reaction was hiding in the cracks. With the very first ebb of the wave, property owners of all kinds and tendencies gathered around the banner of the Kurd party, which had suddenly become the only non socialist party, and at the same time the extreme right party. In the open arena. The masses went over in droves to the socialists, whom they identified with the Soviet. Not only the workers and soldiers of the enormous garrisons in the rear, but all the many colored small people of the towns, mechanics, street peddlers, petty officials, cab drivers, janitors, servants of all kinds, feeling alien to the provisional government and its bureaus, were seeking a closer and more accessible authority. In continually increasing numbers, peasant delegates were appearing at the Torrid Palace. The masses poured into the Soviet as though into the triumphal gates of the revolution. All that remained outside the boundaries of the Soviet seemed to fall away from the revolution, seemed somehow to belong to a different world. And so it was in reality. Beyond the boundaries of the Soviet remained the world of the property owner, in which all colors mingled now in one grayish pink defensive tint. Not all the toiling masses chose the Soviet, not all awakened at once, not every layer of the oppressed dared instantly believe that the revolution concerned them. In the consciousness of many, only an undiscriminating hope was stirring. But all the active elements of the masses poured into the Soviet and activity prevails in times of revolution. Moreover, since mass activity was growing from day to day, the basis of the Soviet was continually broadening. It was the sole genuine basis of the revolution. In the Torrid Palace there were two halves, the Duma and the Soviet. The executive committee was at first crowded into some narrow secretarial chambers, through which flowed an uninterrupted human flood. The deputies of the Duma tried to feel like proprietors in their sumptuous chambers. But the barriers were soon swept away by the overflow of the revolution. In spite of all the indecisiveness of its leaders, the Soviet spread out irresistibly, and the Duma was crowded away into the backyard. The new correlation of forces broke its path everywhere. Deputies in the Torrid Palace, officers in their regiments, commanders in the staffs, directors and managers in factories, on the railroads, in the telegraph offices, landlords or managers of estates, all felt themselves during those first days of the revolution to be under the suspicious and tireless scrutiny of the masses. In the eyes of those masses, the Soviet was an organized expression of their distrust of all who had oppressed them. Typesetters would jealously follow the text of the articles which they had set up, railroad workers would anxiously and vigilantly watch over the military trains, Telegraphers would become absorbed in rereading the texts of telegrams, soldiers would glance around suspiciously every time their officer made a move, workers would dismiss from the factory an overseer belonging to the black hundreds and take in under observation a liberal manager. The Duma from the first hours of the revolution, and the provisional government from its first days, became reservoirs into which flowed a continuous stream of complaints and objections from the upper layers of society, their protests against excesses, their woeful comments and dark forebodings. Without the bourgeoisie we cannot manage the state apparatus, reasoned the socialistic petty bourgeois, timidly looking up at the official buildings where the skeleton of the old government looked out with empty eyes. The problem was solved by setting some sort of a liberal head on the institution which the revolution had beheaded. The new ministers entered into the Tsarist bureaus, took possession of the apparatus of typewriters, telephones, couriers, 
Act stenographers, and clerks, and found out from day to day that the machine was running empty. Kierensky subsequently related how the provisional government took the power in its hands on the third day of all Russian anarchy, when throughout the whole extent of the Russian land there existed not only no governmental power, but literally not one policeman. The Soviets of workers and soldiers deputies standing at the head of millions of people, counted for nothing, that of course was merely one element of the anarchy. The orphaned condition of the country is summed up for Kierensky in the disappearance of policemen. In that confession of faith of the most leftward of the ministers, you have the key to the whole policy of the government. The place of the governors of provinces was occupied, on the order of Prince Lvov by the presidents of the provincial Zemstvos, who differed but little from their predecessors. Often enough they were feudal landlords who regarded even the governors as Jacobins. At the head of the counties stood the presidents of the county Zemstvos. Under the new name of commissars the population recognized their old enemies. New presbyteries but old priests at large, as Milton once said of the cowardly Presbyterian Reformation. The provincial and district commissars took possession of the typewriters, correspondence, and clerks of the governors and chiefs of police, only to find out that they had inherited no real power. Real life, both in the provinces and in the counties, concentrated around the Soviet. A two-power system thus reigned from top to bottom. But in the provinces, the Soviet leaders, those same social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, were a little simpler and by no means everywhere renounced that power which the whole situation was imposing upon them. As a result of this, the activity of the provincial commissars consisted mainly of submitting complaints as to the complete impossibility of fulfilling the duties of their office. Two days after the formation of the liberal ministry the bourgeoisie were feeling that they had not acquired the power, but lost it. In spite of all the fantastic caprices of the Rasputin clique before the revolution, its real power had been limited. The influence of the bourgeoisie upon the government had been enormous. The very participation of Russia in the war was more the work of the bourgeoisie than the monarchy. But the main thing was that the Tsarist government had guaranteed to the property owners their factories, land, banks, houses, newspapers. It was consequently upon the most vital questions their government. The February Revolution changed the situation in two contrary directions, it solemnly handed over to the bourgeoisie the external attributes of power, but at the same time it took from them that share in the actual rulership which they had enjoyed before the revolution. The former employees of the Zemstvos where Prince Lvov was the boss, and of the military industrial committee where Guchkov was in command became today, under the name of social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, lords of the situation in the country and on the front, in the city and in the village. They appointed Lvov and Guchkov to the ministry, and laid down the conditions of their work as though they were hiring stewards. On the other hand, the executive committee, having created a bourgeois government, could not make up its mind like the Bible God to call the creation good. On the contrary, it made great haste to increase the distance between itself and the work of its hands, and announced that it intended to support the new power only in so far as it should truly serve the democratic revolution. The provisional government very well knew that it could not survive an hour without the support of the official democracy. But this support was promised only as a reward for good behavior, that is, for fulfilling tasks alien to it and which the democracy itself had just declined to fulfill. The government never knew within what limits it might dare to reveal its semi-contraband sovereignty. The leaders of the executive committee could not always advise it, because it was hard for them to guess just where some dissatisfaction would break out in their own midst, expressing the dissatisfaction of the masses. The bourgeoisie pretended that the socialists were deceiving them. The socialists in their turn were afraid that the liberals, with their premature demands, would stir up the masses and complicate a situation difficult enough as it was. Insofar as that equivocal formula laid its imprint on the whole pre-October period, it became the juridical formulation of the inner lie contained in the hybrid regime of the February Revolution. To bring pressure upon the government, the executive committee elected a special commission which it politely but ludicrously named Contact Commission. 
the organization of the revolutionary power was thus upon the principle of mutual persuasion. The mystic writer Mir Eskovsky could find a precedent for such a regime only in the Old Testament, the kings of Israel had their prophets. But the prophets of the Bible, like the prophets of the last Romanov, used at least to receive suggestions directly from heaven, and the kings did not dare to contradict. In that way, a single sovereignty was assured. It was quite different with the prophets of the Soviet, they prophesied only under the stimulus of their own limited intelligence. The liberal ministers moreover believed that nothing good could come out of the Soviet. Chides, Skoblev, Sukhanov, and others would run to the government and garrulously try to persuade it to make some concession, the ministers would object, the delegates would return to the executive committee, try to influence it with the authority of the government, again get into contact with the ministers, and so begin over again from the beginning. This complicated mill wheel never did any grinding dot in the contact commission everybody complained. Guchkov especially wept over the disorders in the army caused by the connivances of the Soviet. At times the war minister of the revolution in the literal sense of the word dot poured out tears, or at least earnestly wiped his eyes with his handkerchief. He was quite right in thinking that to dry the tears of the anointed is one of the functions of a prophet. On the 9th of March, General Alexov, the chief of staff, telegraphed the war minister, the German yoke is near if only we indulge the Soviet. Guchkov answered him tearfully, the government, alas, has no real power, the troops, the railroads, the post, and telegraph are in the hands of the Soviet. The simple fact is that the provisional government exists only so long as the Soviet permits it. Week followed week, but the situation did not improve in the least. Early in April when the provisional government sent deputies of the Duma to the front, it directed them, gritting its teeth, not to reveal any disagreements with the delegates of the Soviet. Throughout the whole journey, the liberal deputies felt as though they were under convoy, but they also knew that without this, notwithstanding their lofty credentials, they not only could not approach the soldiers, but they could not even find seats in the trains. That prosaic detail in the memoirs of Prince Mansi Ref excellently supplements Guchkov's correspondence with the staff as to the essence of the February constitution. One of the reactionary wits pretty well characterized the situation thus, the old government is in prison, and the new one under house arrest. But did the provisional government have no other support but this equivocal one of the Soviet leaders? What had become of the possessing classes? The question is a fundamental one. United by their past with the monarchy, the possessing classes had hastened to group themselves around a new axis after the revolution. On the 2nd of March, the Council of Trade and Industry, representing the united capital of the whole country, saluted the act of the State Duma and declared itself wholly at the disposition of its committee. The Zemstvos and the town Duma adopted the same course. On March 10, even the Council of the United Nobility, the mainstay of the throne, summoned all the people of Russia in a language of eloquent cowardice to unite around the provisional government as now the sole lawful power in Russia. Almost at the same time, the institutions and organs of the possessing classes began to denounce the dual power and to lay the blame for the disorders upon the Soviet, at first cautiously but then bolder and bolder. The employers were soon followed by the clerks, the united liberal professions, the government employees. From the army came telegrams, addresses, and resolutions of the same character, manufactured in the staff. The liberal press opened a campaign for a single sovereignty which in the coming months acquired the character of a hurricane of fire around the heads of the Soviet. All these things together looked exceedingly impressive. The enormous number of institutions, well-known names, resolutions, articles, the decisiveness of tone, it had an indubitable effect upon the suggestible heads of the committee. And yet there was no serious force behind this threatening parade of the propertied classes. How about the force of property? said the petty bourgeois socialists, answering the Bolsheviks. Property is a relation among people. It represents an enormous power so long as it is universally recognized and supported by that system of compulsion called law and the state.
but the very essence of the present situation was that the old state had suddenly collapsed, and the entire old system of rights had been called in question by the masses. In the factories the workers were more and more regarding themselves as the proprietors, and the bosses as uninvited guests. Still less assured were the feelings of the landlords in the provinces, face to face with those surly vengeful muzics, and far from that governmental power in whose existence they did for a time, owing to their distance from the capital, believe. The property holders, deprived of the possibility of using their property, or protecting it, ceased to be real property holders and became badly frightened Philistines who could not give any support to the government for the simple reason that they needed support themselves. They soon began to curse the government for its weakness, but they were only cursing their own fate. In those days the joint activity of the executive committee and the ministry seemed to have for its goal to demonstrate that the art of government in time of revolution consists in a garrulous waste of time. With the liberals this was a consciously adopted plan. It was their firm conviction that all measures demanded postponement except one, the oath of loyalty to the Entente. Miliukov acquainted his colleagues with the secret treaties. Kierensky let them in one ear and out the other. Apparently only the procurer of the Holy Synod, a certain Lvov, rich in surprises, a namesake of the Premier but not a prince, went into a storm of indignation and even called the treaties brigandage and swindle which undoubtedly provoked a condescending smile from Miliukov, the everyday man is a fool, and a quiet proposal to return to the order of business. The official declaration of the government promised to summon a constituent assembly at the earliest possible date, which date, however, was intentionally not stated. Nothing was said about the form of government, they still hoped to return to the lost paradise of monarchy. But the real meat of the declaration lay in its promise to carry the war through to victory, and unswervingly carry out the agreements made with our allies. So far as concerned the most threatening problems of the people's existence, the revolution had apparently been achieved only in order to make the announcement, everything remains as before. Since the Democrats attributed an almost mystic importance to recognition by the Entente, a small trader amounts to nothing until the bank recognizes his credit, the executive committee swallowed in silence the imperialist declaration of March 6. Not one official organ of the democracy, Greaves Sukin a year later, publicly reacted to the declaration of the provisional government, which disgraced our revolution at its very birth in the eyes of democratic Europe. At last, on the 8th of March, there issued from the ministerial laboratory a decree of amnesty. By that time the doors of the prisons had been opened by the people throughout the whole country, political exiles were returning in a solid stream with meetings, hurrahs, military speeches, flowers. The decree sounded like a belated echo from the government buildings. On the 12th they announced the abolition of the death penalty. Four months later it was restored in the army. Kierensky promised to elevate justice to unheard of heights. In a moment of heat, he actually did carry out a resolution of the executive committee introducing representatives of the workers and soldiers as members of the courts of justice. That was the sole measure in which could be felt the heartbeat of the revolution, and it raised the hair on the heads of the eunuchs of justice. But the matter stopped right there. Lawyer Damianov, an important officer in the ministry under Kierensky, and also a socialist, decided to adopt the principle of leaving all former officials at their posts. To quote his own words, the policies of a revolutionary government ought never to offend anybody unnecessarily. That was, at bottom, the guiding principle of the whole provisional government, which feared most of all to offend anybody from the circles of the possessing classes, or even the Tsarist bureaucracy. Not only the judges, but even the prosecutors of the Tsarist regime remained at their posts. To be sure, the masses might be offended. But that was the Soviet's business, the masses did not enter into the field of vision of the government. The sole thing in the nature of a fresh stream was brought in by the above mentioned temperamental procurer, Lvov, who gave an official report on the idiots and scoundrels sitting in the Holy Synod. The ministers listened to his juicy characterizations with some alarm, but the synod continued a state institution, 
and Greek Orthodoxy the state religion. Even the membership of the Synod remained unchanged. A revolution ought not to quarrel with anybody. The members of the state council, faithful servants of two or three emperors, continued to sit, or at least to draw their salaries. And this fact soon acquired a symbolic significance. Factories and barracks noisily protested. The executive committee worried about it. The government spent two sessions debating the question of the fate and salaries of the members of the state council, and could not arrive at a decision. Why disturb these respectable people, among whom, by the way, we have many good friends? The Rasputin ministers were still in prison, but the provisional government hastened to vote them a pension. This sounded like mockery, or a voice from another world. But the government did not want to offend its predecessors even though they were locked up in jail. The senators continued to drowse in their embroidered jackets, and when a left senator, Sokolov, newly appointed by Kierinsky, dared to appear in a black frock coat, they quietly removed him from the hall. These Tsarist legislators were not afraid to offend the February Revolution, once convinced that its government had no teeth. Karl Marx saw the cause of the failure of the March Revolution in Germany in the fact that it reformed only the very highest political circles, leaving untouched all the layers beneath them the old bureaucracy, the old army, the old judges, born and brought up and grown old in the service of absolutism. Socialists of the type of Kierensky were seeking salvation exactly where Marx saw the cause of failure. And the Menshevik Marxists were with Kierensky, not Marx. The sole sphere in which the government showed initiative and revolutionary tempo was that of legislation on stock holdings. Hence, the degree of reform was issued on the 17th of March. National and religious limitations were annulled only three days later. There were quite a few people on the staff of the government, you see, who had suffered under the old regime, if at all, only from a lack of business in stocks. The workers were impatiently demanding an eight hour day. The government pretended to be deaf in both ears. Besides, it is wartime, and all ought to sacrifice themselves for the good of the fatherland. Moreover, that is the Soviets' business, let them pacify the workers. Still more threatening was the land question. Here it was really necessary to do something. Spurred on by the prophets, the Minister of Agriculture, Shingarf, ordered the formation of local land committees, prudently refraining, however, from defining their tasks and functions. The peasants had an idea that these committees ought to give them the land. The landlords thought the committees ought to protect their property. From the very start, the Muzik Snus, more ruthless than all others, was tightening round the neck of the February regime. Agreeably to the official doctrine, all those problems which had caused the revolution were postponed to the Constituent Assembly. How could you expect these irreproachable Democrats to anticipate the national will, when they had not even succeeded in seating Mikhail Romanov astride of it? The preparation of a national representation was approached in those days with such bureaucratic heaviness and deliberate procrastination that the Constituent Assembly itself became a mirage. Only on the 25th of March, almost a month after the insurrection, a month of revolution exclamation mark the government decided to call a lumbering special conference for the purpose of working out an election law. But the conference never opened. Miliukov in his History of the Revolution, which is false from beginning to end, confusedly states that as a result of various difficulties the work of the special conference was not begun under the first government. The difficulties were inherent in the constitution of the conference and in its function. The whole idea was to postpone the constituent assembly until better times, until victory, until peace or until the calends of Kornilov. The Russian bourgeoisie which appeared in the world too late, mortally hated the revolution. But its hatred had no strength. It had to bide its time and maneuver. Being unable to overthrow and strangle the revolution, the bourgeoisie counted on starving it out. 11 Dual power What constitutes the essence of a dual power? Question mark 10 We must pause upon this question, for an illumination of it has never appeared in historic literature. And yet this dual power is a distinct condition of social crisis, 
by no means peculiar to the Russian Revolution of 1917, although the most clearly marked out dot antagonistic classes exist in society everywhere, and a class deprived of power inevitably strives to some extent to swerve the governmental course in its favor. This does not as yet mean, however, that two or more powers are ruling in society. The character of a political structure is directly determined by the relation of the oppressed classes to the ruling class. A single government, the necessary condition of stability in any regime, is preserved so long as the ruling class succeeds in putting over its economic and political forms upon the whole of society as the only forms possible. The simultaneous dominion of the German junkers and the bourgeoisie, whether in the Hohenzollern form or the Republic, is not a double government, no matter how sharp at times may be the conflict between the two participating powers. They have a common social basis, therefore their clash does not threaten to split the state apparatus. The two-power regime arises only out of irreconcilable class conflicts, is possible, therefore, only in a revolutionary epoch, and constitutes one of its fundamental elements. The political mechanism of revolution consists of the transfer of power from one class to another. The forcible overturn is usually accomplished in a brief time. But no historic class lifts itself from a subject position to a position of rulership suddenly in one night, even though a night of revolution. It must already on the eve of the revolution have assumed a very independent attitude toward the official ruling class, moreover, it must have focused upon itself the hopes of intermediate classes and layers, dissatisfied with the existing state of affairs, but not capable of playing an independent role. The historic preparation of a revolution brings about, in the pre-revolutionary period, a situation in which the class which is called to realize the new social system, although not yet master of the country, has actually concentrated in its hands a significant share of the state power, while the official apparatus of the government is still in the hands of the old lords. That is the initial dual power in every revolution. But that is not its only form. If the new class placed in power by a revolution which it did not want, is in essence an already old, historically belated, class, if it was already worn out before it was officially crowned, if on coming to power it encounters an antagonist already sufficiently mature and reaching out its hand toward the helm of state, then instead of one unstable two-power equilibrium, the political revolution produces another, still less stable. To overcome the anarchy of this twofold sovereignty becomes at every new step the task of the revolution, or the counter revolution. This double sovereignty does not presuppose, generally speaking, indeed, it excludes, the possibility of a division of the power into two equal halves, or indeed any formal equilibrium of forces, whatever. It is not a constitutional, but a revolutionary fact. It implies that a destruction of the social equilibrium has already split the state superstructure. It arises where the hostile classes are already each relying upon essentially incompatible governmental organizations, the one outlived, the other in process of formation, which jostle against each other at every step in the sphere of government. The amount of power which falls to each of these struggling classes in such a situation, is determined by the correlation of forces in the course of the struggle. By its very nature such a state of affairs cannot be stable. Society needs a concentration of power, and in the person of the ruling class, or, in the situation we are discussing, the two half-ruling classes, irresistibly strives to get it. The splitting of sovereignty foretells nothing less than a civil war. But before the competing classes and parties will go to that extreme, especially in case they dread the interference of a third force, they may feel compelled for quite long time to endure, and even to sanction, a two-power system. This system will nevertheless inevitably explode. Civil war gives to this double sovereignty its most visible, because territorial, expression. Each of the powers, having created its own fortified drill ground, fights for possession of the rest of the territory, which often has to endure double sovereignty in the form of successive invasions by the two fighting powers, until one of them decisively installs itself. The English Revolution of the 17th century, 
exactly because it was a great revolution shattering the nation to the bottom, affords a clear example of this alternating dual power, with sharp transitions in the form of civil war. At first, the royal power, resting upon the privileged classes or the upper circles of these classes, the aristocrats and bishops, is opposed by the bourgeoisie and the circles of the squirearchy that are close to it. The government of the bourgeoisie is the Presbyterian Parliament supported by the City of London. The protracted conflict between these two regimes is finally settled in open civil war. The two governmental centres, London and Oxford, create their own armies. Here the dual power takes territorial form, although, as always in civil war, the boundaries are very shifting. Parliament conquers. The king is captured and awaits his fate. It would seem that the conditions are now created for the single rule of the Presbyterian bourgeoisie. But before the royal power could be broken, the parliamentary army has converted itself into an independent political force. It has concentrated in its ranks the independents, the pious and resolute petty bourgeoisie, the craftsmen and farmers. This army powerfully interferes in the social life not merely as an armed force, but as a praetorian guard, and as the political representative of a new class opposing the prosperous and rich bourgeoisie. Correspondingly the army creates a new state organ rising above the military command, a council of soldiers and officers deputies, agitators. A new period of double sovereignty has thus arrived, that of the Presbyterian Parliament and the Independence Army. This leads to open conflicts. The bourgeoisie proves powerless to oppose with its own army the model army of Cromwell, that is, the armed plebans. The conflict ends with a purgation of the Presbyterian Parliament by the sword of the independents. There remains but the rump of a parliament, the dictatorship of Cromwell is established. The lower ranks of the army, under the leadership of the levellers, the extreme left wing of the revolution, try to oppose to the rule of the upper military levels the patricians of the army, their own veritably plebeian regime. But this new two-power system does not succeed in developing, the levelers, the lowest depths of the petty bourgeoisie, have not yet, nor can have, their own historic path. Cromwell soon settles accounts with his enemies. A new political equilibrium, and still by no means a stable one, is established for a period of years. In the Great French Revolution, the Constituent Assembly, the backbone of which was the upper levels of the third estate, concentrated the power in its hands, without however fully annulling the prerogatives of the king. The period of the constituent assembly is a clearly marked period of dual power, which ends with the flight of the king to Vienne, and is formally liquidated with the founding of the Republic. The first French constitution, 1791, based upon the fiction of a complete independence of the legislative and executive powers, in reality concealed from the people, or tried to conceal, a double sovereignty, that of the bourgeoisie, firmly entrenched in the National Assembly after the capture by the people of the Bastille, and that of the old monarchy still relying upon the upper circles of the priesthood, the clergy, the bureaucracy, and the military, to say nothing of their hopes of foreign intervention. In this self-contradictory regime lay the germs of its inevitable destruction. A way out could be found only in the abolition of bourgeois representation by the powers of European reaction, or in the guillotine for the king and the monarchy. Paris and Cobblins must measure their forces. But before it comes to war and the guillotine, the Paris Commune enters the scene, supported by the lowest city layers of the Third Estate, and with increasing boldness contests the power with the official representatives of the national bourgeoisie. A new double sovereignty is thus inaugurated, the first manifestation of which we observe as early as 1790, when the big and medium bourgeoisie is still firmly seated in the administration and in the municipalities. How striking is the picture, and how vilely it has been slandered exclamation mark of the efforts of the plebeian levels to raise themselves up out of the social cellars and catacombs and stand forth in that forbidden arena where people in wigs and silk breeches are settling the fate of the nation. It seemed as though the very foundation of society, tramped underfoot by the cultured bourgeoisie, was stirring and coming to life. Human heads lifted themselves above the solid mass. Horny hands stretched aloft, 
hoarse but courageous voices shouted. The districts of Paris, bastards of the revolution, began to live a life of their own. They were recognized, it was impossible not to recognize them exclamation mark and transformed into sections. But they kept continually breaking the boundaries of legality and receiving a current of fresh blood from below, opening their ranks in spite of the law to those with no rights, the destitute and sculottes. At the same time the rural municipalities were becoming a screen for a peasant uprising against that bourgeois legality which was defending the feudal property system. Thus from under the second nation arises a third dot the Parisian sections that first stood opposed to the commune, which was still dominated by the respectable bourgeoisie. In the bold outbreak of August 10, 1792, the sections gained control of the commune. From then on the revolutionary commune opposed the legislative assembly, and subsequently the convention, which failed to keep up with the problems and progress of the revolution, registering its events, but not performing them, because it did not possess the energy, audacity, and unanimity of that new class which had raised itself up from the depths of the Parisian districts and found support in the most backward villages. As the sections gained control of the commune, so the commune, by way of a new insurrection, gained control of the convention. Each of the stages was characterized by a sharply marked double sovereignty, each wing of which was trying to establish a single and strong government, the right by a defensive struggle, the left by an offensive. Thus, characteristically, for both revolutions and counter-revolutions, the demand for a dictatorship results from the intolerable contradictions of the double sovereignty. The transition from one of its forms to the other is accomplished through civil war. The great stages of a revolution, that is, the passing of power to new classes or layers, do not at all coincide in this process with the succession of representative institutions, which march along after the dynamic of the revolution like a belated shadow. In the long run, to be sure, the revolutionary dictatorship of the Sansculottes unites with the dictatorship of the convention. But with what convention? A convention purged of the Girondists, who yesterday ruled it with the hand of the terror, a convention abridged and adapted to the dominion of new social forces. Thus by the steps of the dual power the French Revolution rises in the course of four years to its culmination. After the ninth Thermidor it begins, again by the steps of the dual power, to descend. And again civil war precedes every downward step just as before it had accompanied every rise. In this way the new society seeks a new equilibrium of forces. The Russian bourgeoisie, fighting with and cooperating with the Rasputin bureaucracy, had enormously strengthened its political position during the war. Exploiting the defeat of Tsarism, it had concentrated in its hands, by means of the country and town unions and the military industrial committees, a great power. It had at its independent disposition enormous state resources, and was in the essence of the matter a parallel government. During the war the Tsar's ministers complained that Prince Lvov was furnishing supplies to the army, feeding it, medicating it, even establishing barber shops for the soldiers. We must either put an end to this, or give the whole power into his hands, said Minister Krivoshin in 1915. He never imagined that a year and a half later Lvov would receive the whole power only not from the Tsar, but from the hands of Irinsky, Chides, and Sukhanov. But on the second day after he received it, there began a new double sovereignty, alongside of yesterday's liberal half-government, today formally legalized. There arose an unofficial, but so much the more actual government of the toiling masses in the form of the Soviets. From that moment the Russian Revolution began to grow up into an event of world historic significance. What, then, is the peculiarity of this dual power as it appeared in the February Revolution? In the events of the 17th and 18th centuries, the dual power was in each case a natural stage in a struggle imposed upon its participants by a temporary correlation of forces, and each side strove to replace the dual power with its own single power. In the revolution of 1917, we see the official democracy consciously and intentionally creating a two-power system, dodging with all its might the transfer of power into its own hands. The double sovereignty is created, 
or so it seems at a glance, not as a result of a struggle of classes for power, but as the result of a voluntary yielding of power by one class to another. Insofar as the Russian democracy sought for an escape from the two-power regime, it could find one only in its own removal from power. It is just this that we have called the paradox of the February Revolution. A certain analogy can be found in 1848, in the conduct of the German bourgeoisie with relation to the monarchy. But the analogy is not complete. The German bourgeoisie did try earnestly to divide the power with the monarchy on the basis of an agreement. But the bourgeoisie neither had the full power in its hands, nor by any means gave it over wholly to the monarchy. The Prussian bourgeoisie nominally possessed the power, it did not for a moment doubt that the forces of the old government would place themselves unreservedly at its disposition and convert themselves into loyal adherents of its own omnipotence, Marx and Engels. The Russian democracy of 1917, having captured the power from the very moment of insurrection, tried not only to divide it with the bourgeoisie, but to give the state over to the bourgeoisie absolutely. This means, if you please, that in the first quarter of the 20th century the official Russian democracy had succeeded in decaying politically more completely than the German liberal bourgeoisie of the 19th century. And that is entirely according to the laws of history, for it is merely the reverse aspect of the upgrowth in those same decades of the proletariat, which now occupied the place of the craftsmen of Cromwell and the sansculottes of Robespierre. If you look deeper, the twofold rule of the provisional government and the executive committee had the character of a mere reflection. Only the proletariat could advance a claim to the new power. Relying distrustfully upon the workers and soldiers, the compromisers were compelled to continue the double bookkeeping, of the kings and the prophets. The twofold government of the liberals and the democrats only reflected the still concealed double sovereignty of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. When the Bolsheviks displace the compromisers at the head of the Soviet, and this will happen within a few months, then that concealed double sovereignty will come to the surface, and this will be the eve of the October Revolution. Until that moment the revolution will live in a world of political reflections. Refracted through the rationalizations the socialist intelligentsia, the double sovereignty, from being a stage in the class struggle, became a regulative principle. It was just for this reason that it occupied the center of all theoretical discussions. Everything has its uses, the mirror-like character of the February double government has enabled us better to understand those epochs in history when the same thing appears as a full-blooded episode in a struggle between two regimes. The feeble and reflected light of the moon makes possible important conclusions about the sunlight. In the immeasurably greater maturity of the Russian proletariat in comparison with the town masses of the older revolutions, lies the basic peculiarity of the Russian Revolution. This led first to the paradox of a half spectral double government, and afterward prevented the real one from being resolved in favor of the bourgeoisie. For the question stood thus. Either the bourgeoisie will actually dominate the old state apparatus, altering it a little for its purposes, in which case the Soviets will come to nothing, or the Soviets will form the foundation of a new state, liquidating not only the old governmental apparatus, but also the dominion of those classes which it served. The Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries were steering toward the first solution, the Bolsheviks toward the second. The oppressed classes, who, as Marat observed, did not possess in the past the knowledge, or skill, or leadership to carry through what they had begun, were armed in the Russian Revolution of the 20th century with all three. The Bolsheviks were victorious. A year after their victory, the same situation was repeated in Germany, with a different correlation of forces. The social democracy was steering for the establishment of a democratic government of the bourgeoisie and the liquidation of the Soviets. Luxembourg and Liebknecht steered toward the dictatorship of the Soviets. The social democrats won. Hilferding and Kautsky in Germany, Max Adler in Austria, proposed that they should combine democracy with the Soviet system, including the workers' Soviets in the constitution. 
that would have meant making potential or open civil war a constituent part of the state regime. It would be impossible to imagine a more curious utopia. Its sole justification on German soil is perhaps an old tradition. The Württemberg Democrats of 1848 wanted a republic with a duke at the head. Does this phenomenon of the dual power, heretofore not sufficiently appreciated, contradict the Marxist theory of the state, which regards government as an executive committee of the ruling class? This is just the same as asking, does the fluctuation of prices under the influence of supply and demand contradict the labor theory of value? Does the self-sacrifice of a female protecting her offspring refute the theory of a struggle for existence? No, in these phenomena we have a more complicated combination of the same laws. If the state is an organization of class rule, and a revolution is the overthrow of the ruling class, then the transfer of power from the one class to the other must necessarily create self-contradictory state conditions, and first of all in the form of the dual power. The relation of class forces is not a mathematical quantity permitting a priori computations. When the old regime is thrown out of equilibrium, a new correlation of forces can be established only as the result of a trial by battle. That as revolution. It may seem as though this theoretical inquiry has led us away from the events of 1917. In reality, it leads right into the heart of them. It was precisely around this problem of twofold power that the dramatic struggle of parties and classes turned. Only from a theoretical height is it possible to observe it fully and correctly understand it. 12 The Executive Committee, the organization created on February 27 in the Tauride Palace, and called Executive Committee of the Soviet of Workers' Deputies, had little really in common with its name. The Soviet of Workers' Deputies of 1905, the originator of the system, rose out of a general strike. It directly represented the masses in struggle. The leaders of the strike became the deputies of the Soviet, the selection of its membership was carried out under fire, its executive committee was elected by the Soviet for the further prosecution of the struggle. It was this executive committee which placed on the order of the day the armed insurrection. The February Revolution, thanks to the revolt of the troops was victorious before the workers had created a Soviet. The executive committee was self-constituted, in advance of the Soviet and independently of the factories and regiments, after the victory of the revolution. We have here the classic initiative of the radicals, standing aside from the revolutionary struggle, but getting ready to harvest its fruit. The real leaders of the workers had not yet left the streets. They were disarming some, arming others making sure of the victory. The more far-sighted among them were alarmed by the news that in the Tauride Palace some kind of a Soviet of workers' deputies had come into being. Just as in the autumn of 1916 the liberal bourgeoisie, in expectation of a palace revolution which somebody was supposed to put through, had got ready a reserve government to impose upon the new Tsar in case it succeeded. So the radical intelligentsia got ready its reserve sub-government at the moment of the February victory. And as much as they had been, at least in the past, adherents of the workers' movement and inclined to cover themselves with its tradition, they now named their offspring Executive Committee of the Soviet. That was one of those half-intentional falsifications with which all history is filled, especially the history of popular revolutions. In a revolutionary turn of events involving a break in the succession, those educated classes who have now to learn to wield the power, gladly seize hold of any names and symbols connected with the heroic memories of the masses. And words not infrequently conceal the essence of things, especially when this is demanded by the interests of influential groups. The immense authority of the executive committee from the very day of its birth rested upon its seeming continuance of the Soviet of 1905. This committee, ratified by the first chaotic meeting of the Soviet, thereafter exerted a decisive influence both upon the membership of the Soviet, and upon its policy. This influence was the more conservative, in that the natural selection of revolutionary representatives which is guaranteed by the red-hot atmosphere of a struggle no longer existed. The insurrection was already in the past. All were drunk with victory, were planning how to get comfortable on the new basis, were relaxing their souls, partly also their heads. 
it required months of new conflicts and struggles and new circumstances, with the consequent reshuffling of personnel, in order that the Soviets, from being organs for consecrating the victory, should become organs of struggle and preparation for a new insurrection. We emphasize this aspect of the matter because it has until now been left completely in the shade. However, not only the conditions in which the Executive Committee and the Soviet arose determined their moderate and compromising character. Deeper and more enduring causes were operating in the same direction. There were over 150,000 soldiers in Petrograd. There were at least four times as many working men and women of all categories. Nevertheless for every two worker delegates in the Soviet, there were five soldiers. The rules of representation were extremely elastic, and they were always stretched to the advantage of the soldiers. Whereas the workers elected only one delegate for every thousand, the most petty military unit would frequently send two. The Grey Army cloth became the general ground tone of the Soviet. But by no means all even of the civilians were selected by workers. No small number of people got into the Soviet by individual invitation, through pull, or simply thanks to their own penetrative ability. Radical lawyers, physicians, students, journalists, representing various problematical groups, or most often representing their own ambition. This obviously distorted character of the Soviet was even welcomed by the leaders, who were not a bit sorry to dilute the too concentrated essence of factory and barrack with the lukewarm water of cultivated Philistia. Many of these accidental crashes in, seekers of adventure, self-appointed messiahs, and professional bunk shooters, for a long time crowded out with their authoritative elbows the silent workers and irresolute soldiers. And if this was so in Petrograd, it is not hard to imagine how it looked in the provinces, where the victory came wholly without struggle. The whole country was swarming with soldiers. The garrisons at Kiev, Helsingfors, Tiflis, were as numerous as that in Petrograd, in Saratov, Samara, Tambov, Omsk, there were 70,000 to 80,000 soldiers, in Yaroslavl, Ekaterinoslav, Ekaterinburg, 60,000, in a whole series of other cities, 50,000, 40,000, and 30,000. The Soviet representation was differently organized in different localities, but everywhere it put the troops in a privileged position. Politically this was caused by the workers themselves, who wanted to go as far as possible to meet the soldiers. The Soviet leaders were equally eager to go to meet the officers. Besides the considerable number of lieutenants and ensigns at first elected by the soldiers themselves, a special representation was often given, particularly in the provinces, to the commanding staff. As a result the military had in many Soviets an absolutely overwhelming majority. The soldier masses, who had not yet had time to acquire a political physiognomy, nevertheless determined through their representatives the physiognomy of the Soviets. In every representative system there is a certain lack of correspondence. It was especially great on the second day of the revolution. The deputies of the politically helpless soldiers often turned out in those early days to be people completely alien to the soldiers and to the revolution, all sorts of intellectuals and semi-intellectuals who had been hiding in the rear barracks and consequently came out as extreme patriots. Thus was created a divergence between the mood of the barracks and the mood of the Soviet. Officer Stankovich, whom the soldiers of his battalion had received back sullenly and distrustfully after the revolution made a successful speech in the soldiers section on the delicate question of discipline. Why, he asked, is the mood of the Soviet gentler and more agreeable than that of the battalions? This naive perplexity testifies once more how hard it is for the real feelings of the lower ranks to find a path to the top. Nevertheless, as early as March 3rd, meetings of soldiers and workers began to demand that the Soviet depose forthwith the provisional government of the liberal bourgeoisie, and take the power in its own hands. Here again the initiative belonged to the Vyborg district. And could there be, indeed, a demand more intelligible and nearer to the hearts of the masses? But this agitation was soon broken off, not only because the defensists sharply opposed it, worse than that, the majority leadership had already in the first half of March bowed down in real fact to the two-power regime. 
and anyway, aside from the Bolsheviks, there was no one to bring up squarely the question of power. The Vyborg leaders had to back down. The Petrograd workers, however, did not for one moment give their confidence to the new government, nor consider it their own. They did listen keenly, though, to the soldiers and try not to oppose them too sharply. The soldiers, on the other hand, just learning the first syllables of political life, although as shrewd peasants they would not trust any master who happened along, nevertheless intently listened to their representatives, who in turn lent respectful ear to the authoritative leaders of the executive committee, and these latter did nothing but listen with alarm to the pulse of the liberal bourgeoisie. Upon this system of universal listening from the bottom toward the top everything rested, for the time being. However, the mood from below had to break out on the surface. The question of power, artificially sidetracked, kept pushing up anew, although in disguised form. The soldiers don't know whom to listen to, complained the districts and the provinces, expressing in this way to the executive committee their dissatisfaction with the divided sovereignty. Delegations from the Baltic and Black Sea fleets announced on the 16th of March that they were ready to recognize the provisional government insofar as it went hand in hand with the executive committee, in other words, they did not intend to recognize it at all. As time goes on, this note sounds louder and louder. The army and the population should submit only to the directions of the Soviet, resolves the 172nd Reserve Regiment and then immediately formulates the contrary theorem, those directions of the provisional government which conflict with the decision of the Soviet are not to be obeyed. With a mixed feeling of satisfaction and anxiety the executive committee sanctioned this situation, with grinding teeth the government endured it. There was nothing else for either of them to do. Already early in March, Soviets were coming into being in all the principal towns and industrial centers. From these they spread in the next few weeks throughout the country. They began to arrive in the villages only in April and May, at first it was practically the army alone which spoke in the name of the peasants. The executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet actually acquired a state significance. The other Soviets guided themselves by the capital, one after the other adopting resolutions of conditional support to the provisional government. Although in the first months the relations between the Petrograd and provincial Soviets worked themselves out smoothly, and without conflict or serious disagreement, nevertheless the necessity of a state organization was obvious in the whole situation. A month after the overthrow of the autocracy a first conference of Soviets was summoned, incomplete and one-sided in its membership. Although, out of 185 organizations represented, two-thirds were provincial Soviets, these were for the most part soldiers Soviets. Together with the representatives of the front organizations, these military delegates, for the most part officers, were in an overwhelming majority. Speeches resounded about war to complete victory, and outcries resounded against the Bolsheviks, notwithstanding their more than moderate behavior. The conference filled out the Petrograd Executive Committee with 16 conservative provincials, thus legitimizing its state character. That strengthened the right wing still more. From now on, they frightened the malcontents by alluding to the provinces. The resolution on regulating the membership of the Petrograd Soviet, adopted March 14, was hardly carried out at all. It is not the local Soviet that decides, but the All Russian Executive Committee. The official leaders thus occupied an almost unassailable position. The most important decisions were made by the executive committee, or rather by its ruling nucleus, after a preliminary agreement with the nucleus of the government. The Soviet remained on one side. They treated it like a meeting, not there, not in general meetings, is the policy wrought out. All these plenary sessions had decidedly no practical importance, Sukhanov. These complacent rulers of destiny thought that in entrusting the leadership to them the Soviets had essentially completed their task. The future will soon show them that this is not so. The masses are long-suffering, but they are not clay out of which you can fashion anything you want. Moreover, in a revolutionary epoch they learn fast. In that lies the power of revolution. In order better to understand the further development of events, 
it is necessary to pause upon the character of the two parties which from the very beginning formed a close political bloc, dominating in the Soviets, in the democratic municipalities, in the congresses of the so-called revolutionary democracy, and even carrying their steadily dwindling majority to the constituent assembly, which became the last reflection of their former power, like the glow on a hilltop illumined by a sun already set. If the Russian bourgeoisie appeared in the world too late to be democratic, the Russian democracy for the same reason wanted to consider itself socialistic. The democratic ideology had been hopelessly played out in the course of the 19th century. A radical intelligentsia standing on the edge of the 20th, if it wanted to find a path to the masses, had need of a socialist coloring. This is the general historic cause which gave rise to those two intermediate parties, Menshevik and Social Revolutionary. Each of them, however, had its own genealogy and its own ideology. The views of the Mensheviks were built up on a Marxist basis. In consequence of that same historical belatedness of Russia, Marxism had there become at first not so much a criticism of capitalist society as an argument for the inevitability of the bourgeois development of the country. History cleverly made use of the emasculated theory of proletarian revolution, in order with its help to Europeanize, in the bourgeois sense, wide circles of the moldy Narodnik intelligentsia. In this process a very important role fell to the Mensheviks. Constituting the left wing of the bourgeois intelligentsia, they put the bourgeoisie in touch with the more moderate upper layers of the workers, those with a tendency toward legal activity around the Duma and in the trade unions. The social revolutionaries, on the contrary, struggled theoretically against Marxism, although sometimes surrendering to it. They considered themselves a party which realized the union of the intelligentsia, the workers and the peasants, under the leadership it goes without saying, of the critical reason. In the economic sphere their ideas were an indigestible mess of various historical accumulations, reflecting the contradictory life conditions of the peasantry in a country rapidly becoming capitalistic. The coming revolution presented itself to the social revolutionaries as neither bourgeois nor socialistic, but democratic, they substituted a political formula for a social content. They thus laid out for themselves a course halfway between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and consequently a position of arbiter between them. After February it might seem as though the social revolutionaries did actually approach this position. From the time of the first revolution they had had their roots in the peasantry. In the first months of 1917, the whole rural intelligentsia adopted for its own the traditional formula of the Narodniks, land and freedom. In contrast to the Mensheviks who remained always a party of the cities, the social revolutionaries had found, it seemed, an amazingly powerful support in the country. More than that, they dominated even in the cities, in the Soviets through the soldiers' sections, and in the first democratic municipalities where they had an absolute majority of the votes. The power of this party seemed unlimited. In reality it was a political aberration. A party for whom everybody votes except that minority who know what they are voting for, is no more a party than the tongue in which babies of all countries babble is a national language. The Social Revolutionary Party came forward as a solemn designation for everything in the February Revolution that was immature, unformulated, and confused. Everybody who had not inherited from the pre-revolutionary past sufficient reasons to vote for the Kudits or the Bolsheviks, voted for the social revolutionaries. But the Kudits stood inside a closed circle of property owners, and the Bolsheviks were still few, misunderstood, and even terrifying. To vote for the social revolutionaries meant to vote for the revolution in general, and involved no further obligation. In the city it meant the desire of the soldiers to associate themselves with a party that stood for the peasants, the desire of the backward part of the workers to stand close to the soldiers the desire of the small townspeople not to break away from the soldiers and the peasants. In those days the social revolutionary membership card was a temporary ticket of admission to the institutions of the revolution, and this ticket remained valid until it was replaced by another card of a more serious character. It has been truly said of this great party, which took in all and everybody, that it was only a grandiose zero. From the time of the first revolution, 
the Mensheviks had inferred the necessity of a union with the liberals from the bourgeois character of the revolution. And they valued this union higher than cooperation with the peasantry, whom they considered an unsafe ally. The Bolsheviks, on the contrary, had founded their view of the revolution on a union of the proletariat with the peasantry against the liberal bourgeoisie. As an actual fact we see in the February Revolution an opposite grouping, the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries come out in a close union, completed by their common bloc with the liberal bourgeoisie. The Bolsheviks, on the official political field, are completely isolated. This apparently inexplicable fact is in reality wholly in accord with the laws of things. The social revolutionaries were not by any means a peasant party, notwithstanding their wholesale sympathy for their slogans in the villages. The central nucleus of the party, what actually defined its policies and created ministers and bureaucrats from its midst, was far more closely associated with the liberal and radical circles of the cities than with the masses of the peasants in revolt. This ruling nucleus, monstrously swelled by the careerist flood of social revolutionaries of the March vintage, was frightened to death by the spread of the peasant movement under social revolutionary slogans. These freshly baked Narodniks wished the peasants all good things, of course, but did not want the red cock to crow. And the horror of the social revolutionaries before the peasant revolt was paralleled by the horror of the Mensheviks before the assault of the proletariat. In its entirety this democratic fright was a reflection of the very real danger to the possessing classes caused by a movement of the oppressed, a danger which united them in a single camp, the bourgeois landlord reaction. The bloc of the social revolutionaries with the government of landlord Lvov signalized their break with the agrarian revolution, just as the bloc of the Mensheviks with industrialists and bankers of the type of Guchkov, Tereshkenko, and Konovlev meant their break with the proletarian movement. In these circumstances the union of Mensheviks and social revolutionaries meant not a cooperation of proletariat with peasants, but a coalition of those parties which had broken with the proletariat and the peasants respectively, for the sake of a bloc with the possessing classes. From what has been said it is clear that the socialism of the two democratic parties was a fiction. But this is far from saying that their democratism was real. It is a bloodless sort of democratism that requires a socialistic disguise. The Russian proletariat had waged its struggle for democracy in irreconcilable antagonism to the liberal bourgeoisie. The democratic parties therefore, in entering a bloc with the liberal bourgeoisie, had inevitably to enter into conflict with the proletariat. Such were the social roots of the cruel struggle to come between compromisers and Bolsheviks. If you reduce the above outlined processes to their naked class mechanism, of which of course the participants, and even the leaders, of the two compromise parties were not thoroughly conscious, you get approximately the following distribution of historic functions, the liberal bourgeoisie was already unable to win over the masses. Therefore it feared revolution. But a revolution was necessary for the bourgeois development. From the enfranchised bourgeoisie two groups split off, consisting of sons and younger brothers. One of these groups went to the workers, the other to the peasants. They tried to attach these workers and peasants to themselves, sincerely and hotly demonstrating that they were socialists and hostile to the bourgeoisie. In this way they actually gained a considerable influence over the people. But very soon the effect of their ideas outstripped the original intention. The bourgeoisie sensed a mortal danger and sounded the alarm. Both the groups which had split off from it, the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries, eagerly responded to the summons from the head of the family. Hastily patching up the old disagreements they all stood shoulder to shoulder, abandoned the masses, and rushed to the rescue of bourgeois society. The social revolutionaries made a feeble and flabby impression even in comparison with the Mensheviks. To the Bolsheviks at all important moments they seemed merely third-rate cadets. To the cadets they seemed third-rate Bolsheviks. The second-rate position was occupied, in both cases, by the Mensheviks, their unstable support and the formlessness of their ideology were reflected in their personnel. On all the social revolutionary leaders lay the imprint of unfinishedness, superficiality, and sentimental unreliability. 
We may say without any exaggeration that the rank and file Bolshevik revealed more political acumen, more understanding of the relations between classes, than the most celebrated social revolutionary leaders. Having no stable criteria, the social revolutionaries showed a tendency toward moral imperatives. It is hardly necessary to add that these moral pretensions did not in the least hinder them from employing in big politics those petty knaveries so characteristic of intermediate parties lacking a stable support, a clear doctrine, and a genuine moral axis. In the Menshevik social revolutionary bloc, the dominant place belonged to the Mensheviks, in spite of the weight of numbers on the side of the social revolutionaries. In this distribution of forces was expressed in a way the hegemony of the town over the country, the predominance of the city over the rural petty bourgeoisie, and finally the intellectual superiority of a Marxist intelligentsia over an intelligentsia which stood by the Simon Pure Russian sociology, and prided itself on the me ageness of the old Russian history. In the first weeks after the revolution, not one of the left parties, as we know, had its actual headquarters in the capital. The generally recognized leaders of the socialist parties were abroad. The secondary leaders were on their way to the center from the Far East. This created a mood of prudence and watchful waiting among the temporary leaders, which drew them closer together. Not one of the guiding groups in those weeks thought anything through to the end. The struggle of parties in the Soviet was extremely peaceable in character. It was a question, almost, of mere nuances within one and the same revolutionary democracy. It is true that with the arrival of Tsritelli from exile, March 19, the Soviet leadership took a rather sharp turn toward the right, toward direct responsibility for the government and the war. But the Bolsheviks also toward the middle of March, under the influence of Kamenev and Stalin who had arrived from exile, swung sharply to the right, so that the distance between the Soviet majority and its left opposition had become by the beginning of April even less than it was at the beginning of March. The real differentiation began a little later. It is possible to set the exact date, April 4, the day after the arrival of Lenin in Petrograd. The Menshevik party had a number of distinguished figures at the head of its different tendencies, but not one revolutionary leader. Its extreme right wing, led by the old teachers of the Russian social democracy, Polekhanov, Zasulich, Deutsch, had taken a patriotic position even under the autocracy. On the very eve of the February Revolution, Polekhanov, who had so pitifully outlived himself, wrote in an American newspaper that strikes and other forms of working class struggle in Russia would now be a crime. The broader circles of old Mensheviks, among their number such figures as Martov, Dan, Tsritelli, had inscribed themselves in the camp of Zimmerwald and refused to accept responsibility for the war. But this internationalism of the left Mensheviks, as also of the left social revolutionaries, concealed in the majority of cases a mere democratic oppositionism. The February Revolution reconciled a majority of those Zimmerwaldists eleven to the war, which from now on they discovered to be a struggle in defense of the revolution. The most decisive in this matter was Tsritelli, who carried Dan and the others along with him. Martov, whom the war had found in France, and who arrived from abroad only on May 9, could not help seeing that his former party associates had after the February Revolution arrived at the same position occupied by Gerst, Sembat, and others at the beginning of 1914 when they took upon themselves the defense of a bourgeois republic against German absolutism. Standing at the head of the left wing of the Mensheviks, which did not rise to any serious role in the revolution, Martov remained in opposition to the policy of Tsritelli and Dan, at the same time opposing a rapprochement between the left Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Tsritelli spoke in the name of official Menshevism and had an indubitable majority pre-revolutionary patriots having found it easy to unite with these patriots of the February vintage. Polekhanov, however, had his own group, completely chauvinist and standing outside the party and outside the Soviet. Martov's faction, which did not quit the party, had no paper of its own and no policy of its own. As always at times of great historic action, Martov floundered hopelessly and swung in the air. In 1917, as in 1905, 
the revolution hardly noticed this unusually able man. The president of the Menshevik faction of the Duma, Chides, became almost automatically the president of the Petrograd Soviet, and afterward of its executive committee. He tried to consecrate to the duties of his office all the resources of his conscientiousness, concealing his perpetual lack of confidence in himself under an ingenuous jocularity. He carried the ineradicable imprint of his province. Mountainous Georgia, the land of sun, vineyards, peasants, and petty princes, with a small percentage of workers, produced a very wide stratum of left intellectuals, flexible, temperamental, but the vast majority of them not rising above the petty bourgeois outlook. Georgia sent Mensheviks as deputies to all four Duma, and in all four factions her deputies played the role of leaders. Georgia became the gyrond of the Russian Revolution. But whereas the gyrondists of the 18th century were accused of federalism, the gyrondists of Georgia, although at first defending a single and indivisible Russia, ended in separatism. The most distinguished figure produced by the Georgian gyrond was undoubtedly the former deputy of the Second Duma, Tsri Teli, who immediately on his arrival from exile took the leadership, not only of the Mensheviks, but of the whole Soviet majority. Not a theoretician and not even a journalist, but a distinguished orator, Zritelli remained a radical of the southern French type. In conditions of ordinary parliamentary routine he would have been a fish in water. But he was born into a revolutionary epoch, and had poisoned himself in youth with a dose of Marxism. At any rate, of all the Mensheviks, Zritelli revealed in the events of the revolution the widest horizon and the desire to pursue a consistent policy. For this reason he, more than any other, helped on with the destruction of the February regime. Chides wholly submitted to Tsritelli, although at moments he was frightened by the doctrinaire straightforwardness which caused the revolutionary hard labor convicts of yesterday to unite with the conservative representatives of the bourgeoisie. The Menshevik Skoplev, indebted for his new popularity to his position as deputy in the last Duma, conveyed, and not only on account of his youthful appearance, the impression of a student playing the role of statesman on a homemade stage. Skoplev specialized in putting down excesses, quieting local conflicts, and in general corking up the cracks of the two-power regime, until he was included, in the unlucky role of Minister of Labor, in the coalition government of May. A most influential figure among the Mensheviks was Dan, an old party worker, always considered the second figure after Martov. If Menshevism in general was nourished upon the flesh, blood, tradition, and spirit of the German social democracy of the period of decline, Dan actually seemed to be a member of the German party administration, an Ebert on a smaller scale. Ebert, the German Dan, successfully carried out in Germany a year later that policy which Dan, the Russian Ebert, had failed to carry out in Russia. The cause of the difference however was not in the men, but in the conditions. If the first violin in the orchestra of the Soviet majority was Tsritelli, the piercing clarinet was played by Lieber, with all his lung power and blood in his eyes. This was a Menshevik from the Jewish Workers' Union, the Bund, with a long revolutionary past, very sincere, very temperamental, very eloquent, very limited, and passionately desirous of showing himself an inflexible patriot and iron statesman. Lieber was literally beside himself with hatred of the Bolsheviks. We may close the phalanx of Menshevik leaders with the former ultra left Bolshevik, Voitinsky, a prominent participant in the First Revolution, who had served at hard labor, and who broke with his party in March on grounds of patriotism. After joining the Mensheviks, Voitinsky became, as was to be expected, a professional Bolshevik hater. He lacked only Lieber's temperament in order to equal him in baiting his former party comrades. The general staff of the Narodniks was equally heterogeneous, but far less significant and bright. The so called popular socialists, the extreme right flank, were led by the old emigrant Cheikovsky, who equaled Pelekinov in military chauvinism but lacked his talent and his past. Alongside him stood the old woman Breshko Breshkovskaya whom the social revolutionaries called the grandmother of the Russian Revolution, but who zealously forced herself as godmother on the Russian counter-revolution. 
the superannuated anarchist Kropotkin, who had had a weakness ever since youth for the Narodniks, made use of the war to disavow everything he had been teaching for almost half a century. This denouncer of the state supported the Entente, and if he denounced the dual power in Russia, it was not in the name of anarchy, but in the name of a single power of the bourgeoisie. However, these old people played mostly a decorative role, although later on in the war against the Bolsheviks Tchaikovsky headed one of the white governments financed by Churchill. The first place among the social revolutionaries, far in advance of the others, though not in the party but above it, was occupied by Kierensky, a man without any party past whatever. We shall meet often again this providential figure, whose strength in the two-power period lay in his combining the weaknesses of liberalism with the weaknesses of the democracy. His formal entrance into the Social Revolutionary Party did not destroy Kierensky's scornful attitude toward parties in general, he considered himself the directly chosen one of the nation. But after all, the Social Revolutionary Party had ceased by that time to be a party, and become a grandiose and indeed national zero. In Kierensky this party found an adequate leader. The future Minister of Agriculture, and afterward President of the Constituent Assembly, Jinov, was indubitably the most representative figure of the old Social Revolutionary Party, and by no accident was considered its inspirator, theoretician and leader. A well-read rather than educated man, with a considerable but unintegrated learning, Jinov always had at his disposition a boundless assortment of appropriate quotations, which for a long time caught the imagination of the Russian youth without teaching them much. There was only one single question which this many-worded leader could not answer, whom was he leading and whither? The eclectic formulas of Jinov, ornamented with moralisms and verses, united for a time a most variegated public who at all critical moments pulled in different directions. No wonder Jinov complacently contrasted his methods of forming a party with Lenin's sectarianism. Jinov arrived from abroad five days after Lenin, England after some hesitation had passed him. To the numerous greetings of the Soviet, the leader of its biggest party answered with its longest speech, a speech about which Sukhanov, himself a half-social revolutionary, comments as follows, not only I but many other social revolutionary party patriots wrinkled our brows and shook our heads, because he chanted so unpleasantly and minced and rolled his eyes, yes, and talked endlessly and without aim or purpose. All the further activity of Jinov in the revolution developed in tune with this first speech. After some attempts to oppose Kierensky and Tzriteli from the left, finding himself pressed on all sides, Jinov surrendered without a struggle, purged himself of his emigrant Zimmerwaldism, took a seat in the Contact Commission, and later also in the coalition government. Everything he did was inappropriate. He decided therefore to evade all issues. Abstaining from the vote became for him a form of political life. His authority melted away from April to October, faster even than the ranks of his party. With all the differences between Zinov and Kierensky, who hated each other, they were both completely rooted in the pre-revolutionary past, in the old flabby Russian society, in that thin-blooded and pretentious intelligentsia, burning with a desire to teach the masses of the people, to be their guardian and benefactor, but completely incapable of listening to them, understanding them, and learning from them. And without learning from the masses there can be no revolutionary statesmanship. Avksentov who was raised by his party to the highest revolutionary posts, President of the Executive Committee of the Peasants' Deputies, Minister of the Interior, President of the Pre-Parliament, was the complete caricature of a statesman. A charming teacher of language in a ladies' seminary in Orel, that is really all you can say about him, although, to be sure, his political activity turned out far more pernicious than his personality. A large role was played although mostly behind the scenes, in the social revolutionary faction, and in the ruling nucleus of the Soviet, by Gotts. A terrorist of well-known revolutionary family, Gotts was less pretentious and more business-like than his closest political friends. But in his character as a so-called practical, he limited himself to kitchen matters, 
leaving the big questions to others. It is necessary to add that he was neither orator nor writer, and that his chief resource was his personal authority bought with years of imprisonment at hard labor. We have named essentially all who can be named among the ruling circle of the Narodniks. Below them are completely accidental figures like Filipovsky, whose arrival at the very height of the February Olympus nobody ever could explain, the deciding factor would seem to have been his naval officer's uniform. Alongside the official leaders of the two ruling parties and the executive committee, there were quite a few wild ones, solitaries, participants of the past movement at its various stages, people who had withdrawn from the struggle long before the uprising. And now, after a hasty return under the banner of the victorious revolution, were in no hurry to adopt the yoke of any party. On all fundamental questions the wild ones followed the line of the Soviet majority. For the first few days they played even a leading role, but in proportion as the official leaders began to arrive from exile and from abroad, these non-party men retired to a secondary place. Politics began to take form and party allegiance entered into its rights. Enemies of the executive committee in the reactionary camp made a great point of the preponderance in it of non-Russians, Jews, Georgians, Letts, Poles, and so forth. Although by comparison with the whole membership of the executive committee the non-Russian elements were not very numerous, it is nevertheless true that they occupied a very prominent place in the presidium, in the various committees, among the orators, etc. Since the intelligentsia of the oppressed nationalities, concentrated as they were for the most part in cities, had flowed copiously into the revolutionary ranks, it is not surprising that among the old generation of revolutionaries the number of non-Russians was especially large. Their experience, although not always of a high quality, made them irreplaceable when it came to inaugurating new social forms. The attempt, however, to explain the policy of the Soviets and the course of the whole revolution by an alleged predominance of non-Russians is pure nonsense. Nationalism in this case again reveals its scorn for the real nation, that is, the people, representing them in the period of their great national awakening as a mere block of wood in alien and accidental hands. But why and how did the non-Russians acquire such miracle working power over the native millions? As a matter of fact, at a moment of deep historic change, the bulk of a nation always presses into its service those elements which were yesterday most oppressed, and therefore are most ready to give expression to the new tasks. It is not that aliens lead the revolution, but that the revolution makes use of the aliens. It has been so even in great reforms introduced from above. The policy of Peter I did not cease to be national when, swinging out of the old tracks, it impressed into its service non-Russians and foreigners. The master of some German suburb, or some Dutch skipper, would express far better at that period the demands of the nation development of Russia, than Russian priests dragged in long ago by the Greeks, or Moscow boy ours, who also complained of foreign predominance, although themselves descended from those alien tribes who created the Russian state. In any case, the non-Russian intelligentsia of 1917 were distributed among the same parties as the 100% Russians, suffered from the same vices, made the same mistakes, and moreover the non-Russians among the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries displayed a most particular zeal for the defense and unity of Russia. Such was the executive committee, the highest organ of the democracy. Two parties which had lost their illusions but preserved their prejudices with a staff of leaders who were incapable of passing from word to deed, arrived at the head of revolution called to break the fetters of a century and lay the foundations of a new society. The whole activity of the compromises became one long chain of painful contradictions, exhausting the masses and leading to the convulsions of civil war. The workers, soldiers, and peasants took events seriously. They thought that the Soviets which they had created ought to undertake immediately to remove those evils which had caused the revolution. They all ran to the Soviet. Everybody brought his pains there. And who was without pains? They demanded decisions, hoped for help, awaited justice, insisted upon indemnification. Solicitors, complainers, petitioners, 
exposes, all came assuming that at last they had replaced a hostile power with their own. The people believe in the Soviet, the people are armed, therefore the Soviet is the sovereign power. That was the way they understood it. And were they not indeed right? An uninterrupted flood of soldiers, workers, soldiers' wives, small traders, clerks, mothers, fathers, kept opening and shutting the doors, sought, questioned, wept, demanded, compelled action, sometimes even indicating what action, and converted the Soviet in very truth into a revolutionary government. That was not all in the interest, or at least did not at all enter into the plans, of the Soviet itself, complains our friend Sukhanov, who of course struggled with all his might against this process. But with what success did he struggle? Alas, he is soon compelled to acknowledge that the Soviet apparatus began involuntarily, automatically, against the will of the Soviet, to crowd out the official governmental machine, which was grinding more and more without grain. What did the doctrinaires of capitulation do, the mechanics of this empty grinding? It became necessary to reconcile oneself and take up the separate functions of administration, Sukhanov sadly confesses, at the same time preserving the fiction that the Mariinsky Palace was performing them. That is what those people were busy with in a shattered country caught in the flames of war and revolution, protecting with masquerade measures the prestige of a government which the people had organically ejected. The revolution may die, but long live the fiction. And all the while the power which they had driven out of the door, kept crawling back through the window, catching them every time unawares and making them look cheap or ludicrous. On the night of the 28th of February, the Executive Committee closed up the monarchist press and established a licensing system for newspapers. Protests were heard, those shouting the loudest who had been accustomed to stop the mouths of others. After a few days, the committee had to take up again the problem of a free press to permit or not to permit the publication of reactionary papers? Disagreements arose. Doctrinaires of the type of Sukhanov stood for absolute freedom of the press. Chides at first disagreed, how can we leave weapons at the uncontrolled disposition of our mortal enemies? It occurred to nobody, by the way, to turn over the whole question to the decision of the government. Anyway, that would have been useless. The typographical workers took orders only from the Soviet. On March 5, the Executive Committee confirmed this fact as follows, the right press is closed and the issue of new papers will depend upon the decision of the Soviet. But as early as the 10th, under pressure from bourgeois circles, that resolution was annulled. They took only three days to come to their senses, exults Sukhanov. Ill-founded exultation. The press does not stand above society. The conditions of its existence during a revolution reflect the progress of the revolution itself. When the latter assumes, or may assume, the character of a civil war, not one of the warring camps will permit the existence of a hostile press within the sphere of its influence, no more than it will let escape from its control the arsenals, the railroads, the printing establishments. In a revolutionary struggle the press is only one kind of weapon. The right to speech is certainly not higher than the right to life. A revolution takes the latter two into its hands. We may lay this down as a law, revolutionary governments are the more liberal, the more tolerant, the more magnanimous to the reaction, the slower their program, the more they are bound up with the past, the more conservative their role. And the converse. The more gigantic their tasks and the greater the number of vested rights and interests they are to destroy, the more concentrated will be the revolutionary power, the more naked its dictatorship. Whether this is a good thing or bad, it is by these roads that humanity has thus far moved forward. The Soviet was right when it wanted to retain control of the press. Why did it so easily give this up? Because in general it was refusing to make a serious fight. It remained silent about peace, about the land, even about a republic. Having turned over the power to the conservative bourgeoisie, it had neither a reason for fearing the right press, nor a possibility of struggling against it. The government, on the other hand, began after a few months, with the support of the Soviet, to suppress ruthlessly the left press.
the Bolshevik papers were shut down one after another. On March 7 in Moscow, Kierinsky declaimed, Nicholas II is in my hands. I will never be the Marat of the Russian Revolution. Nicholas II is to go under my personal supervision to England. Ladies threw flowers, students applauded. But the depths bestirred themselves. Not one serious revolution yet, not one that had something to lose, has let the deposed monarch escape over the border. From the workers and soldiers came continuous demands, arrest the Romanovs. The executive committee sensed the fact that there could be no joking here. It was decided that the Soviet must take into its own hands the question of the Romanovs, the government was thus openly proclaimed undeserving of confidence. The executive committee gave an order to all railroads not to let Romanovs through. That was why the Tsar's train got lost in the tracks. One of the members of the executive committee, the worker Gvozdv, a right Menshevik, was commissioned to arrest Nicholas. Kierinsky was disavowed and along with him the government. But instead of resigning it submitted in silence. On March 9th Chides reported to the executive committee that the government had renounced the thought of sending Nicholas to England. The Tsar's family was put under arrest in the Winter Palace. Thus the executive committee stole the power from under its own pillow. But from the front the demand became more and more insistent, Transfer the former Tsar to the Peter and Paul fortress. Revolutions have always involved a reshuffling of property, not only by legislative means, but also by mass seizure. No agrarian revolution in history has ever proceeded otherwise, legal reforms always trail behind the red cock. In the towns, forcible seizures have played a smaller role, bourgeois revolutions have not had the task of uprooting bourgeois property relations. But there has never been any revolution, it seems, in which the masses have not appropriated for social purposes the buildings which formerly belonged to the enemies of the people. Immediately after the February Revolution the parties came out from underground, trade unions arose, continuous meetings were held, there were Soviets in every district, for all these things quarters were needed. Organizations seized the uninhabited summer homes of the Tsarist ministers or the vacant palaces of the Tsar's ballerinas. The victims complained, or else the government interfered on its own initiative. But since the expropriators really possessed the sovereign power, the official power being a ghost, it became necessary for the prosecuting attorney to appeal in the long run to that same executive committee to restore the ravished rights of a certain ballerina whose none too complicated functions had been so highly paid for by the members of the dynasty out of the people's wealth. The contact commission of course was brought into operation. The ministers held sittings, the bureau of the executive committee conferred, delegations were sent to the expropriators, and the affair dragged on for months. Sukhinif relates that as a left he had nothing against the most radical legislative invasions of the rights of property but on the other hand he was a bitter opponent of all forcible seizures. With ruses like this the unhappy lefts have always covered up their bankruptcy. A genuinely revolutionary government might unquestionably have reduced these chaotic seizures to a minimum by a timely decree on the requisition of quarters. But the left compromises had turned over the power to the fanatics of property, in order afterward carefully to preach to the masses, under an open sky a respect for revolutionary legality. The climate of Petrograd is not favorable to Platonism. The breadlines had given the last stimulus to the revolution. They also proved the first threat to the new regime. At the very first session of the Soviet a food commission had been created. The government bothered little about feeding the capital. It would not have been averse to holding it down with hunger. The task lay on the Soviet. It had at its disposition economists and statisticians with some practical experience, people who had served formerly in the economic and administrative organs of the bourgeoisie. They were in most cases Mensheviks of the right wing, like Grochman and Shrovenin, or former Bolsheviks like Mazarov and Ivalov, who had moved far to the right. But they had hardly approached the problem of feeding the capital when they found themselves compelled by the whole situation to apply extremely radical measures to control speculation and organize a market. 
in a series of sessions of the Soviet a whole system of measures of military socialism was adopted, including the declaring of all grain stores public property, the establishment of a definite price for bread, to accord with similar prices for industrial products, state control of industry, a regulated exchange of goods with the peasants. The leaders of the executive committee looked at each other in alarm, not knowing what else to propose, however, they supported these radical resolutions. The members of the contact commission afterward communicated them, in some embarrassment, to the government. The government promised to examine them. But Prince Lvov and Guchko and Konovlev had not the least desire to control, requisition, or otherwise cut down on themselves and their friends. All the economic measures of the Soviet went to pieces against the passive resistance of the state apparatus, except in so far as they were carried out independently by local Soviets. The sole practical measure carried through by the Petrograd Soviet in the matter of food supply was the limitation of the consumer to a strict ration, a pound and a half of bread for people engaged in physical labor, a pound for the rest. To be sure, this limitation introduced almost no change into the natural food budget of the population of the capital, you can live on a pound, or a pound and a half. The misery of daily undernourishment was still ahead. For a period of years, not months, but years, the revolution will have to take in its belt tighter and tighter on a shrinking stomach. It will weather the ordeal. At present what troubles it is not hunger but doubt, indefiniteness, uncertainty of tomorrow. Economic difficulties that have been multiplied by 32 months of war, are knocking at the doors and windows of the new regime. The breakdown of transport, the lack of various kinds of raw materials, the exhaustion of a considerable part of the equipment, alarming inflation, dislocation of trade, all these things demand bold and immediate measures. But while approaching these problems economically, the compromisers made the solution of them impossible politically. Every economic problem they encountered turned into a condemnation of the dual power, every decision they had to sign burned their fingers unbearably. The eight hour working day was the great test of strength and mutual relations. The insurrection had conquered, but the general strike continued. The workers seriously assumed that a change in the regime ought to introduce changes into their lives. This caused instant alarm to the new rulers, both liberal and socialist. The patriotic parties and newspapers adopted the cry, soldiers to the barracks, workers to the shops. Does that mean that everything is going to remain the same? asks the worker. For the time being, answer the Mensheviks, embarrassed. But the workers understand, if there isn't a change right now. The never will be. The bourgeoisie left the task of settling things with the workers to the socialists. Referring to the fact that the victory already won has sufficiently guaranteed the position of the working class in its revolutionary struggle to be sure, have not the liberal landlords come into power? The executive committee designated March 5 as the date for resuming work in the Petrograd district workers to the shops. Such is the ironclad egotism of the educated classes, liberals and socialists alike. Those people believed that millions of workers and soldiers lifted to the heights of insurrection by the inconquerable pressure of discontent and hope, would after their victory tamely submit to the old conditions of life. From reading historical works, they had got the impression that it happened this way in previous revolutions. But no. Even in the past it has never been so. If the workers have been driven back into their former stalls, it has been only in a roundabout way, after a whole series of defeats and deceptions. Marat was keenly aware of this cruel social perversion of political revolutions. For that reason he is so well slandered by the official historians. A revolution is accomplished and sustained only by the lowest classes of society. He wrote a month before the revolution of August 10, 1792, by all the disinherited, whom the shameless rich treat as canale, and whom the Romans with their usual cynicism once named proletarians. And what will the revolution give to the disinherited? Winning a certain success at the beginning. The movement is finally conquered, it always lacks knowledge, skill, 
means, weapons, leaders, and a definite plan of action, it remains defenseless in the face of conspirators possessed of experience, adroitness, and craft. Is it any wonder that Irinsky did not want to be the Marat of the Russian Revolution? One of the former captains of Russian industry, V. Auerbach, relates with indignation how the revolution was understood by the lower orders as something in the nature of an Easter carnival, servants, for example, disappeared for whole days, promenaded in red ribbons, took rides in automobiles, came home in the morning only long enough to wash up, and again went out for fun. It is remarkable that in trying to demonstrate the demoralizing effect of a revolution, this accuser describes the conduct of a servant in exactly those terms which, with the exception, to be sure, of the red ribbon, most perfectly reproduce the daily life of the bourgeois lady patrician. Yes, a revolution is interpreted by the oppressed as a holiday, or the eve of a holiday, and the first impulse of the household drudge aroused by it is to loosen the yoke of the day by day humiliating, anguishing, ineluctable slavery. The working class as a whole could not, and did not intend to, comfort themselves with mere red ribbons as a symbol of victory, a victory won for others. There was agitation in the factories of Petrograd. A considerable number of shops openly refused to submit to the resolution of the Soviet. The workers were of course ready to return to the shops, for that was necessary, but upon what terms? They demanded the eight-hour day. The Mensheviks answered by alluding to 1905 when the workers tried to introduce the eight-hour day by forcible methods and were defeated. A struggle on two fronts, against the reaction and against the capitalist, is too much for the proletariat. That was the central idea of the Mensheviks. They recognized in a general way the inevitability of a break in the future with the bourgeoisie. But this purely theoretical recognition did not bind them to anything. They considered that it was wrong to force the break. And since the bourgeoisie is driven into alliance with the reaction not by heated phrases from orators and journalists, but by the independent activity of the toiling classes, the Mensheviks tried with all their power to oppose this activity, to oppose the economic struggle of the workers and peasants. For the working class, they taught. Social questions are not now of the first importance. Its present task is to achieve political freedom. But just what this speculative freedom consisted of, the workers could not understand. They wanted in the first place a little freedom for their muscles and nerves. And so they brought pressure on their bosses. By the irony of fate it was exactly on the 10th of March when the Mensheviks were explaining that the eight-hour day is not a current issue that the Manufacturers Association, which had already been obliged to enter into official relations with the Soviet, announced its readiness to introduce the eight-hour day and permit the organization of factory and shop committees. The industrialists were more far-seeing than the democratic strategists of the Soviet. And no wonder, these employers came face to face with the workers and the workers in no less than half of the Petrograd plants, among them a majority of the biggest ones, were already leaving the shops in a body after eight hours of work. They themselves took what the Soviet and the government refused them. When the liberal press unctuously compared this gesture of the Russian industrialists of March 10, 1917, with that of the French nobility of August 4, 1789, they were far nearer the historic truth than they themselves imagined, like the feudalists of the end of the 18th century, the Russian capitalists acted under the club of necessity, hoping by this temporary concession to make sure of getting back in the future what they had lost. One of the good publicists, breaking through the official lie, frankly acknowledged this, unfortunately for the Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks had already by means of terror compelled the Manufacturers Association to agree to an immediate introduction of the eight-hour day. In what this terror consisted we already know. Worker Bolsheviks indubitably occupied the front ranks in the movement, and here as in the decisive days of February an overwhelming majority of the workers followed them. The Soviet, led by Mensheviks, recorded with mixed feelings this gigantic victory gained essentially against its opposition. The disgraced leaders were compelled, however, 
to make a still further step forward, they had to propose to the provisional government the promulgation in advance of the Constituent Assembly of an eight-hour law for all Russia. The government, however, in agreement with the manufacturers, resisted. Hoping for better days, they refused to fulfill this demand, presented to them, to be sure, without any particular insistence. In the Moscow region the same struggle arose, but it lasted longer. Here too the Soviet in spite of the resistance of the workers demanded a return to work. In one of the biggest factories a resolution against calling off the strike received 7,000 votes against six. Other factories reacted in much the same way. On the 10th of March the Soviet again proclaimed the duty of returning immediately to the shops. Although work began after that in a majority of shops, there developed almost everywhere a struggle for the shortening of the working day. The workers corrected their leaders by direct action. After a long resistance the Moscow Soviet was obliged on the 21st of March to introduce the eight-hour day by its own act. The industrialists immediately submitted. In the provinces the same struggle was carried over into April. Almost everywhere the Soviets at first refrained and resisted, and afterward under pressure from the workers entered into negotiations with the manufacturers. And where the latter did not accede, the Soviets were obliged independently to decree the eight-hour day. What a breach in the system! The government stood aside on purpose. In those days, a furious campaign was opening under liberal leadership against the workers. In order to subdue them it was decided to turn the soldiers against them. To shorten the working day means, you see, to weaken the front. How can anybody think only of himself in wartime? Are they counting the hours in the trenches? When the possessing classes make a start on the road of demagogism, they stop at nothing. The agitation assumed a frenzied character, and was soon carried into the trenches. The soldier Pyraeco in his reminiscences of the front confesses that this agitation, carried on chiefly by half-baked socialists among the officers, was not without success. But the great weakness of the official staff in their effort to turn the soldiers against the workers lay in the fact that they were officers. It was too fresh in the mind of every soldier what his officer had been to him in the past. This baiting of the workers was most bitter, however, in the capital. The industrialists along with the good staff found unlimited means and opportunities for agitation in the garrison. Toward the end of March, says Sukhanov, you could see at all street crossings, in the tramways, and in every public place, workers and soldiers locked together in a furious verbal battle. Even physical fights occurred. The workers understood the maneuver and skillfully warded it off. For this it was only necessary to tell the truth, to cite the figures of war profits, to show the soldiers the factories and shops with the roar of machines, the hell fires of the furnaces, their perpetual front where victims are innumerable. On the initiative of the workers there began regular visits by the troops of the garrison to the factories, and especially to those working on munitions. The soldiers looked and listened. The workers demonstrated and explained. These visits would end in triumphant fraternization. The socialist papers printed innumerable resolutions of the military units as to their indestructible solidarity with the workers. By the middle of April the very topic of the conflict had disappeared from the newspapers. The bourgeois press was silent. Thus after their economic victory, the workers won a political and moral victory. The events connected with this struggle for the eight hour day had an immense significance for the whole future development of the revolution. The workers had gained a few free hours a week for reading, for meetings, and also for practice with the rifle, which became a regular routine from the moment of the creation of the workers' militia. Moreover, after this clear lesson, the workers began to watch the Soviet leadership more closely. The authority of the Mensheviks suffered a serious drop. The Bolsheviks grew stronger in the factories, and partly too in the barracks. The soldier became more attentive, thoughtful, cautious, he understood that somebody was stalking him. The treacherous design of the demagogues turned against its own inspirers. Instead of alienation and hostility, they got a closer welding together of workers and soldiers. The government, in spite of the ill of contact, 
hated the Soviet, hated its leaders and their guardianship. It revealed this upon the very first occasion. Since the Soviet was fulfilling purely governmental functions, and this moreover at the request of the government itself whenever it became necessary to subdue the masses, the executive committee requested the payment of a small subsidy for expenses. The government refused, and in spite of the repeated insistence of the Soviet, stood pat, it could not pay out the resources of the state to a private organization. The Soviet swallowed it. The budget of the Soviet lay on the workers who never tired of taking up collections for the needs of the revolution. In those days both sides, the liberals and the socialists, kept up the decorum of a complete mutual friendliness. At the All-Russian Conference of Soviets the existence of the dual power was declared a fiction. Kierensky assured the delegates from the army that between the government and the Soviets there was a complete unity of problems and aims. The dual power was no less zealously denied by Tsri Teli, Dan, and other Soviet pillars. With the help of these lies, they tried to reinforce a regime that was founded on lies. However, the regime tottered from the very first weeks. The leaders were tireless in the matter of organizational combinations. They tried to bring to bear all sorts of accidental representative bodies against the masses, the soldiers against the workers, the new Duma, Zemstvos and cooperatives against the Soviets, the provinces against the capital, and finally the officers against the people. The Soviet form does not contain any mystic power. It is by no means free from the faults of every representative system, unavoidable so long as that system is unavoidable. But its strength lies in that it reduces all these faults to a minimum. We may confidently assert, and the events will soon prove it that any other representative system, atomizing the masses, would have expressed their actual will in the revolution incomparably less effectively, and with far greater delay. Of all the forms of revolutionary representation, the Soviet is the most flexible, immediate, and transparent. But still it is only a form. It cannot give more than the masses are capable of putting into it at a given moment. Beyond that, it can only assist the masses in understanding the mistakes they have made and correcting them. In this function of the Soviets lay one of the most important guarantees of the development of the revolution. What was the political plan of the executive committee? You could hardly say that any one of the leaders had a plan thoroughly thought out. Sukhanov subsequently asserted that, according to his plan, the power was turned over to the bourgeoisie only for a short time, in order that the democracy, having strengthened itself, might the more surely take it back. However, this construction, naive enough in any case, was obviously retrospective. At least it was never formulated by anybody at the time. Under the leadership of Tsri Teli, the vacillations of the executive committee, if they were not put an end to, were at least organized into a system. Tsri Teli openly announced that without a firm bourgeois power the revolution would inevitably fail. The democracy must limit itself to bringing pressure on the liberal bourgeoisie. Beware of pushing it over by some incautious step into the camp of the reaction, and conversely, support it insofar as it backs up the conquests of the revolution. In the long run that half-minded regime would have ended in a bourgeois republic with the socialists as a parliamentary opposition. The main difficulty for the leaders was not so much to find a general plan, as a current program of action. The compromisers had promised the masses to get from the bourgeoisie by way of pressure a democratic policy, foreign and domestic. It is indubitable that under pressure from the popular mass, Ruling classes have more than once in history made concessions. But pressure means, in the last analysis, a threat to crowd the ruling class out of the power and occupy its place. Just this weapon however was not in the hands of the democracy. They had themselves voluntarily given over the power to the bourgeoisie. At moments of conflict the democracy did not threaten to seize the power, but on the contrary the bourgeoisie frightened them with the idea of giving it back. Thus the chief lever in the mechanics of pressure was in the hands of the bourgeoisie. This explains how, in spite of its complete impotence, the government succeeded in resisting every somewhat serious undertaking of the Soviet leaders. By the middle of April, 
even the executive committee had proven too broad an organ for the political mysteries of the ruling nucleus, who had turned their faces completely toward the liberals. A bureau was therefore appointed, consisting exclusively of right defense cysts. From now on big politics was carried on in its own small circle. Everything seemed nicely and permanently settled. Zretelli dominated in the Soviet without limit. Kierinsky was riding higher and higher. But exactly at that moment appeared clearly the first alarming signs from below, from the masses. It is amazing, writes Stankovich, who was close to the circle of Kierinsky, that at the very moment this committee was formed, when responsibility for the work was assumed by a bureau selected only from defensist parties, exactly at this moment they let slip from their hands the leadership of the masses, the masses moved away from them. Not at all amazing, but quite in accord with the laws of things. 13 The army and the war in the months preceding the revolution, discipline in the army was already badly shaken. You can pick up plenty of officers' complaints from those days, soldiers disrespectful to the command, their treatment of horses, of military property, even of weapons, indescribably bad, disorders in the military trains. It was not equally serious everywhere. But everywhere it was going in the same direction, toward ruin. To this was now added the shock of revolution. The uprising of the Petrograd garrison took place not only without officers, but against them. In the critical hours the command simply hid its head. Deputy Oktoberist Shudlovsky conversed on the 27th of February with the officers of the Preobrazhensky regiment, obviously in order to feel out their attitude to the Duma, but found among these aristocrat cavaliers a total ignorance of what was happening, perhaps a half hypocritical ignorance, for they were all frightened monarchists. What was my surprise? says Shidlovsky, when the very next morning I saw the whole Preobrazhensky regiment marching down the street in military formation led by a band, their order perfect and without a single officer. To be sure, a few companies arrived at the Toride with their officers, more accurately, they brought their officers with them. But the officers felt that in this triumphal march they occupied the position of captives. Countess Klimichael, observing these scenes while under arrest, says plainly, the officers looked like sheep led to the slaughter. The February uprising did not create the split between soldiers and officers but merely brought it to the surface. In the minds of the soldiers the insurrection against the monarchy was primarily an insurrection against the commanding staff. From the morning of the 28th of February, says the Kurt Nabokov, then wearing an officer's uniform, it was dangerous to go out because they had begun to rip off the officers' epaulets. That is how the first day of the new regime looked in the garrison. The first care of the executive committee was to reconcile soldiers with officers. That meant nothing but to subordinate the troops to their former command. The return of the officers to their regiments was supposed, according to Sukhanov, to protect the army against universal anarchy or the dictatorship of the dark and disintegrated rank and file. These revolutionists, just like the liberals, were afraid of the soldiers, not of the officers. The workers on the other hand, along with the dark rank and file, saw every possible danger exactly in the ranks of those brilliant officers. The reconciliation therefore proved temporary. Stankovich describes in these words the mental attitude of the soldiers to the officers who returned to them after the uprising, the soldiers breaking discipline and leaving their barracks, not only without officers, but in many cases against their officers and even after killing them at their posts, had achieved, it turned out, a great deed of liberation. If it was a great deed, and if the officers themselves now affirm this, then why didn't they lead the soldiers into the streets? That would have been easier and less dangerous. Now, after the victory, they associate themselves with this deed but how sincerely and for how long. These words are the more instructive that the author himself was one of those left officers to whom it did not occur to lead his soldiers into the streets. On the morning of the 28th, on Samsonsky Prospect, the commander of an engineer's division was explaining to his soldiers that the government which everybody hated is overthrown, a new one is formed with Prince Lvov at the head, therefore it is necessary to obey officers as before. 
and now I ask all to return to their places in the barracks. A few soldiers cried, glad to try. Twelve the majority merely looked bewildered, is that all? The scene was observed accidentally by Kayurov. It jarred him. Permit me a word, Mr. Commander. And without waiting for permission, Kayurov put this question, has the workers' blood been flowing in the streets of Petrograd for three days merely to exchange one landlord for another? Here Kayurov took the bull by the horns. His question summarized the whole struggle of the coming months. The antagonism between soldier and officer was a refraction of the hostility between peasant and landlord. The officers in the provinces, having evidently got their instructions in good season, explained the events all in the same way, His Majesty has exceeded his strength in his efforts for the good of the country, and has been compelled to hand over the burden of government to his brother. The reply was plain on the faces of the soldiers, complains an officer in a far corner of the Crimea, Nicholas or Mikhail, it's all the same to us. When, however, this same officer was compelled next morning to communicate the news of the revolutionary victory, the soldiers, he tells us, were transformed. Their questions, gestures, glances, testified to the prolonged and resolute work which somebody had been doing on those dark and cloudy brains, totally unaccustomed to think. What a gulf between the officer, whose brain accommodates itself without effort to the latest telegram from Petrograd, and those soldiers who are, however stiffly, nevertheless honestly, defining their attitude to the events, independently weighing them in their calloused palms. The high command, although formally recognizing the revolution, decided not to let it through to the front. The chief of staff ordered the commander-in-chief of all the fronts, in case revolutionary delegations arrived in his territory, delegations which General Alexov called gangs for short, to arrest them immediately and turn them over to court-martial. The next day the same general, in the name of His Highness, the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, demanded of the government an end of all that is now happening in the rear of the army in other words, an end of the revolution. The command delayed informing the active army about the revolution as long as possible, not so much through loyalty to the monarchy as through fear of the revolution. On several fronts they established a veritable quarantine, stopped all letters from Petrograd, and held up newcomers. In that way the old regime stole a few extra days from eternity. The news of the revolution rolled up to the line of battle not before the 5th or 6th of March, and in what form? About the same as above, the Grand Duke is appointed Commander-in-Chief, the Tsar has abdicated in the name of the Fatherland, everything else as usual. In many trenches, perhaps even in the majority, the news of the revolution came from the Germans before it got the from Petrograd. Could there have been any doubt among the soldiers that the whole command was in a conspiracy to conceal the truth? And could those same soldiers trust those same officers to the extent of two cents, when a couple of days later they pinned on a red ribbon? The chief of staff of the Black Sea Fleet tells us that the news of the events in Petrograd at first made no marked impression on the soldiers. But when the first socialist papers arrived from the capital, in the wink of an eye the mood changed meetings began, criminal agitators crawled out of their cracks. The admiral simply did not understand what was happening before his eyes. The newspapers did not create this change of mood. They merely scattered the doubt of the soldiers as to the depth of the revolution, and permitted them to reveal their true feelings without fear of reprisals from the staff. The political physiognomy of the Black Sea staff, his own among them, is characterized by the same author in a single phrase, the majority of the officers of the fleet thought that without the Tsar the fatherland would perish. The Democrats also thought that the fatherland would perish, unless they brought back bright lights of this kind to the dark sailors. The commanding staff of the army and fleet soon divided into two groups. One group tried to stay in their places, tuning in on the revolution, registering as social revolutionaries. Later a part of them even tried to crawl into the Bolshevik camp. The other group strutted a while and tried to oppose the new order, but soon broke out in some sharp conflict and were swept away by the soldier flood. 
such groupings are so natural that they have been repeated in all revolutions. The irreconcilable officers of the French monarchy, those who in the words of one of them fought as long as they could, suffered less over the disobedience of the soldiers than over the knuckling under of their noble colleagues. In the long run the majority of the old command were pushed out or suppressed, and only a small part educated and assimilated. In a more dramatic form the officers shared the fate of those classes from which they were recruited. An army is always a copy of the society it serves, with this difference, that it gives social relations a concentrated character, carrying both their positive and negative features to an extreme. It is no accident that the war did not create one single distinguished military name in Russia. The high command was sufficiently characterized by one of its own members, much adventurism, much ignorance, much egotism, intrigue, careerism, greed, mediocrity, and lack of foresight writes General Zaleski, and very little knowledge, talent or desire to risk life, or even comfort and health. Nikolai Nikolaevich, the first commander-in-chief, was distinguished only by his high stature and august rudeness. General Alexov, a grey mediocrity, the oldest military clerk of the army, won out through mere perseverance. Kornilov was a bold young commander whom even his admirers regarded as a bit simple, Kierinsky's war minister, Verkovsky, later described him as the lion heart with the brain of a sheep. Braslov and Admiral Kolchak a little excelled the others in culture, if you will, but in nothing else. Denikin was not without character, but for the rest, a perfectly ordinary army general who had read five or six books. And after these came the Udanishes, the Dragomirovs, the Lukomskis, speaking French or not speaking it, drinking moderately or drinking hard, but amounting to absolutely nothing. To be sure, not only feudal, but also bourgeois and democratic Russia had its representatives in the officers' corps. The war poured into the ranks of the army tens of thousands of petty bourgeois youths in the capacity of officers, military clerks, doctors, engineers. These circles, standing almost solid for war to complete victory, felt the necessity of some broad measures of reform, but submitted in the long run to the reactionary command. Under the Tsar they submitted through fear, and after the revolution through conviction just as the democracy in the rear submitted to the bourgeoisie. The conciliatory wing of the officers shared subsequently the unhappy fate of the conciliatory parties, with this difference, that at the front the situation developed a thousand times more sharply. In the executive committee you could hold on for a long time with ambiguities, in the face of the soldiers it was not so easy. The ill will and friction between the democratic and aristocratic officers. incapable of reviving the army, only introduced a further element of decomposition. The physiognomy of the army was determined by the old Russia, and this physiognomy was completely feudal. The officers still considered the best soldier to be a humble and unthinking peasant lad, in whom no consciousness of human personality had yet awakened. Such was the national tradition of the Russian army, the Suvorov tradition, resting upon primitive agriculture, serfdom, and the village commune. In the 18th century Suvorov was still creating miracles out of this material. Leo Tolstoy, with a baronial love, idealized in his plate and Karatuev the old type of Russian soldier, unmurmuringly submitting to nature, tyranny, and death, war and peace. The French Revolution, initiating the magnificent triumph of individualism in all spheres of human activity, put an end to the military art of Suvorov. Throughout the 19th century, and the 20th too, throughout the whole period between the French and Russian revolutions, the Tsar's army was continually defeated because it was a feudal army. Having been formed on that national basis, the commanding staff was distinguished by a scorn for the personality of the soldier, a spirit of passive mandarinism, an ignorance of its own trade, a complete absence of heroic principles, and an exceptional disposition toward petty larceny. The authority of the officers rested upon the exterior signs of superiority, the ritual of caste, the system of suppression, and even a special caste language, contemptible idiom of slavery, 
in which the soldier was supposed to converse with his officer. 13 Accepting the revolution in words and swearing fealty to the provisional government, the Tsar's marshals simply shouldered off their own sins on the fallen dynasty. They graciously consented to allow Nicholas II to be declared scapegoat for the whole past. But farther than that, not a step. How could they understand that the moral essence of the revolution lay in the spiritualization of that human mass upon whose inertness all their good fortune had rested? Denikin, appointed to command the front, announced at Minsk, I accept the revolution wholly and irrevocably. But to revolutionize the army and bring demagogism into it, I consider ruinous to the country. A classic formula of the dull wittedness of major generals. As for the rank and file generals, to quote Zaleski, they made but one demand, only keep your hands off us, that is all we care about. However, the revolution could not keep its hands off them. Belonging to the privileged classes, they stood to win nothing, but they could lose much. They were threatened with the loss not only of officer privileges, but also of landed property. Covering themselves with loyalty to the provisional government, the reactionary officers waged so much the more bitter a campaign against the Soviets. And when they were convinced that the revolution was penetrating irresistibly into the soldier mass, and even into their home estates, they regarded this as a monstrous treachery on the part of Kierinsky, Miliukov, even Rodzy and Co to say nothing of the Bolsheviks. The life conditions of the fleet even more than the army nourished the live seeds of civil war. The life of the sailors in their steel bunkers, locked up the by force for a period of years, was not much different even in the matter of food from that of galley slaves. Right beside them the officers, mostly from privileged circles and having voluntarily chosen naval service as their calling, were identifying the fatherland with the Tsar the Tsar with themselves, and regarding the sailor as the least valuable part of the battleship. Two alien and tight-shut worlds thus live in close contact, and never out of each other's sight. The ships of the fleet have their base in the industrial seaport towns with their great population of workers needed for building and repairing. Moreover, on the ships themselves, in the engineering and machine corps, there is no small number of qualified workers. Those are the conditions which convert the fleet into a revolutionary mine. In the revolutions and military uprisings of all countries the sailors have been the most explosive material, they have almost always at the first opportunity drastically settled accounts with their officers. The Russian sailors were no exception. In Kronstadt the revolution was accompanied by an outbreak of bloody vengeance against the officers, who attempted, as though in horror at their own past to conceal the revolution from the sailors. One of the first victims to fall was Admiral Viren, who enjoyed a well-earned hatred. A number of the commanding staff were arrested by the sailors. Those who remained free were deprived of arms. In Helsingfors and Sverborg, Admiral Nepanin did not admit the news of the insurrection in Petrograd until the night of March 4, threatening the soldiers and sailors meanwhile with acts of repression. So much the more ferocious was the insurrection of these soldiers and sailors. It lasted all night and all day. Many officers were arrested. The most hateful were shoved under the ice. Judging by Skopleff's account of the conduct of the officers of the fleet and the Helsingfors authorities, writes Sukhanov, who is by no means indulgent to the dark rank and file, it is a wonder these excesses were so few. But in the land forces too there were bloody encounters several waves of them. At first this was an act of vengeance for the past, for the contemptible striking of soldiers. There was no lack of memories that burned like ulcers. In 1915 disciplinary punishment by flogging had been officially introduced into the Tsar's army. The officers flogged soldiers upon their own authority, soldiers who were often the fathers of families. But it was not always a question of the past. At the All-Russian Conference of Soviets, a delegate speaking for the army stated that as early as the 15th or 17th of March an order had been issued introducing corporal punishment in the active army. A deputy of the Duma, returning from the front, reported that the Cossacks said to him, in the absence of officers, here, you say, is the order. Evidently the famous order number one, of which we will speak further, we got it yesterday.
and yet today an officer socked me on the jaw. The Bolsheviks went out to try to restrain the soldiers from excesses as often as the conciliators. But bloody acts of retribution were as inevitable as the recoil of a gun. The liberals had no other ground for calling the February Revolution bloodless except that it gave them the power. Some of the officers managed to stir up bitter conflicts about the red ribbons, which were in the eyes of the soldiers a symbol of the break with the past. The commander of the Sumsky regiment got killed in this way. Another commander, having ordered newly arrived reinforcements to remove their ribbons, was arrested by the soldiers, and locked up in the guardhouse. A number of encounters also resulted from the Tsar's portraits, not yet removed from the official quarters. Was this out of loyalty to the monarchy? In a majority of cases it was mere lack of confidence in the revolution, an act of personal insurance. But the soldiers were not wrong in seeing the ghost of the old regime lurking behind those portraits. It was not thought out measures from above, but spasmodic movements from below which established the new regime in the army. The disciplinary power of the officers was neither annulled nor limited. It merely fell away of itself during the first weeks of March. It was clear, said the chief of the Black Sea staff, that if an officer attempted to impose disciplinary punishment upon a soldier, the power did not exist to get it executed. In that you have one of the sure signs of a genuinely popular revolution. With the falling away of their disciplinary power, the practical bankruptcy of the staff of officers was laid bare. Stankovich, who possessed both a gift of observation and an interest in military affairs, gives a withering account in this respect of the commanding staff. The drilling still went on according to the old rules, he tells us, totally out of relation to the demands of the war. Such exercises were merely a test of the patience and obedience of the soldiers. The officers, of course, tried to lay the blame for this, their own bankruptcy, upon the revolution. Although they were quick with cruel reprisals, the soldiers were also inclined to childlike trustfulness and self forgetful acts of gratitude. For a short time, the deputy Filonko, a priest and a liberal, seemed to the soldiers at the front a standard bearer of the idea of freedom, a shepherd of the revolution. The old churchly ideas united in funny ways with the new faith. The soldiers carried this priest on their hands, raised him above their heads, carefully seated him in his sleigh. And he afterward, choking with rapture, reported to the Duma, we could not finish our farewells. They kissed our hands and feet. This deputy thought that the Duma had an immense authority in the army. What had authority in the army was the revolution. And it was the revolution that threw this blinding reflection on various accidental figures. The symbolic cleansing carried out by Guchkov in the upper circles of the army, the removal of a few score of generals, gave no satisfaction to the soldiers, and at the same time created a state of uncertainty among the high officers. Each one was afraid that he would lose his place. The majority swam with the current, spoke softly, and clenched their fists in their pockets. It was still worse with the middle and lower officers, who came face to face with the soldiers. Here there was no governmental cleansing at all. Seeking a legal method, the soldiers of one artillery battery wrote to the executive committee and the state Duma about their commander, brothers, we humbly request you to remove our domestic enemy, Vanchkaza. Receiving no answer to such petitions, the soldiers would employ what means they had, disobedience, crowding out, even arrest. Only after that the command would wake up, remove the arrested or assaulted officer, sometimes trying to punish the soldiers, but often leaving them unpunished in order to avoid complicating things. This created an intolerable situation for the officers, and yet gave no clear definition to the situation of the soldiers. Even many fighting officers, those who seriously cared about the fate of the army, insisted upon the necessity of a general clean-up of the commanding staff. Without that, they said, it is useless to think of reviving the fighting ability of the troops. The soldiers presented to the deputies of the Duma no less convincing arguments. Formerly, they said, when they had a grievance, they had to complain to the officers, who ordinarily paid no attention to their complaint. And what were they to do now? 
the officers were the same, the fate of their complaints would be the same. It was very difficult to answer that question, a deputy confesses. But nevertheless that question contained the whole fate of the army and foreordained its future. It would be a mistake to represent the state of affairs in the army as homogeneous throughout the country in all kinds of troops and all regiments. The variation was very considerable. While the sailors of the Baltic fleet responded to the first news of the revolution by killing officers, right beside them in the garrison at Helsingfors the officers were occupying a leading position in the soldiers' Soviet by the beginning of April, and here an imposing general was speaking at celebrations in the name of the social revolutionaries. There were many such contrasts between hate and trustfulness. But nevertheless the army was like a system of communicating vessels and the political mood of the soldiers and sailors gravitated toward a single level. Discipline was maintained somehow while the soldiers were counting on a quick and decisive change. But when the soldiers saw, to quote a delegate from the front, that everything remained as before, the same oppression, slavery, ignorance, the same insults, and agitation began. Nature, who was not thoughtful enough to arm the majority of men with rhinoceros skin, also endowed the soldier with a nervous system. Revolutions serve to remind us from time to time of this carelessness on the part of nature. In the rear as well as at the front, accidental pretexts easily led to conflicts. The soldiers were given the right to attend theatres, meetings, concerts, etc., equally with all citizens. Many soldiers interpreted this as a right to attend theatres free. The ministry explained that freedom was to be understood in a speculative sense. But a people in insurrection has never shown any inclination toward Platonism or Kantianism. The worn out tissue of discipline broke through in various ways at different times, in different garrisons, and in different regiments. A commander would often think that everything had gone well in his regiment until certain newspapers appeared, or until the arrival of some outside agitator. It was all really the work of deep inexorable forces. The liberal deputy Yanushkevich came back from the front with a generalization that the disorganization is worst of all in the green troops composed of muzziks. In the more revolutionary regiments, the soldiers are getting along very well with the officers. As a matter of fact, discipline rested for the most part on two foundations the privileged cavalry made up of well off peasants and the artillery or technical branch in general with a high percentage of workers and intellectuals. The land-owning Cossacks held out longest of all, dreading an agrarian revolution in which the majority of them would lose and not gain. More than once after the revolution individual Cossack divisions carried out punitive operations, but in general these differences were merely in the date and tempo of disintegration. The blind struggle had its ebbs and flows. The officers would try to adapt themselves, the soldiers would again begin to bide their time. But during this temporary relief, during these days and weeks of truce, the social hatred which was decomposing the army of the old regime would become more and more intense. Oftener and oftener it would flash out in a kind of heat lightning. In Moscow, in one of the amphitheaters, a meeting of invalids was called, soldiers and officers together. An orator cripple began to cast aspersions on the officers. A noise of protest arose, a stamping of shoes, canes, crutches. And how long ago were you, Mr. Officer, insulting the soldiers with lashes and fists? These wounded, shell shocked, mutilated people stood like two walls, one facing the other. Crippled soldiers against crippled officers, the majority against the minority crutches against crutches. That nightmare scene in the amphitheater foreshadowed the ferocity of the coming civil war. Above all these fluctuations and contradictions in the army and in the country, one eternal question was hanging, summed up in the short word war. From the Baltic to the Black Sea, from the Black Sea to the Caspian, and beyond into the depths of Persia, on an immeasurable front, stood sixty-eight corps of infantry and nine of cavalry. What should happen to them further? What was to be done with the war? In the matter of military supplies the army had been considerably strengthened before the revolution. Domestic production for its needs had increased, 
and likewise the importation of war material through Murmansk and Archangel, especially artillery from the Allies. Rifles, cannon, cartridges, were on hand in incomparably greater quantities than during the first years of the war. New infantry divisions were in process of organization. The engineering corps had been enlarged. On this ground a number of the unhappy military chieftains attempted later to prove that Russia had stood on the eve of victory, and that only the revolution had prevented it. Twelve years before, Kuropatkin and Linovich had asserted with as good a foundation that wit prevented them from cleaning up the Japanese. In reality Russia was farther from victory in 1917 than at any other time. Along with the increase in ammunition there appeared in the army toward the end of 1916 an extreme lack of food supplies. Typhus and scurvy took more victims than the fighting. The breakdown of transport alone cancelled all strategy involving large-scale regroupings of the military mass. Moreover an extreme lack of horses often condemned the artillery to inaction. But the chief trouble was not even here, it was the moral condition of the army that was hopeless. You might describe it by saying that the army as an army no longer existed. Defeats, retreats, and the rottenness of the ruling group had utterly undermined the troops. You could no more correct that with administrative measures, than you could change the nervous system of the country. The soldier now looked at a heap of cartridges with the same disgust that he would at a pile of wormy meat, the whole thing seemed to him unnecessary and good for nothing, a deceit and a thievery and his officer could say nothing convincing to him, couldn't even make up his mind to crack him on the jaw. The officer himself felt deceived by the higher command, and moreover not infrequently ashamed before the soldiers for his own superiors. The army was incurably sick. It was still capable of speaking its word in the revolution, but so far as making war was concerned, it did not exist. Nobody believed in the success of the war the officers as little as the soldiers. Nobody wanted to fight any more, neither the army nor the people. To be sure, in the high chancelleries, where a special kind of life is lived, they were still chattering, through mere inertia, about great operations, about the spring offensive, the capture of the Dardanelles. In the Crimea they even got ready a big army for this latter purpose. It stood in the bulletins that the best element of the army had been designated for the siege. They sent the regiments of the guard from Petrograd. However, according to the account of an officer who began drilling them on the 25th of February, two days before the revolution, these reinforcements turned out to be indescribably bad. Not the slightest desire to fight was to be seen in those imperturbable blue, hazel, and grey eyes. All their thoughts and their aspirations were for one thing only, peace. There is no lack of such testimony. The revolution merely brought to the surface what already existed. The slogan down with the war. Became for that reason one of the chief slogans of the February days. It came from demonstrations of women, from the workers of the Vyborg quarter, from the regiments of the guard. Early in March when deputies from the Duma made a tour of the front, the soldiers, especially the older ones, would continually ask them, what are they saying about the land? The deputies answered evasively that the land question would be decided by the constituent assembly. But here would sound out a voice betraying the hidden thought of everybody, well, as a for the land, if I'm not here, you know, I won't need it. Such was the original soldier program of revolution, first peace, and then the land. Toward the end of March at the All Russian Conference of Soviets, where there was a good deal of patriotic bragging. One of the delegates representing the soldiers in the trenches reported very sincerely how the front received the news of the revolution, all the soldiers said, thank God. Maybe now we will have peace. The trenches instructed the delegate to tell the conference, we are ready to lay down our lives for freedom, but just the same, comrades, we want an end of the war. That was the living voice of reality, especially the latter half of it. We will wait a while if we have to, but you up there at the top, hurry along with the peace. The Tsar's troops in France, in a completely unnatural atmosphere, being moved by the same feelings, passed through the same stages of disintegration. When we heard that the Tsar had abdicated, 
an illiterate middle-aged peasant soldier explained to his officer, we all thought it meant that the war was over. The Tsar sent us to war, and what is the use of freedom if I have got to rot in the trenches again? That was the genuine soldier philosophy of the revolution, not brought in from the outside. No agitator could think up those simple and convincing words. The liberals and the half liberal socialists tried afterward to represent the revolution as a patriotic uprising. On the 2nd of March, Miliukov explained to the French journalists the Russian Revolution was made in order to remove the obstacles on Russia's road to victory. Here, hypocrisy goes hand in hand with self deceit, the hypocrisy somewhat the larger of the two. The candid reactionaries saw things clearer. Von Struve, a German panslavist, a Lutheran Greek Orthodox, and a Marxist monarchist, better defined the actual sources of the revolution, although in the language of reactionary hatred. Insofar as the popular, and especially the soldier, masses took part in the revolution, it was not a patriotic explosion, but a riotous self demobilization and was directed straight against a prolongation of the war. That is, it was made in order to stop the war. Along with a true thought, those words contain also a slander. The riotous demobilization was growing as a matter of fact right out of the war. The revolution did not create, but on the contrary checked it. Deserting, extraordinarily frequent on the eve of the revolution, was very infrequent in the first weeks after. The army was waiting. In the hope that the revolution would give peace, the soldier did not refuse to put a shoulder under the front, otherwise, he thought, the new government won't be able to conclude a peace. The soldiers are definitely expressing the opinion, reports the chief of the Grenadier Division on the 23rd of March, that we can only defend ourselves and not attack. Military reports and political speeches repeat this thought in various forms. Ensign Krylenko an old revolutionist and a future commander-in-chief under the Bolsheviks, testified that for the soldier the war question was settled in those days with this formula, support the front, but don't join the offensive. In a more solemn but wholly sincere language, that meant, defend freedom. We mustn't stick our bayonets in the ground. Under the influence of obscure and contradictory moods the soldiers those days frequently refused even to listen to the Bolsheviks. They thought perhaps, impressed by certain unskillful speeches, that the Bolsheviks were not concerned with the defense of the revolution and might prevent the government from concluding peace. The social patriotic papers and agitators more and more cultivated this idea among the soldiers. But even though sometimes preventing the Bolsheviks from speaking, the soldiers from the very first days decisively rejected the idea of an offensive. To the politicians of the capital this seemed some kind of misunderstanding which could be removed with appropriate pressure. The agitation for war reached extraordinary heights. The bourgeois press in millions of issues portrayed the problems of the revolution in the light of war to complete victory. The compromisers hummed the same tune, at first under their breath, then more boldly. The influence of the Bolsheviks, very weak in the army at the moment of the revolution became even weaker when thousands of workers who had been banished to the front for striking left its ranks. The desire for peace thus found no open and clear expression exactly where it was most intense. This situation made it possible for the commanders and commissars, who were looking round for comforting illusions, to deceive themselves about the actual state of affairs. In the articles and speeches of those times it is frequently asserted that the soldiers declined the offensive because they did not correctly understand the formula without annexations or indemnities. The compromisers spared no effort to explain that defensive warfare permits taking the offensive, and sometimes even requires it. As though that scholastic question were at issue. An offensive meant reopening the war. Awaiting support of the front meant armistice. The soldier's theory and practice of defensive warfare was a form of silent, and later indeed of quite open, agreement with the Germans, don't touch us and we won't touch you. More than that the army had nothing to give to the war. The soldiers were still less open to warlike persuasions because, under the form of preparation for an offensive, 
reactionary officers were obviously trying to get the reins in their hands. In the soldiers' conversation appeared the phrase, bayonet for the Germans, but for the inside enemy. The bayonet, however, had here a defensive significance. The soldiers in the trenches never thought of the Dardanelles. The desire for peace was a mighty underground current which must soon break out on the surface. Although he did not deny that negative signs were to be observed in the army, Miliukov tried for a long time after the revolution to assert that the army was capable of fulfilling the tasks laid out for it by the Entente. The Bolshevik propaganda, he writes in his character of historian, by no means immediately reached the front. For the first month or month and a half after the revolution the army remained healthy. He approaches the whole question at the level of propaganda, as though that exhausts the historic process. Under the form of a belated struggle against the Bolsheviks, to whom he attributes veritably mystic powers, Miliukov carries on his struggle against facts. We have already seen how the army looked in reality. Let us see how the commanders themselves appraised its fighting capacity in the first weeks, and even days, after the revolution. On March 6, the commander in chief of the Northern Front, General Ruski, informs the executive committee that a complete insubordination of the soldiers is beginning, popular personalities must be sent to the front in order to introduce some sort of tranquility into the army. The chief of the staff of the Black Sea Fleet says in his memoirs, from the first days of the revolution it was clear to me that it was impossible to wage war, and that the war was lost. Kolchak, according to him, was of the same opinion, and if he remained at his post as commander at the front, it was merely to defend the staff officers against violence. Countognatov, who occupied a high command in the Imperial Guard, wrote to Nabokov in March, You must clearly understand that the war is finished that we can't and won't fight any longer. Intelligent people ought to be thinking up a way to liquidate the war painlessly, otherwise there will be a catastrophe. Guchkov told Nabokov at the same time that he was receiving such letters by the thousand. Certain superficially more hopeful reports, rare enough in any case, were mostly contradicted by their own supplementary explanations. The desire of the troops for victory remains says the commander of the second army, Danilov. In some regiments it is even stronger. But just here he adds, discipline has fallen off. It would be well to postpone offensive action until the situation quiets down, say one to three months. And then an unexpected supplement, only 50% of the reinforcements are arriving. If they continue to melt away in the future, and are equally undisciplined, we cannot count on the success of the offensive. Our division is fully capable of defensive action, reports the valiant commander of the 51st Infantry Division, and immediately adds, it is necessary to rescue the army from the influence of the soldiers and workers' deputies. That, however, was not so easy to do. The chief of the 182nd Division reports to the commander of the Corps, with everyday misunderstandings are increasing, essentially about trifles, but ominous in their character. The soldiers are increasingly nervous, and the officers still more so. This is so far only scattered testimony, although there is much of it. But on the 18th of March there was held at staff headquarters a conference of high officers on the condition of the army. The conclusion of the central organs of command was unanimous, it will be impossible to send troops to the front in sufficient numbers to replace the losses, for there is unrest among all the reserves. The army is sick. It will probably take two or three months to adjust the relations between officers and soldiers. The generals did not understand that the disease could only progress. For the present they observed a decline of spirits among the officers agitation among the troops, and a considerable tendency to desert. The fighting capacity of the army is lowered, and it is difficult at present to rely on the possibility of an advance. Conclusion: It is now impossible to carry into execution the active operations indicated for the spring. In the weeks following, the situation continues to get worse and similar testimony is endlessly multiplied. Late in March the commander of the 5th Army General Dragomirov, 
wrote to General Rosky, the fighting spirit has declined. Not only is there no desire among the soldiers to take the offensive, but even a simple stubbornness on the defensive has decreased to a degree threatening the success of the war. Politics, which has spread through all the layers of the army, has made the whole military mass desire only one thing, to end the war and go home. General Lukomsky, one of the pillars of the reactionary staff, dissatisfied with the new order, took over the command of a corps and found, as he tells us, that discipline remained only in the artillery and engineering division in which there were many officers and soldiers of the regular army. As for the three infantry divisions, they were all on the road to complete disintegration. Deserting, which had decreased after the revolution under the influence of hope, increased again under the influence of disappointment. In one week, from the 1st to the 7th of April, according to the report of General Alexov, approximately 8,000 soldiers deserted from the northern and western fronts. I read with the utmost astonishment, he wrote to Guchkov, the irresponsible reports as to the excellent temper of the army. What is the use? It will not deceive the Germans, and for us it is a fatal self-deception. So far, it is well to note, there is hardly a reference to the Bolsheviks. The majority of officers had hardly learned that strange name. When they raised the question of the causes of the army's disintegration, it was newspapers, agitators, Soviets, politics in general, in a word, the February Revolution. You still could find individual officer optimists who hoped that everything would turn out all right. There were still more who intentionally shut their eyes to the facts, in order not to cause unpleasantness to the new government. On the other hand, a considerable number, especially of the highest officers, consciously exaggerated the signs of disintegration in order to get from the government some decisive action, which they themselves, however, were not quite ready to call by name. But the fundamental picture is indubitable. Finding the army sick, the revolution clothed the inexorable process of its decline in political forms which became more cruelly definite from week to week. The revolution carried to its logical end not only the passionate thirst for peace, but also the hostility of the soldier mass to the commanding staff and to the ruling classes in general. In the middle of April, Alexov made a personal report to the government on the mood of the army, in which he evidently did not hesitate to lay on colours. I well remember, writes Nabokov, what a feeling of awe and hopelessness seized me. We may assume that Miliukov was present during that report, which must have occurred in the first six weeks after the revolution. More likely indeed it was he who had summoned Alexov with the desire of frightening his colleagues, and through their mediation, his friends the socialists. Guchkov actually had a conversation after that with the representatives of the executive committee. A ruinous fraternization has begun, he complained. Cases of direct insubordination are reported. Orders are talked over in army organizations and at general meetings before being carried out. In such and such regiments they wouldn't even hear of active operations. When people are hoping that peace will come tomorrow, Guchkov added, wisely enough, you can't expect them to give up their lives today. From this the war minister drew the conclusion, we must stop talking out loud about peace. But since the revolution was just what had taught people to say out loud what they were formerly thinking in silence, this meant stop the revolution. The soldier, of course, from the very first day of the war, did not want either to die or to fight. But he did not want this just the way an artillery horse does not want to drag a heavy gun through the mud. Like the horse, he never thought that he might get rid of the load they had hitched to him. There was no connection between his will and the events of the war. The revolution showed him that connection. For millions of soldiers the revolution meant the right to a personal life, and first of all the right to life in general, the right to protect their lives from bullets and shells, and by the same token their faces from the officers' fists. In this sense it was said above, that the fundamental psychological process taking place in the army was the awakening of personality. In this volcanic eruption of individualism, which often took anarchistic forms, the educated classes saw only treachery to the nation.
but as a matter of fact in the stormy speeches of the soldiers, in their intemperate protests, even in their bloody excesses, a nation was merely beginning to form itself out of impersonal prehistoric raw material. This flood of mass individualism, so hateful to the bourgeoisie, was due to the very character of the February Revolution, to the fact that it was a bourgeois revolution. But that was not its only content, either. For besides the peasant and his soldier son, the worker took part in this revolution. The worker had long ago felt himself a personality, and he entered into the war not only with hatred of it, but also with the thought of struggling against it. The revolution meant for him not only the naked fact of conquering, but also the partial triumph of his ideas. The overthrow of the monarchy was for him only a first step, and he did not pause on it but hastened toward other goals. The whole question for him was, how much farther would the soldier and peasant go with him? What good is the land to me if I won't be there? asked the soldier. What good is freedom to me? he repeated after the worker before the closed doors of the theatre, if the keys to freedom are in the hand of the master. Thus across the immeasurable chaos of the February Revolution, the steely gleams of October were already visible. 14 The ruling group and the war What did the Provisional Government and the Executive Committee intend to do with this war and this army? First of all it is necessary to understand the policy of the liberal bourgeoisie, since they played the leading role. In external appearance the war policy of liberalism remained aggressive patriotic, annexationist, irreconcilable. In reality it was self-contradictory, treacherous, and rapidly becoming defeatist. Even if there had been no revolution, wrote Rodzi and Colater, the war would have been lost just the same, and in all probability a separate peace signed. Rodzi and Co's views were not distinguished by independence and for that reason ably typify the average opinions of liberally conservative circles. The mutiny of the battalions of the guard foretold to the possessing classes not victory abroad but defeat at home. The liberals were the less able to deceive themselves about this, because they had foreseen, and to the best of their ability struggled against, this danger. The unexpected revolutionary optimism of Miliukov, declaring the revolution a step toward victory was in reality the last resort of desperation. The question of war and peace had almost ceased for the liberals to be an independent question. They felt that they would not be able to use the revolution for the purposes of war, and so much the more imperative became their other task, to use the war against the revolution. Problems concerning the international situation of Russia after the war, debts and new loans, the capital market, and the sales market of course still confronted the leaders of the Russian bourgeoisie, but these questions did not directly determine their policy. The concern of the moment was not to secure advantageous international conditions for bourgeois Russia, but to save the bourgeois regime itself, even at the price of Russia's further enfeeblement. First we must recover, said this heavily wounded class. After that we will put things in order but to recover meant to put down the revolution. To keep up the war hypnosis and the mood of chauvinism was the only possible way the bourgeoisie could maintain their hold upon the masses, especially upon the army, against the so-called deepeners of the revolution. The problem was to sell to the people an old war which had been inherited from Tsarism, with all its former aims and allies, as a new war in defense of the conquests and hopes of the revolution that would be something of an achievement. But how achieve it? The liberals firmly expected to direct against the revolution that whole organization of patriotic social opinion which they had been using yesterday against the Rasputin clique. Since they had failed to save the monarchy, the highest court of appeal against the people, so much the more must they hold fast to the allies. In time of war at any rate, the Entente was a far more powerful court of appeal than their own monarchy could be. A prolongation of war would justify them in preserving the old military bureaucratic apparatus, postponing the Constituent Assembly, subordinating the revolutionary country to the front, that is, to the commanding staff acting in unison with the liberal bourgeoisie. All domestic questions, especially the agrarian, and all social legislation, were to be postponed until the end of the war, 
which in turn was to be postponed until a victory in which the liberals did not believe. A war to exhaust the enemy was thus converted into a war to exhaust the revolution. This was not perhaps a completed plan, thought up in advance and talked over in official meetings. But that was unnecessary. The plan flowed inevitably from the whole preceding policy of liberalism and the situation created by the revolution. Compelled to choose the path of war, Miliukov could not, of course, refuse in advance to participate in the division of the booty. The Allied hopes of victory remained very real, and indeed, with the entrance of America into the war, had grown immensely stronger. To be sure, the Entente was one thing and Russia another. The leaders of the Russian bourgeoisie had learned during the war that, in view of the economic and military weakness of Russia, a victory of the Entente over the Central Empires would also mean a victory over Russia. For whatever might happen, Russia could only come out of the war broken and weakened. But the liberal imperialists quite consciously decided to close their eyes to this prospect. There was really nothing else for them to do. Guchkov frankly stated to his circle that only a miracle could save Russia, and that his program as war minister was to hope for a miracle. For domestic purposes Miliukov needed the myth of victory. It does not matter how much he himself believed in it. At any rate, he stubbornly asserted that Constantinople must be ours. In this he acted with his usual cynicism. On the 20th of March this Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs tried to persuade the Allied ambassadors to betray Serbia in order by this means to purchase the treason of Bulgaria to the Central Empires. The French ambassador wrinkled his nose. Miliukov, however, insisted upon the necessity of abandoning sentimental considerations in this matter abandoning at the same time that neo-slavism which he had been preaching ever since the defeat of the First Revolution. Engels was right when he wrote to Bernstein as early as 1882, what does all this Russian pan-Slavic charlatanism amount to? The seizure of Constantinople and nothing more. The charge of being Germanophile, even of being bribed by the Germans, directed yesterday against a court Camarilla, was now directed with venom against the revolution. Bolder, louder, more insolent day by day. This note resounded in the speeches and articles of the Kurd party. Before capturing the Turkish waters, liberalism was going to dirty the springs and poison the wells of the revolution. By no means all the liberal leaders took an irreconcilable position, at least immediately after the revolution, on the question of war. Many were still in the pre revolutionary mood, contemplating the prospect of a separate peace. Certain leading cadets told about this afterward with complete frankness. Nabokov, according to his own confession, was already talking with members of the government about a separate peace on the 7th of March. Several members of the Kurd Center tried collectively to demonstrate to their leaders the impossibility of continuing the war. Miliukov with his usual cold precision explained, says Baron Nolder, that the aims of the war must be achieved. General Alexov, at that time drawing near to the Kurd party, joined his voice with Miliukov's, asserting that the army could be revived. That staff organizer of calamities apparently felt called to revive it. A good many of the liberals and democrats, a little more naive, misunderstood Miliukov's course, and thought him a very knight of loyalty to the Allies. The Don Quixote of the Entente. What nonsense! After the Bolsheviks seized the power, Miliukov did not hesitate one second to hurry down to Kiev, then occupied by the Germans, and offer his services to the Hohenzollern government, which, to be sure, was in no hurry to accept them. Miliukov's immediate goal in this was to secure for the purpose of his struggle with the Bolsheviks that same German gold with whose spectre he had earlier tried to befoul the revolution. Miliukov's appeal to Germany in 1918 seemed to many liberals just as incomprehensible as his program of shattering Germany in the first months of 1917. But these were merely two sides of the same medal. In preparing to betray the Allies, as formerly he tried to betray Serbia, Miliukov did not betray himself nor his class. He was pursuing the same policy, and it was not his fault if it didn't look nice. In feeling out under Zarism the path to a separate peace in order to avoid revolution, 
in demanding war to complete victory in order to stop the February Revolution when it came, in seeking an alliance with the Hohenzollerns in order to overthrow the October Revolution, in all this Miliukov remained true to the interests of the possessing classes. If he did not succeed in helping them, but only butted his head each time into a new wall, that is merely because his patrons were in a blind alley. What Miliukov especially needed in the first days after the uprising was an enemy attack, a good German crack over the skull for the revolution. Unfortunately for him, March and April were inauspicious from a climatic point of view for large operations on the Russian front. And more important, the Germans, whose own situation was getting more and more difficult, decided after some hesitation to leave the Russian Revolution to its own inner course. General Lysingen alone showed some private initiative at the Stuttgart, the 20th and 21st of March. His success simultaneously frightened the German, and delighted the Russian governments. The staff, with the same shamelessness with which under the Tsar it had exaggerated every trivial success, now exaggerated this defeat on the Stuttgart. And the liberal press took up the cry. They described examples of weakness, panic, and loss in the Russian troops with the same gusto with which they had formerly described war prisoners and trophies. The bourgeoisie and the general staff had quite plainly gone over to the defeatist position. But Lysingen was stopped by his superior officers, and the front again stood stock still in spring mud and expectation. The device of using the war against the revolution had a chance of success only if the intermediate parties, whom the popular masses followed, agreed to play the part of transmitting mechanism for this liberal policy. Liberalism was not in a position to unite the idea of war with the idea of revolution, only yesterday it had been preaching that a revolution would be ruinous to the war. This task must be turned over to the Democrats. But of course the secret must not be revealed to them. They must not be initiated into the scheme, but taken with a hook. The best way to take them was through their prejudices, their vanity, their high opinion of their own statesmanlike intelligence their fear of anarchy, their superstitious bowing down to the bourgeoisie. In the first days the socialists, for brevity we will use this name for both Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, did not know what to do with the war. Chides heaved a sigh, we have been talking against war all the time, how can I now advocate continuing the war? On March 10 the executive committee voted to send a greeting to Franz Mering.14 with this little gesture, the left wing tried to quiet its not very active socialist conscience. Upon the war itself the Soviet continued to say nothing. The leaders were afraid they might stir up a conflict with the provisional government on this subject, and darken those honeymoon weeks of contact. They were no less afraid of a split in their own ranks. They had both defenders of the fatherland and Zimmerwaldists among them. Each of these groups overestimated their differences. Wide circles of the revolutionary intelligentsia had undergone a deep bourgeois metamorphosis during the war. Patriotism, open or disguised, had united the intelligentsia with the ruling classes, drawing them away from the masses. The banner of Zimmerwald with which the left wing had covered themselves did not bind them to anything much and it did permit them to keep hidden their patriotic solidarity with the Rasputin clique. But now the Romanov regime was overthrown. Russia had become a democratic country. Her freedom, dancing in all colors, stood out sharply on the background of well-policed Europe with her military dictatorships. Must we not defend our revolution against the Hohenzollern? exclaimed both the old and the new patriots at the head of the executive committee. Zimmerwaldists of the type of Sukhinov and Steklov diffidently pointed out that the war remained imperialist, that the liberals were insisting that the revolution guarantee the annexations agreed on under the Tsar. How can I now advocate continuing the war? says the worried chides. But since these Zimmerwaldists were themselves the initiators of the transfer of power to the liberals, their objection to the liberal policy merely hung in the air. After some weeks of wavering and obstruction the first part of Miliukov's plan was, with the help of Tsritelli, decided in a satisfactory manner, these half-hearted Democrats calling themselves socialists were hitched up in the war harness, 
and under the whip of the liberals tried with all their tiny strength to guarantee victory, the victory of the Entente over Russia and of America over Europe. The chief function of the compromisers was to short-circuit the revolutionary energy of the masses into patriotic choirs. They tried on the one hand to revive the fighting capacity of the army, that was difficult. They tried on the other hand to induce the governments of the Entente to renounce their prospective robberies, that was ludicrous. In both efforts they passed from illusion to disappointment, from error to humiliation. Let us note the first signposts on this road. In the brief hours of his grandeur, Rodzienko succeeded in publishing an order for the immediate return of the soldiers to their barracks, and their subordination to the officers. The indignation this caused in the garrison compelled the Soviet to dedicate one of its first sessions to the question of the future of the soldier. In the heated atmosphere of those hours, in the chaos of those sessions like mass meetings, and at the direct dictation of the soldiers whom the absent leaders could not restrain, there was born the famous Order No. 1 the single worthy document of the February Revolution, a charter of the freedom of the Revolutionary Army. Its bold paragraphs, giving the soldiers an organizational mode of entry to the new highway, declare, that elective committees shall be formed in all military regiments. Soldiers' deputies shall be elected to the Soviet, in all political acts the soldiers shall submit to the Soviet and its committees, weapons shall be in the control of the regimental and battalion committees, and shall in no case be given up to the officer, on duty, the severest military discipline, off duty, complete citizens' rights, saluting off duty and titling of officers, is abolished, uncivil treatment of soldiers is forbidden, and particularly addressing them as thou, such were the inferences drawn by the Petrograd soldiers from their participation in the revolution. Could they have been other? Nobody dared to oppose them. During the preparation of this order the leaders of the Soviet were distracted by more lofty business, they were conducting negotiations with the liberals. That gave them an alibi later when they had to justify themselves before the bourgeoisie and the commanding staff. Simultaneously with order number one, the executive committee, having hastily pulled itself together, sent to the printer, by way of antidote, an appeal to the soldiers, which, under the pretext of condemning lynch law for officers, demanded the soldiers' subordination to the old commanding staff. The typesetters simply refused to set up this document. Its democratic authors were beside themselves with indignation, where are we headed for? It would be a mistake to imagine, however, that the typesetters were longing for bloody reprisals upon officers. The demand for subordination to the Tsarist commanding staff on the second day after the revolution, seemed to them to be merely opening the door to the counter-revolution. Of course the typesetters exceeded their rights. But they did not feel themselves to be only typesetters. It was a question, in their opinion, of the life of the revolution. In those first days, when both the soldiers and the workers were intensely excited about the future of the officers who had returned to their troops, the Mesre Ontsai, a social democratic organization close to the Bolsheviks, formulated this sore question with revolutionary audacity. In order that the aristocrats and officers shall not deceive you, said their appeal to the soldiers, choose your own platoon, company, and regiment commanders accept only those officers whom you know to be friends of the people. And what happened? This proclamation, which adequately met the situation, was immediately confiscated by the executive committee, and Chides in his speech called it an act of provocateurs. The Democrats, you see, were not in the least embarrassed about limiting the freedom of the press when it came to dealing blows to the left. Fortunately their own freedom was sufficiently limited, for the workers and soldiers, although supporting the executive committee as their highest organ, at all important moments corrected the policy of the leadership by direct interference. Before two days passed, the executive committee was trying by means of order number two to annul the first order, limiting its application to the Petrograd military district. In vain. Order number one was indestructible, it had not invented anything, but merely affirmed and strengthened what had already come to pass both in the rear and at the front, and was demanding recognition. Even liberal deputies, when face to face with the soldiers, 
defended themselves against questions and reproaches by referring to order number one. But in the sphere of big politics, that audacious order became the chief argument of the bourgeoisie against the Soviet. From that time on, the beaten generals discovered in order number one the chief obstacle which had prevented them from crushing the German armies. Its origin was even traced to Germany. The compromisers never ceased to apologize for what they had done, and bewildered the soldiers by trying to take away with their right hand what their left hand had let slip. Meanwhile, in the Soviet, the majority of rank and file deputies were already demanding the election of officers. The Democrats got excited. Finding no better argument, Sukhanov tried to frighten the deputies with the idea that the bourgeoisie, to whom they had turned over the power, would not go this far. The Democrats frankly hid behind Guchkov's back. In their scheme, the Liberals occupied the same place which the monarchy was to have occupied in the scheme of the Liberals. As I was returning from the Tribune to my place, Sukhanov relates, I ran into a soldier who blocked my path, and shaking his fist in my face, angrily shouted something about gentlemen who have never been in a soldier's skin. After this excess our Democrat, completely losing his equilibrium, ran to find Irinsky, and only with the latter's help was the question somehow smoothed over. These people did nothing all the time but smooth questions over. For two weeks they succeeded in pretending that they had not noticed the war. At last, however, a further postponement became impossible. On the 14th of March, the executive committee introduced into the Soviet the project of a manifesto written by Sukhanov and addressed to the people of the whole world. The liberal press soon named this document, which united the right and left compromises, order number one in the sphere of foreign policy. But this flattering appraisal was just as false as the document to which it referred. Order number one had been the honest answer of the lower ranks themselves to the questions raised before the army by the revolution. The Manifesto of March 14 was the treacherous answer of the upper ranks to the questions honestly presented to them by soldiers and workers. The Manifesto of course expressed a desire for peace, and moreover a democratic peace without annexations or indemnities. But long before the February Revolution, the Western imperialists had learned to make use of that same phraseology. It was exactly in the name of a durable, honorable, democratic peace, that Wilson was getting ready just at that moment to go into the war. The pious Mr. Asquith had given to Parliament a learned classification of annexations, from which it could be unmistakably inferred that all those annexations were to be condemned as immoral which conflicted with the interests of Great Britain. As for French diplomacy, its very essence consisted in giving the most liberating possible aspect to the greediness of the shopkeeper and money lender. The Soviet document, to which one cannot deny a rather simple sincerity of motive, dropped with fatal perfection into the well-worn rut of official French hypocrisy. The manifesto promised firmly to defend our own freedom against foreign militarism. The French social patriots had been occupied with just that business ever since August 1914. The hour has come for the people to take into their own hands the decision about war and peace, declares this manifesto, whose authors, in the name of the Russian people, had just turned over the decision of that question to the big bourgeoisie. The workers of Germany and Austria-Hungary were summoned by the manifesto to refuse to serve as an instrument of conquest and spoliation in the hands of kings, landlords, and bankers. Those words are the quintessence of a lie, for the leaders of the Soviet had no intention of breaking off their own alliance with the kings of Great Britain and Belgium, with the Emperor of Japan, with the landlords and bankers of their own and all the countries of the Entente. While turning over the leadership of foreign policy to Miliukov, who had been scheming not long before to convert East Prussia into a Russian province, the leaders of the Soviet summoned the German and Austro-Hungarian workers to follow the lead of the Russian Revolution. Their theatrical condemnation of slaughter altered nothing, the Pope himself was doing that. With the help of magniloquent phrases directed against the shadows of bankers, landlords, and kings, these compromisers were converting the February Revolution into an instrument in the hands of real kings, 
landlords, and bankers. In his telegram of salutation to the provisional government, Lloyd George had appraised the revolution as a proof that the present war is in its foundations a struggle for popular government and freedom. The manifesto of March 14 associated itself with Lloyd George in its foundations, and gave invaluable aid to the war propaganda in America. Milly Ukoff's paper was a thousand times right when it declared that the manifesto, although it began with so typical a note of pacifism, developed an ideology essentially common to us and to all our allies. If the Russian liberals nevertheless at times fiercely attacked the manifesto, and the French censorship would not let it through, that was merely due to a fear of the interpretation which would be given it by revolutionary but still trustful masses. Although written by Zemewaldists, the manifesto signalized the victory of the patriotic wing. The local Soviets understood the signal. They pronounced the slogan war against war unpermissible. Even in the Urals and in Kostroma, where the Bolsheviks were strong, the patriotic manifesto received unanimous approval. No wonder, when in the Petrograd Soviet itself the Bolsheviks offered no resistance to this false document. After a few weeks it became necessary to make partial payments on bills of exchange. The provisional government issued a war loan, of course called Liberty Loan. Zretelli explained that since the government as a whole and in general was fulfilling its obligations, the democracy ought to support the loan. In the executive committee the opposition captured more than a third of the votes. But at the plenum of the Soviet, April 22, only 112 votes were cast against the loan out of almost 2,000. From this the conclusion is sometimes drawn that the executive committee was further to the left than the Soviet. But that is not true. The Soviet was merely more honest than the executive committee, if the war is in defense of the revolution then you must give money for the war, you must support the loan. The executive committee was not more revolutionary, but more evasive. It lived on ambiguities and reservations. It supported the government set up by itself only as a whole and in general, and took the responsibility for the war insofar as. These petty trickeries are alien to the masses. Soldiers cannot fight insofar as, nor die as a whole and in general. In order to reinforce the victory of statesmanly thinking over wild talk, General Alexov, who had been intending on March 5 to shoot all gangs of propagandists, was on April 1 officially placed at the head of the armed forces. From then on everything was in order. The inspirer of the Tsarist foreign policy, Mili Ukov, was Minister of Foreign Affairs, the leader of the army under the Tsar, Alexov, had become commander-in-chief of the revolution. The succession was fully re-established. At the same time, however, the Soviet leaders felt compelled by the logic of the situation to unravel the loops of the net they were weaving. The official democracy mortally feared those officers whom they tolerated and supported. They could not help opposing to them their own authority, trying to find support for it among the rank and file soldiers, and make it as independent of the officers as possible. At the session of March 6, the executive committee considered it advisable to install its own commissars in all regiments and in all military institutions. Thus was created a threefold bond between the soldier and the Soviet, the regiments sent their representatives to the Soviet, the executive committee sent its commissars to the regiments, and finally at the head of each regiment stood an elective committee constituting a sort of lower nucleus of the Soviet. One of the principal duties of the commissars was to keep watch over the political reliability of the staff and commanding officers. The democratic regime. Outdid in this respect the autocratic, says Denikin with indignation. And he boasts how cleverly his staff intercepted and handed over to him the cipher correspondence of the commissars with Petrograd. To watch over monarchists and feudal lords. What could be more outrageous? To steal the correspondence of commissars with the government is, of course, a different matter. But however things stood in the field of morals, the internal situation in the ruling apparatus of the army at that time is perfectly clear, each side was afraid of the other and watching the other with hostility, they were united only by their common fear of the soldier. Even the generals and admirals, Whatever further hopes and plans they may have had, 
saw clearly that without a democratic smokescreen things would go badly with them. The resolutions on committees in the fleet were drawn up by Kolchak. He counted on strangling the committees in the future. But since it was impossible for the present to take a single step without them, Kolchak interceded with the staff to get them confirmed. Similarly General Markov, one of the future white chieftains, sent to the ministry early in April a plan for the institution of commissars to keep watch over the loyalty of the commanding staff. Thus the age-old laws of the army that is, the traditions of military bureaucratism, went to pieces like straws under the pressure of the revolution. The soldiers approached the committees from the opposite angle, and united around them against the commanding staff. And although the committees did defend officers against the soldiers, this was only within certain limits. The situation of an officer who came into conflict with the committee became unbearable. Thus was created the unwritten right of the soldiers to remove their commanders. On the Western Front by the month of July, according to Denikin, 60 of the old officers ranking from commander of a corps to commander of a regiment, had gone. Similar removals had occurred within the regiments. At that time, a meticulous secretarial work was going on in the War Ministry, in the Executive Committee, in the contact sessions, aiming to create reasonable relations in the Army, raise the authority of the officers, and reduce the Army committees to a secondary and mainly economic role. But, while the high up leaders were thus cleaning away the shadow of the revolution with the shadow of a broom, the committees were actually developing into a powerful system ascending toward the Petrograd Executive Committee and strengthening its organizational control over the army. The Executive Committee used this control, however, chiefly in order, through the commissars and committees, to drag the army once more into the war. More and more the soldiers found themselves pondering the question, how does it come about that committees elected by us so often say, not what we think? but what our officers want of us. The trenches are more and more frequently sending deputies to the capital to find out how things stand. From the beginning of April this movement of the soldiers from the front becomes continual. Every day mass conversations are going on in the Toride. Arriving soldiers are stirring their heavy brains, trying to find their way among the mysteries of the politics of an executive committee which cannot give a clear answer to any single question. The army is ponderously moving over to a Soviet position, but only in order the more clearly to convince itself of the bankruptcy of the Soviet leadership. The liberals, not daring to oppose the Soviet openly, nevertheless tried to carry on a struggle for the control of the army. Chauvinism, of course, must serve as their political bond with the soldiers. The Kurd minister Shingarf, in one of the conferences with the trench delegates, defended the order of Guchkov against unnecessary indulgence toward war prisoners, and spoke of German ferocity. His remarks did not meet with the slightest sympathy. The conference decisively expressed itself in favor of relieving the conditions of the prisoners of war. These were the same men whom the liberals had so casually accused of excesses and ferocities. But the gray men from the front had their own criterion. They considered it permissible to take vengeance on an officer for insulting soldiers, but it seemed contemptible to them to avenge on a captive German soldier the real or imagined ferocity of Ludendorff. The eternal standards of morality remained, alas, quite foreign to those rough and lousy mozzics. Out of the attempt of the bourgeoisie to get control of the army there arose a contest, which, however, never came to anything, between the liberals and the compromisers. It was at a Congress of Delegates from the Western Front on the 70th-10th of April. This first Congress of one of the fronts was to be a decisive political test of the army, and both sides sent to Minsk their best forces. From the Soviet, Tsritelli, Chides, Skoblev, Gvozdv. From the bourgeoisie, Rodzienki himself, the Kud, Demosthens Rodichev, and others. An intense feeling reigned in the crowded hall of the Minsk theatre, and spread in ripples throughout the town. The reports of the delegates painted a picture of the real state of affairs. Fraternization was going on along the whole front, the soldiers were taking the initiative more and more boldly, the commanding staff could not even think of repressive measures. What could the liberals say here? 
Faced by this passionate audience, they at once gave up the idea of opposing their own resolutions to those of the Soviet. They confined themselves to a patriotic note in their speeches of greeting, and soon erased themselves entirely. The battle was won by the Democrats without a struggle. Their task was not to lead the masses against the bourgeoisie, but to hold them back. The slogan of peace, equivocally woven in with war for the defense of the revolution, in the spirit of the Manifesto of March 14, ruled the Congress. The Soviet resolution on the war was adopted by 610 votes against eight, with 46 abstaining. The last hope of the liberals, that of opposing the front to the rear, the army to the Soviet, went up in smoke. But the Democratic leaders returned from the Congress more frightened than inspired by their victory. They had seen the ghosts raised by the revolution and they felt unable to cope with them. 15 The Bolsheviks and Lenin On 3 April Lenin arrived in Petrograd from abroad. Only from that moment does the Bolshevik party begin to speak out loud, and, what is more important, with its own voice. For Bolshevism, the first months of the revolution had been a period of bewilderment and vacillation. In the manifesto of the Bolshevik Central Committee, drawn up just after the victory of the insurrection, we read that the workers of the shops and factories, and likewise the mutinied troops, must immediately elect their representatives to the provisional revolutionary government. The manifesto was printed in the official organ of the Soviet without comment or objection, as though the question were a purely academic one. But the leading Bolsheviks themselves also regarded their slogans as purely demonstrative. They behaved not like representatives of a proletarian party preparing an independent struggle for power, but like the left wing of a democracy, which, having announced its principles, intended for an indefinite time to play the part of loyal opposition. Sukhinov asserts that at the sitting of the Executive Committee on March 1, the central question at issue was merely as to the conditions of the handing over of power. Against the thing itself, the formation of a bourgeois government, not one voice was raised, notwithstanding that out of 39 members of the executive committee, 11 were Bolsheviks or their adherents, and moreover three members of the Bolshevik center, Zalutsky, Shlyapnikov, and Molotov, were present at the sitting. In the Soviet on the next day, according to the report of Shlyapnikov himself, out of 400 deputies present, only 19 voted against the transfer of power to the bourgeoisie and this although there were already 40 in the Bolshevik faction. The voting itself passed off in a purely formal parliamentary manner, without any clear counter-proposition from the Bolsheviks, without conflict, and without any agitation whatever in the Bolshevik press. On the 4th of March, the Bureau of the Bolshevik Central Committee adopted a resolution on the counter-revolutionary character of the provisional government, and the necessity of steering a course toward the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. The Petrograd Committee, rightly regarding this resolution as academic, since it gave no directives for today's action, approached the problem from the opposite angle. Taking cognizance of the resolution on the provisional government adopted by the Soviet, it announces that it will not oppose the power of the provisional government insofar as, etc. In essence this was the position of the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, only moved back to the second line trenches. This openly opportunist resolution of the Petrograd Committee contradicted only in a formal way the resolution of the Central Committee whose academic character had meant nothing politically but putting up with an accomplished fact. This readiness to submit silently, on with reservations, to the government of the bourgeoisie did not have by any means the entire sympathy of the party. The Bolshevik workers met the provisional government from the first as a hostile rampart unexpectedly grown up in their path. The Vyborg Committee held meetings of thousands of workers and soldiers which almost unanimously adopted resolutions on the necessity for a seizure of power by the Soviets. An active participant in this agitation, Dingelstedt, testifies, there was not one meeting, not one workers meeting, which would have voted down such a resolution from us if there had only been somebody to present it. The Mensheviks and social revolutionaries were afraid in those first days to appear openly before audiences of workers and soldiers with their formulation of the question of power. 
a resolution of the Viborg workers, in view of its popularity, was printed and pasted up as a placard. But the Petrograd committee put an absolute ban upon this resolution, and the Viborg workers were compelled to submit. On the question of the social content of the revolution and the prospects of its development, the position of the Bolshevik leadership was no less cloudy. Shlyapnikov recalls, we agreed with the Mensheviks that we were passing through the period of the breakdown of feudal relations, and that in their place would appear all kinds of freedoms proper to bourgeois relations. Pravda said in its first number, the fundamental problem is to establish a democratic republic. In an instruction to the workers' deputies, the Moscow Committee announced, the proletariat aims to achieve freedom for the struggle for socialism, its ultimate goal. This traditional reference to the ultimate goal sufficiently emphasizes the historic distance from socialism. Further than this nobody ventured. The fear to go beyond the boundaries of a democratic revolution dictated a policy of waiting, of accommodation, and of actual retreat before the compromises. It is easy to imagine how heavily this political characterlessness of the center influenced the provinces. We will confine ourselves to the testimony of one of the Saratov organizations, our party after taking an active part in the insurrection has evidently lost its influence with the masses, and this has been caught up by the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries. Nobody knew what the slogans of the Bolsheviks were. It was a very unpleasant picture. The left Bolsheviks, especially the workers, tried with all their force to break through this quarantine. But they did not know how to refute the premise about the bourgeois character of the revolution and the danger of an isolation of the proletariat. They submitted, gritting their teeth, to the directions of the leaders. There were various conflicting currents in Bolshevism from the very first day, but no one of them carried its thoughts through to the end. Pravda reflected this cloudy and unstable intellectual state of the party, and did not bring any unity into it. The situation became still more complicated toward the middle of March, after the arrival from exile of Kamenev and Stalin, who abruptly turned the helm of official party policy to the right. Although a Bolshevik almost from the very birth of Bolshevism, Kamenev had always stood on the right flank of the party. Not without theoretical foundations or political instinct, and with a large experience of factional struggle in Russia and a store of political observations made in Western Europe, Kamenev grasped better than most Bolsheviks the general ideas of Lenin, but he grasped them only in order to give them the mildest possible interpretation in practice. You could not expect from him either independence of judgment or initiative in action. A distinguished propagandist, orator, journalist, not brilliant but thoughtful. Kamenev was especially valuable for negotiations with other parties and reconnoiters in other social circles, although from such excursions he always brought back with him a bit of some mood alien to the party. These characteristics of Kamenev were so obvious that almost nobody ever misjudged him as a political figure. Sukhanov remarks in him an absence of sharp corners. It is always necessary to lead him on a tow line, he says. He may resist a little, but not strongly. Stankiewicz writes to the same effect, Kamenev's attitude to his enemies was so gentle that it seemed as though he himself were ashamed of the irreconcilableness of his position, in the committee he was certainly not an enemy but merely an opposition. There is little to add to that. Stalin was a totally different type of Bolshevik, both in his psychological makeup and in the character of his party work, a strong, but theoretically and politically primitive, organizer. Whereas Kamenev as a publicist stayed for many years abroad with Lenin, where stood the theoretical forge of the party, Stalin as a so-called practical, without theoretical viewpoint, without broad political interests, and without a knowledge of foreign languages, was inseparable from the Russian soil. Such party workers appeared abroad only on short visits to receive instructions, discuss their further problems, and return again to Russia. Stalin was distinguished among the practicals for energy, persistence, and inventiveness in the matter of moves behind the scenes. Where Kamenev as a natural result of his character felt embarrassed by the practical conclusions of Bolshevism, Stalin on the contrary was inclined to defend the practical conclusions which he adopted without any mitigation whatever, 
uniting insistence with rudeness. Notwithstanding their opposite characters, it was no accident that Cayman F and Stalin occupied a common position at the beginning of the revolution. They supplemented each other. A revolutionary conception without a revolutionary will is like a watch with a broken spring. Cayman F was always behind the time, or rather beneath the tasks, of the revolution. But the absence of a broad political conception condemns the most willful revolutionist to indecisiveness in the presence of vast and complicated events. Stalin, the empiric, was open to alien influences not on the side of will but on the side of intellect. Thus it was that this publicist without decision, and this organizer without intellectual horizon, carried Bolshevism in March 1917 to the very boundaries of Menshevism. Stalin proved even less capable than Kamenev of developing an independent position in the executive committee, which he entered as a representative of the party. There is to be found in its reports and its press not one proposal, announcement, or protest, in which Stalin expressed the Bolshevik point of view in opposition to the fawning of the democracy at the feet of liberalism. Sukhanov says in his notes of the revolution, among the Bolsheviks, besides Kamenev, there appeared in the executive committee in those days Stalin. During the time of his modest activity in the executive committee he gave me the impression, and not only me, of a grey spot which would sometimes give out a dim and inconsequential light. There is really nothing more to be said about him. Although Sukhanov obviously underestimates Stalin as a whole, he nevertheless correctly describes his political characterlessness in the executive committee of the compromises. On the 14th of March, the manifesto to the people of the whole world, interpreting the victory of the February Revolution in the interests of the Entente, and signifying the triumph of a new republican social patriotism of the French stamp, was adopted by the Soviet unanimously. That meant a considerable success for Cayman F and Stalin but one evidently attained without much struggle. Pravda spoke of it as a conscious compromise between different tendencies represented in the Soviet. It is necessary to add that this compromise involved a direct break with the tendency of Lenin, which was not represented in the Soviet at all. Kamen F., a member of the emigrant editorial staff of the Central Organ, Stalin, a member of the Central Committee, and Muranov, a deputy in the Duma who had also returned from Siberia, removed the old editors of Pravda, who had occupied a two-left position, and on the 15th of March, relying on their somewhat problematic rights, took the paper into their own hands. In the program announcement of the new editorship, it was declared that the Bolsheviks would decisively support the provisional government insofar as it struggles against reaction or counter-revolution. The new editors expressed themselves no less categorically upon the question of war, while the German army obeys its emperor, the Russian soldier must stand firmly at his post answering bullet with bullet and shell with shell. Our slogan is not the meaningless down with war. Our slogan is pressure upon the provisional government with the aim of compelling it dot to make an attempt to induce all the warring countries to open immediate negotiations. Dot and until then every man remains at his fighting post. Both the idea and its formulation are those of the defensists. This program of pressure upon an imperialist government with the aim of inducing it to adopt a peace-loving form of activity, was the program of Kautsky in Germany, Jean Longet in France, Macdonald in England. It was anything but the program of Lenin, who was calling for the overthrow of imperialist rule. Defending itself against the patriotic press, Pravda went even farther, all defeatism, it said, or rather what an undiscriminating press protected by the Tsar's censorship has branded with that name, died at the moment when the first revolutionary regiment appeared on the streets of Petrograd. This was a direct abandonment of Lenin. Defeatism was not invented by a hostile press under the protection of a censorship, it was proclaimed by Lenin in the formula, the defeat of Russia is the lesser evil. The appearance of the first revolutionary regiment, and even the overthrow of the monarchy, did not alter the imperialist character of the war. The day of the first issue of the transformed Pravda, says Shlyapnikov was a day of rejoicing for the defense cysts. The whole Torride Palace, 
from the businessman in the committee of the state Duma to the very heart of the revolutionary democracy, the executive committee, was brimful of one piece of news, the victory of the moderate and reasonable Bolsheviks over the extremists. In the executive committee itself they met us with venomous smiles. When that number of Pravda was received in the factories it produced a complete bewilderment among the members of the party and its sympathizers, and a sarcastic satisfaction among its enemies. The indignation in the party locals was enormous, and when the proletarians found out that Pravda had been seized by three former editors arriving from Siberia they demanded their expulsion from the party. Pravda was soon compelled to print a sharp protest from the Vyborg district, if the paper does not want to lose the confidence of the workers, it must and will bring the light of revolutionary consciousness, no matter how painful it may be, to the bourgeois. These protests from below compelled the editors to become more cautious in their expressions, but did not change their policy. Even the first article of Lenin which got the from abroad passed by the minds of the editors. They were steering a rightward course all along the line. In our agitation, writes Stinglestedt, a representative of the left wing, we had to take up the principle of the dual power dot and demonstrate the inevitability of this roundabout road to that same worker and soldier mass which during two weeks of intensive political life had been educated in a wholly different understanding of its tasks. The policy of the party throughout the whole country naturally followed that of Pravda. In many Soviets resolutions about fundamental problems were now adopted unanimously, the Bolsheviks simply bowed down to the Soviet majority. At a conference of the Soviets of the Moscow region the Bolsheviks joined in the resolution of the Social Patriots on the war. And finally at the All-Russian Conference of the Representatives of 82 Soviets at the end of March and the beginning of April, the Bolsheviks voted for the official resolution on the question of power, which was defended by Dan. This extraordinary political rapprochement with the Mensheviks caused a widespread tendency toward unification. In the provinces the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks entered into united organizations. The Kamenev Stalin faction was steadily converting itself into a left flank of the so-called revolutionary democracy and was taking part in the mechanics of parliamentary pressure in the colloyers upon the bourgeoisie, supplementing this with a similar pressure upon the democracy. The part of the Central Committee which lived abroad in the Central Organ, the Social Democrat, had been the spiritual center of the party. Lenin, with Zinovov as assistant, had conducted the whole work of leadership. The most responsible secretarial duties were fulfilled by Lenin's wife, Krupskaya. In the practical work this small center relied upon the support of a few score of Bolshevik emigrants. During the war their isolation from Russia became the more unbearable as the military police of the Entente drew its circle tighter and tighter. The revolutionary explosion they had so long and tensely awaited caught them unawares. England categorically refused to the emigrant internationalists, of whom she had kept a careful list, a visa to Russia. Lenin was raging in his lyric cage, seeking a way out. Among a hundred plans that were talked over, one was to travel on the passport of a deaf-mute Scandinavian. At the same time Lenin did not miss any chance to make his voice heard from Switzerland. On March 6 he telegraphed through Stockholm to Petrograd, our tactic, absolute lack of confidence, no support to the new government. Suspect Kierinsky especially, arming of proletariat the sole guarantee, immediate elections to the Petrograd Duma, no rapprochement with other parties. In this directive, only the suggestion about elections to the Duma instead of the Soviet, had an episodic character and soon dropped out of sight. The other points, expressed with telegraphic incisiveness, fully indicate the general direction of the policy to be pursued. At the same time Lenin begins to send to Pravda his letters from afar which, although based upon fragments of foreign information, constitute a finished analysis of the revolutionary situation. The news in the foreign papers soon enabled him to conclude that the provisional government, with the direct assistance not only of Kierinsky but of Chides, was not unsuccessfully deceiving the workers, giving out the imperialist war for a war of defense. 
On the 17th of March, through friends in Stockholm, he wrote a letter filled with alarm. Our party would disgrace itself forever, kill itself politically, if it took part in such deceit. I would choose an immediate split with no matter whom in our party, rather than surrender to social patriotism. After this apparently impersonal threat, having definite people in mind however, Lenin adjures, came and if must understand that a world historic responsibility rests upon him. Kemenev is named here because it is a question of political principle. If Lenin had had a practical militant problem in mind, he would have been more likely to mention Stalin. But in just those hours when Lenin was striving to communicate the tensity of his will to Petrograd across smoking Europe, Kemenev with the cooperation of Stalin was turning sharply toward social patriotism. Various schemes, disguises, false whiskers, foreign or false passports, were cast aside one after the other as impossible. And meanwhile the idea of traveling through Germany became more and more concrete. This plan frightened the majority of emigrants, and not only those who were patriotic, either. Martov and the other Mensheviks could not make up their minds to adopt the bold action of Lenin, and continued to knock in vain on the doors of the Entente. Later on even many of the Bolsheviks repented of their journey through Germany, in view of the difficulties caused by the sealed train in the sphere of agitation. From the beginning Lenin never shut his eyes to those future difficulties. Kropskaya wrote not long before the departure from Durek, of course the patriots will raise an outcry in Russia, but for that we must be prepared. The question stood as follows, either stay in Switzerland or travel through Germany. There was no other choice. Could Lenin have hesitated for a moment? Just one month later Martov, Axelrod, and the others had to follow in his steps. In the organization of this unusual trip through hostile territory in wartime, the fundamental traits of Lenin as a statesman expressed themselves, boldness of conception and meticulous carefulness in its fulfillment. Inside that great revolutionist there dwelt a pedantic notary, one who knew his function, however and drew up his paper at the moment when it might help in the overthrow of all such notarial acts forever. The conditions of the journey through Germany were worked out with extraordinary care in this unique international treaty between the editorial staff of a revolutionary paper and the empire of the Hohenzollerns. Lenin demanded complete extraterritoriality during the transit, no supervision of the personnel of the passengers, their passports, or baggage. No single person should have the right to enter the train throughout the journey. Hence the legend of the sealed train, on their part, the emigrant group agreed to insist upon the release from Russia of a corresponding number of German and Austro-Hungarian civil prisoners. At the same time a joint declaration was drawn up with several foreign revolutionists. The Russian internationalists who are now going to Russia in order to serve the, the cause of the revolution will help us arouse the proletariat of other countries, especially of Germany and Austria, against their governments. So speaks the protocol signed by Laureate and Gilbx from France, Paul Levy from Germany, Platon from Switzerland, by Swedish left deputies, and others. On those conditions and with those precautions, 30 Russian emigrants left Switzerland at the end of March. A rather explosive trainload even among the loads of those war days. In his farewell letter to the Swiss workers Lenin reminded them of the declaration of the central organ of the Bolsheviks in the autumn of 1915, if the revolution brings to power in Russia a republican government which wants to continue the imperialist war, the Bolsheviks will be against the defense of the republican fatherland. Such a situation has now arisen. Our slogan is no support to the government of Guchkov Miliukov. With those words Lenin now entered the territory of the revolution. However, the members of the provisional government did not see any ground for alarm. Nabokov writes, at one of the March sessions of the provisional government, during a recess, in a long conversation about the increasing propaganda of the Bolsheviks, Kierinsky exclaimed with his usual hysterical giggle, just you wait. Lenin himself is coming, then the real thing will begin. Kierinsky was right. The real thing would begin only then. However the ministers, according to Nabokov, were not greatly disturbed, 
the very fact of his having appealed to Germany will so undermine the authority of Lenin that we need not fear him. As was to be expected, the ministers were exceedingly perspicacious. Friendly disciples went to meet Lenin in Finland. We had hardly got into the car and sat down, writes Raskolnikov, a young naval officer and a Bolshevik, when Vladimir Ilyich flung at Cayman F. What's this you're writing in Pravda? We saw several numbers and gave it to you good and proper. Such was their meeting after a separation of several years. But even so it was a friendly meeting. The Petrograd Committee, with the cooperation of the military organization, mobilized several thousand workers and soldiers for a triumphal welcome to Lenin. A friendly armored car division detailed all their cars to meet him. The committee decided to go to the station with the armored cars. The revolution had already created a partiality for that type of monster, so useful to have on your side in the streets of a city. The description of the official meeting which took place in the so-called Tsar's room of the Finland station, constitutes a very lively page in the many volumed and rather faded memoirs of Sukhanov. Lenin walked, or rather ran, into the Tsar's room in a round hat, his face chilled, and a luxurious bouquet in his arms. Hurrying to the middle of the room, he stopped still in front of Chides as though he had run into a completely unexpected obstacle. And here Chides, not abandoning his previous melancholy look, pronounced the following speech of greeting, carefully preserving not only the spirit and letter, but also the tone of voice of a moral instructor, Comrade Lenin, in the name of the Petrograd Soviet and the whole revolution. We welcome you to Russia. But we consider that the chief task of the revolutionary democracy at present is to defend our revolution against every kind of attack both from within and from without. We hope that you will join us in striving toward this goal. Chides ceased. I was dismayed with the unexpectedness of it. But Lenin, it seemed, knew well how to deal with all that. He stood there looking as though what was happening did not concern him in the least glanced from one side to the other, looked over the surrounding public, and even examined the ceiling of the Tsar's room while rearranging his bouquet, which harmonized rather badly with his whole figure, and finally, having turned completely away from the delegates of the executive committee, answered thus, Dear comrades, soldiers, sailors, and workers, I am happy to greet in you the victorious Russian Revolution to greet you as the advance guard of the international proletarian army. The hour is not far when, at the summons of our comrade Karl Liebknecht, the people will turn their weapons against their capitalist exploiters. The Russian revolution achieved by you has opened a new epoch. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution. Sukhanov is right, the bouquet harmonized badly with the figure of Lenin and doubtless hindered and embarrassed him with its inappropriateness to the austere background of events. In general, as it happens, Lenin did not like flowers in a bouquet. But doubtless he was far more embarrassed by that official and hypocritical Sunday school greeting in the parade room of a station. Chides was better than his speech of greeting. He was a little timid of Lenin. But they undoubtedly had told him that it was necessary to pull up on the sectarian from the very beginning. To supplement Chides's speech, which had demonstrated the pitiable level of the leadership, a young naval commander, speaking in the name of the sailors, was brilliant enough to express the hope that Lenin might become a member of the provisional government. Thus the February Revolution, garrulous and flabby and still rather stupid, greeted the man who had arrived with a resolute determination to set it straight both in thought and in will. Those first impressions, multiplying tenfold the alarm which he had brought with him, produced a feeling of protest in Lenin which it was difficult to restrain. How much more satisfactory to roll up his sleeves! Appealing from chides to the sailors and workers, from the defense of the fatherland to international revolution, from the provisional government to Liebknecht, Lenin merely gave a short rehearsal there at the station of his whole future policy. And nevertheless, that clumsy revolution instantly and heartily took its leader into its bosom. The soldiers demanded that Lenin climb up on one of the armored cars, and he had to obey. The oncoming night made the procession especially impressive. The lights on the other armored cars being dimmed, the night was stabbed by the sharp beam from the projector of the machine on which Lenin rode. 
it sliced out from the darkness of the street sections of excited workers, soldiers, sailors, the same ones who had achieved the great revolution and then let the power slip through their fingers. The band ceased playing every so often, in order to let Lenin repeat or vary his speech before new listeners. That triumphal march was brilliant, says Sukhanov, and even somewhat symbolic. In the palace of Kshesinskaya, Bolshevik headquarters in the satin nest of a court ballerina, that combination must have amused Lenin's always lively irony, greetings began again. This was too much. Lenin endured the flood of eulogistic speeches like an impatient pedestrian waiting in a doorway for the rain to stop. He felt the sincere joyfulness at his arrival, but was bothered by its verboseness. The very tone of the official greetings seemed to him imitative, affected, in a word borrowed from the petty bourgeois democracy, declamatory, sentimental, and false. He saw that the revolution, before having even defined its problems and tasks, had already created its tire etiquette. He smiled a good-natured reproach, looked at his watch, and from time to time doubtless gave an unrestrained yawn. The echo of the last greeting had not died away, when this unusual guest let loose upon that audience a cataract of passionate thought which at times sounded almost like a lashing. At that period the stenographic art was not yet open to Bolshevism. Nobody made notes. All were too absorbed in what was happening. The speeches have not been preserved. There remain only general impressions in the memoirs of the listeners. And these have been edited by the lapse of time, rapture has been added to them, and fright washed away. The fundamental impression made by Lenin's speech even among those nearest to him was one of fright. All the accepted formulas, which with innumerable repetition had acquired in the course of a month a seemingly unshakable permanence, were exploded one after another before the eyes of that audience. The short Leninist reply at the station, tossed out over the head of the startled chides, was here developed into a two-hour speech addressed directly to the Petrograd cadres of Bolshevism. The non-party socialist, Sukhanov, was accidentally present at this meeting as a guest, admitted by the good-natured Kamenev, although Lenin was intolerant of such indulgences. Thanks to this we have a description made by an outsider half hostile and half ecstatic, of the first meeting of Lenin with the Petersburg Bolsheviks. I will never forget that thunder-like speech, startling and amazing not only to me, a heretic accidentally dropped in, but also to the faithful, all of them. I assert that nobody there had expected anything of the kind. It seemed as if all the elements and the spirit of universal destruction had risen from their lairs, knowing neither barriers nor doubts nor personal difficulties nor personal considerations, to hover through the banquet chambers of Kshesinskaya above the heads of the bewitched disciples. Personal considerations and difficulties, to Sukhin if that meant for the most part the editorial waverings of the novices and circle having tea with Maxim Gorky. Lenin's considerations went deeper. Not the elements were hovering in that banquet hall, but human thoughts, and they were not embarrassed by the elements, but were trying to understand in order to control them. But never mind, the impression is clearly conveyed. On the journey here with my comrades, said Lenin, according to Sukhanov's report, I was expecting they would take us directly from the station to Peter and Paul. We are far from that it seems. But let us not give up the hope that it will happen, that we shall not escape it. For the others at that time the development of the revolution was identical with the strengthening of the democracy, for Lenin the nearest prospect led straight to the Peter and Paul prison fortress. It seemed a sinister joke. But Lenin was not joking, nor was the revolution joking. He swept aside legislative agrarian reform, complains Sukhanov along with all the rest of the policies of the Soviet. He spoke for an organized seizure of the land by the peasants, not anticipating dot any governmental power at all. We don't need any parliamentary republic. We don't need any bourgeois democracy. We don't need any government except the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and farmhands deputies. At the same time Lenin sharply separated himself from the Soviet majority tossing them over into the camp of the enemy. 
that alone was enough in those days to make his listeners dizzy. Only the Zimmer Wild left stands guard over the proletarian interests and the world revolution thus Sukhinif report, with indignation, the thoughts of Lenin. The rest are the same old opportunists, speaking pretty words but in reality betraying the cause of socialism and the work masses. Raskolnikov supplements Sukhinif, he decisively assailed the tactics pursued before his arrival by the ruling party groups and by individual comrades. The most responsible party workers were here. But for them too the words of Eilich were a veritable revelation. They laid down a Rubicon between the tactics of yesterday and today. That Rubicon, as we shall see, was not laid down at once. There was no discussion of the speech. All were too much astounded, and each wanted a chance to collect his thoughts. I came out on the street, concludes Sukhanov, feeling as though on that night I had been fogged over the head with a flail. Only one thing was clear, there was no place for me, a non-party man, beside Lenin. Indeed not. The next day Lenin presented to the party a short written exposition of his views which under the name of Theses of April 4th has become one of the most important documents of the revolution. The Theses expressed simple thoughts in simple words comprehensible to all, the republic which has issued from the February revolution is not our republic, and the war which it is now waging is not our war. The task of the Bolsheviks is to overthrow the imperialist government. But this government rests upon the support of the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, who in turn are supported by the trustfulness of the masses of the people. We are in the minority. In these circumstances there can be no talk of violence from our side. We must teach the masses not to trust the compromisers and defensists. We must patiently explain. The success of this policy, dictated by the whole existing situation, is assured, and it will bring us to the dictatorship of the proletariat and so beyond the boundaries of the bourgeois regime. We will break absolutely with capital, publish its secret treaties, and summon the workers of the whole world to cast loose from the bourgeoisie and put an end to the war. We are beginning the international revolution. Only its success will confirm our success, and guarantee a transition to the socialist regime. These theses of Lenin were published in his own name and his only. The central institutions of the party met them with a hostility softened only by bewilderment. Nobody, not one organization, group, or individual, affixed his signature to them. Even Zinovov, arriving with Lenin from abroad, where for ten years his ideas had been forming under the immediate and daily influence of Lenin, silently stepped aside. Nor was this sidestepping a surprise to the teacher, who knew his closest disciple all too well. Where Kamenev was a propagandist popularizer, Zinovov was an agitator, and indeed, to quote an expression of Lenin, nothing but an agitator. He has not, in the first place, a sufficient sense of responsibility to be a leader. But not only that. Lacking inner discipline, his mind is completely incapable of theoretical work, and his thoughts dissolve into formless intuitions of the agitator. Thanks to an exceptionally quick scent, he can catch out of the air whatever formulas are necessary to him, those which will exercise the most effective influence on the masses. Both as journalist and orator he remains an agitator, with only this difference, that in his articles you usually see his weaker side, and in oral speech his stronger. Although far more bold and unbridled in agitation than any other Bolshevik, Zinovov is even less capable than Kamenev of revolutionary initiative. He is, like all demagogues, indecisive. Passing from the arena of factional debate to that of direct mass fighting, Zinovov almost involuntarily separated from his teacher. There have been plenty of attempts of late years to prove that the April party crisis was a passing and almost accidental confusion. They all go to pieces at first contact with the facts. 15 What we already know of the activity of the party in March reveals the deepest possible contradiction between Lenin and the Petrograd leadership. This contradiction reached its highest intensity exactly at the moment of Lenin's arrival. Simultaneously with the All Russian Conference of Representatives of 82 Soviets, 
where Kamen F. and Stalin voted for the resolution on sovereignty introduced by the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, that took place in Petrograd a party conference of Bolsheviks assembled from all over Russia. This conference, at the very end of which Lenin arrived, has an exceptional interest for anyone wishing to characterize the mood and opinions of the party and all its upper layers as they issued from the war. A reading of the report, to this day unpublished, frequently produces a feeling of amazement, is it possible that a party represented by these delegates will after seven months seize the power with an iron hand? A month had already passed since the uprising, a long period for a revolution, as also for a war. Nevertheless opinions were not defined in the party on the most basic questions of the revolution. Extreme patriots such as Voitensky, Ilyava, and others, participated in the conference alongside of those who considered themselves internationalists. The percentage of outspoken patriots, incomparably less than among the Mensheviks, was nevertheless considerable. The conference as a whole did not decide the question whether to break with its own patriots or unite with the patriots of Menshevism. In an interval between sessions of the Bolshevik conference there was held a united session of Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, delegates to the Soviet conference, to consider the war question. The most furious Menshevik patriot, Lieber, announced at this session, we must do away with the old division between Bolshevik and Menshevik, and speak only of our attitude toward the war. The Bolshevik, Voitinsky, hastened to proclaim his readiness to put his signature to every word of Lieber. All of them together, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, patriots and internationalists, were seeking a common formula for their attitude to the war. The views of the Bolshevik conference undoubtedly found their most adequate expression in the report of Stalin on relations with the provisional government. It is necessary to introduce here the central thought of this speech, which, like the reports as a whole, is not yet published. The power has been decided between two organs of which neither one possesses full power. There is debate and struggle between them, and there ought to be. The roles have been divided. The Soviet has in fact taken the initiative in the revolutionary transformation, the Soviet is the revolutionary leader of the insurrectionary people an organ controlling the provisional government. And the provisional government has in fact taken the role of fortifier of the conquests of the revolutionary people. The Soviet mobilizes the forces, and controls. The provisional government, balking and confused, takes the role of fortifier of those conquests of the people, which they have already seized as a fact. This situation has disadvantageous but also advantageous sides. It is not to our advantage at present to force events, hastening the process of repelling the bourgeois layers, who will in the future inevitably withdraw from us. Transcending class distinctions, the speaker portrays the relation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat as a mere division of labor. The workers and soldiers achieve the revolution, Guchkov and Miliukov fortify it. We recognize here the traditional conception of the Mensheviks, incorrectly modeled after the events of 1789. This superintendent's approach to the historical process is exactly characteristic of the leaders of Menshevism, this handing out of instructions to various classes and then patronizingly criticizing their fulfillment. The idea that it is disadvantageous to hasten the withdrawal of the bourgeoisie from the revolution has always been the guiding principle of the whole policy of the Mensheviks. In action this means blunting and weakening the movement of the masses in order not to frighten away the liberal allies. And finally, Stalin's conclusion as to the provisional government is wholly in accord with the equivocal formula of the compromisers, insofar as the provisional government fortifies the steps of the revolution, insofar we must support it, but insofar as it is counter-revolutionary support to the provisional government is not permissible. Stalin's report was made on March 29th. On the next day the official spokesman of the Soviet conference, the non-party Social Democrat Steklov, defending the same conditional support to the provisional government, in the ardor of his eloquence painted such a picture of the activity of the fortifiers of the revolution, opposition to social reforms, leaning toward monarchy, protection of counter-revolutionary forces appetite for annexation, 
that the Bolshevik conference recoiled in alarm from this formula of support. The right Bolshevik Nogin declared, the speech of Stekloff has introduced one new thought, it is clear that we ought not now to talk about support, but about resistance. Skripnik also arrived at the conclusion that since the speech of Stekloff many things have changed, there can be no more talk of supporting the government. There is a conspiracy of the provisional government against the people and the revolution. Stalin, who a day before had been painting an idealistic picture of the division of labor between the government and the Soviet, felt obliged to eliminate this point about supporting the government. The short and superficial discussion turned about the question whether to support the provisional government insofar as, or only to support the revolutionary activities of the provisional government. The delegate from Saratov, Vaslov, not untruthfully declared, we all have the same attitude to the provisional government. Krestinsky formulated the situation even more clearly, as to practical action there is no disagreement between Stalin and Voitinsky.